What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK, live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Thursday, March 28th, 20 and 24, and the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours on today's show. Opening day is here in Major League Baseball. We'll preview the 2024 seasons for the Texas Rangers and the Houston Astros. We've got some Texas baseball tonight. The Longhorns on the road taking on the first place Kansas State Wildcats. Three-game series in the Little Apple getting going tonight. We will preview that one. Plus, the NCAA tournament resumes action later today. We will pick the Sweet 16 and repick our Final Four as the second weekend of March Madness begins. We've got some more updates from Texas football spring practice. We've got some women's college basketball stories to get into. And uh, another classic TBT video on a buck on, buck off Thursday. A lot to tackle over the next couple of hours. What's going on this morning, Buck? Oh, BK, it's another beautiful day here in Tripping Springs, Texas, USA, America. Just really nice. Sun's out. We had a little rain. Well, we had some thunderstorms just before you got out of town on uh, on Wednesday. And it's still cool this morning. My um, Woods Comfort Systems kicked in a little heat coming on this morning because it was it's 40 some degrees here and get, and to get to the high today is supposed to be about 77 so it'll end up being nice and sunny a beautiful day but yesterday the storms rolled in kind of started to cloud up around three o'clock didn't start raining until after you left town though but man when it came down it came yesterday and as you see i'm ready for the first day of the major league baseball season you got That's your right. yankees get up you got the full uni on Got the full uni on, yes, sir. The jock? No, I can't find my jock. I think after I think after I used my jock as a as a mask during COVID, I think my wife got in there and threw it away for some reason. But I'm going to I'm going to empty all the drawers this morning because I got to have that. Can't play without a lucky jock on. I mean, really? How am I pitch? I got my long sleeves on, you know, because I'm I'm on the mound today. You're on the mound for the Yankees today. You know they play inside. It's a retractable roof stadium down in Houston. You don't need the long sleeves for the weather. You need long sleeves. You know they're going to keep it cool down there in Houston. Mm. 77. That's still can use. His arm's not quite loose enough. You know, I got to loosen it up a little bit. So I'm going to keep the long sleeve on. It'll be Bucky Godbold against Fromber Valdez. Fromber. Yeah, come on, Fromber. Later this afternoon at the Juice Box. So no jock. Man, well – First of all, I'd like to congratulate and thank your wife on the best decision she's ever made in her entire what? life, getting rid of your 50-year-old jock strap that you used to wear when you played high school and college football. That oh, thing no. should have been tossed decades ago, and hopefully she finally took charge and threw that thing away because there, there, there's worse than COVID on that jock strap. You were trying to protect yourself from coronavirus whatever's yeah. on there is significantly worse than covid there's no doubt in my mind yeah i mean i was expecting that jock to stand up in a drawer you know what i mean to be right there where i knew where it was to be a little harder than the socks and everything else in that drawer mm. but i didn't see it on the top so i didn't i was afraid to dig down there and stick my hand down there but i'll empty the drawer today and find that jock you got the crusty jock next to the crusty sock, huh? Yes. <laughs> Nasty. And you've got the pants on? I got the pants on, too. The pants and the belly. Heck, yeah, man. You show the people? No, you're not loose this morning. Oh, my God. The, <laughs> the, un- <laughs> the unbuttoned right. pants. I didn't button them all the way, yes. Oh, my gosh. 32 got the pants. The pants. Yes. The belt. I got, got it all. stirrups on today, too. No, I didn't go straight. I just went black socks. Oh, my gosh. Bucky Dent is in. Bucky the Dent is here, yes. I was always I was always Bobby Richardson for the Yankees, little second baseman. Okay. That's what it is. I was I, I love the Yankees during Cleet Bo- I mean the Boyers and Tommy Trash, Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, uh Joe Pepitone, Elston Howard, Whitey Ford. Those are my guys. It's a bad I didn't name. Go right as, there. I, didn't, I didn't go as far as Yogi Berra and that group, Babe Ruth. No, I wasn't around then. You sure? Pa- pretty positive. 
I feel like you were in the building when the <laughs> Babe Ruth trade happened that started the curse of the Bambino. You were there when the Red Sox and Yankees agreed to that deal. When Lou Gehrig made the speech, no, I was not there. <laughs> I thought you were like 50 when that happened. No, no, not at all. I'm, I'm a, more of a modern day, you know, Whitey Ford, that's still back there. Joe Pepitone and, and that was then that group, Tommy Trash. Mm. That was great, man. That was great baseball. Yeah, you don't see too many Whiteys nowadays. Well, you see plenty of Whiteys, but you don't hear that Major name. League baseball, there's tons of Whiteys in Major League <laughs> Yeah, baseball. tons of Whiteys all over the place. But, uh, yeah, the name Whitey, not as prominent as it used to be. And I think that's for the best. So we'll get to some baseball. We've got World Series odds to get into. We'll talk some Astros. We'll talk some Rangers. Of course, we'll get into the Yankees a little bit because the Yankees are opening up their season in Houston. But uh, before we do all of that, Buck, how about a shout-out to the Soldiers? Yes, definitely. Good morning to the Soldiers at Fort Cavazos, Texas, the Soldiers in the state of Texas, and all those that fight for us each and every day. Thank you for what you do. It is appreciated to you and your families and to your families. Thank you for sharing you with us. And, of course, be careful out there. Yes, indeed. Shout out to all of you this morning. All right, Should, I made, rain Should I have made that rain prediction yesterday? Or, or I thought maybe I was in solitary confinement. So I, I just decided to close my mouth. You know, I'll make the next I'll make the next rain prediction. So since we don't have a really a weatherer any longer. So I will become the official weatherer once again. Well, I don't know if you can stake claim to being the official weatherer when you didn't predict the weather that we had yesterday. You can't be talking all of this trash after a missed forecast. Come on, man. You're supposed to let the people know when the rain is coming. And Dude, apparently it, it thunderstormed. It was thunderstorms. It was kind of, it was, I mean, I know there's some places I believe got hail yesterday. That's how it came down. It was Kind of scary the way it snuck up on us. I was surprised you got out of there. You must have just got out in time. I guess I got lucky, man, because my flight was at uh, 4.55 p.m. yesterday. And, you know, on the drive to the airport, not a problem at all. No rain. It was out west. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess uh, I I got out just in time. I'm not sure if any flights were delayed leaving Austin last night or anything like that. But, uh, yeah, long day of travel for me. Door to door, it took me 11 hours to get from my apartment in South Austin to Corvallis, Oregon, the land of the beaver. Nice. Another I am, right? Oh, plenty of beaver walking around here last night, let me tell you. So, and then you're going from there, you're heading to, where are you heading from there today? So I've got, yeah, I spent 11 hours traveling yesterday, and then after the show this morning, I will spend six hours in a car Whew. driving from here to Vancouver. I'm going to cross the border today, Buck. I got to call your friend. Javier for some tips to make sure I can get there. I I think they'll smile at you there. Probably the Canadian border there. They probably smile. You go anywhere where you're around here, South Padre, going to Big Ben, uh, the Mexican border. There's no smiles there. There's nothing to be happy about with those border patrol guys. They're they they don't play. The Mexicans aren't happy. Is that our news update this morning? They don't. Well, it seems like they they all are border patrol. So. You know, mm. and I'm not saying there's something up with that, but just saying something up with that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was going to say, it sure sounds like you're saying something is up with that. It's just kind of strange when I went to Big Ben that time and I get to the I get to the border. and I'm like, he goes, where are you from? I said, from Austin, Texas. And I pointed to my Yankees cap and the dude looked at me and he, there was, it wasn't funny to him. And I'm like, hey, where are all the white border patrols here? Oh, hey, we're all the white. Where are all the white women at? I'm like, where are all the, the white border patrols at? It's like run by all Hispanics. I'm thinking, wait a minute. So you can let people over and then they can come back. Like a relative can come over, come back, go back. Come. And somebody says, no, man, those are those are Americans. And I'm like, they didn't think I was funny. I said, I don't think that's what I like. I said, I need to see more white people here at the border patrol, you know. No, oh, you think all Mexicans are related and they're all. Oh, I, I didn't say it. that. Did I say that? That sure sounds like you were saying that. <laughs> Dude, and they had these mangy dogs. I'm thinking I'm looking for German shepherds, you know, big German shepherds. They had these mangy dogs look like my wife's schnauzer. I said, <laughs> that dog ain't going to find shit. That dog ain't going to find any pot. <clears throat> Not find any pot or any bombs or anything. That dog can't smell past that hubcap. 
Uh, if you had weed or bombs, oh. or both, that dog would have found everything. Oh, everything. Oh, yeah. I had like, I had like Tito's. Golly, it is, oh, it is a buck off Thursday. So the first buck off from the buck is to the Mexicans. No, <laughs> no, it just, it seems strange. It just, it's like, hmm. wait a minute, border, border patrol. Come on now. They don't mess around. Well, they, don't, they don't they don't have a sense of humor no no not at all it's not for anybody either it's not for people crossing from the u.s to mexico or mexico oh. to the u.s their their yes. job is to not take any shit and they don't they take got, any shit and they got their ars and they got those things strapped to their chest like and like their hands on them like rubbing them like a genie i'm like shit that guy yeah. just waiting for me to make some weird move I feel like the Canadian border, there's going to be somebody with a cup of coffee from Timmy Orton's, eh? Yeah. Hey, here, this is for you. Hey, sorry about the wait, eh? <laughs> no, no, not at our borders. Not around no. here. There's no joking, no laughter, no fun and games. No, hey, you got your Yankees cap on? I don't give a shit about your Yankees cap. That ain't funny. No. Just asking you where you're from. Austin. Oh, he's, yeah, he's, uh, he's probably a Dodgers fan or an Astros fan. Yeah, no kidding. That's usually how it works. My goodness, it is a sensitivity training Thursday here on Texas wow. Sports Unfiltered. If you didn't Which know, every day. Yeah, and I, now you know. Twelve minutes in to today's show, so yeah, opening day is here. Three ten this afternoon. The Houston Astros will host the New York Yankees. Buck, your Yankees missed the playoffs last year. It was the first time the Bronx Bombers did not make the playoffs since 2016. So they're trying to bounce back and make it back to October. Yeah. Of course, the Astros made it to Game 7 of the American League Championship Series where they came up short against who, Buck? Do you remember? Was it the Rangers? I believe it was the Texas Rangers who knocked the Astros out of the postseason in their house Last October, the Astros. You don't want to talk about the Rangers. Did you just say you who wants to talk about the Rangers? They got one. Your group has 27. Wow. Been a long time. That's right. There's a little light skinned brother right there. I mean, there's a little mixer right there. <laughs> a <little> mixer. <laughs> well, you need that little mixer back because y'all haven't won one since he left 2009, wow. the last time. It seems the like Yankees. a very long time. It is a very long time. The Astros, they've been the most consistent team in baseball over the last seven years. Of course, seven straight trips to the American League Championship Series. I think they've got a damn good chance to make it eight. They are the favorites in the American League West once again. Uh, I think they should be the favorites in the American League West once again. They have won that division in six straight full seasons. They didn't win it in COVID, the shortened 2020 season, but they did still find their way to the AL Championship Series that year. But when we're talking about full 162 game years, the Astros have won the American League West six years in a row, trying to make it seven here in 2024. Uh, they are loaded injuries, though, for both of these teams, right? I mean, uh, the two pitchers that you would expect to be taking the bump for opening day are both on the injured list. The former Astro, Garrett Cole, is out for the Yankees. Yes. And Justin Verlander is on the IL to begin the year for the Astros. So still a pretty great pitching matchup with Nasty Nestor Cortez taking the hill for the Yanks and Framber Valdez, who has been an ace. I know he sucked in the postseason last year for the Strohs, but that guy's been one of the best pitchers in the AL the last two seasons. You still got a good pitching matchup on tap today. Yeah, he'll, get his stuff. he'll have his stuff again. I mean, yeah. that, that stuff, that good stuff that he has just doesn't disappear. He had too many yeah. walks last year, control problems. And your, uh, your Yankees, Juan Soto, will make his – How old is that guy, 60? What do we got? Like? Juan Soto, that guy's still in his like early to mid-20s. That was his bit. Astros fans hated that. When the uh, 2019 World Series, when the Nationals beat the Astros, you know, Juan Soto was that young oh, star, that's... and he was like 19 – during that postseason run, and Joe Buck was like so infatuated with Juan Soto, and he couldn't stop talking about how young. Yeah, he made him some money. No, Juan Soto made himself some money. That guy can can swing it now. Yeah, so it feels like he's been in the league forever because yeah. he was so young when he got called up and when he started terrorizing Major League Baseball. But he's only twenty five. He was born in nineteen ninety eight. He's got a nice contract too going. Yeah, and he got uh, you know, the big trade that the Yankees made and then the big extension that the Yankees gave him this offseason. You talk about the middle of the order with Aaron Judge, with John Carlos Stanton, and – Don't worry about Stan. He'll be hurt by the end of the get, by the end of the end day. He'll have a hammy. Uh, you're, you're putting in the call that he doesn't make it through one game this no, no, year? I'm, I'm going to say this. By the end of the 
second week, that dude is going to have a hammy. Yeah. There's going to be some, some leg injury with him. And that guy will miss. He'll be in and out of the lineup all season long again. Hey, that was, it's time to get rid of that dude. Mm. Getting close. I mean, he's got too many injuries. His body is all banged up. Yeah. Okay, he's it's time to get rid of him. And Booney can take Booney with him. He can take Booney with him and let Aaron Judge be player, player manager. Let's go. I forgot. Yeah, you want Aaron Judge to be the Jackie Moon of yeah. Major League Baseball. Come on, Jackie. Hell the yeah. player coach. For the Yankees, there, yeah, you know, John Carlos Stanton's one of the best hitters in baseball, but he gets hurt man every does year, and he gets, he gets hurt, hurt when he swings. I mean, he hurts his he does all kinds of weird things, all kinds of weird things. Yep. And then for the Astros, look, their biggest offseason acquisition was the former Astro farmhand Josh yep. Hader, uh, one of the best relievers in all of Major League Baseball, and a yeah. guy I think who would have been very fond of uh, your racism early on in today's what? show just based on some old tweets from Josh Hader back in the day. Oh, but the Astros the Astros have the best back end of the bullpen in all of baseball. I mean, they, they've had maybe the best back end of the bullpen in all of baseball the last few years. And then they went out and got Josh Hader, who's a perennial all-star. So you've got Brian Abreu for the seventh. You've got Ryan Presley, who's been the Astros' closer in the past few seasons for the eighth. And then Josh Hader presumably taking the ninth. Uh, if you want to beat the Astros this year, you better have a lead after six. Because if you get into – those three horses, uh, you're not going to have much of a chance. Those are three of the livest arms in the sport. So the Astros are great all around. They've got some injuries to their starting rotation. I think four Astro starters are on the injured list to start the year. So they're a little bit banged up. But man, that bullpen is lethal. And, of course, they still have your guy, little Petey Altuve, oh. as you like to call him at the top of the order. And oh, little Petey. He is Latino, so that's why you made that sound effect. Come on, man. Come on, Petey. Mm. Yeah, so he's still good. Jordan Alvarez, I mean, y'all know who the Astros have. It's it's still one of the best teams in baseball. How about some World Series odds, Buck? You going to call your cousin for a futures bet before the season starts later today? Tell me the Yankees are 30-1. to 1. No, the Yankees are never 30-1. to 1. The Yankees are 9-1. to 1. Oh. They have the fourth best odds in Major League Baseball, according to Sportsline. Is this an updated article? Yeah, March 27th. So this is from yesterday. This is about as updated as you could get from CBS Sports Line. The Los Angeles Dodgers, your World what Series favorite. The, yeah, what can I get on those gamblers? Just ask Shohei. <laughs> I'm sure Shohei's got a few bones. Excuse me, Shohei's interpreter has a few yes. bones on the Dodgers to start the year. But LA is plus 320. That's that as good of odds as you could possibly get. No kidding. For a World Series champ, and by that I mean as bad of odds. If you're trying to bet and make money, you're not getting value there. But that just shows you how good, how deep, how loaded the Dodgers are here in 20. Yeah, I'm not making enough money on that even to win. No, no, it's not worth it. You know, too much can happen in the baseball postseason, as as we learn seemingly every year. Uh, the Braves right behind them, plus 450. Then the Astros, plus 700. The New York Yankees with the fourth best odds at plus 900. And you've got a, a two-way tie for fifth with the defending champion, Texas Rangers, and the Baltimore Orioles, both at plus 14 hundy. What are you thinking there? A coin right there. All right. Yeah, not bad. The Rangers, they've got a lot of dudes injured to start the year. So I, they could. Where are the Cubs at in this deal? Oh, the Cubs? You got to scroll down a little bit for the Cubbies. They are plus 3,500. They, of course, open against the Rangers in Arlington tonight. That's your ESPN primetime game as the uh, Rangers will raise a banner in Arlington. And I will be sitting in my car crying watching that Just happen. Crying watching it, yes. I'll be, I'll be crying. I cried when they won it, and I'll probably be crying when they raise the banner later tonight. Come on, softy. Get used. It's hard when you got 27 of them. You don't cry anymore. Yeah. That no, goes- you're right. If the Rangers get 27 world championships in my lifetime, I will not cry because I'll get so used to it Then I won't uh, I won't be shocked by it anymore. But I never thought they'd win one, and they got to one. So uh, there might be a tear or two, a sports tear or two shed. Those are different. Sports crying is different than real crying, okay? You can't get mad at me. You can't accuse me of real crying. It's sports crying. It's a completely yeah. different entity. No, you're right. It's It's totally different. You're right. It's not watching a sad movie or something, you know? 
You cry when you watch movies. movies? No, do I cry for movies? Not really. No, See, you know no what? Problem. Because some of the saddest movies I've never seen. I've never seen Bambi. I've never seen Old Yeller. And you're either. Yeah, you're one of those no movie seeing guys. You've never seen. You've probably seen Old Yeller at some point. Somebody in your house turned it on. You probably cried. At, you probably saw. Obviously, you've seen Grease, the whitest movie of all time. So you probably no. cried at that. No. No, not, not enough diversity for me to cry. Oh, oh yeah, very nice. <laughs> yeah, well, too many well, whites in that movie. Well, Is that the morning it started? Well, that's a good question. We can ask our uh, code of textures, 512-222-9328, or the YouTube commenters who are with us this morning. What's the widest movie of all time? If you're going Grease. Grease. And the yeah. widest TV show of all time is Friends, without question. You can go back to the 20s and 30s and find shows with more diversity than Friends. No, there's a show called Father Knows Best. That was the other one. Uh, yeah. All whites? Yeah. Mm. It was the all whites, yeah. I'm trying to think of other candidates for the widest movies of all time. But no, I don't think I've seen Old Yeller before. I don't want to watch a movie where the dog dies. Spoiler alert. I think I'm supposed to say spoiler alert before I spoil the movie. Um, I don't want to watch that. That's really weird. I never, I've never seen that. I actually never saw Bambi. What's Bambi about? That's the little pig that gets. No, it's not a pig. It's a deer. It's a little Uh, goat. A little deer. Uh, Yeah, I can just drive. I can just drive down seventy one and see Bambi. As it crosses right in front of you, taking Bambi out. Yeah, I've never, I've never done that, but I've driven by that a few times. I just know they wait for me. They jump out just when I come by. They decide to make their move. Have you hit one before? I've never. Obviously, I've, I've hit one deer one time, and the deer ran into the side of the car hmm. and bounced off and got back up, just dazed, just got a little, maybe a little concussion, hit like the side of the car, shook his head, got up, and took off again. How about that? Hit, no, I've never had, I've never hit a head on one. I've never run into one. Wow. DJ says they turned Bambi's mom into jerky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I shouldn't uh, laugh at that, but I don't know if it's true or not. Who knows? No, neither do I. So it was the mom that got crushed. It wasn't Bambi. Bambi was all alone, gone with the wind. The whitest movie. No, there's slaves in that movie. What are you talking about? The whitest movie. Mm, it could be pro white, but it's not all white. Oh. No. Mm. Uh, ooh, we got a story we got to get into in a moment, but real quick, uh, the Rangers do open up against the Cubs tonight. Nathan Avaldi, who was the starter the last time the Rangers took the hill, the last time the Rangers took the field in Arizona in game five of that World Series last November. Uh, Avaldi will get the ball for the Rangers going up against Travis Steele for the Chicago Cubs. 635 first pitch from Arlington. Once again, a nationally televised game. A lot of injuries for the Rangers. Jacob DeGrom will start the year on the injured list. Max Scherzer will start the year on the injured list. Did you say DeGrom on the yeah. injured list? Can you believe that? that that's hard to believe. That guy's, that guy's been playing a lot of ball lately. Yeah. Well, it's it's, it's the same injury. Same injury that caused him to miss like 80% of 2023. That is keeping him out for probably half, if not more than half, of 2024. So he's out. Scherzer's out. He got hurt in the postseason. Uh, Tyler Molly, who's one of the free agent arms the Rangers brought in, he's also probably out until the summer. So the Rangers a little bit short-handed. Of course, Jordan Montgomery signed with Arizona, the aforementioned Arizona D-Bags, earlier this week. So yeah, the Rangers not at full strength to begin the year. Nathaniel Lowe, the starting first baseman, is also on the injured list too. So it's not just the Rangers' arms that are a little bit banged up right now. But the Rangers are still very good. They've got Seager. They've got Simeon. They've got Adolis Garcia. Uh, they've got most of the guys back from that World Series championship squad. So expectations still pretty high for Texas. I wouldn't pick them to repeat. I don't even think they're going to win the division. But, hell, they didn't win the division last year. They snuck into the playoffs. And with Bruce Bruce Bochy, easy for me to say, as the manager, you never want to count You're right. any team with that guy out. Yeah, we'll they got to win, period. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Astros, uh, I'm going to pull up the quick fan graphs projections here. DeGrom, you think, did you think if DeGrom was available for somebody, they would pay millions upon millions and take that chance on him, even the no. way he is now? I think so. There'd be some stupid team that would do it. There's the Rangers a stupid, already did. 
Yeah, they are, yeah, they've done it before. They did it in, in New York. They've done yeah. it in up in Arlington. Somebody else would take that chance. Well, he he still has like five years on his contract with the Rangers. The Rangers like a lot of money. Yeah, they're not going to get anything out of that, and he's going to collect a ton. <sighs> yeah, uh, the Rangers, of course, have spent a ton of money. They didn't spend much this off season. They didn't really need to, but the two off seasons prior, the Rangers went Man. out and. You know, they got Seeger and they got Simeon and they got the Grom and a few other guys who obviously were paramount to them winning the championship. But yeah, the Grom, that's his issue. He's one of the best pitchers of all time. I mean, maybe the best pitcher of this generation. He just can't stay on the field. So, you know, the Rangers were, I'm sure, thinking there was a chance this would happen when they signed the deal. They were probably hoping that they wouldn't have to deal with these injuries until like the back end of the contract. Oh, course, yeah. In year one, it already started. So that's scary to think what is going to happen at the back end when it's already happening on the front end. But, uh, yeah, yeah, DeGrom will be back in the summer. We'll see how long he's back. He's one of those John Carlos Stanton dudes where – Oh, he is. feels like you just can't rely on him. Even when he is healthy, you're always wondering, okay, when's he going to go out next? Yeah, when does, he, when does he start grabbing his elbow? Yeah, 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 yeah. So – how about this? The American League West, according to fan graphs, the Astros a 62% chance to win the division this year. The Mariners actually second, about 23%. A nice young team. This year. Yep. And the Rangers at 11%. Rangers only have a 39.6% chance to make the playoffs this year, according to fan graphs. So the analytics, not huge fans of the defending champs. Interesting. Very, very. Well, it all depends on what kind of start they get off to. You know, they've got those bats, and if they get off to a, a hot start, man, that that's special for them. Yeah, yeah, it would help. I, you know, I don't know. You know I mean, like the Astros are a team now, you know, a- after winning a couple championships, that's a group that gets better as the year goes on. They start getting that, you know, after the All Star break, they start really coming together, pitching and hitting, you uh, know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Astros, like, I, I'm going to go ahead and pencil them in the ALCS again. That's become the Astros Invitational, right? Yeah. Seven straight years they've made it to baseball's Final Four. I think you'd be foolish to pick against them making it again for the eighth oh, straight three. season. So, yeah, they've got a great shot to win it all again. But honestly, I think the Astros are going to win the American League this year. And then that that battle in the NL between the Braves and the Dodgers, once again, you get to the playoffs, anything can happen. You can't count the Phillies out. They've eliminated – uh, the Braves the last couple of years in the playoffs, so they've got a shot, and uh, it'll be fun. And the marathon, the 162 game marathon, and Shohei it's, with the Dodgers is going to be special. Yeah, he won't be able to pitch this year, not because of bets, because of injuries. Uh, but we'll see what happens with that storyline. But as of now, Shohei is with the LA Dodgers, and yeah, that team is loaded. Yeah, he it plays is. hard. That scares me. I mean, even though him just. His at bats, he likes to steal bases. He wants to run. He just wants to play, you know. Mm-hmm. And Dodgers, of course, have already played a couple of games. They're one and one this year because they played the Padres in that Sewell series uh, last week. They're back home today to take on the Redbirds. All right, Buck. Before we uh, shift gears, I got a funny story to to okay. give you here in a second. We've got some Texas spring football to talk about. We've got yeah, some NCAA tournament to talk about. Tons to get into over the next 90 minutes this morning. But uh, how about some sponsor shout-outs today? I'll be over at Sue Patrick's today. Got to get my jelly cats done. But, folks, if you're looking at those Texas-themed gifts, Sue Patrick's is the place to go for sure. They've got everything you want. They offer free shipping on online orders, over $49, free curbside pickups as well. And, folks, plenty of parking at 5222 Burnett Road. Say hello to Sue Patrick when you're there. Also, go to suepatrick.com for more information. Don't forget to say hello to Jay and the gang over there. Haven't been there for a while. Must be coming up on time to get over there to see the folks at Sue Patrick. So they said they've got everything that you're looking for. The baseball caps, the T-shirts. I'm sure they're ready to get – I'm ready – I know they're ready to get volleyball started once again, too. Plus, very soon, I think it's July 1st. Is it July 1st when they move? we move over to the SEC officially? That is the, the move date. It is July. No more Big 12 gear. All about the SEC. All about the SEC, baby. It just means more. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I love our friends at Sue Patrick. You can shop online at suepatrick.com. For sure. As well. Also, shout out to our friends at 7-Eleven. I was 
driving to my sister's place last night here in Corvallis. Guess what I saw? A you did not see Ali Pop at 7 Eleven. I didn't go into the 7 Eleven, but I did drive by a 7 Eleven yesterday. And my sister was driving. I, I, I wasn't controlling the car. If I was in charge, I would have pulled turned it right in and had some pizza. I would have gotten, oh man, nothing like that uh, 12 30 a.m. Pacific time pizza. Oh, yeah. That would have hit different right there. But they've got 7 Eleven everywhere, all over the country, but of course, all over yeah. the great state of Texas. The best convenience store in the world. They've got the donuts, the pizzas, the rollers, the wings, the nachos. They've got those tiny tacos now that are pretty damn good too at 7 Eleven. Oh, yeah. Tiny they are, tacos? They are adding. You thought they were finished. They ain't finished. They were finished. They're, mm -mm. they're adding to the menu. They're just getting started over there at 7-Eleven. They do not mess around. Ashish and Wendy and the gang, 7-Eleven in Austin, they know what they're doing. They've got all the fresh food. They've got all the prepackaged food, the drinks, the hard the coffee, coffee, the newspaper. Nobody reads it, but they have it, so you can uh, use it as toilet paper if they're out <laughs> in the bathroom. I uh, love our friends at 7-Eleven. Nice. Very nice. Also, shout out to Tom McKay of AV Consultations. We're going to have to bring Tom on next week. We're off tomorrow for Good Friday. Yes. Uh, but we're going to have to bring Tom on at some point soon to tell the full story. I'm going to give you a little snippet of a story that Tom told me yesterday. He was driving through Lakeway. Oh, no. The municipality? The municipality, and you know our man Tom McKay of Audiovisual Consultations, he likes to drive fast. Yes, he does. And he's prone to a speeding ticket from time to time. And when I say from time to monthly, time, I mean monthly. like it's he. It, it's rare if it's only one in a month, I think, yes. for Tom McKay. I mean, that guy gets pulled over a lot. He's got places to go, people to see, hands to kiss, babies to shake. You know the deal. Please tell me he did not mention my name. In passing with one of these jackals. So he got pulled over. Oh, no. In Lakeway yesterday. And the officer. No, it was not him. Walks up to his car door. Tom rolls down his window. And guess who it was? It was not Officer Peacock. No officer chance. Tiny Peacock. <laughs> no. 100%. No. No, he's told him he's, oh, no. And Tom, of course, who's a big-time listener to Texas Sports Unfiltered. He, he did not have a conversation with Peacock about oh, me, did he? A long conversation with Peacock about you. About the Subaru? About the carpet-munching car. <laughs> oh, your man. Subaru Outback. And I'll say this. You know who did not get a ticket from Officer Peacock? No, that's Bull. Tom McKay. He talked, he got into a conversation with him and got out of it. Damn it. Just a warning. Wow. But uh, yeah, Officer Peacock, he remembered you very well. Just go ahead and say that. Yeah. Well, he, yeah, he remember, probably remembered me from the aftermath of the two weeks afterwards on this here show. That's what he remembered. <laughs> he didn't remember me because I was well behaved on that day as I was gliding downhill, not hitting the gas. As he said, I know you're not hitting the gas, but those people in the apartments up there are complaining. Yeah, mm -hmm. officer, they're complaining about the kids going 65 down the hill from the Lakeway area. They're not complaining about me going 44. You're complaining about, was he driving his scooter? I mean, his motorcycle? On a motorcycle. Oh, yeah, hiding? same dude. He, he didn't catch him hiding behind a tree or something, did he? And he may or may not have issued another threat to you. At the end of that conversation with Tom. Yeah. So. Well, listen, I go to the municipality very carefully now. I'm going under the speed limit. And when I go, I don't go down that hill anyway. I go out of my way to go around that area. You better be going exactly 30 miles an hour there because the way Peacock was talking to Tom, it sounds like if you're going 29 or 31, you're getting pulled over for yeah, doing something wrong. You know why? Because he's taking a beating with the people. The people don't like what he did to me. And, you know, I've had run-ins with those people, with those officers in that municipality before. The white ones? I, well, well, yeah, most of them were. But <laughs> they didn't stop me back-to-back -back days were. 
That's wanted that's to know where mean. I was going at four o'clock in the morning. I'm going to work, officer. I'm allowed to work in the morning like you work. Mm. So there you go. I figured you'd get a kick out of that one this morning. Yeah, pulled over by Peacockius. Tiny Peacock. See, you're the one who gets this going like this with this kind of language. Not me. I'm respectful to our officers in the municipalities and all the municipalities. Oh, no, not just the Lakeway. By the way, Tom Tom couldn't believe that his name was actually Peacock. He thought you were just messing with everybody. Oh, no, you found that out for real. He yeah, I think he even told that to the officer. He's like, no shit, your name's actually Peacock. <laughs> You've been getting dogged on the radio these last couple no, of years. No, no. Mm. No, remember, I still got about 50 days or so that I cannot get a ticket in that municipality or I have to pay the full freight, considering they still made me pay over 200 for that 274 ticket. Yeah, that's the worst. You still got a few more weeks, you said? Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah yeah i i I just kind of dodged that area but i stay on the main drag of 620 once again i don't know the jurisdiction because between that group and the b cave cop b cave scott can they can go downtown austin and bring you in i feel like any cop can bring you in anywhere at least they all think that they can bring you in anywhere i I feel like a utpd cop could get me here in oregon today (laughs) <laughs> oh no! He'd be acting like, "Yeah, I've, I've got jurisdiction here." They got no jurisdiction okay. there. All right, campus police, get back on your segue and get the hell <laughs> out of here. See, see how you're talking about them? I'm not like that. I'm very careful how I deal with officers. You're the guy who called him Mo Lester a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> oh my god! No, Officer Peacock, you're always welcome to come on this program and defend yourself and how you pulled over an old black guy driving his. That's right. His Subaru cruising mm-hmm. down a hill, not bothering anybody, just going off. Hey, doing something for the kids. Yeah, I wonder if Peacock's partner, Ophelia Cox, was working with him. <laughs> Ophelia. Oh, no. <laughs> Everybody's out buying new breasts for their wives on my dime now. Oh, oh. that's a shot right there. You can't accuse me of taking shots, and then you're saying that. Oh, my goodness. Can't believe Tom got away with that. That's amazing. Really? Shout out to Tom. AV Consultations, 512-255-8678. If you uh, are looking to spruce up your home TV setup, you got to call Tom and the crew at AVC. They've been around since 1988. They're the best at what they do. Tom's one of our best friends. He's hilarious. You're going to meet him. He's not going to like send you off to other people. No, you're going to talk to Tom. He's going to come by, scope out your place, and uh, he's going to hook you up with what you want done in the comfort of your own home. Check no wires, no holes in the walls. No wires, no holes. Now everything's professionally done. Uh, yeah, once again, they're the best in the business, and they've been in business for coming up on four decades now, Buck. They've been around a long time in Central Texas. Shout out to AV Console. Love it. All right. Uh, the Sweet 16 begins today in men's college basketball. Of course, the women's Sweet 16 will get going tomorrow. The Texas Longhorns back in action tomorrow night. They will take on the four-seed Gonzaga yes. in the Portland Four region. I uh, wonder where that game's going to be played. So tomorrow night, 9 o'clock Central Time, the Texas women will be back at it, taking on a very, very good Gonzaga team for a trip to the Elite Eight. But the men's tournament resumes a little after 4 o'clock Central Time. You've got four games today. You've got four games tomorrow. That will set the Elite Eight. And then, by the end of the weekend, uh, by the time we do a show again on Monday, the final four will be set. So we trimmed down from 64 to 16 last weekend. We'll go from 16 to four this weekend. And I said it earlier this week, man, we've got some great games like this. Mm-hmm. Of course, you want Texas to still be alive. And if you root for a different team, you wish they were still dancing. But if you're just a neutral college basketball fan, This is the type of second weekend you want. You want some chaos in the first weekend. You want some craziness in round one. But when you get to weekend two, you want the cream to rise to the top. You want blue bloods. You want big names. You want great teams. You want special players. And that's what we've got this weekend, man. Some unbelievable games on the slate over these next two days. And, of course, that will turn into these next four days It's going to be a hell of a lot of fun. So I got to give you some credit. You're doing a pretty good job with your bracket right now. Three of your four final four teams are still alive. Now, you did have Baylor 
And two Baylor, three, yes. Baylor got bounced by Clemson in the round of 32. But your other three Final Four teams, you had UConn. They're your national champ. They're, of course, still alive, and they've looked very good through two games. You've got Purdue. They're still alive as your one seed in the Midwest. And then NC State, your bold pick, the 11 seed. Uh, they are still dancing. They will play tomorrow against Shaka Smart and Marquette. So I will give you the chance now to repick your final four. Do you want to stick with those three teams? Obviously, you got to pick one more instead of Baylor. But any changes you want to make to the other three that no, you had I'll in just, your bracket? I'll just add North Carolina. That's it. Okay. So you're going with the one seed? Yes. In the they're, West region. So they're, actually, they're really playing well, too. Yeah, they have looked uh, pretty good in their first couple of games as well. So you're going three number one seeds with UConn, UNC, and Purdue, and then you're rolling with the 11 seed Wolfpack. Yeah, I can't wait till the two big men collide in that in that deal. Yeah. Oh, you're saying if we get an NC State Purdue? Oh, yeah, that's going to be awesome. Semifinal matchup. Oh my God, with Zach Eady, the two-time National Player of the Year, going up against big old DJ Burns, the oh, right yeah, tackle. Man right tackle is ready to go I'm telling you the Dallas Cowboys at pick 24 they better be watching film on that kid uh the, believe me they won't be no you're right that requires them to do yeah. some work that does feel hold on now don't put that past Jerry Jones he does like headlines he does want people yes, talking he does. About it. if he goes and drafts a college basketball player who didn't play any college football with his first round pick that's how you generate some buzz isn't it well he'll probably Take on Kaylin Clark as a as, as a safety for him. Probably bring her into the fold, ask and draft her. Oh my God! Yep, DJ Burns in round one and Kaylin Clark. Sure, why not? Uh, he I, likes I a about, circus. I can give you about a thousand reasons why not, but uh, you're right. He does like a circus, and that would be a circus. Yeah, people are offering ridiculous amounts of money to Kaitlyn Clark right now to not play in the WNBA. That's a big story. We can get into that here in a second. Yeah, you, let me just ask you, what do you think? I, I, that's that's a that's a hot topic. She is I mean I, I I just she won't do it. She won't do that to the to the ladies, right? She just won't do that. The WNBA, she wants to keep that thing going. I mean, this oh. is that's it's not just her le individual legacy, it's a legacy for a professional team. If she doesn't join them and she decides to join the the what is it, three Peters that play or whatever the Three teamers, three Peters. What is it? What is it that <laughs> LL Cool J has? Nope. Oh boy, all rappers are the same, huh? But <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. it'd be the it? big three is the cool name of the and Cool Mo D. Not Cool Mo D. It'd be Ice Cube. Oh, one of those other ice. Oh, Icicle. That's the dude, huh? Not Icicle. Not Ice T. Not LL Cool J. Not Cool Mo D. Okay. No, it's Ice Cube, and he has reportedly offered Caitlin Clark $5 million to skip the WNBA and instead join his big three basketball league. That's the three-on-three -three league with all the former players. That all the old dudes. All the old dudes. So, obviously, Caitlin Clark would help bring a ton of pub to that league. You know, Cube's got money because he's – Got uh, money. Great rapper and actor and producer and just – incredible businessman you know he's got money to throw around um yeah that's uh that's an option and also barstool as you see my sister's greyhound dog in the background here oh kind of he's just readjusting on the dog bed over here um anyways uh dave portnoy the ceo of barstool sports has apparently offered caitlin clark 10 million dollars to join the Barstool Sports intramural team. I don't know what that is. What in the hell is that? <laughs> I guess it's just. And why are you giving $10 million? Well, Barstool's got a ton of money. And she would bring a ton of pub to them too. And I looked at the average rookie salary for WNBA players. The high end of that average salary is about $75,000. Yeah, by WNBA. So that's where it is right now. Now, Caitlin Clark is already making a lot of money with endorsements, and she's going to make sure. a crap ton more with endorsements. So obviously she's going to be doing better than the 75 k sure. that the rookie contract is set to be when she becomes the number one overall pick in the WNBA draft here in a couple of months. But that's that's what's happening right now. Like she's going to make five figures from her league, 
and she's getting offered seven figures from Ice Cube and eight figs from Barstool right now. Wow. So I look, she's not going to do it, but you're right. If she if she spurns the WNBA for the big three or Barstool Sports, that's gonna set that league back a lot, dude. She won't do that. You, you think like PGA tour golfers leaving for the live tour. There you go. Like th- this is this is next level. She is far and away the biggest star in women's college basketball. Forget college, excuse me, women's basketball right now. The well, WNBA needs her. Just get that kind of cash for a year and then join the WNBA. She could. Or, would that hurt? Would that oh. hurt him too bad? Oh, it, it was. She said, hurt. "I'm doing this for one year." I mean, you know, if she did it for one year, you know, Ice Cube, they would give her. They didn't end up going eight million the next year. I mean, it's her, her, her. It's not going down. It's only going to go up for right. popularity. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a one year offer that's on the table for Caitlin Clark, but you're right. Like if she did accept that offer, then I think that offer would be there again the following year. Sure would. It probably would be for more money like you're talking about. So she'd never see the WNBA. No, she, she, she's playing in the WNBA. Like she is, but it's just, it's wild that those offers are out there. And I wonder if there's another offer that comes. Oh, someone's got it. Something else has got it. Well, there's Jerry Jones for playing safe, free safety. Oh, even the the NFL rookie contract, she wouldn't make ten million dollars a year like she'd no. get from Barstool. But uh, yeah, Caitlin Clark, Iowa still in the women's tournament. They're number one seed. Now, they barely got by West Virginia last weekend. Iowa has not looked great in the women's tournament, but we'll see if they can get back to the Final Four again. So, all right, back to the men's tournament. Um, UConn, you're still rolling with them as your national champ. I am. Yeah, it's hard not to. So my my final four, I've got three of my four teams still alive in my final four, but my national champion is gone. And they got bounced in the round of 64. I went a little off the beaten path and went with the Auburn Tigers to cut down the nets at the end of the tournament, and they lost to the Nerds of Yale. Good pick there, BK. So uh, now I've got to change my pick, and it feels like UConn, man. I hate doing that because they're the favorite, and most people have them winning it all, but – it feels like the year of the repeat, right? The Chiefs were able to do it in football. Yes. They were the first team to do it in the NFL in like two decades. Obviously, it hadn't been done in the tournament in a while. Got to go back to Florida in uh, 06, 07 to find the last back-to-back national champ in men's college hoops. And just UConn's looked incredibly impressive. Yeah, and got- one seeds are playing really their best their best ball now. They're not like yeah. stumbling in here. Everybody's waiting for them to play a, their best game in order to continue on. They've been playing – all these number ones have been playing great from the start. Yeah, I'm trying to think which one seed has, has looked the worst. I would say Houston has probably been the least impressive one seed because they sure. needed overtime to get by A&M last Sunday and that epic, epic thriller. Uh, so of the four one seeds, yeah, Houston has looked the worst. But I think all of them, like you said, are playing pretty well right now. And it is rare to get you know all four ones and all four twos in the Sweet 16. Sure. One of them usually gets bounced before we get to the second weekend, but not the case this year. So, yeah, I'll go with UConn. Uh, I had Purdue in my Final Four. I'll stick with them. I had uh, Houston in my Final Four. I'm going to stick with them. And Arizona was my fourth Final Four team, and they're still alive, and I'll roll with them as well. So, yeah, you're rolling with some high seeded groups yeah. too. It's been chalky, yeah. man. Like, I, I, you know, I went with a four seed to try to go off the beaten path, and I got punished for it. So, your NC State pick, once again, looking solid right now. But if they're going to get to the Final Four, they've got to get through Marquette and then potentially Houston. Yeah, that's State. going to be rough for them. Yeah, or Marquette and then Duke. They did beat Duke in the ACC tournament and right. went to that ACC Conference Championship. Uh, but, yeah, two, two of those teams in three days, not going to be easy. So, yeah, it'll be fun, man. Some good ones today. Illinois, Iowa State tonight. That's oh, your that's night. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to watch that for sure. I've got Illinois in my bracket in that one, but that's going to be fun. You got a rematch of the national championship from last year, earlier, uh, later today, excuse me, with UConn playing San Diego State. Yep. Bam in North Carolina. I mean, all of these games are, are really, really good. I'll tell you what, Duke Houston tomorrow in Dallas is going to be a lot of fun as yes, well. This is uh, buckle up, man. I mean, it, the tournament's always fun, but once again, it's more fun when you get the best teams dancing into the second weekend. And we have that. Over these next couple of days, this will be great to just post up on the couch, watch some baseball, watch some Longhorn baseball, watch some college basketball, and uh, life's going to be all right for you. Well, and it's going to be an interesting game with with Tennessee, too, with Rick Barnes' team. 
Yeah, let me ask you this. Who, who are you more confident in, Rick Barnes or Shaka Smart? Both coaches two wins away from a Final Four. Rick Barnes hasn't been to a Final Four since T.J. Ford in Texas in 03. Shaka was there in 2011 with VCU. Uh, who who are you more confident in? I mean, you know? I, I think I'm more confident in that Tennessee team okay. right now. I didn't think they had to play their best to beat Texas, and I don't think they did. I think they still got something in their tank. That's really, really good. You know what I mean? I, yeah. their, their best player just had an okay game. He hasn't had one of those lights out games. I think he'll play lights out this weekend. Yeah, Dalton Connect, first yeah. team All American. You're right. Didn't do much against sure. Texas. They didn't need him to do much against St. Peter's in their first game. I like Creighton in that one tonight. Um, I, I, I kind of think both former Texas coaches go down. I'm riding with NC State like you. Yeah. But, of those two, I like Marquette more just because they're playing an 11 seed. Tennessee's got to deal with the three seed, and I think that Creighton team is really, really good. Uh, but, yeah, both both coaches, they've got a shot to make it happen. Marquette's got the easier draw once again, but uh, we'll see if either one can get it done. And I don't know. That's that's frustrating. Are you rooting for either of those coaches? Yeah, I mean, I'm, guys? I mean I'm, I'm actually rooting for both of them, actually. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 like can't, I like to see them. Go ahead. I can't, I'd like to see them both win. I mean, I'd like to see that Tennessee Purdue matchup. That's that's the one I want to see. And you know, because I think Purdue, they've just had so much bad luck in this deal. I, I think they get to their final four. You know, I got them playing in the final game. You do. Yeah, they've got the Zags tomorrow. The Zags dismantled Kansas in the second half in that round of 32 game. But uh yeah, Purdue's looked pretty impressive. They ran away from Utah State. Oh, yeah. 40 last week so the boilermakers have looked good maybe they've got a little virginia to them right virginia in 2018 they lost to a 16 right. seed went back the next year and won the national championship maybe that's uh where purdue is headed this year but uh, that'll be a tough one tomorrow with the zags team that is playing their best basketball right now um i i can't root for shaka smart i can't do it people get mad at me for that they say i'm petty they say i'm bitter and i say yes i'm both of those yes, things I'm both of those, all of the above I don't root for my exes. Sorry. No. Especially not, not an ex who I was with for six years who gave me nothing. I'm not going to root for them to be successful with another man. That's ridiculous. Not so I just gave Texas nothing. All these Texas fans are like, oh, I'm rooting for him. Ah, you wasted six years of your life, and you're rooting for him? You're not a better person than me because you want him to win. You're an <laughs> idiot. No, I'm kidding. You, no. you can, Come you on. Can fan, you, can fan, you can fan however you want to fan. I won't tell people how to fan, but I, I'm just – I am not rooting for him. I I wish they lost to the 15 seed that they played in round one because he couldn't bring us any happiness. I don't want him bringing anybody else any happiness. Peacock never brought me any happiness. No, and you're not rooting for Peacock anywhere else, are you? No. You're not hoping he wins like Officer of the Year awards. Why not? Way. Sure, he should win all. I mean, anybody that's hiding behind trees on motorcycles should win something. So now you're being sarcastic here. No, it's a great disguise. I mean, I, I like to where you do camouflage yourself. Mm. Yeah, Camille. You're Chameleon on wheels. That's nice. You should invite him to give a speech at the Mullet Open here. Oh, no, no thanks. Oh, hey, hey, you know, that guy can collect money. We're trying to collect money for charity out there. That yeah. guy. Oh, they took it out of my pocket. They're taking it out of the kids' mouths. How about this bit? He just gives out parking tickets to everybody at Lost Pines and he says, you know what? Instead of donating the money to my wife's chest, you can donate wow. it <laughs> to this raffle here. Tom's not getting away there again. We're making we're making sure that he won't get away next time. Oh, you're gonna call he Peacock. Really, he really got called pulled over by Peacock. That is that's golden, Jerry. It 100%. really is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's he's gonna come on at some point next week and tell the full story. I asked him this morning and he's like, I got stuff to do, I can't make it. But he wants to Oh, there's share doubt his to it. Oh yeah. I I've only told you about a third of what he told me. So I don't want to spoil it. And he was obviously there, so he could tell you better he than I is telling that guy, there's these dudes that are shitting on you on the daily. Mm -hmm. I mean, just unbelievable. And if they come through your place, stop them. Just stop them for the hell of it. Just have a conversation. So good. So no, I can't I can't even get stopped and pulled over. I'll start crying. I'll have tears. You're talking about sports tears. I have ticket tears in my eyes when the officer pulls up. Yeah. If you get pulled over, you're going to start crying. Yeah, I'm going to start crying next time. Is that going to be your excuse to try to get out of a ticket? Like what? Yeah. I'm going to see what? if that works. You need to have a reason for why you're crying, though. You can make something up. Like my I, can't family have another, I can't have another ticket. 
Oh, it's just on my way to the hospital. I was on my way over to the hospital over here in Lakeway, just trying to get to the doctor. That's the one right there. Oh, the doctor or the pills? You gotta say my medication. You gotta say, oh, oh, you could say you're going to the doctor for yourself, or you could say like, oh my, my ex-wife, she's in the hospital right now. I gotta go say goodbye to her and put the pillow on her and suffocate her (laughs) on the way out the door. (laughs) Put the pillow on her head. I don't know. No. Yeah. I'm trying to think like the best excuses you could use. The, the classic one is you have like a water bottle in your car and then you get pulled over. You just pour the water bottle on your crotch and it's like, oh, I couldn't, uh, I had to use the bathroom. That's why I was going fast. I was trying to get to an exit to get to a gas station to use the John. And this, you don't believe me. Here's what I just did. Check this out here. Let me stand out here in the road and let everybody see this. Mm. Yeah. Come on, Peacock. I'm not. That works. No. I see I've got to go through there today too. That's what's scary. Uh oh. I'm not going the back road. I'm not going to, no. I'm no. staying on the main drag. You know Peacock's out there. He was out there yesterday. He's out there every day. He's out there every day eating a donut behind that tree. You know how much those fakies cost? Those things cost a lot of money. What's that? The fakies? Yeah. What is a fakie? The fake boobs. Yeah, those things are not <laughs> <laughs> this costs a lot. The fakies, man. Oh, for, for, Ms., for Mrs. Cock. Oh, gee. What are you doing? You're putting me in a bad situation there. You know they're going to find that little gray Subaru. There's probably all points bullets and out for that car now. Oh, he, he knows your car. He told Tom that he remembers you. He remembers your car, a license plate number, social the language I number. use. He probably the nice language that I use. Everything. Yep. He remembers that you called him Dixon between her legs. He remembers. <laughs> I did not. No. Oh, the deal. Right. That Border Patrol guy still does that. You know, after the Border Patrol incident for me in uh, Big Ben, when I went to South Padre and I pulled up on the, I mean, I was almost sweating as I was pulling up from car to car to go from South Padre back towards Austin. Mm-hmm. It was like dripping down my face. Like the air <laughs> conditioner is at full blast and the guy's looking at me. What are you sweating for? Uh, I don't know, officer. Maybe we need to check inside your car. Oh Got any God. paraphernalia on you? I love when they ask you if you have any paraphernalia. Like like cocaine? No, officer, I don't have any cocaine on me. He goes, what about what about the pipes and all that? You mean the papers and pipes that you see sitting right there in the middle there? What about my pipe? Yeah, what, yeah. what who's, about that? Who, who's trying to pipe? I'm smoking tobacco, officer. Mm. I'm, a little, I'm a little tobacco smoke here. Why are your eyes red? Oh, I got glaucoma. <laughs> Classic excuse right there. Oh, I've never had to use any of those. I've, I've never, I've, I've, I've only been, I've only been pulled over one time when there was a possibility. I'm not saying that I've never had a couple of drinks and drove, but I got pulled over in my hometown city of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania once when I had a few. Mm. Do try to do the ABCs, touch your nose. I said, I did it with my right finger. I said, would you like for me to do it with my left hand too? Would you like for me to go multiple times? <laughs> oh, you, were getting, you were getting sappy with them. Oh, I was I was pissed because I wasn't drunk. Oh, you weren't? No, but I, I just got the whole pullover and, you know, just kind of coming just a happy-go-lucky me. Uh, we just want to do a little test with you. I'm like, oh, oh, boom, 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 boom. Did you, did you boom, switch boom. to the, the middle finger? Uh, no, I did not switch to the middle finger. The one step, you know, heel, toe, heel, toe, doing like a yeah. two step there. They don't never find had, that to be funny. Never had to do that before. I, I, made sure to, I made sure to memorize the alphabet backwards just in case I did have to do oh, that. Oh, no, but. I just, no, I didn't. I just got to like Q and the guy said, okay, you're done. Now get out of here, God bolt. That's what he said. I'm like, yeah. it was almost like, do you know who I am? I almost wanted to drag that out in my hometown. Oh, you yeah. Know? I'm the I'm the high school Hall of Famer who had to use the porta pot <laughs> at my reunion because <laughs> they didn't let me into the building because no the, one knew who I was. The big purple porta pot. Yeah. yeah, with the bone oh, yeah. wave in there. So gross. All um, right. Well, Before we get to some Texas football, I got uh, an interesting question about the 2024 season I want to ask you. We also have some spring football updates to give the people. Before all of that, though, how about another sponsor? Shout out. Your friends over at Leaf Landscape Supply Services right there, Monterey Oaks and 290 South. 
and Pond Springs Road up north. All that you need to have a healthy garden, healthy landscape area. I love the folks over there. 25 years of going over to Leaf. It's uh, just the best. Contractors, tons of contractors over there available for you if you want to do some landscaping at your home. But if you want to do it yourself, please talk to the experts there. Don't, don't put it on yourself to know exactly what plants, which side of the, the home that you want them in. Certain plants grow a certain way on the east side, as I've known, as a matter of fact, and I've suffered from that. Certain plants do well in certain uh, soils. And, and believe me, for those that don't believe in the fact that I know there's a lot of caliche out here, BK, a little bit of stony, gravelly type stuff, be surprised at the things that, that roses that can grow in the caliche. I'll give you that tip right now. People are saying, I can't, I can't grow anything in this caliche. Caliche will hold water for a long, long time. And you know how we get through these droughts and, and stuff here. Put a little caliche in there with some of the soil that you have. You'd be surprised. That's my tip for the day from my, our friends over at Leaf. Use a little caliche. If you can get uh, dig up a little some of that, put that in some of the, the grounds that you're using for whether it's uh, roses or uh, shrubs. Use a little bit of caliche. It holds water really, really well. Are you talking about the mother of dragons, Khaleesi? No, no. Mother of children. Mother of children, no, Khaleesi, the ground, the soil around some of the hill country areas that we have. You know, when you hit that, put that pickaxe in there and you hit that stone, some of it's Khaleesi stone, some of it will break up. And if you put water on it, it gets kind of mushy, almost like a little bit like mud. Well, you'd be surprised at how, how that works in some of the great soils. So I do, I do mix a little Khaleesi in some of the things that I do. But at Leaf Landscaping and Supply Services, believe me, they'll let you know about all of the things that you need to know. Your oh, plant's yeah. still alive. Before you left, did you do anything special to the plant? I watered it. You watered it? Is there anything else I need to do? Eventually, you're going to have to fertilize it just a bit. Oh. When you get back, when you come back. That's a lot of work. You just told me I had to water it like every couple of weeks. Now you're telling me I got to do some more stuff? Because you want yours to look outstanding. You don't want your plant to be like every other plant out there. You want a nice bloom. There's a nice little pink flower that comes out of that cactus that you've got. So I'm, I'm worried if I put fertilizer in there, your dog's going to come by and eat it. Eat the whole thing. Or that just dog just shit in it. Good Lord. He shit right in my plant yesterday or the day before after he ate the fertilizer. I had to go yeah. spray the plant down because that wasn't the hard stuff that came out of him. He's still suffering a little bit from that. I guess if you ate a bag of fertilizer, you'd suffer for a couple of days. I'd probably die if I ate a bag of fertilizer. Oh, you'd be okay. Your stomach? Are you kidding me? Uh, that's true. I feel like half the Taco Bell meat is fertilizer anyways. <laughs> so. Oh, man. It's Shout out to Altstad Beer. Hey, whether you're eating fertilizer or fast food or a nice meal, uh, you got to wash it down with some Altstad Beer. The best beer that you can find all throughout the state of Texas and, oh, man, it is a phenomenal sports weekend coming up. Major League Baseball is back. Of course, the Longhorns are back in action on the diamond tonight. You've got the Sweet 16 in both men's and women's college basketball getting going. It is a beautiful thing. You need a great beer to accompany all of your sports watching all month and all year long. Make that Altstad beer. Altstad is brewed in Fredericksburg. But once again, available wherever you buy your beer all across the Lone Star State. They've got a bunch of different brews. The Lager, that's the OG. That's my personal favorite. We're talking award-winning beers here. It's not just some guy on a sports talk show telling you about Altstadt. People who get paid to drink beer for a living have been telling you about the greatness of Altstadt for years now. Don't just take my word for it. Don't just take their word for it. Go get you some the next time you're at the store. It's Altstadt beer. No impurities. No regrets. Good stuff. Absolutely. And also a shout out to Jack Allen's Kitchen. That's a place you can get some old stat beer. If you're looking for, for a sure. place to watch the games today, get to Jack Allen's Kitchen. Five Austin area locations. Fantastic dining experience every time you go in there. The service is second to none. They're going to greet you right at the door. They're going to walk you to your table. They're going to have that pimento cheese ready for you. Uh, they'll take your drink order. They'll get you in. They'll get you out. Or if you want to stay for a while and have a great time with friends and family and catch up, they'll accommodate you whenever however you want amazing food so many options to choose from something for the whole fam the whole office you can literally go there every day for a year and not have the same thing twice they've got so much good stuff at jack allen's kitchen go to the uh, anderson lane location say what's up to our guy brad too nice. fantastic human uh jack gilmore knocked it out of the park with jack allen's kitchen uh, if you've been in austin you know we don't have to tell you if you haven't tried it yet you are missing out go and see them Okay, let's do uh, 
Let's do a quick exercise here, Buck. You ready? Okay. You loose? I'm loose. Arms getting, you know, getting ready for opening day. Yeah, I'm a little loose right now. You got about six hours till uh, the Yankees and Astros take the field in Houston. That's how long it takes me to get loose. I think you're rounding down, my friend. Yeah. We got a, a tweet that was sent out by at TS Unfiltered, and that's us, yesterday. We've got some early college football lines for the upcoming 2024 season. Maybe the three biggest games on the slate for the Longhorns already have numbers out in the desert. So I'm asking you, you've got a hundred bucks, or your yes. cousin has a hundred bucks, or your interpreter has a hundred bucks to bet on. You can either bet on Texas minus two and a half at Michigan. You can bet on Texas minus nine and a half against Oklahoma, or you can bet on Texas plus one and a half against Georgia. Got a hundred bucks to spend. You can't split it up evenly or anything like that. You get to pick one of these lines for your cousin to bet on. Which of these lines are you most confident in right now? Uh, UT versus Michigan, game one. That game That's on the, the one. on the top level right there. Yeah, for sure. Even though it's on the road, I don't care. I'll Even take it against the defending national champs. Without their quarterback, little JJ, the wide receivers. You know, one of those running backs is gone. But the other dude still remains. Uh, yeah, I'll take my chances with that one. There's no way that UT, that line of nine – did I see that thing say nine and a half? Nine and a half. In a rivalry game? No thanks. I don't want any part of that one for sure. And that other one over there? No. Two-time national champs? I'm not playing that game, no. Even though they're on the road here in Austin, I don't want that either. I'll take game one, the first game on the top. Even though Texas is an underdog against Georgia. You don't want that. I know. No. I think most people agree with you. I asked Trey this question yesterday, and he gave a resounding answer, and it was the same as yours. He said, Michigan, easily. Uh, he thinks Texas is going to go into Ann Arbor and beat down the defending national champs, and I tend to agree with him. Like, that'd be my answer, too. Uh, I'm with you in regards to Oklahoma. Like, honestly, I, I'd put a lot of money on Oklahoma plus nine and a half. Yeah, it's I mean, and, and too big against, of a number in a rivalry game like that. You know, I, I wish if that number, if, if you told me that was seven and a half, I would take Texas. Mm. Nine and a half, no thanks. Because I'm still not sold on the, the new uh, OU quarterback. I'm, I mean, by that by that time, we'll, we'll really have two or three games under his belt as the starter. Oh, as the that. They'll uh, have him that. Yeah, I think probably five. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd have to see that, but I'm not sold on him as being the next big thing at Oklahoma. I'm just not. Yeah. He started one game last year for the Sooners, that Alamo Bowl against Arizona, and it's things terrible. did not go well. He had five turnovers. Oklahoma as a team had six turnovers in that loss in San Antonio. Remember the Alamo Bowl. Thank God. He looks, he just, a little, he's just a look, he looks a little shaky to me. He's shaking. Yeah. He can be pretty, rattled pretty easily. You know, it was his first start ever yeah. um, against a good Arizona team in a weird bowl type of environment. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to close the book on Jackson Arnold just because of that performance. But you're right. I mean, it was a very shaky game for him. Five turnovers. Like, I don't care how many good throws he made. He did make mm -hmm. some good throws. But, yeah, five turnovers is not going to get it done at, at this level of college football. So, uh, yeah, and the jury's out. He'll obviously have a few more games under his belt by the time we get to the Cotton Bowl in mid-October. Uh, yeah, you know, Texas – look, Texas was the favorite last year, and they, they lost to OU. Uh, I understand why Texas is the favorite. Texas is a lot better than Oklahoma right bring now. Back a lot of people too. Texas bringing back a lot of people. I've got more faith in the coach. I've got more faith in the quarterback. I got more faith in the overall <laughs> roster for the Longhorns than I do the Sooners right now. But you know, yeah. but in year three, their their coach is not going to be you know sucking on water through a fire hose and mm. you know, putting a hose where it goes in his nose and things like that. You know, blowing so he, and going. Yeah, blowing and smoking and going or whatever he does. That's going to be a little bit different for him. So, let me hear that again. Still can't believe that's what he came up with. Mm. Uh, it's burn. been just like you would expect. The fire hose is fully inserted uh, in my mouth here, and uh, we've been blowing and going. And so, fully inserted in his mouth. Thank goodness. Hmm. And the hand gestures too to go along. Yeah, with I didn't like that. Those hand gestures. No, leave those out. No, oh, that's not what I would have expected, Coach. I don't think that's what coaching is, inserting fire hoses and blowing 
in your mouth. I'm not <laughs> no, sure. I'm no. Sure that's normal college football coaching protocol, but I've never been a college football coach. So what do I know, Buck? Never had, no, never inserted hoses in my mouth. I'm blowing and going. Just you were never, coaching. You were just never coaching. blowing and going, dudes. Just coaching. Just coaching. That's all. Like just that's coaching. What most people do, but not Brent Venables. Wow. In, uh, in Norman. But yeah, uh, close to 10 points in a rivalry game. Look, if OU was favored by 10, I'd be like, that's too many points, right? It's just, you throw the records, you throw the stats, you throw everything out the window when you step sure. to it at the state fair. And uh, yeah, that feels like a lot. And I, I'm with you on Georgia. I just, Georgia's really good. I I, I don't bet against yeah, but, but by the time that game comes, we'll see how the horns are. But sure. I don't even change a hard period in that game or how yeah. I feel about, you know, we, I think we all, by that time, We'll all have we'll understand what both teams are like. Oh, we're still more than 150 days away from the start of the season. So uh yeah, we've got so a long sad. way to go. I know it sucks. I wish we were seven days away from the start of the season, but alas, here we are at the end of March. Um, yeah, I mean that that Georgia game is right after the Oklahoma game. So wow. We'll 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 learn a lot about Texas at the Cotton Bowl. But then even if Texas wins and covers against the Sooners. It'll be like, okay, what about the hangover effect? And, oh, well, Georgia's a hell of a lot better than Oklahoma. So, yeah, that's that's going to be tough regardless of how the Red River shootout goes at the Cotton Bowl. But, yeah, but number one is the one I'd take if I had yeah, 100 to put on there. I tend to agree. I think most Texas fans would agree with that as well. All right, speaking of March 28th, it is my dad's birthday today. Happy birthday, Happy Pops. Birthday, Pops. Not sure if he's tuned in this morning. Hopefully he's out doing something better with his time, but I uh, want to give him some love this morning. Appreciate you. See you soon. Uh, all right. How about uh, some more Texas football here? Let me ask you this. Buck, you're the running back coach here. Yes, so, I am. Let's, make, the, let's establish that. Yes. Well, you're not the current running back coach. No, I'm not. Let's establish that. Too. <laughs> you're making it sound like you're uh, leaving the show every day to go coach somebody up. No, nobody wants you anymore. Come on. Look, do you see the gear I'm wearing? You're wearing a baseball hat. How does that make you a football coach? Hey. You got some on your face? Just getting my signs ready for today. But that's that. They don't like rub their face like that. They do like quick taps. Is that what they – oh, this? What about the crotch thing? Do they do anything? They used to do stuff there, but they leave that area alone now. Now, now the third base coach brings a baseball bat and cup checks himself as a part of the sun. <laughs> oh, that's great. You wearing a cup today with that get up? No cup. Just mm. long long undies today. No jock, no cup, no stirrups. What kind of baseball player are you? I don't know. I, I've just never been hit in that area with a baseball. Mm. Yeah, thank God. It, it That'd be a different happen. world if I did that. That that would have been automatically, Mama, I need to go buy a cup. Your no. voice would be a lot higher. I never got never just never got hit like that. Yeah, I I was hit there a couple of times, but I was wearing a cup every time. I wouldn't I wouldn't taking any chances, dude. No, the biggest hits I ever took there were by my kids when they were little. When they ran, come running to you if you're sitting on something, and oh. they dive into you, and their knee hits first. Oh. Oh, and you roll around in the couch, and everybody's like, "What's the big deal?" You're telling me you got to wear a cup as a parent now. Oh, I mean, with young kids, you know, they go head first sometimes too. Oh, face full yeah. of Johnson, <laughs> forehead full of Johnson. Oh no, that hurts. No, that yeah. cross, I got cross-eyed a couple times <laughs> by my kids. Yeah, for sure. Gross. All right, well, you're the former running back coach here. There you go. So, the fifth practice for Texas, yes, spring practice for Texas went down yesterday, and they had an open media viewing. And our guy Jeff Howe, Texas Sports Unfiltered, and Horns Twenty Four Seven was there. And I'm looking at his practice notes from yesterday, and he said it was a rough day for the true freshman running back Jarek Gibson. Said he fumbled a couple of times during ball security drills. Whoa! So, let me ask you this. I mean, look, he's a true freshman. He's an early enrollee. We're talking about a kid who should be in his senior year of high school right now. And this is one practice. Like everybody has bad practices. Sure. At least I think everybody has bad practices. Uh, in any, like, let's just say, generally speaking, if a guy has ball security issues going into college, how easy is that to fix? How long can that take to fix? I've never recruited one that had that kind of problem. That's what I said. I told you before, I said, I never recruited kids that if I knew they had ball security problems in high school, I very seldom would I 
would I ask him to come to any place that I was at? Because that's that's hard to that that's that comes into play in a lot of different areas. That's you know they I don't like them overthinking that. I'm not. I'm. This isn't you know one of those movies where you send a guy walking around freaking campus with a ball under his arms. <laughs> you know that that weird shit like that. My deal was if he can't secure the ball, he can't play. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, I've had guys fumble before in games. It's not like I didn't throw them right back in the game, but I've never had one fumble twice in a game that played. I just, I just never, I've never, I've never had that. I've never recognized. It. I mean, I did all the, all the drills you could do. I told you I had a guy who never, who always ran with the ball in his left hand, no matter which way he went. He, his ball security was, he felt more comfortable with the ball in his left hand. So I don't say, I don't give a crap what it looks like. Just you run, you secure the ball. You don't have to put it away from the defender. If you feel more secure that it's at the defender, but that's your dominant hand, then put it in your dominant hand. Because if you fumble it on the other one, we're going to have some problems that you didn't use your dominant hand. But I didn't. I didn't do any. I mean, I did some extra. We did a little extra things, but I didn't. I didn't find it when a guy got to college that I was going to go nuts. And I mean, some guys just have a bad practice. Yeah. And you know, generally, generally that goes along with not just the two, two or three fumbles that he may have had at a practice. But he's probably had a couple of drops when the ball hit him in passing. He probably didn't warm up very well. You know, he probably missed some cuts that you looked at and said, dude, that was the time you should have been going inside. How did you not see that? It generally, you know, it kind of goes with some other things that happened during the course of the day. Yep. You know, it's funny you say that because in Jeff's practice notes, he also mentioned that uh, Jarrett Gibson had a drop when the running backs were running routes, doing drills with the quarterbacks sure. in, in the passing game. So, uh, yeah, it's just a bad day. Look, I don't remember – I didn't watch Jarrett Gibson in high school. I'm not going to sit and BS with you or the people. But, like, I don't remember reading about fumble issues with no. him at IMG Academy in Florida. He wouldn't and, have got here. Yeah, he wouldn't course, have. Their, court, their coach is a pro, former professional player. Bingo. If that guy was fumbling, you know, once a game or whatever, having nice runs, but then fumbling the ball twice, even if he got it back and he didn't lose the fumble, he wouldn't be here. No, he was one of the top running back recruits in the country, too. Right. Like, this is not just a oh, a guy that Texas took a chance on. They think they found a diamond in the rough, a needle in the haystack, whatever. Uh, this is a guy that everybody wanted. So, yeah, I, I, just, I think it's a bad practice. Once again, it's a guy who should be in his second semester of his last year of high school. Yeah, uh, There's he a transition back. for everybody. He gets back in the fall, and he's still doing the same things. He won't get in the game. Yeah, well, the good I'm news sure. is Texas I, has I, won't, I won't give him an opportunity to have a bad game in a yeah, game. That's a you good point. And, like, and the good, you know, Texas isn't relying on that guy, right? Like at best, no. Garrett Gibson is third on the depth chart to start the year. Sure. You've got CJ Baxter and you've got Jaden Blue with experience already coming back. Uh, Trey Wisner, we, we talked about him earlier this week. He continues to get rave reviews from the coaching staff, but also from the media members who have gone to watch Texas practice this spring. It's nice, yeah. but that dude's not playing this year. He's not yeah. going to be, unless somebody gets hurt, he's not a part of that rotation. Not maybe rotating three running backs. Right. Yeah. Maybe he's your number three and he's the mop up duty kind of guy. Like, you know, if Texas has a four touchdown lead against Colorado State in the season opener in the fourth quarter, then sure. maybe you see some Trey Wisner. Well, you you feel good, if you feel good about his speed and everything else, he's returning kickoffs for you. Yeah. 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 There's an opportunity there. Plenty of opportunities there. Texas will need Absolutely. some new returners with uh, Xavier Worthy and Keelan Robinson gone to the NFL. So, those position battles will be fun ones to keep an eye on in the spring and through the fall as yeah, well. I just, I just never had fumblers, BK. I just never had – I didn't – you know, by the time you get to college, this isn't about teaching guys fumble drills and shit like that. It's – dude, if you were doing that in high school a lot, you're going to come here. There's nothing I'm going to tell you to prevent you from doing that. You're just – that's what you are, you know. I mean, yeah. I put I put overemphasis – I overemphasize drills that – where you're running in the sleds. I mean, there's very few running back coaches that use a seven man sled for his players. So that he's bouncing off of one going back, bouncing off the other, you know, seven times repetition. I mean, we, we did that a lot. Guys hated it. They're like, Oh shit, here we go. Offensive lineman running into the seven man sled did it. And that was an every day. That was just a part of the deal. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that was a part of it, but I never did any drill. I didn't run around during practice with, with guys who had the ball in their hands, slapping the ball away, playing games, you know, hey, you didn't secure the ball. I wasn't surprising people. And I've never, ever, I mean, Magovic told me that one time we had a, I think Ricky may have fumbled in a game or somebody fumbled in a game. 
And because we had very few of those and no matter where I was, we just, we didn't. And the ones that we lost, we got back. Like I said, I never see guys die on a ball as quick as it went out of their hands. There was one year we had two fumbles during the whole year period at Texas. Wow. And, and I wasn't, and he said, you know, I remember we had a fumble. He said, do you think we need to have him walk around campus with a football? And I'm like, John, are you effing kidding me? I think I'm going to have this guy walk around campus with, with girls talking to him. He's got a football tucked under his arm. I'm like, this is, this ain't the movies. He just won't play. It's a good conversation starter right there. Hey, I like, he just won't play. That's all. Not- somebody, else, somebody else will take care of the ball. Yeah, I don't know if good, have- good guys yeah. that would to take care of the ball. You know, I didn't, I just threatened him with playing time. That was enough. Yeah. That works. And it was a loaded running back room when you were coaching at Texas. Yeah. It's a loaded running back room right now. So I, I would think a type of threat like that from Tashard Choice would work for any of these running backs. Like it, it, if you're fumbling a bunch, we right. can't have that. I mean, look at look at the Sugar Bowl, right? People ripped Stark for his play calling in that, that game. And I do wonder if part of his uh, – I'm trying to think of the right word. Part of the reason why he abandoned the run game was because both of his running backs fumbled early in the third quarter of that oh, that'll game. Make, that'll get you gun shy as a play caller. Yeah. And those Both guys – obviously, Jonathan Brooks was out, but both of the guys who were in that Texas running back room struggled in that game. So, yeah, that'll make a head coach gun shy. That'll make a running back coach gun shy. Ball security, man. That's You cannot cough up the pill. It's too no. important. And uh, yeah, that's I'm sure Tashar Choice was all over Jarrett Gibson yesterday. And he will be all over him for the remainder of this spring about that too. And he's going to let him know. He's going to he'll be whispering stuff in his ear as he walks by him. You're going to have a good day today. You're not going to put the ball on the ground today. You know, like you did yesterday. There's things that coaches say that they get you. We get your attention. You know, with some of the little wise remarks we'll say. You know, send you home to your mama in a box. You know what? Really, coach? You get rid of me? Uh, yeah, well, you can't say stuff like that anymore. Probably send get in you, trouble. For, send yeah. you home to your mama in a box? Yeah, I've, I've, I've said that before. What is it, like the movie Seven where you're going to chop off the guy's head and put it in a box and send it to a loved one? No, I just sent him home in a coffin back to his mom after I get done with him. Oh. No, it was – it was. you can't even do that. You can't even say stuff like now. I'm in the portal. I'm afraid the coach is going to get – I don't know. He's going to send me to my mom. He's going to me. Oh, my God. No. No, you just don't play. And they get the message. They understand when they're sitting on the bench and you're looking over the top of them to the next guy. Oh, no, not you. You fumbled too much. I'm looking at the other guy. I'm not looking at you. That would work. Yeah. Oh, I'll it works. What, I'll tell you Playing what. Playing time always works. I'd maybe hit the portal if a coach came up to me and was like, yeah, I'm going to put your ass in a coffin and send you home to mom. <laughs> be like, all right, you can just tell me I suck. That's fine. Please don't threaten to kill me and send my remains to my mother. Please. Yeah, we didn't have to do. We didn't have to do much of that. And I mean, I like you said, I had, I had pretty good rooms at three places I was at, and they were that playing time was scary because those guys were all fighting. I mean, Howard Griffith and Keith Jones back at Illinois. Those two dudes. One was with the Falcons. One was with Denver. Those guys. Howard wanted the ball all the time. I mean, he played the whole fullback, single back. He wanted it coming out of the backfield. Oh no, I can go out and up. You know, he wanted it every time. Sure. I mean, that guy, that was the guy who went into to Makovic before a game and wanted to have a talk with him about how many carries he needed that day. No way. Oh, no. I'm, he's walking up to the office. I'm like, I mean, he's got his, you know, he's got his game pants on and his underneath stuff on. I'm like, what you doing? He goes, I need to talk to John. I'm like, what? Call him John. Talk to John about what? He goes, and he goes, I need to get this ball today. And it wasn't a game that he scored eight touchdowns in. It was just. It was probably against Michigan where we didn't give him the ball enough, you know? Yeah. I've never had – he was the only player I've ever had go by me to the head coach. And direct. he had a direct relationship with McAvick, Howard Griffith. He was he and McAvick were tight because McAvick is the one who told me he won't be playing for you. Don't worry about him. Howard was a prop uh, proposition, whatever it was, back in the day where he said, he won't be here, Buck. He's not going to make the grades. He's not going to be able to stay here at Illinois very long, only to graduate and then write a book and then win two Super Bowl rings. Prop mm-hmm. 48, it was called, Prop 48. He was. He said, he's not going to be here. He's not going to be able to make it with you. That's and true. I'm like, Coach, he's got to make it. He is really, really good. <laughs> we need this guy, Coach. Yeah, we need this guy. he got to make it. So he was the only one who could go talk directly to him. I mean, between him and Jeff George, those are the only two dudes on our team that could go to McAvick 
like go in, shut the door and sit down and start talking to him. And he did this before a game. And I was like, I was like horrified. I'm like, hell, what did I do that he's going in there to tell coach? Wow, that is bold, but it worked yeah. out. And yeah, yeah, he was that good. He deserved the ball probably more and than Ricky he got. Never, it. Ricky never did that. Ricky just and Ricky had a good relationship, but he never came in and said, I need the ball. He was gonna get the ball. Yeah, it was, it was like there was there was no need. It he was just gonna get it. Right. So. Right, right, right. A lot of love for Tashard Choice. I heard Jeff talking about Coach Choice yesterday. Just the energy that he brings oh, to yeah. practice day in and day out is second to none. He's just super emotional, super energetic, very positive. Seems like a fun guy to play for. And you, and you see why, Buck. I mean, sure, we've only, we've only had the chance to hear from Tashard Choice a couple of times because the position coaches aren't made available very often. But just from every report and review that we've gotten about T-Choice is that he's just – a super great guy and and you see why texas has recruited that position incredibly well i think you see why guys are getting developed at that position here at texas at an incredibly high level that guy enjoy him while we have him because yeah because somebody nfl teams are going to come get him they already tried he he turned down an nfl job this off season and he got a raise for it and well worth that raise based on what we saw from jonathan brooks last year and his Uh, recruiting of these players too from florida I mean, we, we, we talked about Stan Drayton, right? Stan Drayton was uh, Tashard Choice's predecessor, and he went from running back coach to head coach at Temple. That's so right. I don't know. I don't, you know, hasn't worked out super well there, but still, like, that's uh, – people held the last UT running back coach in a high enough regard to where, yeah, he skipped NFL running back coach. He skipped coordinator. He went straight right. to head coach somewhere. So I don't know if T-Choice wants to do that. I don't know if that is in his future. But he keeps uh, pumping them out the way that he has, then he's he's going to be getting more and more offers from around the country and maybe the NFL too. Yeah, I mean, I mean he's an NFL player, he's a former NFL player, so he understands that game, that part of the game. So that's not that's not like a huge step for him. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you were to do that. So, and a couple of freshmen who were getting some love: Kobe Black, the uh, true freshman defensive back, and Alex January. Uh, both of those guys singled out by Jeff Howe in his report, Alex January, a defensive lineman for Texas. And, you know, Texas, there, there's not a ton of depth on the interior of the defensive line this year. Like, that's that's something where I do wonder if the Longhorns look to the portal maybe after spring because the transfer right. portal will reopen up when we get to the summer once all of these spring games are done. Uh, I do wonder if Texas looks – for an additional defensive tackle for depth. I don't know if they're going to be able to find like a super talented starting caliber player there, but that's, that's the one thing. Maybe Alex January can be a guy as a true freshman who steps in, but you know, you've got Alfred Collins, you know, you've got Vernon Broughton, you've got Sadiq Mitchell there. I mean, you've got some experienced guys coming back, but in terms of just top to bottom, that's one of your uh, shallowest positions, if you will. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the part that I, I mean, I fear the secondary, but I fear the defensive line still. I, I mean, that's one of those, let me see how they are. Let me see how these two two combinations of guys work together, like the two that are, that are going to head off to the NFL. What are they going to mm-hmm. be like? I mean, is there going to be a substantial drop-off there? Because you can't have that in the SEC, not on the defensive line, not when the when the when both the lines of scrimmages in the SEC, even with mediocre teams, are big and bad, you know? Yeah. So that's the part I worry about more than anything. I, I don't worry that – there's not enough special players or specialty type of players at Texas compared to specialty types of players at Auburn or, you know, with the exception of Georgia and Alabama, all the rest of them, the Texas has got those type of players all over the place. I worry about the big guys, the big grunts, and especially on the defensive side, offensive, offensive linemen, they've been just Texas now will have that line together for the third year. And that line has got to be one of the most potent lines in college football. I mean, mm-hmm. size, strength, the whole works. And also assignment-wise, they know all the things that Sark is trying to do now. They got it going into year three. They had it going into year – hell, they had it in going into year one, actually, with him, and year two was better. And now you go into this year, believe me, things should be – there shouldn't be – they should have plays, new plays that they're making up with some of these guys. Some of these guys pull and run better than they did even two years ago. They do a lot of things better with this offensive line coach. So. You're, you're adding plays now. You're not just running the same things. You're doing different types of things because the skill level is even better with this group together now in the third year, you know? 
yeah, the uh, I remember the 2023 Phil Steele College Football Preview Magazine, aka the Bible, and they mm-hmm. do their position unit rankings every year. And Texas was the fourth ranked offensive line in the country right. going into last year. Now, were they a top four O line last year? No, they're probably a top 15 to 20 offensive line last mm-hmm. year. Like they were very, very good. But I wonder where they're at this year. Like, could they be even higher than that, considering they've got four starters back from a very solid offensive line in 20? Well, they're always it's 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 kind of you know, like you when you get groups like from Ohio State, the wide receiver position, it's like wide receiver you now. I mean, they'll yep. come up with a couple guys that we haven't heard about that will be really, really special for Ohio State. Michigan offensive line. You know, and Michigan's got guys stacked. Even though they're losing guys, losing their whole offensive line, the ones behind them probably could play anywhere anyway. Yeah, you know, yeah you're right. It's not going to take a lot of a drop-off. But for Texas to lose possibly two first-round guys, to me, especially on the defensive line, that that's just really hard to replace. Yeah, the D-line. Play, D-line play, but it's just first rounder, right? I mean, shit, I mean, maybe two of them. That's yeah. that's hard to replace those guys. You can talk about how Broughton and these other guys. Well, they played too, but they didn't play like they played too, but they didn't play like those two guys. Those guys were those are special players, and when you have two of them that are not fifth round picks, you know, just big big guys that are fifth round picks, and somebody will take a chance in the fourth round. These are two first round draft picks possibly. Mm-hmm. That's hard to come by on your defensive line. That's hard to come by on your offensive line. But I believe Michigan does that, seems to do that every year. Or Notre Dame seems to do that every year with an offensive lineman. You know? Yeah, they'll have they'll have an offensive lineman drafted in the top 10 this year. Sure. Talking about Notre Dame, that kid. It Joe seems like Hall. every year they have one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, But you're right. No, I mean, T. Sweat, Byron Murphy are going to be very, very tough to replace. As Lazarus says, we need a young guy to emerge and be adequate to above – Average, Dre yes. Bledsoe, Aaron Bryant, Alex January. Yeah, those are three of the candidates. Bryant's a redshirt sophomore. That makes sense. You're right. Dre Bledsoe, I believe, is also a redshirt sophomore. So you've got a couple of guys there entering their third season. You're going to need some depth on that defensive line. Right? I mean, Alfred Collins and Vernon Broaden, even if they are great, even if they do turn into really solid players, uh, defensive linemen, especially interior defensive linemen, don't play every snap. No. That was a big part of of the success that Texas had last year, right? I mean, T Sweat and, and Byron Murphy. Experience, and they got that experience from going yeah. into games. Well, Sweat and Murphy got all the love, and they should have gotten all the love. They were two of the most dominant players in the nation last year. But uh, a huge part of why they were so dominant was because they were fresh, because Texas had a deep rotation of defensive tackles, right? Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton and Sadir Mitchell and Trill Carter. Those guys all played a decent number of snaps. So, yeah, Murphy and Sweat could stay fresh. And in the fourth quarter of these close games that Texas was playing in, those guys had enough gas left in the tank to still make an impact. So and that's Texas what has one of the better offensive line coaches in America. I'm talking about the D line, but yeah, yeah, D, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. But, and then you look on the other side, but they do have one of the better coaches in the country with incredible talent offense on that sure. offensive line. Yeah, no, I'm not worried about the O line. I'm I'm with you though. You said you're worried about the D line. Yeah, like, well, I just I'm concerned, yeah. and you've got you don't have Bo Davis there. Like you talk about, yeah, Kyle Flood's a beast. The O line should be fine. If it's not fine, that'd be a problem because yeah. that's unexpected. But the D yeah, line, the D line, I still worry about. You're right. I just it just it just worries me the quality of guy that you lose. What is the quality of the backup? I mean, as you just can't, you know, as the 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 texture just says. You can't, they can't be, they've got to be average to above. They've got to be just like those guys to above. You're not going to be like like those two guys. There's there's nobody that's coming back with the exception of body man himself, Alfred, Alfred Collins, that can do he he should be able to he should have been able to do that to me. But that dude, but there's not a lot of guys that look like that. That might be the worst superhero name of all time. But body man. Body man. What is that? That dude is, I mean, that guy looked like that coming out of high school. I mean, that was like a sure bet of a guy who's going to be all American, huh? first team Big 12. I mean, that's that's how we should have been talking about that guy. Going to this year, we're talking about a guy who the SEC is going to look at and go, holy shit, Texas has got that guy for I, another year? I wish he wasn't here. Like, I wish Alfred Collins was so good that he was already off in the NFL. That I, I figured he'd be a three and done kind of guy. 
And I think we is, kind of all thought that. We just kind of been waiting and waiting and waiting. There he is going into year five. And hey, maybe Kenny Baker can figure him out. Like sure. Davis couldn't quite get the most out of Alfred Collins, although he did get better, definitely, uh, under the tutelage of Bo Davis. But maybe Kenny Baker's the guy who can take Collins' game to the next level. And he does look like that, you know, top two day draft pick in the NFL, like we thought he was coming out of the bass drop area in high school. Yeah, and I think what happens is you get you get wound up with you know, the, the two guys that are leaving, what did they do well? I mean, was it pass rush? Was it stop the run? They did it all well. They were they were very good. That's why you get to be a first-round draft pick on the defensive line is when you do it all well. You rush the passer. You sack the quarterback. You stuff the run. They did all of Both those guys did both of those things incredibly well. They didn't have one that they did much better than the other. They were all very evenly aligned to the way they got to the, got to the run, stuffed yeah. the run strength-wise. I mean, those are the things that get you in the first, you know, the first round as a defensive lineman. That's that's the part that gets me. We know we talk about linebacker. We don't know if we have a linebacker. I worry about the guys in front of the linebackers. For sure. Quick question from Brad here. How much time will Anthony Hill spend on the D-line versus linebacker? I think as of right now, Anthony Hill is working ex- exclusively with the linebackers. So I yeah. think Sarkeesian said at one of his press conferences that if the season started today. Anthony Hill would be a starting middle linebacker. For That's fine. So, That's yeah. fine. I mean, yeah, yeah. I never, I never thought of him. I mean, in high school, yeah, you can be. What is he? Six two, six one, or whatever it is. He can be out there rushing the passer. There's no, there's not very many high school tackles or guards that can pull out and get to that guy before he gets to your quarterback when he drops back. You know, your running back's not going to help you, and that guy's going to run through your running back. So, but. For me, if he's best suited to be a linebacker, be there. You got enough guys that need to learn how to pass rush and do that that are big enough and you know physical enough. We talked about those guys yesterday. You know the kids yeah. in Westlake, they're going to be stronger, bigger. They're going to be ready to go. I think that's the biggest part of this thing, right? Like maybe Anthony Hill is best at inside slash off ball linebacker. Like maybe that's best for him. But Texas is in a better spot at edge right now than they are at traditional sure. linebacker. They just have more depth there with, yeah, with with Burke and Sorrell and Vosick and Trey Moore coming in from UTSA and Colin Simmons, the five-star freshman. Right, and some of that's not good for a player. When you keep moving him around saying, I want you to be a pass rusher. We saw you in high school. I want you to be that. But he's really got to this level, and he's not suited to do that. We saw that at LSU with their great pass rusher. Then they flipped him the, the next year after he was a great player and put him inside, and he sucked. I'm like, yeah. what did you do? What did you just do to this guy? Right. You hurt your yeah, team by doing that. I know. I know. I'm back and forth on Anthony Hill. Like, Anthony Hill did play inside linebacker a lot last year, especially in the second half of last season, and he played it really well. But, I mean, we saw him as a force off the edge at times. I mean, he was second on the team in sacks last year with five, and that was as a true freshman, and that was kind of bouncing around playing a few different positions on PK's defense. So part of me thinks that dude has some natural pass rushing abilities that I want to see – and edge players are more important than linebackers, I think. But you also have to have good linebacker play, especially when nickel is the base nowadays, and you only have two linebackers on the field sure. more often than not. So that's an important position. So this might be a, two uh, monsters inside. Yeah, exactly. So it might be a hey, this is just where we need Anthony Hill right now type of situation. But I, I don't think he's going to be bad there. I think he's going to be one of the better uh, inside linebackers in the SEC. I really do, even though it's. His second year of college football, even though in that position, yeah, I think he's going to be. I think he'll be just fine in there. Yeah, yeah, even though it'll be his first full year of playing that position too, I do think he'll be just fine there. So, uh, keep the questions coming. Go to text line five one two 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 nine three two eight. The YouTube comment line is open. Uh, Tom McKay missed the earlier segment when we told an abbreviated version of the okay. office of Peacock story, but he did text in just now and said, "Sorry, I'm just tuning in. Been busy." Bucky, Officer Peacock says hello. We had a nice little chat yesterday. Nothing to chat about with me. I'm paying my I'm paying to the municipality over there of Lakeway, and uh, very polite to the officers. I understand I understand the communication skills that you need when you're talking to anyone, and more so when when a police pull you over, you got to know exact right thing to say. No tapping of the ring. Didn't do that. Didn't get that out because I didn't get it out quick enough. Mm-hmm. But um, that's a problem for you. I've heard. Yeah, I've had some problems with that. Yeah, I'm just and you know I had good conversation. You know, it was very cordial. I just didn't get it when he was telling me about the apartments up there, 
saying that people are coming down here to, down this hill too fast. Like I'm thinking, really, mm -hmm. really, officer. Just yeah, give me my ticket. I don't need all the explanations. If you're going to give me a ticket, I don't need the explanations. If you're going to ticket me, hey, Tom McKay is a better guy than you are. It's as simple as that, I guess. You know, he's a more likable guy. He's a better guy. However you want to spin it, he you know he's come the through there. You did and got off the hook with a warning, and you ended up getting a two hundred and seventy-five dollar ticket. It's the other municipalities that he has a problem with because he does get ticketed. He doesn't always get a warning. I feel like nine out of ten times Tom gets off with just a warning, but he gets pulled over ten times every two months, so he does. Yeah, that's get a warning. lot. I can't my I, my stress level. I can't take that part of it. Oh, He's having yeah. that thing blaring behind me. People seeing me, seeing my Subaru. You know, I don't. I don't like. I don't like. And I don't. And you know, you they want you to stay in the car, keep your hands in the car. Mm -hmm. You know, Wags telling you how you gotta have your hands up on there. I'm like ten no. and two, baby, ten and two. No, just just give me the ticket. Let me move along here. There you don't go. give me the speech. I don't need the speech. Old yeah. enough that I know about the speech. Just. Give me the I'm ticket. with you. I'm with you. Yeah, like, just come up and give me the ticket right away, or just give me the warning right away. I don't need to hear all this other stuff. Or don't tell me I'm going to go. I'll be in my car. I'll be right back. They never come right back. You're sitting there, you know. Uh, they're trying to find out how many years you, you spend. How many years yeah. you spend in prison? I'm like, or how many warrants do you have, have out for your arrest? Mm -hmm. You know, you're paying your child support. I'm like, dude, just give me the go back there. Find out really quickly, like you said you were going to do, which you never do. You come back like 12 minutes later. Hey, I'm sorry it took me so long. Yeah, I'm sorry too. And then they got to go back to their car. They come back and ask you for something else. And it's like, hold on, I'll be right back. And then you see them in your rear view mirror just eating a donut back there. It's like, <laughs> Dude, no, he wasn't. So Jack C. Wagon speed it up a little bit. I, got, like, I was speeding for a reason. I got somewhere yeah. to be. Let's get it's me about my kids. Way. I got to hurry up and get to the kids. Oh, my God. Yeah, stop down in that coffee. And find a bigger that. tree to hide behind. Yeah, how about hide you? behind the trees are only two years old. They mix in a salad, Jack Wagon. <laughs> it's not that ass. Come on, man. You can't come through there. You got to really be careful. I know. I know. I do. Yeah, with Tom's gonna give, Tom, and Tom's going to give out names, of course. I knew Tom was blurting my – I knew he was going to be blurting my name to this guy. Oh, as soon as he, he found out me. it was the same cop, he's like, oh, you you know my friend Bucky. Oh, gosh. That's hilarious. And the cop remembered. We'll get Tom on next week. Well, yeah, it was Michael Godbold. See, nobody knows. The, oh, the he, knew, he knew you were Bucky. His, huh? He knew you were Bucky. You know why he knows him, Bucky? Because it's been blurted from people that listen to this show to him in, in that area now. Dude, every day they've been on your ass. They just, mm -hmm. why did you give? You gave the wrong guy the ticket. He's probably going, no, I gave the right guy the ticket because he's paying for it. He is paying for it. And my wife's getting a new pair of breasticles. <laughs> Thank <laughs> God for that. All right, some, uh, some quick sponsor shout outs here. How about a word? From our great friends out at Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous Hill Country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Got to ask Dan how many tickets he has out there in that municipality. He's probably going to say zero because I don't drive a Subaru. Mm. They don't no pull one, me over. No one's giving the Covert family a ticket anywhere in Austin. They're, they're <laughs> off the hook. They're, are you think they're good in Bee Cave too? Yeah, they're too, well, they're too well known in this area. I'm just, me, I'm a felon. Yeah, you are. Sorry yeah. there, fella. We've heard some of the yeah, stories. You know, drive around my Yankee outfit on today, walking around. Do I need to wear this outside? I told my wife, please make sure that I don't, that I'm not like tied that I walk out of here with this uni on today. Why would you not wear it? It's opening I'm day. This an opening day. Are you, dude, I wouldn't wear, if somebody offered me a thousand dollars, I would not wear this. What? No, I would not. I would not go out in public, driving my car, getting out, going to H-E-B, with a Yankees uniform on. You're willing to wear it in front of a thousand people on camera, but you're not willing to wear it out in public? 
I'm not, I wouldn't go and get my grapes or my bananas or fruit or any of that stuff at HEB today for a thousand dollars when I walk in there with this. You know how much it would cost? How you know how much it would take for me to walk around in this gear for the day? Five thousand bucks. Oh my god, you wore a jock strap on your face during COVID out in public, and you're not wearing a, a shirt and pants out in public for it. Mean, I didn't go to pants. work. I didn't go to work with it on. I didn't drive down the highway with the jock on my face. <laughs> Did it once I got to the place. I, I, I love I love seeing the people in the cars with the masks on still. Like there's oh, no yeah. one else in their car. They're driving by themselves. They've got like what are we what are we doing here? What are you preventing right now? I do too. They, they must hate when I go out and go, Choo! excuse me. <laughs> oh, you sneeze on them? I, right by them, like, Choo! oh, I'm sorry. Someone's wearing a COVID mask and you just like lift their mask and sneeze right in their face. 5,000 BK, I would do it. That's absurd. That is absurd. You'd do it for an S, wouldn't you? You'd do it for 1,500, you'd do it, right? 100 bucks. You'd walk around with a Rangers outfit today. If it was a Yankees uniform, it would take me 5000 bucks because I hate the Yankees. You won't catch me dead wearing any Yankees gear. But, yeah, Rangers gear, 100 bucks. The, the pants, the whole works. Sure, I'll put a you cup on, too. Cleats. You wear the cleats. I'll wear the cleats. I'll wear a cup. The Come whole on. nine, baby. No, you can't go out in public like that. Yeah, no. it's open day. Why not? No, no, no. This is not oh. Halloween. This Look is who not it is. No, it, no, it's not Halloween. Look who's here this morning. Who's here? Dee Dee. Hi, Dee Dee. It's funny. She comes back today after you failed to forecast the rain that we had yesterday. Dee Dee comes back on a sunny day here today. Mm, here's Start the reason. Time. We were worried Dee Dee had entered the listener portal, but instead she started a new gig, so she can't tune in as much. She's now. weathering now. She's a she's a weather lady. Yeah, we need we need your weather forecast. The buck is trying to take your throne. DD. Wow. Yeah. So thanks for tuning in this morning. We appreciate you, you stopping by for a few minutes. All right. Some other sponsor shout outs. Some love to send text tickets.com. Uh, if you need tickets to anything, you can get them. Send text tickets.com. I might be using send uh, text tickets today to buy stars tickets. There you go. Even though, even though they're playing in Canada tonight, I might get me some NHL tickets from send text tickets.com. All the sports, all the concerts, all the Broadway shows right there in one place. Just Log on on your phone or computer to SendTextTickets.com. You're supporting local business every time you use Sentex, and you're getting 100% guaranteed seats that will be delivered right to your phone or computer. So easy to use. Don't go to those national brokers. Don't do the scalping. Make it simple no. on yourself with SendTextTickets.com, Buck. And, folks, if you're having problems with your back, you need to head on over to, like I've done, to relax the back. I love that place. Sitting in my comfortable chair today, as a matter of fact, I've been doing it for over 20 years. Uh, sitting in a, a comfortable back uh, chair from relaxed back. Love the folks over there. They've got numerous types of chairs. And of course, uh, not only just office chairs they have for you, but they've got the recliners, zero gravity recliners. They've got stand up desks just for you. They've got the Tempur Pedic uh, pillows for you, which I told you, BK, I'm having some really weird stuff going on with my hands falling asleep at night and my shoulders. I may have to go ahead and try one of those, those new pillows. Maybe it's my pillow. Maybe it is. Maybe it's that silly ass pillow that I've had for 30 years. I know what you're doing. All right. You don't have to make any excuses. You're sitting on your arm and then you're going to the bathroom in the middle of the night to. No, no, dude. No, no, quick. no. You're it's, acting like it's somebody else's hand and not yours. It's the oldest no. trick in the book. All right. My hand is numb. Some, I wake up and my hand is numb. My arm is numb. And I'm thinking it's because of the pillow. I just refuse to get away from that pillow. I've had that pillow. I've had that pillow for like 25 years. Yeah. No, time to get another pillow in. It. it was time like 15 years ago. Yeah, well, they're going to they're gonna hook you up and relax back. they got two great locations, the Hill Country Galleria across from Whole Foods and then Austin up north at the Gateway Shopping Center across from the Container Store. Live pain-free like the buck. We're relaxed up back. Love my chair. Absolutely. Shout out to Olipop as well. Don't have any Olipop here. I've got some back home in the fridge. It's you like crazy. the flavor yesterday. That's was it citrusy flavored. Yeah, it, it tasted like a Fanta. Nice, like a sun kissed, just like your classic orange soda. And there was vitamin C in there. One hundred sixty percent of my daily value of vitamin C was in that one can of the orange squeeze flavor of Olipop. Very nice. Every Olipop has nine grams of fiber. 
every Olipop barely has any sugar, barely has any calories, barely has any fat. I mean, this it's a great tasting soda that's actually good for you. You've got ingredients in there that will help support good digestive health. So not only is it not bad for you, once again, it's actually good for you. And most importantly for me, it tastes great. It tastes like soda. I had sworn off soda for years because it was so bad for me, but I missed the taste. Now I don't have to miss the taste. Thanks to Olipop. Once again, I get all those great ingredients that help my digestive system to allow me to eat all the fast food that I love to eat. Love that. Get you some Olipop, man. H-E-B, Target, Whole Foods, Walmart, Costco, wherever you go to buy your groceries, you can find the greatness of Olipop. Pop. We do like our liquids for sure. We really do. And I love my mocktails from Big Hat and yep. Big, the Big Hat uh, spirits. They are doing fantastic. Uh, the mocktail that I taste is absolutely delicious. The margarita mocktail. They're coming out with the mojito here very shortly. It'll be out there in the market at HEBs. Or they're getting all around the HEBs right now, that mocktail. Boy, that taste of ginger. I was a ginger ale drinker back in the day, too. I love that clear ginger ale, but that ginger taste. Uh, is is special. This ginger is not carbonated, so you don't get all that all the bubbles and everything with it. This ginger is good for digestive your digestive system, and you're going to love the taste. And Big Hat is doing a fantastic job all over the state. As a matter of fact, they're starting to get around a little bit, so we're excited about them. And I want to I can't wait to taste this mojito. Mm-hmm. Yeah, our guy Sheesh texted us yesterday saying he had tried the mojito mocktail flavor of Big Hat. He loved it. So nice over ice. Ice over ice. Not wasting the ice like I used to do back in the day. Never wasting yeah. the ice with the Jack Daniels. You just drink your booze straight. Straight up. Why? Why waste ice? Somebody Why else needs the ice. Somebody, there, there are kids dying in Africa. As, oh, as no. Spectrum. Spectrum person would say. Oh, no. I say that to my wife at least once a day. She goes, I should have never told you that. She so said, good. you're just crushing it with that one. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, sort of. Still. You know what? Buck off to that lady. You know what I mean? On this Thursday, buck off to her. How dare her tell my wife that she should be worried about other things besides her money? You mm. know what I mean? Don't you worry about our money. You just need to worry about giving us the proper, you know, give us what we needed to know why this is happening. Don't tell us how the kids in Africa don't have enough and you should be worried about them and not worried about your money. Really? Hey, how about you donate some of your paycheck to those starving kids? <laughs> Lady? Yeah. yeah, really. Tell me how to spend my money. You That's spend it. your money the way you want to spend it. Stop overcharging me for cable and internet. And come on, Spectrum, you can hire better than that. Or she maybe you can't. Or maybe you can. can. It's hard to hire people nowadays. And I feel like a call center is not at the top of the list for desired jobs. Dude, when I, I'm telling you something. When I was a kid, if, if there's as many jobs that you can get four or five jobs now. I'd have worked until I couldn't sleep. You know what I mean? I'd have slept on two hours and gone to work. If I'd have got three jobs, dude, I used to cut grass for a living. I used to take my lawnmower and go knocking door to door. When I, when I, when I was in seventh grade, hey, can I cut your grass? Yeah, but you see the hills in my yard? You're going to cut all this? I, yeah, I will. And I'll get it done. In about, in about two hours, I'll be done. Because there was no trimming at that time. We didn't have... They didn't have, you know, the trimmers and all that stuff, edgers and all that. I said, I'd just go there with the little clippers and clip the little high parts. I said, and I'll be done in two hours because I got to keep on moving. I got to make some money today. I can't spend all day at your yard, at your little hilly yard. I'll get this baby done with. You know, who used to cut my yard in Greensboro, North Carolina? Bob McAdoo and Cookie Sanders. Charlie, the, the brother of Charlie Sanders. Charlie Sanders that played for the Detroit Lions. I think Hall of Fame tight end. Charlie Sanders. Okay. He used to come by our house every two weeks with his little lawnmower. The thing looked like a little toy in his hand when he's doing cutting the grass on the hills where I lived in North Carolina on Bimbo Road. He'd come there back and forth. Bob McAdoo. I worked for Bob McAdoo's dad taking shingles up a ladder. The Hall of Famer? Yes. Bob McAdoo used to cut your yard? I used and, and his dad shingled the roof of our home in Greensboro, North Carolina. How about because, that? And I used to bring the shingles up as a kid. I would bring up because I couldn't take a whole, you know, a thing of shingles, how heavy that thing was on you, know, the, the pallet of shingles. I'd bring about six shingles up the ladder to his dad because all I wanted to do is get on that damn ladder and get on top of that house with him. And he would send my ass right back down to get more shingles. I spent the day going up and down. I could never get actually on the roof 
because if my if my parents ever caught me on the roof with the guy who's shingling the roof, shit, they'd probably kill me. But he had me bringing those shingles up, so he never came down. Two but thoughts here. You're, number one, you're old as shit. Number two, you had shingles as a kid, like Terry Bradshaw shingles. Not shingles on the roof. Those shingles. That's what they were called oh. shingles. Come on, man. You no, never did awesome. that hard labor. But I also used to get. I used to get into the to the yards of the McAdoo's. They had pear trees. I used to go there with a big sharp shopping bag, jump the fence, get those, jump back over the fence. Because when I saw Mr. McAdoo at my house for the first time, I was like, shit, he's coming to tell my mom I jumped his fence and took the pears out of his yard. Mm. No, no, I grew up around all those guys. Bob McAdoo, Curly Neal from the Globetrotters. Sure. Chasing him around, trying to get the ball from him at the at the rec center. I could never get that ball from Curly Neal, the Globetrotter. That guy could dribble his ass off. Oh, of course. But I watched those guys play. I watched those guys play basketball down uh, at my part of town there, down at the the playground. Bob McAdoo shooting those jumpers. I mean, those guys were good. Charlie yeah. Sanders, Charlie about Sanders. An NBA Hall of Famer and a Globe Trot. Like the Globe Trotters can hoop now. They're not oh, just yeah. good at tricks. Those guys are awesome basketball big, players. Big Hall of Fame tight end from the Detroit Lions, Charlie Sanders. That was that was something to watch. Those guys just play at the playground, and you know when they had their group. They were up every game. You never beat them, dudes. Yeah, all those guys, and then you, the old frail brother. Come on, man! I was a little football player. I was okay. It's true. All right, we got to get to our TBT video today. Oh yeah, baby! I almost forgot. So I, I, I did forget until this morning. This is not going to be the best TBT video we've ever had. But... It's not going to be like the one you showed me of Ben Shelton yesterday. Oh, you got knocked the. I'm still oh, mad man. about that one, man. I'm still mad about that. That guy. I, I was just thinking he'd be a goner or somebody in his family would be a goner. You know who called me yesterday after the show to tell exactly. me he, he agreed with my take? Lil Kev, the great Lil Kev. Really? He's like, somebody BK, been you, gone. He's yeah. like, BK, you were right. Like the, the worst part of that video was not that VY got sucker punched, it's the fact that he got sucker punched and nobody started fighting the guy who sucker punched him. Like that guy was just able to walk away scot free. It's like uh, none of those guys were BY's boys. None of them started wailing on the dude who took that cheap shot. Are you kidding me? That was it. That was, did you say that was in Houston? Too? Yeah, and I've been to that bar a couple of times in the Heights area of Houston. It's a popular and he, spot. And, and and BY's not that guy. I mean, I've never heard of him as being a guy who created problems didn't, like that. Didn't, didn't look like. I mean, it looked like a verbal altercation. Don't know who started the verbal altercation because he can't. Well, he's hear trying the sound. to break up something more than anything. Yeah, it's getting a little physical. It looks like he's trying to break it up, and then. Yeah, it seems like it's broken up and it's over. And then that jabroni just throws that right hook wow. to the jaw and it knocked VY down. So, yeah, tough, tough to watch. But, no, that's not the video. This is a, an old news clip. I don't know when this happened, but I know it's from Idaho. Uh-oh. You also did. Idaho. And this, this was posted to YouTube 16 years ago. It's a story about a woman who got struck by lightning and lived to tell the tale. And you got the news anchor just talking about how this woman got struck by lightning, but she's perfectly fine. Like, she's exactly the same as how she was before. And it's a miracle that literally nothing has changed in her life. And then they uh, go to interview this woman, and it doesn't go too great. A Boise, Idaho woman is considered a medical miracle. Laura Esterman was struck by lightning nearly a month ago, and she was considered officially dead. Thankfully, CPR from her mom revived her heart, but she laid in a coma for two weeks, and then she defied all odds and woke up. I, 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 I well... Obviously, there was a problem with that tape. She doesn't really sound like that. She doesn't remember the accident, but the evidence is clear. I am so sorry. Laura's learning to walk again after the lightning burned her legs. And we'll have more on that story and hopefully get that tape fixed for you. Dude, that is, hor that is horrible. Uh, yeah, okay. So I poor setup job by me. Once again, I, I just found this like 20 minutes before we got on the show this morning. oh my so gosh she was not fine she was not the same as how she was before she was in a coma for two weeks uh, you can almost turn me into a bit with uh, how poorly i set that up there but yeah she's in a coma 
but medical miracle. She's fine. She's alive. She's revived and she's making a recovery. And then we'll, 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 uh, we'll play the clip one more time, but oh, man. Th this is rough. The news network did her wrong. A Boise, Idaho woman is considered a medical miracle. Laura Esterman was struck by lightning nearly a month ago and she was considered officially dead. Thankfully, CPR from her mom revived her heart, but she laid in a coma for two weeks and then she defied all odds and woke up. I, 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 I should buy a little, 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 little. Well, obviously. <laughs> Look at that dude's face. <laughs> that dude is like, I don't know how he kept it together, man. This, this well, dude, like, did this shit just happen to me, really? That's okay. what he looks like. This really just happened to me. You talk about electrifying right there. Dude, she just became an alien. I mean, wow. Yeah, there's be nothing wrong. And she's normal? Yeah, she's Come perfectly on. fine. It's all good. I think the funniest part is, yeah, him saying well right after that cut. Uh, truly yeah. an electrifying speech right there. She was she was spitting straight facts, if you will. Man. Uh, oh, my she God. not the same. She was two <laughs> weeks in a coma? What was the same about that? that and then it, 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 we'll bring on Double R and Wags here so they what can. What was uh, the same about that? They could give their thoughts as the, the other sister and brother in law's dog runs in here. Jeez, what the that. hell was that? Showing it one more time. <laughs> hey, but you know what? She's recovered. She's the same. Really? I love how they go to a black and white Jeez. photo of her, too, right after this. Here we go. One more time. A Boise, Idaho woman is considered a medical miracle. Laura Esterman was struck by lightning nearly a month ago, and she was considered officially dead. Thankfully, CPR from her mom revived her heart, but she laid in a coma for two weeks, and then she defied all odds and woke up. Well... Obviously, there was a problem with that tape. She doesn't really sound like that. She yeah, well, there was a problem with well, that. Tape. <laughs> really? Was she, was she saying she should buy a lottery ticket? Like I, 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 I should, 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 should yeah, buy, like, buy a lottery uh, ticket. So I, I, I want to sit here and say that I, I'm, I'm pretty sure a producer put that in just to mess with the anchor. Oh no, it was oh, an intern. God. It's always the intern that does. Yeah, the intern gets blamed for everything on these news things. It's not. It's not like years ago. When the dude who was on the on the uh, on the air here in the Austin area who dropped an f bomb, they got the blame. Oh, that was Robert Flores, yeah, yeah, Robert Flores. What is yeah. the deal? Why does everybody get? Why does the intern always get blamed? I mean, you're the professionals. If you see the word f u c k, you probably just shouldn't say it. They, no, <laughs> don't say it. Oh, that you know that everybody that didn't say might, anything I, wrong. I, that would have, yeah, but that video would have been that video would have been implemented or put in there by a producer or whatever. I don't think an intern would have had any chance to do that. So hey, somebody yeah. might have snuck in there like that dog just did. Where are and, you at, BK? Uh, kind of change that up. And, hey, what was that? What was that old song in the '80s? Um, I, I forget who it was that where when it started it went. Ah, I need you. Oh. That's Max Max Headroom. Max Headroom. No, oh, no, it was girls. Ma it was Ma girls. Ma Max, Max Headroom. Headroom. <laughs> Men in hats. Boys with hats. Ma oh, ma 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 what no, a that's, mess. That's, that's Pet Shop Boys. Like you're talking about, you're you're talking like about Pet Shop Boys. Are you talking about yeah. Do Me by Belle Biv DeVoe? Hey, Ronnie, BK said, <laughs> BK asked, I told BK I would not, I would not walk around in this uni. I got pants and all. I got everything. I couldn't find the jock. I think my wife you threw ain't away got, the jock. Don't stand up, Bucky. You ain't wearing anything. Oh, Lord. Look out. He's got, he's got oh. baseball. Earlier today, he didn't have his pants buttoned. He showed everybody his unbuttoned pants at the you know, start of the show. Thankfully, you guys missed that. Bucky, have you ever seen that that episode of the Jeffersons where uh, George Jefferson is showing his boxing, his boxing, he, he's going to box somebody. And he comes out with his boxing shorts and Florence, you know, the maid is there and, and the cup is hanging on the side. And uh, <laughs> she, she said, what's that? And he goes, oh, that's my cup. And she goes, ain't nobody going to drink out of that. <laughs> that cup hanging right next to the shorts. Oh my God. I was looking for that yesterday. I couldn't find it. Would you, would you wear, I mean, I told BK, I would not wear this outfit out amongst public going to do stuff today for less than $5,000. I said, if somebody offered me five grand, I would go to HEB. I would go to a meeting. I would go to BK would do it for like BK would do it for like 500 bucks. Oh, my, I mean that, I mean, I'd wear that for 
Hell, you give me ten dollars, I'd go out and wear that. You put in pinstripes on your, you, you, you're telling me you put pinstripes on your body. Me? me? Yes. Oh, yes. No. Rodney. Rodney, no. you just said you do it. I've got an Astros jersey with pinstripes on it. So, but I mean, yeah, I mean, we're you know, we're talking about the Yankees. Are you wear a Yankees you, uniform? You give me we're money and I wear anything. The real oh, pinstripes. Wow. That's who we're talking about. Yeah. See, oh Lord, guy. here he is. He's ready. He's ready for opening day. You're gonna you're gonna have to get you a Juan Soto. You're gonna have to get you a Juan Soto mm -hmm. little guy right there because that may be your uh, saving grace. Replace what about BK? That. Where's your guy at BK? Where's your guy? Your your guy that doesn't wear a uniform that you bring out all the time. I'm not well, home, but next time. Oh, you didn't take him on the trip. road with you? No, no. I feel I'm embarrassed. I'm not wearing my baseball uniform. I don't have my Rangers get up on today. You guys well, are all dressed to the nines for opening day, and here I am wearing a normal shirt. Well, right. it, yeah, it's like we're. I, I will say we're though, gonna get two boys. We're gonna get two. Get I two will here. say that. that I don't know what somebody oh. must have had something going down on my hat. I don't know. Oh, that's <laughs> that looks like bird shit or or. Someone was going down. Someone was right going down on somebody. Huh? Going down on something. And ain't nobody going down on me. That's for sure. I've, I've, I've got, I've got every Astros jersey. I, I think. I mean, I've got the Space City. I've got all of them. But they don't have a number on the back, so they're all mine. So I'm not wearing another dude's name. So, no, so these I got the number. Wrong. You know whose number this is, don't you? Yeah, that's the Mick. There you go. There it is. That's the Mickey's number. That's ain't nothing wrong with that. It took you five that seconds to turn halfway around. Are you okay? <laughs> In my relaxed back chair. I had to spiral around, yes. <laughs> this so, thing's actually 100% wool and it's hot as hell, so I'm taking it off. It's Brooks Robinson's official jersey. He actually gave it to me before he died. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. sure he gave yeah. you his jersey. Yeah, he, said he, took yeah. it, he took it out of Cooperstown and everything. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you what. Wags is like Brooks Robinson – uh, Bobby Epstein. I mean, I didn't realize that we were graced by this greatness of this Adam Wagner here with all these. Uh, what it is, that guys? Know. You put your head down and just walk like you've been somewhere, or act like you own the damn spot, and people don't ask you any questions, right? They don't, they really where are you going? I was like, you could tell Bobby that I've been here already. I don't know where my damn pass is, and they just let me in. Mm. Just like that, huh? Just like that. You just gotta act like you own the damn place. Okay, well, see if you can walk into the into the uh, Formula Nuts. One. See if you can walk into Formula One like that. Go out there and try that then. Where's yeah. your lanyard, sir? Where's yeah, your sir. lanyard? Yeah. Where's your Formula lanyard, sir? Formula One, they're going to throw him in the in the hoose cow. Uh, yeah. I guarantee you for that one. Hey, I'm Bruce Robinson. Can't you see the jersey? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> go, go hobbling up. Don't you see the name on my back, Sonny? Oh, that is too much. All right. I got to go, boys. I had to change this outfit. There right he goes. Out. There he goes. Take two. He's getting two. Let's get two here, Buck. And there they're, they're out. They're out. Where the hell was BK at? He was in where? I think Seattle or, or Washington or where are you at Seattle? Where, where are you? I'm currently in Corvallis, Oregon. Home oh, of the what, what are you Oregon doing over State? there? Why? Beavers. I'm in beaver country. You boys. beaver hunting? Why, Why didn't you take us? I know. Sorry about that. What That's are you okay. doing up there? What is, what is he? I never know what he's doing. Yeah. What, what are you doing? You're you're like everywhere, dude. I don't know, man. No, I'm currently at he's my close. sister, my sister and my brother-in-law's place. Gotcha. And oh. shortly after Chaos Theory, we will be. Road tripping to Vancouver, watching the Dallas Stars take on the Vancouver Canucks tonight. Damn, and then watching the Stars play the Seattle Kraken on Saturday. So a little uh, Pacific Northwest road trip for some hockey this weekend. There you go, man. Don't you know? Don't, nice. don't you know, huh? Don't you know? You CB, make sure you tell CB hi up there when you uh, when you see him. Oh, yeah, up. that's right. Yeah, if you hook up with him, uh, yeah, yeah, be Whoa. sure and uh, high five that dude for us. That's, that's main man right there. I don't swing that way, but I will. Do uh, I know Cal Ripken? No, I don't know. I don't know Cal Ripken as a matter. Of, like I've talked to Cal Ripken a few times, but I don't. I, like I've I've seen his house before. Um, I've I've been over there a few times when I was a kid, but not since <laughs> we haven't been off of Exit Thirty Two in in God knows how long. Probably. <laughs> Goodness. All right, name droppers. I'll see y'all. Have a great show, guys. Later, Later man. man. Be good. Uh, there he goes. A little bit of a West Coast hockey tour. Like going to a little bit north of the borders. Did he say he was going to Vancouver? Yeah. He said he was yeah. going to Canada? Going right, across man. the border. Go get, going go, get the some, border. go get some moose meat. Go get some moose head or, or whatever, man. Uh, yeah, anyways, right. yeah, dude. That guy is, is always flying and always going around. If you are mobile like BK is, make sure you're hitting us up on that code of text line, 512-222-9328. It is opening day. We are getting ready to celebrate in emphatic fashion we're gonna have al walsh on at the at the bottom of the hour and get you some futures picks and get you some green in your pocket make sure you're following us on our socials i'm on 
uh twitter not the fake wags rodney's on there at the rodney r and then on instagram at the underscore rodney r i'm on the instagram at the wagner wire make sure you hit us up on all that stuff and subscribe make sure you smash that subscribe button man on this youtube channel um tell five friends like harge always says and let's get ready for uh opening day we also got the start of the sweet 16 portion of uh the men's bracket here for march yeah. madness so Pretty damn good sports tonight here on a Thursday, man. On a, a buck off Thursday, as Buck likes to say. Yeah, man. Isn't that the cool thing about it? I mean, you've got the you've got the Sweet Sixteen for the men and the women, so you got all of that and and oh, some man. really great baseball. I mean, and it fires off at what what two o'clock? I mean, I think two o'clock our time we get we get started. So, um, isn't that the great thing? I I, I tweeted this back, out earlier. Baby, it's fucking back, man. I, I tweeted it out to where it's like it's a fucking Thursday. And here we are with opening day, men and women's sweet 16. Dude, I mean, it's a and and and, and think about this Fuck one, man. P- people say this is the this is the downtime for sports. It, I mean, it, it kind of is though. That's the thing. Like when when whenever NFL's not in it or uh or football, like football's the big money driver, especially in America, right? But dude, like we we talked about it, man. The world influence of baseball, like especially with Shohei Otani in it and everything, like the yeah. the world gets jazzed, man. The world gets jazzed for America's pastime. It might be our pastime, but it's it's the present time for everybody else right now, baby. Baseball is back. Opening day is upon us. Um, let let let's get down. Let, let's let's go right after before we get go right into it before we get Walsh in here, man. Um, let's go around you know around the Major League Baseball around Major League Baseball and uh and get our our little picks our predictions here between our divisions. We'll go divisions first, and then we'll we'll tell you who we think is going to be representing the AL and the NL and the pennants there, and then give you a World Series kind of showcase here. But a way too early prediction for your World Series picks here, just off a. Of, you know, based off of what we've seen out of spring training and, and the numbers. It's a numbers game, by the way, as a matter of fact. Uh, but based off of what we see on the numbers, we're going to give you our picks for who we think is going to be returning returning, or going to the postseason show here for Major League Baseball. Rodney, what's up? How would you sleep, though? How was your hump day? How was your ass sleep day? Was it good? Uh, you know, it was good. I um, I had some interviews that I had to do last night uh, for some other racing stuff. So got all of that done and then uh, just kind of hung saw, out. Hey, I saw that candidate you sent me. Uh, you like, you like Yo. that? Oh, you she, like that? she's already won. She's a winner. She's going next. That, that right there, you're going to, you're not going to believe when I tell you this. You probably that know is, her. I'm, I'm sure you probably know her. That's a friend of mine. Yeah. You yeah, are she, full of shit. She, she, she um, so, so when she was. Can you get her on the show? She, uh, uh, Yeah. Yeah, she's yeah, like right. In. There's no way. Wait till you see what we're ta- who we're talking about, and then you just you just heard Rodney say, "Yeah, I can pull it. I can get her on the show." Why? She's like she's like in my phone, and the coolest part about she's in my phone. The, the coolest part about talking to to that particular race car driver is she will. You can ask her about the assets and stuff, and she will just like lay it out. She just, lay, I mean, not, not literally lay it out, but I mean, sure, sure. She'll, she'll, she'll tell, tell you because kind of the kind of the stuff that happens with her is people are like, well, you know, she she's not the greatest driver. It's because she looks good or whatever. And she, I mean, she'll yeah, totally she gets a car. She whips it around. She she will totally tell you. Look, anyway, we will get her on. I promise yeah. you, we will get her on. Um, yes, good friend of mine good friend of mine i had a buddy i had a buddy that he would always send these pictures of girls to us in our little dudes chat group and we're like who's that and he'd be like a co-worker and i'm like a co-worker my ass i saw her on the instagram yes. she's in illinois come on man but uh bs yeah. yes, my guy yeah. rodney's got it all uh rodney's got it all scoped out there on the on the gram that's for sure. hey make sure you guys are following us on instagram if you haven't done so already make sure you give us our your candidates every Wednesday for uh, athlete of the week. We will have Al Walsh on, like I said, at the bottom of the hour, unless he forgot about me. He usually doesn't, but that's all right. It, it, it's 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 opening day. He might have a lot going on, so we'll see. Uh, anyways, though, man, let's without further ado, let's get into it, man. Um, let's throw the first pitch out here. Who we got for uh, moving around in our Major League Baseball picks and our predictions here? We'll start off with the National League, just because it's the league that you and I aren't really in or senior. aren't really. Uh, got too league. much skin in the game, but yeah, yeah man. Uh, we'll go right. We'll we'll say the National League West here, popping off since BK's out west. We'll go west to east here, uh, from west coast to uh, to the east coast. What are we liking out of the West here, Rodney? Well, I mean, is obviously, it Sho- is it Shohei? Is it Shohei and the boys? Well, I mean, yeah, you you would think, but but what I'm kind of curious about is how is. 
I'm really wanting to see what else happens with this investigation because that can be a distraction. Um, I mean, they're projected to win what, like 103 and a half is what mm -hmm. they're projected to win. I think it's going to be under on that win total for them, but I think if this distraction continues to happen, I mean, I think it's something that, that can tailor them back. And I mean, look, you can't discount. I don't know if the Diamondbacks will win that division, but I think, you know, with some of the later acquisitions right there that the Diamondbacks made, I mean, they got Jordan Montgomery. I mean, they signed Jordan Montgomery the other day. That's good arm. I what about so. uh, what about Blake Snell heading over to um, heading over to the San Francisco Orange? There, exactly. uh, what do you think about the the Giants being able to make a splash, especially you know upgrading their uh, their rotation there, getting yeah. What, what was 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 Snell a Cy Young? Was a he couple a Cy years Young back. Year? A couple years back, he was. Okay. He, yeah. Yeah. And then I mean, and then really can can I mean the Padres. I mean, the Padres are just kind of, you, you know, they're, they're just kind of there. You don't talk they got about a lineup. them. The Padres got, they got the lumber, but do they have yeah. the arms to actually make it happen? That's, that's really the whole thing. I think when you kind of look at the whole NL West, about the only one that you really have to discount is Colorado because you don't know what you're going to get from Colorado. It's the Dodgers to lose, but I think that the Dodgers could possibly unravel depending on what happens with all this other bullshit because clubhouse problems like that is something right. that, that could just n destroy them. They got a lot of stars and a lot of money, and Biggie Small says, "Mo money, mo problems." That's for sure, Rodney. Damn My sure. pick is the Dodgers out of the West. Uh, I'd like yeah. to think the the Giants make a splash, but it's hard to sit there and go against the National League All Stars when they're all on the same damn roster. They're all in one tonight, spot. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's pretty tough. It, it, you'd be kind of foolish to to not pick, you know, the Dodgers to, to represent the West uh, coming out of the West there from the National League, um, especially when they're just absolutely loaded make almost yeah. makes yeah. almost makes you sick if you're a small if you're a small club uh fan or whatnot you absolutely hate the conglomerate or just the damn um goliath yeah of, of yeah. you know the la dodgers and i don't even know if how i don't even know how you can be a fan of of seeing you know just nothing but you know all-stars on your team uh, i don't know but the yankees have been able to do it for a while maybe sal can tell me how it feels i don't know we usually just get farm players and you know um they get poached from us as as the end of their contracts get yeah. get up or whatnot but you know i, I don't know it's i think it's going to be uh the season will be turning so to so to say or the leaves will be falling differently from the tree um whatever old adage you want to put on there or other analogy it doesn't really matter man uh new a new season's here and the the boys from baseball or the boys from Baltimore rather will be uh, leading the way rather over the damn pinstripes. All right. So to move on from the West to the central, uh, what are we like in here? Who's representing the central out of this, uh, out you, of this year, Rodney, you know, to me wags the, the central is the one to where it's like, I mean, it's a weaker division and it's kind of the, it's kind of the toss up. I mean, seriously, the NL is two teams. I mean, if you really look at it right now, as we start with Atlanta and the Dodgers, I mean, that's, that's two super teams like you're talking about, but I mean, I mean, I guess obviously you give the uh, I don't know. I mean, do you give the nod to the Cubs? Um, I think the how Reds. About the red? are, how about the big red machine? Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say, man. I, I think the Reds. That's a very young team. They've got health. That they've got people healthy. That I think last year was something that 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 hurt them. That division is for the taking. The Brew Crew is always the Brew Crew. They're they're kind of, kind of one of those you know mid tier teams like we talk about to where they come out of nowhere. Um, and then St. Louis. Yeah, you know the the I, I think the tradition of St. Louis has kind of dropped a little bit, but I really think this one this one is one where I, I really have penciled in the Reds to take the Central. Um, yeah, they, I, I, I mean a lot of people are going with the Cubs, but I really like the Reds. We saw how uh, electrifying that De La Cruz was last year. You think with a you know a complete full year uh, under the belt, you know going in with the Reds, it, you know you start making some some magic pop here and yeah. start getting. Uh, that that roster that lineup a little bit more electrifying here. Um, yeah, I like the Reds to represent the Central here. Um, and from the East, you know, you just kind of talked about them. the aforementioned uh, yeah. Atlanta Braves. I think they're still, you know, regardless of whatever roster is formulating over there and, and starting to, to galvanize for for the Dodgers. I I think the Bravos are probably the best team in the National League. I mean, again, like I I know the lineup. I've I've seen the personnel that's on the Dodgers, and I still think. Regardless of that personnel, the Bravos are the best team in baseball. They were the best team in baseball last year. Um, and look, they, but if you take away Shohei Otani, uh, you know, 
the Bravos have the best player in all of Major League Baseball, and that's Ronald Acuna Jr. Of, of course, he's he is he's second up to Shohei Otani. No, so uh, yeah, with that yeah. with that adage in in the advent of of the LA Dodgers, uh, with Shohei Otani getting getting him, I think it's kind of hard not to to say that the Dodgers are the favorite. But until I see them be able to get it out of their own way, I'm taking the Bravos, my guy. Yeah, and, and kind of kind of the battle there behind them. Least, now look, I'm not I'm not trying to to take a slap at the Phillies either. And when, we'll, you know, if Walsh hasn't responded yet, but when Walsh comes on, I'm sure he'll break down a little bit from his Philadelphia squad. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can't, you can't discount the Phillies, but just kind of from some of the, some of the stuff that I've been looking at right here, I really want to keep my eye on the Washington nationals. I why, think why, that, that? Why, why are they so intriguing for you? It's kind of the same thing with the reds for me to where I mean, you've got people back. You're a very young club. You, you've you elevated folks from a farm system that isn't that bad. Um, I think if they were in the central, it would be better for them because I, I kind of think that it's wide open. But uh, I just I, I got to keep keep a pulse there on the Walgreens right there because uh, I, I just think that there's something something about that team that that's just kind of gnawing at me a little bit, kind of like that NC State thing in, in the in the gotcha. in the Big Dance. It's, 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 like, it's, like, it's just a vibe. Yeah, every time I turn around, it's like I, I turn around and there's that Walgreens uh, label looking at me. No, with, I got you with, there with, with Washington. Um, so Longhorn Bear Will Smith signed for another ten years. Where is, where do you guys put Will Smith for your catchers? Like, wh- where is he in? In ter- is he a top five catcher? You think you'd like to think so, right? I, I, you know, but maybe right outside, maybe six or seven, if not in the top five. But I mean that that that's a solid dude. And how important is that position, man? That's no, dude. That, that's that's the fucking conductor. That's of the, the field defense. general, yeah, man. That's the field general, dude. That's yeah. what I played, man. I was a catcher, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the guy. I mean, you can talk about, you know, guys on the hot corner and, you know, short stops and, and all these different things, but that's a dude. That's a dude that's calling the pitches. I mean, that that's a dude that that is – I say I puppet master five, a lot. Right? I would think he's a top master. five catcher, isn't he? Yeah. I got, yeah. I got Adley. I got Adley Rutschman as one. Like, mm-hmm. And that's not just because I'm a Baltimore dude. Like, I got – like, I – you know, switch hitter, dude can rake and calls a fantastic game, almost, almost a perfect game. Um, and he hugs your pitcher at the end of the at the end of the damn game too. Yeah. Who doesn't love a good hug? Uh, Adley Rutschman's number one. He's he's the best catcher in all of baseball right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd have to, to say. I mean, I might even have Will Smith at three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he could be. He could be. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I definitely I mean, have yeah, no problem, yeah. but I, I did see that another 10 years a decade for will smith as as a dodger man, that, how man about that? so that is that is a lot of years and, and i'll tell you man the dodgers i mean they they do they do a really good job of just solidifying these these rosters and all this but you know this is this is where we talk about like with these super teams and everything you see it in basketball by the way what the fuck is draymond green doing and anyway when he's on the floor they win when when he's on the floor, the Warriors win, man. That's that's the thing. Like he's his basketball acumen is so high. Um, he just he sees three plays before they happen, or he sees the play. He sees the entire sequence unfold before it actually happens. Um, it it does feel like he's got eyes in the back of his his head, but that's just because of how intelligent he is in in terms of basketball, man. Um, you talk about how LeBron James. Everybody talks about Le, LeBron James and how he has you know a photo photographic memory and how he can recite yeah. everything that happens in a game or whatever. Draymond Green's got that same ability. As a matter of fact, he just he doesn't get the credit that he gets because he's Draymond Green and because he's kicking people in the nuts most of the time. So, uh, yeah, when he's on the floor, dude, the Warriors have the, like everybody's big on the splash brothers and Steph. And, you know, we, Steph's the best shooter we've ever seen in, in the history of basketball, man. Um, but when you, you can't deny when Draymond's on the floor, the Warriors win percentage skyrockets a lot higher yeah. than it does when, yeah. when he's not on the floor. And that's the whole thing. Sal, you know, stop, right? stop, Sal. We love you, and you're more than welcome to say whatever you want to say, but you can't preach about the Yankees this year. <laughs> don't, don't want it, Sal, my brother. Uh, let's talk tomorrow. Yeah, let's we'll talk, talk tomorrow. tomorrow. Framber Valdez, Framber Valdez, coming for you. I yeah, is he? Is he? Because I mean, that's about without JB. I mean, that's kind of the the way you gotta you put everything on on his shoulders. I guess, man, that's probably gonna be your ace until. I don't know. Is, is he still going to be your ace when Verlander gets back, or do you guys solidify Verlander as the ace? I, mean, I think I, really, I think Verlander's got too many too many innings on that arm. I call agree, him man. the ace. Still, I think it's I think it's Valdez's squad. I would say. 
I really agree, Wags, and that's where we're going to really see if if Justin Verlander is really the consummate pro that he seems to be. I mean, because I think he needs to be the number two or three <laughs> at this point. I mean, like, let, you, can be the, you can be the, the veteran voice in the locker room all you sure. want. Not like, no, God, absolutely. Oh, God, that motherfucker. Absolutely. Bug flying around me. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, be the be the be the locker room leader. I mean, be the clubhouse sure. leader. I mean, I, I think that's kind of the role that he settled into, and we saw that. We saw that in the postseason, where that's really seemed to be the role that he was taking. I mean, especially now, you, you know, with with the Sparza there, with a new uh, with a new manager, it's kind of a new regime right there. So I really think it is a time for him to to really step up. Uh, oh, by the way, um, I do want to mention there, Ike. If you guys uh, you guys are heading to uh, Minute Maid, if they have like any of those opening day towels or something laying on the seats, still me one my man steal me one i'll put it up here in the studio <laughs> are you taking both boys or just uh i think you got two kids i'm pretty sure i got I think you got the two kids um but i don't know if if you're just taking the one or both of them here like uh, anyways man happy opening day for everybody especially if you're getting out there to watch your ball club man um make sure you guys take a lot of pictures and send us to all of our socials we'd love to see especially at texas sports unfiltered uh send this to us or send them to us on instagram there and uh also on our, our personals as well i'd love to see that yeah. Yeah. just the one gotcha gotcha well you know happy yeah. opening day guys and enjoy the ball game that's for sure Wags. hopefully, hopefully so, the yankees lose and the the astros you know tear it down man that's for sure so you guys i mean you guys are the first game i mean you guys mm -hmm. camped in yards i mean mm -hmm. so uh have, have you gotten any any of the any of the feel any of the vibe from back home i mean i know and again obviously prayers to, and thoughts with the uh, bridge incident um just a horrible thing that we talked about yesterday but uh any other feel from back home as, as to i mean these expectations right now with this team dude this is a team on the cusp of 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 sitting there uh, among one of the best if not the best in the american league i would say and, power you know, we, power we, ranking starts out and uh, they got you at number three right yeah. um and you are you're you're kind of the best team out of the east you you would think right or not just the east but the best team out of the american league um probably behind the atlanta and uh and la but that's again we're way ahead the cart's getting way ahead of the horse here so let, let's walk it back i kind of see this is a, this is a an uneasy feeling for me yeah um I'm, I'm i'm very excited about today just because of all the hype around baltimore but i'm also like kind of terrified and reluctant uh, it's it's weird to it's it's weird to feel this way and it's weird to actually say this but what happens if this is all a dream like what happens if 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 baltimore just reverts back to being you know 47 game winners and just struggling you know i, oh, I know that's that's no. not gonna happen but but damn no. man like it's a lot my, my point is it's a lot better i think for me going into opening day not knowing what to expect or hoping yeah. that that Baltimore will be better, right? Like what happens if you come out to the, to the angels here and you lay down a turd, you know what I mean? Now, look, yeah, everybody that, that heard me on Sunday and that listened to Al on Sunday knows that there's this, it's like a, a race to 10 in baseball. There's a nice little bet that there that you can get on, on DraftKings for prop bets. Um, it's a race to 10. And of course, you know, the Dodgers are the favorite since they already got one in the regular season. Um, but the Orioles Dodgers and uh, Rangers Mariners, and who's the other one? Giants. And the Giants are the top four teams that have the easiest schedule in the beginning of the season. Now, race to 10. I mean, look at who the Orioles play to start off. They got the they got a season with or they got the Angels, right? And then they got the Royals. You know what I mean? Like, there's a really good chance that the Orioles could be the first team to get 10 wins. So if, if that happens, uh, your boy here is gonna get a nice little seven hundred dollars in his pocket. Oh, yeah, baby. That's the that's the only futures bet that I took so far. I didn't bet the Orioles to win the World Series. I just couldn't. I was gonna have BK lay something down. I just I like for the life of me, man. I felt like if I put something down for a futures bet on the Orioles, I would probably jinx them. So I stayed yeah. away, man. Yeah. I stayed away. Well, and this really is. I mean, I love that you know as we go to opening day today with Major League Baseball, as you look at at both at both divisions, and it really is like the Central. I mean, you look at the Central in the AL. I mean, it was you know Minnesota last year. Uh, to where you look at the Central again this year, and it's like, okay, who's who's going to win that? I, I mean, there's Twins, not maybe the Twins. Yeah, that that that's what I'm thinking. Um, maybe maybe somebody makes a move out of there. Maybe Detroit. I mean, I don't know if Detroit. Well, dude, Detroit. The Detroit might make a splash. Uh, make could some be noise the surprise. Here, man. Could be the surprise. I really think that in both of them, in the Senior Circuit and in the American League, that the Central 
could be the division that's going to throw us a surprise. It's going to throw us somebody that could get in there and 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 contend with the Baltimore's and the Yankees and the Astros and the Rangers and you know the Dodgers and the Bravos and, and all of that. Pittsburgh. You know, get, get. young, talented. I mean, they're they're kind of like they, they remind me of the, of what the Orioles were doing a couple of years ago. They really they're do. Ready to make a splash. The arm. I mean, hell, uh, Paul Ske- uh, Skeens. You could argue that you know one of the best young, talented arms in all of the damn mm-hmm. all the damn baseball. Man, he's already up and and throwing fireballs here, throwing heat for uh for Pittsburgh here. I mean, Pittsburgh might be onto something. Yeah, I, I mean, they might, they might, and then. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of watching Kansas City. It's like Kansas City's kind of been, uh, kind of been in a little bit of rut there for a little bit. But uh, I mean, they, they, they seem to be on the come as well. So so it's um, that AL Central is going to be a lot of fun to watch. I mean, we can talk about the we can talk about the East and the West and the East and the West, man. That that's going to be in the American League. That's going to be some of the best baseball that you're going to find. I mean, with your Orioles and the Yankees there, when you add Juan Soto batting right ahead of Aaron Judge, I mean, what what does Soto do? He hits balls and gets on fucking base. And that's and now that, you know, if, he's hitting, if he's hitting in front of Aaron Judge. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you'd like to think that he's going to be seeing a lot more pit, a lot. God, how do you pitch around that? I mean, yeah. dude, 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 these guys, yeah. they're, they're, they're notorious for doing this shit, man. Yes. Sal, that's why I can't stand you all, man. Like, yes. I love you, Sal. You're fantastic. But you're ball yeah. club, man. Well, all, all, all Cashman does is just buy up fucking the best team or, or the best talent in all of baseball, man. Um, Hopefully it does not come to fruition there for the Bronx Bombers. That's for sure. Or else they're going to put a, a little bit of a sour on Orioles' plans to on Baltimore's plans to represent um, the American League pennant or whatnot. Yeah, man, that's what I got. Like a lot of people are t- are pulling the Yankees and take, thinking that they're going to you know represent the East coming you know into the postseason. Uh, I'm not there, man. I'm going to take the hometown. The hometown heroes go go with the the ball club from Baltimore here, man. Um, I just think we're too. Too talented. We got a lot of good young success, or got a lot of good young lumber there. Um, and not to mention that we shored up a little bit of the rotation as well, bringing in Corbin Burns, who's got the start, who's yep. got the nod, as a matter of fact, here in yep. opening day. And then also, Big John Means is coming back too, guys. Let's remember that Big John Means, hell, he was a Cy Young candidate not too long ago, man. This dude can throw, throw smoke, dude. Uh, a perfect game winner, uh, what, three years ago? So, uh, John Means is no slouch to begin with, anyway. So, uh, my only question is kind of what the question was last year was a little bit about the bullpen. So we'll yeah. see. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure Brandon Hyde will, will sure that up a little bit going in, uh, going as, as we continue, uh, rolling out with the regular season, man. Well, and I'll tell you what I like about, about your club, about Baltimore and about Toronto at the same time. Cause you can't, I mean, the blue Jays always seem to find a way to fly their fucking way into the middle of everything in this, in this division is, is that you do have they got a good lineup too, man. That that they do. They're gonna they're gonna match. They do they do, man? And, and Baltimore and Toronto, it's more that homegrown feel to where you don't have the. I mean, it, it's always with the Yankees, like you're talking about. They go out and they buy the farm. They go out and they spend the most money, and they go out and get the most lucrative player that they can find. And somehow they still find a way to fall on their face. I think this is a big year for the Yankees. I, I mean, I think if they underachieve with Brian Garrett Cole, man, Garrett Garrett Cole being busted up with his that's arm, that's huge. That's huge. That's a big deal, and I think if the Yankees, I mean, if the Yankees, so are how, many under- games, how many games do you think that Garrett Cole misses? Mm, man, I, I, I've seen two months. I've seen possibly two months as, as to the severity of that. I, I mean, we we don't. What that's ten that. games. That that might be 10, 15 starts. That's, yeah, that's ten, twelve starts Cole. right there. So I mean, you think about that right there, and I and, and I truly believe that if the Yankees underachieve and miss the postseason again, that you could have some wholesale changes right there up up top, and then you know managerial and and. It, and quite frankly, I love that. I want them to underachieve. You know, it, it's like you know, uh, but again, I, I'll say it, Wags. I, I don't sleep on Toronto. Don't sleep on Toronto. That's a loaded you know, lineup. Their, line, their line's too damn good to actually, you know, go to sleep on them. That's for sure. Man, mm-hmm. that the bats will keep you awake. But speaking of bats, you see this bat right there? What's that? What's that signature? Man, I can't see that. Let's say Adam Wagner. Cal Ripken Jr. Cal Ripken. Cal Ripken Jr. Jr. Cal's going to be catching, or actually, um, I is Cal throwing out? I'm not sure if I read this correctly or not. I I've read that Cal Ripken will be in attendance and be in the ceremonies for opening day. I'm not sure if he's actually going to be throwing out the first pitch or catching the first pitch. This would be um, the year to have him there. This is definitely the yeah. Year I mean, to have well, I, of course, because Angelos isn't there. You know, like yeah. like Cal, yeah. like Cal, Cal and Angelos did not get along. Like for for the life of me, I would also argue that Cal Ripken 
and of course you know no no billionaire is not gonna sell anything just out of spite right that's kind of a stupid thing to mm-hmm. to, to fathom or whatnot but i've always thought that uh Cal Ripken wanted to buy the club or whatnot, and Angelos wouldn't sell him just because Cal Ripken cost Angelos so much money by keeping him on the roster for as long as he did with the Iron Man run. So, yeah, I don't yeah. know, man. Uh, but well, yeah, it's good to have Cal Cal Ripken back, uh, especially around the old ballpark, man, at Camden Yard. So, well, um, and I'll say, Wags, I think one of the guys. I think one of the biggest things, I mean, not only with with the lineup and the and everything that's happening there in Baltimore, man. I, I think the ownership change. I think the breath of fresh air. I think getting the fucking Angelos out. I, I mean, I, I think everything's look. Look what the Rangers did. Look, look what happened to the Rangers last year. I mean, it was a wholesale change. I mean, you had lineup changes. You had changes. I mean, you go out and you get a veteran manager and you bring him in and they win the World Series and you you make changes at the top and all of that. All these pieces come together. There, there's a lot that has to happen in baseball is, to make this work. Is Bruce Bochy, seriously, I'm not just saying it because he, he looks like that guy, but is Bruce Bochy probably the number one pick for all of just anybody in baseball to go have a beer with? absolutely so, or, or maybe maybe it's not even it's probably going to be like a, a bottle of scotch an entire bottle of scotch if you're drinking with bruce bochi yeah or yeah watch watch the, watch him be like a dr pepper guy he probably doesn't even drink <laughs> probably just drinks dr pepper i, I, don't know. I gotta tell you just seems like the fucking man dude i, I gotta tell you i i would have always loved i mean not that he's I'm, I'm acting like he's dead but he's i would have always loved to go spend some time with dusty baker just sit around, talk a little bit of baseball. You know, he can have a toothpick in his mouth and, and and just sit there, just sit there and chew it up, you know, just just back and forth, just bullshit with him. Uh, kind of, I always liked that with Larry Durker, you know, the of Astros fame at one point. Just hang what out with Ron, him. What about Ron Washington? Now, that would be a lot of fun. Now, Wash now, would be a know, lot you know, of fun. Washington's over at, at Anaheim. You know that, I know, right? I know. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he'll be in Baltimore today. Yeah. I'd yeah, like Wash. Have, like, I'd like to have a drink with Washington, man. With Wash, Wash, would, Wash would be yeah, a lot dude. of fun, and that, and that's the thing that that's that's the cool thing about yeah. About double the, D. Hey, speak of the devil, man. You know, great mind, single light, my guy. Yeah, great mind, yeah. single light. And, and that's a cool thing where, where you look at these baseball managers and it's like, you can talk about, we, we can go down. I mean, we can go down probably every damn manager in, in the, in the majors right now. And it's like, yeah, you can have a beer with those dudes to where you look at the NFL and it's like, you know, hanging out with McVay and all these guys it'd be like, eh. what's, I mean, what's Ron Washington drink though. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to venture to say I, he's got a double of Jack, a double <laughs> of Jack or a double of crown. I, I think wash probably. Yeah. I would imagine Wash goes pretty heavy. Did, uh, didn't Wash get in trouble? I think at one point, um, Wash may not drink not for, anymore. Not for booze. I thought it was okay. for uh, for booger sugar or something like that. No, okay, yeah. I mean, oh, that's right. That's what it was. That that's what it was. That's what it was. Sure. So um, yeah, he don't so, fuck around, man. He's, yeah, oh, wow. he's trying to stay. He's trying to stay up, dude. That's for sure. But yeah, um, those are guys that don't know if you haven't seen the news, uh, Ron Ron Washington, your manager for uh for the Anaheim Angels, and they will be. Uh, playing the Baltimore Orioles on opening day in Camden Yards. Uh, yeah, yeah, opening day ceremonies or opening day uh, traditions that you guys do? Anything? Yeah, yeah. You guys tell us. I mean, it's like my wife was like seriously disappointed because it's it's this is her this is her one sport that she's like, you know, all the other shit you do. She's like, I don't really care about football. I sure as fuck don't care about racing. But it's like baseball. I, now, see, I find that hard to believe. I find like, I find Tracy would be like a racing no, girl. Not not at all. Not at all. Um, she likes some supercross, maybe uh, in person, but that's about it. But baseball okay. is her thing. She's got it. This woman has a stack of Houston Astro cards that is probably worth baseball cards that is probably worth. When we first got together, she pulls these folders out and she's like, Hey, take a look at these. And I'm like, Holy smoke, those things are put away. But I told her, I said, 310 today for opening opening day. And she's like, like totally pissed off. But you know, it is what it is. Rangers and Cubs tonight. So all the Rangers fans get to uh, see go. their their world champions in prime time. So usually opening day is the one day that like my wife and and kid, like it's the one event for sports that we all sit down and we watch, right? Except for like the Super Bowl, of course. But I mean, uh, we're not really doing that on the opening kickoff for, uh, for football, right? We're not all sitting around and watching you. Oh, come on. Let's all make sure that we see, you know, the first kick of the the season, right? Yeah. We we do that with with Major League Baseball for some. I, I don't know why it's it's usually baseball. We don't we don't do it with hockey with the puck drop. You know what I mean? Uh, for some reason though, like 
and maybe it is maybe it's just the sport itself it's america's pastime right um it's it's slower it's more of a pageantry that can be told uh when you're when you're watching baseball or when you're trying to consume baseball um i i don't know for the life of me though like i can't explain why we all sit down just for baseball instead of any other sport because my family loves basketball a lot more than they like baseball yeah. so yeah I'm pretty much the only team head for for the Wagners here. I, I mean, my, my kid used to watch the Orioles all the time, but now he's an Astros fan. So yeah. watch. I bet this little shithead comes back to the Orioles now, though. Yeah, right. I think baseball is just kind of one of those to to where you can just sit around and it, and it's kind of like it's kind of like sitting around a campfire, you know, because it, it it's slower. Um, even though I think the pitch clock is there are some changes that we can look at. I mean, they did make a couple of tweaks to all Rob, that. Do you have do you have MLB TV, bud? Actually, you know what? That kind of it sucks for 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 people for Texas, man. Home teams, um, it does suck. It, yeah. it, it really does. Like you guys are screwed. Like Astros and Rangers fans, you're both screwed. You don't get to watch any of them. They're all blacked out. Yeah, which it, it it really sucks because that's the only reason why I, I got MLB TV is so I could watch the Orioles right almost every damn game. But when the Orioles come to uh, you know, to the Arlington or whenever they come to Houston, you don't get to watch the damn thing. You got to find the you know on on Comcast Sports or, or yeah some shit like that you got to find a you know an alternate route or whatnot or you got to go to a, a damn bar where audio audio visual consultations has put their pride in and go watch it there so yeah yeah anyway. I, I could tell you i could tell you for the astros if you're looking for the astros and, and probably the same for the rangers uh at&t sports net is going to be your go-to on direct tv um that, that's going to be the way to, to to go to that and if you can't find any of those if you're going to have to spend money on an app to find either one of the astros or the rangers fubo is the one i, I mean probably going to cost you $74 a month. I think it is depending that they, they've got different packages right there, but Fubo will get you most of those games. Um, but yeah, if, if you're looking on MLB, like on the MLB channel and all that, any Astros or do for games, Rob, is there like, is there anything we can, we can supply for him or provide for him that way he can see some of the games. He says it's the hardest, the hardest sport to follow. I don't want to make that. I, I, I want to make something happen for our guys here that watch baseball, man. I want mm. I want this to be the, the residential baseball show for Texas Sports Unfiltered. Well, the shitty part is now it's like we can't share passwords and all that because now they, they've got all that locked down to where it's like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't wherever. I mean, yeah, direct TV app, I mean... It, Space City, Ike's talking about Space City for the Astros. Yeah, that that's AT and T Sportsnet gotcha. now. That's on Direct TV. I think that's six seventy six or six seventy four. That's where you catch that. So if you have the Direct TV app, you can always catch that. But uh, um, otherwise, Fubo is the way I think to where you can get it, or it used to be. It used to be. So I don't know, and that that's where this is all also fucked up right now. Probably because- free trial for a month, Rob. Rob, I don't know if we if we can figure it out. I'll get you on my damn plan if we can figure it out. That way you can watch your Rangers, man. That's for sure. But hell, yeah. even if that's the thing though, even if you're on MLB TV, you won't be able to watch your fucking Rangers. That's that's the bad part when they block it, and that makes no fucking sense. It's yeah, like, gotta, I'm sorry, I've been dropping the f bombs. I gotta stop. Well, on the F-bomb. The, 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 this is it's something opening really- day, damn We're at the yard. We're at the ballpark. Yeah, this irritates me. Give me a beer. That that that's what irritates me is that you programs, can't even watch- get your programs <laughs> over here, buddy. Yeah. Pretzels, pretzels. You see all the different food they have now. God, that's another thing too. Like I was I was asking about tradition. Like what's some of the food that y'all roll out for opening day, man? Yeah. Or hell, yeah. Ike's, Ike's probably Ike's probably gonna drop about fifty bucks just in food. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I was I was actually watching uh, Fox Seven this morning. They had uh, uh, Tierra Newbaum was at Minute Maid Park, and they were looking at some of the different foods that they have there. And it's like the new shit. stuff for this season, huh? Yeah, for yeah for this season, and it's like crazy. Yeah, I mean it's like all these fancy nachos and all these. Oh, uh, they've God. got Slovak sausage is now a sponsor, so they have what? all these fancy. They have what? What'd you say? The- that Slovak sausage. I, I think that's what the, you said. What the fuck is a Slovak sausage? It's like one of the. It's like one of the most famous German sausages that you can find here in Texas. A sl- Slovak is not German. Slovak is Russian, is it not? Well, hell, I don't know. I'm probably saying the name wrong, but but you can get all these fancy sausage dishes and all this different stuff, wags, and it's like, man. <laughs> It's like, give me a fucking hot dog, man. <laughs> give me a hot dog. Give me some nachos. Give me beer, and, and I'm good to go. Hey, by the way, Friday, Friday, the Round Rock Express fire. There off. you go. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, they're they're taking on who are they taking on? I had it written down somewhere. I, I don't know. Oh, Sugarland. I think that's the Skeeters. Oh, or, hey now. Yeah, I think they're taking on the the Skeeters or whatever they're called. That'll be a Dell Diamond. I read somewhere. I think Vy is supposed to be throwing out the first pitch. That may have been a joke, but. I think VY sitting on that first pitch at the express. Hopefully, 
Oh, and hopefully, I mean, this, you know, of course, that video that we showed you the other day, that happened back in February, I think. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm sure that VY uh, it has recovered and is fine. Again, the punch wasn't really that bad. It knocked VY down. Just the, the manner that it happened. Yeah, yeah. the manner that it happened and the, the disappointing thing that BK alluded to uh, earlier before we came on was the fact that, you know, nobody in, in Vince's crowd actually stood up and, and wrecked that other dude. Like I I'm, I'm a, like you guys know, like I don't, I'm not a fan of jumping up or cowboys jumping up. people. I, I I believe in having it one-on-one, you know, all, all fights should, should stay one-on-one just for one honor, you know, an honorable fight, mm -hmm. but usually that's not how shit goes down. And the guy lost all type of honor when he, you know, decided to sucker punch Vince young when Vince wasn't looking and all, by the way, the altercation was fucking over. Yeah, and the guy, yeah, you know, that, the guy rubs it back up. Don't be a fucking coward. I yeah, mean, that, that is that is that's yeah. that is the epitome of a fucking coward. Yeah, You're yeah, don't, don't, coward. don't be that fucking guy when when somebody turns. And the whole thing is, I mean, the way he did it, I mean, he hit him in the right place. Hey. I mean, if if you want to be a man, it'll, hit him in the it'll, face. It'll, put you, it'll absolutely put you to sleep. Yeah, yeah, hit him in the face and let him fucking hit you back. Let him hit you back, and don't be taking your shirt off, puss. Did did he, uh, he did that after he did? Yeah, he's walking out and he's like classic, taking his, classic taking, hero, taking classic hero right there. The typical classic little hero. man fucking syndrome. Yeah, one hundred percent. All right, well, leading into that, I'm sure they'll appreciate this. Don't forget your new or pre-owned cars, trucks, or SUVs. There is only one place to go. And how about a word from our friends at Covert BKV? I know it's opening day, but you guys be nice to hate. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. That's right. Since 1909, generations of Central Texans and beyond. Nobody beats Cobra Deal. Not now, and sure as hell, not ever. Yeah, I mean, there's a good chance that the Yankees could come out of this first series with no wins, my guy. God, there's a good so. chance that the that the Astros could sweep the Yankees for the opening day ceremonies and series. Wouldn't that be a treat? Wouldn't that be a treat? But back to the food, though. Um, for Baltimore, man. I don't know where you guys. I'm. I'm. You guys got the boomstick for Texas, I believe. I don't know what Houston mm -hmm. has, but mm -hmm. for Baltimore, we don't really have something that's like three feet long or anything like that. Uh, the go-to on Utah Street and Utah spelt like E U T A W. That's how we spell mm -hmm. Utah. There, it's weird. Okay. Um, but anyways, we have sautéed uh, bratwurst, right? Like just sautéed onions and everything done with this bratwurst. Uh, done with uh. Some grilled bratwurst there with a little bit of um, a little bit of old bay sprinkled on it and everything too, man. Give you that, that a little bit of that seafood type of vibe on type on the uh, on the meat as well. And then you put a little bit of lobster imperial in there, do a little surf and turf. My goodness, man, just nothing but greatness at the ballpark there. But of course, you know, seafood's not for everybody, but that's kind of like the Maryland thing or whatnot. But then you got to pay damn fourteen dollars for a fucking beer. I mean, fourteen dollars for a beer, and you know, I will say that you know they're like twenty-two ounces or eighteen ounces or whatnot, but still, man, twenty, you know, fourteen dollars for for any type of beers, you know, just give me the damn case and I'll watch it at my house. My God, <laughs> and, and isn't that the bad part? You know, to where it's like I, I don't care if I'm going to a Cowboy game, an Astros game, a Rangers game, you, you know, whatever it is, e even hockey games. You know, going out to watch the Texas Stars. Usually, if I'm going with with a bunch of dudes. You know, we're, we're gonna slam a few before we get guys there. Being dudes, yeah, you, you're gonna hang. You're gonna, you're gonna slam a few, and then you get there, and you've got all that. Yeah, you know, it's already in you, and and so you want to keep having a few, and it's like, yeah, those those beer prices are just out of control, man. And and I know they don't pay for that, but um, geez, Louise, it's um, yeah. Sam, it so might be it yeah, might be yeah. check, it might be check, but yeah, it's, it's Baltic. West, right? I know one thing, it's fucking Baltic. You know, like slow hockey <laughs> Baltic. It ain't German, that's for sure. Well, it, it, it ain't, the whole thing. It ain't have, Wiener Schnitzel. Wiener Schnitzel. Uh, ha have you noticed with a lot of you know they used to have like dollar beer night? Uh, I think they still. I think like the Express, they still have dollar. Where, hot where do they night. have dollar? Where is there a dollar beer night? The Express used to do that. The Express is used it to flat do that. beer? Is it real beer? Yeah, it was. It was. But You're now a dollar beer. You're getting a dollar beer at a, at a venue. They they used they used to do that. 
I think now it's uh, what? How do they promote it now? We need to get Chris Almondaris on here, and we can get it how right. everything works. But now it's like um, I think they just call it uh, Lesser Beer Night because it ain't a fucking dollar. <laughs> hey, what's I, I, I haven't heard any news with uh, with the damn Express? Is Harge call? Is Harge going to be the the um, play by play for the Express now? The Cappy's out. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I saw that Cappy was gone. Um, I saw that uh, I saw that Harge was on the call. I think at, last night. I guess it was with uh, with uh, the goat with Craig Way. You know, oh, over at okay. uh, for okay. that. So I mean, if he can if he can get into that, I mean, that, that's a great gig to fall in right there. But I think Craig usually has. Um, he's got he's his. Got usual. He usually got Roger, right? Yeah, Roger or uh, Keith Moreland. I think. Uh, oh yeah, the, yeah. Well, Red, Keith Red, Red, does Longhorn Network on TV, so it's like. I, don't I, know. Thought, I thought Moreland and Zeke usually do uh, Longhorn Network, and then Craig and Roger do something else, man. But hell, I could have my could have my broadcasters wrong. Anyways, man, make sure you're watching. Uh, you know the Longhorns. You know this year for for baseball, and also you know uh, Lady Longhorns continue their success. But also, you make sure you watch your Major League Baseball clubs and your hockey clubs as well with audiovisual consultations. Five one two two five five eight six seven eight. That's avconsultations.com. If you want the two TV setup and arcade units that I have behind me or the, the four TVs that BK has and maybe the Dream Theater that I have downstairs, ask Tom about that Sonus surround sound system as well, man. Make sure that you can hear every pitch and all the grunts and moans there on the ball field. And, you know, you got to make sure that you're hearing the grunts and moans on the 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 gridiron too when we don't have any more drop hip you know hip hip tackles and stuff like that you got to do it with audio visual consultations 512-255-8678 that's avconsultations.com wags yo all, all of this baseball fun all of this baseball fun sweet 16 sweet 16 my man yeah i mean do we i mean i guess we got to talk about that too yeah we're off tomorrow yeah remember that sucks yeah we're going to have to all right well, <laughs> my my picks um you got you got your boy you got your wolf pack here going up against uh going up against the eagles the marquette eagles what do you what are you thinking here rodney you think the wolf pack actually continue to success and take down shock smart and the the marquette eagles yeah i really think they do i, I think that they are and, and and looking at what we have tonight i've got every matchup tonight i've got it picked that far except for clemson and arizona and that's what's ruined my bracket as i had those two going out way early but i've got everything else right there but i, I think that nc state is going to be that team that they're i mean they really are the only one at this point that's going to be the one uh the bracket buster you know that there's no team of destiny i guess if there is they're they're the only ones because you look at it i mean you got all the damn near all the ones and twos in there i mean san diego state at number five taking on uconn that's a rematch of wasn't that the national champion was that the national championship so you got a rematch happening right there so you got that happening that this this is very much a chalk uh sweet 16 right here other than nc state if you kind of believed in them a little bit well i mean dj horns like Look, man. I mean, DJ Horn's been able to to keep the magic going there for the Wolf Pack there, and then Middlebrooks is Middlebrooks has been playing, you know, out of his gourd. Uh, and I, I forget the big man, the the big guy that's for NC State too. But I just read that he's got a fucking vending machine uh, <laughs> business that he actually has on the side. So yeah. um, I can't remember that dude's last name, but he, anyways, he's he's kind of built like a built like a Robert Trailer or, or built like a just a dominant. Uh, centerpiece face he's just hard to move man he's hard to get off his spot there but the thing was with the wolf pack you think the magic is going to be running out look you're going up against guys like, like cam cam jones is, is one of the best guards in the damn nation here man so dj moore is going to have his his uh his hands full that's or dj horn rather is going to have his his hands full that's for sure um I, I i'd love to sit here and say that your your boys are going to shock the world here your wolf pack pick is going to shock the world here but i think yeah. shock, i think shock and his crew stays in the game here um mark marquette's a good squad like i know yeah. a lot of people thought that they'd be exiting stage right just because of shaka's mo and in, in the tournament or whatnot but it looks like they got things solidified and i think marquette's going to continue to roll yeah I, I believe so i mean i think it was either going to be for marquette it was going to be one of two things a very early exit or a deep run and it looks like it's going to be the latter uh what they're doing right now so I, i'd love to i'd love to ask you because i know that that you've been a uh, you know, a huge proponent of, of the Houston Cougars. So, so looking at the number ones that Going are up against wet, Duke, man, they're like uh, Dukes. Are, are they Duke the most Duke. acceptable number one at this point? The Cougars? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I, I still yeah. think, I mean, they're going to have, you know, they're going to be rested um, from the other night. Uh, get that, that hell of a bout that they went up, 
you know, the other night against Texas A&M. Here's the thing, though, right? I think, I, I think the the film is out for Houston. I think people people know now what we knew, and that's to take Houston deep, and that's to try and get them in foul trouble and get them deep. Um, expect uh, Filipowski to be bound, banging it and, and just trying to destroy and own that paint. Uh, as best as he can because he's going to have one hell of a rotation to go up against with the forwards there uh, with Roberts, Francis, and, and, and Trugler. Um, they will make it absolutely uh, absolutely grueling for or for Duke. But here's the thing. Like, if Duke if Duke can't – or excuse me, if Houston can't get past this test with Filipowski yeah. – now, I, again, this is clear. This is Captain Obvious speaking, right? How are they going to battle with, with you know, a, a stud or a stalwart like Zach Eady and Purdue? Um, yeah. now you, you guys have, I've been beating Zach Eady up a lot, rightfully. So, um, I, he's, he's a Goliath playing with Davids. He just is. Um, and until he can hit a turnaround hook shot, you know, nine out of 10 times instead of four out of 10 times, um, uncontested, uh, I'm, I'm going to continue to say that he's not exactly the, the best skilled center in the game. He's just a benefit of being, you know, two feet taller than everybody else. But yeah. anyways, if they can't handle the, the little matchup here with Duke, they're going to struggle continuing going forward. Obviously, that's for sure. Um, the mo is out, like I just said. You know, get Houston deep as much as you can. But Houston's just got the dudes, man. Um, I mean, Shed, Cryer, Wilson. I mean, that's the, how we've named their front court. Now we're talking about their back court. And when Cryer's, if if you you know you get a chance to get you know a hand in the face of of Cryer, you know you're going to leave Wilson considerably wide open because he's just the length that this guy has. He can shoot all, over almost anybody. This is. This is my favorite squad, man. They're not just my favorite squad. I think they're the most, you know, the most balanced and toughest squad as well. They can play fast. They play, you know, they play great half court as well. Um, Houston's the team, man. And I think Houston soars by Duke. Yeah, and and I love here, you know, what uh, the conversation happening uh, over on the uh, YouTube chat, you know, about Hurley talking about, I mean, the confidence that he has in his team. I mean, yeah, it's a really good team, but I mean, this is where this is where San Diego State. I mean, they're going to take this with bulletin board material, and and, and I mean, can, I can they? Kind of scores over San Diego State, man. They're, just, they're just way too good. I mean, it's like it's the stupid excuse that I gave when we first talked about this when I said Gonzaga is going to or uh, Gonzaga when when I said that UConn was going to win this, and you're like. Like why and I said they're just too good. I mean they're just too good. Curious to watch Purdue and, and uh, Purdue and Gonzaga. I think that that's one. I, I think you and I both were kind of on the same page when this all started that Purdue was for the taking. I think the Zags are going to get them, Wags. I think the, I feel that too. If the, the, the Zags, Zags are a fundamentally sound squad. I didn't think much of them going into the tournament, right? But then you know I've watched them play a few, uh, you know, a few. Uh, games here and mark few still got the the guys coached up these mm -hmm. you know this team still plays gonzaga basketball regardless of the studs you know sugs not being there anymore and or, or timmy you know not being there anymore you know every you know, uh holmgren all you know all the, the the nba talent that's no longer there anymore uh it doesn't matter because they're still able to play gonzaga basketball man they do all the little things right that usually calculate in the big wins so uh mm -hmm. yeah i can i can see them knocking off purdue here yeah, and I've got I've got Creighton. Not just got, not just the fact that I want them to knock off Purdue. I can see them knocking off. Purdue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. I've got I've got Creighton in, in the national championship. So they get Rick Barnes. So we'll take a look here and see what what Rick Barnes and Tennessee are able to do here. I think Tennessee kind of the same thing with with Rick and with Shaka, where it's like it was either going to be a flame out right at the beginning, or you're going to go deep. And obviously they're going deep here. But man, this, this Creighton team's pretty solid. And that's the late game tomorrow night. That's going to be worth staying up for. So. I think Creighton is solid, but here's the thing: like, I don't expect Connect to have a game like he had uh, the other night um, against Texas. Like, I, you, know, he was off. You know, I mean, the worst game I've ever seen. You know, Ziegler and uh, Connect play, as a matter of yeah. fact. So you can't expect that Tennessee shoots 12 percent from the three point line again. You'd, you'd like to think that that's going to be a lot better going up against Creighton. Um, and when you're the, you know, regardless of of conference uh caliber or whatnot when you're the leading you know conference score you'd like to think that that's going to bode well for you and your squad I, I like the balls here over Creighton. hey wags and you know i, I remember balls vividly play, the balls play absolute banger defense too everybody knows rick barnes identity you oh know, yeah play oh, fantastic yeah. Defense. oh yeah last week when we were talking about trying to break this bracket down and we were looking at everything but both of us we were like what about alabama here they are right here they are, right? I, I thought maybe Auburn Quietly. would be 
I thought Auburn would be, you know, the the strongest that's, SEC team left. I um, but I mean, you know, the aforementioned Tennessee, they're still uh, they're still rocking and rolling. But yeah, Alabama, Alabama was the eye. It was my eye scratcher going into Me this. Too. Like, how far does Alabama actually go without you know the studs that they had last year, the NBA talent that they had last year? Um, and sure enough, they're still surviving, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, surviving mm-hmm. advance, and um, I don't see Alabama continuing to make it past this round, though, man. Um, I do have, yeah, I got them bowing out. They gone, they gone after this round. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's been a good run for them, but I I do think it ends. Hey hey guys, before we go to, it's only an hour. If you want to get rewarded for listening to Texas sports unfiltered, our friends at autograph co-founded by Congressman Tom Brady are redefining the fan experience by letting users earn points for acts of fandom. They take every day, like listening to us right here, live and local, 8 to 5, every day right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. The Autograph app gives you access to your favorite Longhorn content all in one place, exclusive rewards like exclusive merchandise, tickets, and more. You're already listening to TSU guys, and we know that there are so many of you as we get closer and closer to that 8,000 subscriber and follower, and help us get there, by the way, as we get into baseball season. You might as well earn points for it. Head over to the App Store, uh, Google Play, or over to your uh, App Store uh, there with Apple, uh, and just search for Autograph, like we say, Autograph, just like this, Autograph. Download that app for free today using the referral code TSU. That's like Texas Sports Unfiltered, TSU. Use that referral code you can also find that link in the youtube description down below as well get rewarded for being a tsu listener and subscriber it is the autograph app free to you all to use so with this alabama game right now like i I, i'm pretty sure that you know most of the national pundits kind of have it even which is just weird right because you'd think that you know north carolina being the one they'd be able to you know to knock the hell out of uh uh, the Crimson Tide here. Uh, look, though, Sears has been playing fantastic. Uh, Mark Sears, you, when we talk about, you know, making a, a deep run in, in March Madness, right, usually you got to do it with a – you, you got to have one hell of a point guard or, you know, one type of guard in your backcourt that can pretty much put the team on their back and, and carry it. Uh, up to this point, it's been Mark Sears for Alabama, right? Um, but, he look, the, the – the challenge that he has in front of him going up against RJ Davis and the, I mean, Baycott too, like then Baycott's not exactly, you, you know, a stud, you know, underneath, right. but he's just a huge right. body, right? Yeah. Like, like North Carolina is just, they're, they're long, they're big and they do Arch all the little things. I thought, yeah, I thought, yeah exactly. I talk about, you know, little things doing little things, right. They usually contribute into big victories. That's what, that, that is the identity, the epitome of North Carolina basketball this year, all the little things, right. Every, every little thing that they do on uh, sequence down, usually, you know, computes and equates into uh, into like a victory, uh, you know, a half, uh, you know, a ten minute victory, yeah. or you know, a, a victory of of going on an eight eight to nothing run here or whatever. It's the little things that contribute that usually add up to allowing them to be win, uh, allowing them to be, to be so successful there. And that's why they're the number one seed, and that's why I got them going past Alabama today. Well, and Wags, it, it's like we talk about with uh, with UConn. I mean, they do all the little things like that that you're talking about. They do all of that right. Archie Their rotations Davis, are great. Like Archie, yeah. Yeah. Archie Davis is one of the best game guards in in the nation. Absolutely. Like it's gonna be it's gonna be really hard to this is gonna be a good match between Sears yeah. and Davis. I'd like to yep. see this breakdown. And and then the late game tonight. And and I know that uh double D has mentioned this. We've heard it from a couple of other different folks as well. Iowa State and Illinois, man. I, Iowa State that number two seed they I got, really I got Iowa State going past Illinois. Yeah, I do too. I do too. And this this may be the the cyclones right here coming out of the Big 12 that may be the team that that I mean they're a number two seed but I mean I, I think if Iowa State got to the national championship that, that would be a stunner. I actually had BYU, I actually had BYU in this game. I had I had BYU representing um over uh instead of Illinois as well, but I also had Iowa State coming out of this over BYU. So yeah. Um yeah, I thought BYU was going to make a stronger push, but you know, uh, clearly they surprised everybody by exiting so early. Um but yeah, this game was, was for my pick was supposed to be Iowa State over BYU. Um but yeah, I got Iowa State going up in, until the next round where they are predicted to play UConn. Yeah, and then that's where I have, you know, UConn taking out Iowa State. But uh, you know, it, it's a one hell of a, a ride for Iowa State, man. You like to think so. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that that they can get past Illinois here, the fi- fighting Illini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some good matchups uh, the next couple of days as we set the uh, Sweet 16. Uh, Going to be a lot of fun to watch. But I got to say, I'm a little, I'm a little more jazzed. I'm glad that the baseball starts early. 
to get your 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 dose of opening day baseball, and then you can kind of work yourself into the Sweet 16. And and of course, good luck to the uh, uh, Texas uh, women as well, as uh, they set off into the Sweet 16. And uh, Vic Schaefer and his team they looked locked and loaded and ready to make a push as well. That's going to be a pretty sweet 16 or pretty sweet sweet 16 to watch as well. Um, South Carolina, I think they're all chasing, and and of course uh, you can't uh, count out uh, Miss Clark and her group. So it, it, it's going to be going to be a pretty cool ride, I think here. Um, also, UConn's playing. Uh, Becker's is is back, and she looks fantastic. She looks like she hasn't missed a beat. She's coming off of that injury, um, where she missed uh, I, th- I think she missed most of the damn season, as a matter of mm-hmm. fact. Uh, but anyways, man, Becker's is back. Um, we talked about how good Stanford is. We talked about how good um, you know, South Carolina is, and then of course you got the ladies down there at LSU that to get wild as well with kim Malky's crew so look it's a good woman's it's a good woman's season or a good woman's tournament as well man a lot of good basketball to watch a lot of good baseball getting ready to uh to open for opening day getting ready to, to be thrown out there as, as well so make sure you guys are tuning in to all your sports you know hit up tom mccain all the visual consultations you guys know the drill man he'll get you primed and ready for all your baseball and all your basketball uh but look um want to talk a little bit more real quick about opening day hell man before you know jeff and jordan get on i know that the birds open it up look remember the prop bet that we were talking about the race to 10 you guys if, if you haven't gotten it in already man now the dodgers do have one little bit of a head start just because they got the first victory of course but look if you break down this schedule for the orioles i'm telling you right now if you want some easy green in your pocket there's a good chance that the orioles can be the first team to 10 victories they got a uh, they got this series with Anaheim that you think that they could come out of here probably with a good little sweep or maybe with a gentleman sweep. And then they also got the Royals right after this. That is hell that that's damn six, maybe seven games on their way to 10 games right out of the gate. Good chance mm-hmm. to put some money in your pocket. If you bet on the Orioles for the race of 10, man, that's for sure. All right, let's bring the boys on here. Um, it is time for it's only an hour. Let's bring Jeff and Jordan on. What's up, Jeff? What's up, Jordan? How are we doing, guys? What's up, Tony got on that uh, race to ten. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. He, he doesn't. He, he's never bet on baseball once in his life. Doesn't even know what betting never. is. Jeff, didn't even so. know. He doesn't didn't know what even betting. Know. Come on. He doesn't even know what betting is. Didn't you hear him? Don't you believe him? God, he wouldn't tell a lie. I was born at night. I wasn't born last night. I'm telling maybe, you, my guy. I'm telling maybe you. maybe he'll go in a slump because he's so crushed that his friend fucked him over. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, his friend bet on Yamamoto the one day. That's for sure. That's why Yamamoto put up five runs in the first. Don't it's all adding up now, guys. Yeah. I heard something wild, uh, Wags. I'll, I'll address you since you're the seam head of the group. Uh, it was talking about kind of the the fall of Mike Trout, if you will, and like how at this point in his career, like he's healthy. He's healthy. When you think of Mike Trout, like what what big Mike Trout moment do you think of? And like I've had people bring the argument to me, like, well, you know, Griffey never won a title. I'm like, yeah, but you can remember like, you know, big playoff games and, and big Dude. moments where Ken Griffey Jr. did big things. Like, is Mike is is the most significant baseball moment of Mike Trout's career getting struck out by Otani? And that's where I think you're. I, that's where I think it's at, bro. I think the the biggest thing I've seen Mike Trout do is getting struck out by Mike or uh, by Shohei Otani, man. I in, mean, that's the kinda, game. It's, it's sad to think about, but that's kind of it's sad that the first thing people are going to think about maybe the greatest talent of this generation is oh yeah I get struck out by Otani in the World Baseball Classic. Well, I, mean, I think uh, you know it's that old adage: you're only as good as your last trip, right? Yeah, that's kind of that's the last trip that I remember for Mike Trout is you know him walking out to that plate and Otani Look, setting them down, man. I I want Mike Trout to get traded just because I want a postseason with Mike Trout. Yeah, as long as it's not to the effing Yankees, then, right. or the Dodgers, I'm good, man. No, I'll sign that. But you know damn well he's probably going to end up as, in the pinstripes. That's for sure. It's just just that's that's a Brian Cashman move, man. Going out and getting Mike Trout, you know, hell crush me. I, I didn't think that I'd see Soto in that lineup, and sure as shit, Soto's in that lineup. So, God, dude, I hate I hate the Yankees. Yep, me too. Me <laughs> now we love you, but we don't like your crew. That's for sure, dude. Uh, Wags, you you've got a lot to celebrate, man. Uh, it's it's gonna be a good season for Hopefully. Orioles baseball. That's man. what I'm. So it's it's a little bit weird this year. It's a little bit weird today. Like usually, you you go into opening day thinking, all right, you know. It's gonna. It's not gonna be five hundred, but you know we're not gonna. You know we're not gonna win the pennant now with expectations of there's a probability that the Orioles can win the pennant. I don't like this feel. I don't like coming out here and <laughs> I, I don't. I, I, I don't like optimism. Dog. 
my guy. I much prefer being the underdog. <laughs> hey, real oh, quick, Jackson Holiday. Right. Jackson Holiday did not make their opening day roster. No, no, he's down. No. Okay, no, he's down. Yeah, they, that's they a good thing. Though. That 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 lets you know that you know the Orioles. If the Orioles don't need Jackson Holiday right now, that's a good sign for the Orioles. Jeff Wag sounds like a Cowboy fan. He's waiting for the wheels to fall off before the car even takes off. <laughs> that's that's how, that's how you it's have to root for the Dallas guys. football Cowboys, Rodney. You know that. Like it's, it's, a, it's a weird spot. This is this is definitely a different feeling, a different vibe on opening day. It's a good Char- it's a Charlie good vibe, Brown, but it's, like, it's an uneasy vibe. That's like right. Charlie Brown waiting to charge the football. You're like, I know this some bitch is getting pulled out. Yeah, he's gonna pull it right, right out. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, guys. Well, hopefully you guys right, have a great show, man. We'll be listening, guys. Uh, make sure you stay tuned. I'm gonna have you guys on one screen while i got the orioles on the other screen so you guys know the drill man you guys have a great thursday we'll see well actually we won't have a great easter you guys yeah Yeah. everybody you know celebrate the passover and everything and be good guys have a great have a great opening day and a great march madness later boys see ya fellas we don't we don't have shows tomorrow you you didn't get that memo no i guess not i don't know uh they didn't I don't know. Maybe I missed it. <laughs> Shit, it makes my job easier because I got to stand outside and watch kids run in circles for a long time tomorrow. I got Texas relays tomorrow. So, oh, did you get that? My plan. Out? Yeah, I did. We're we're good. Uh, my my plan was just knock out the show because I don't got to be over at the track till about one fifteen, one thirty. So you uh, you almost pulled a, a move that one of your mentors, Snoop Daniel, was famous for pulling, which is don't apply for the credential. And just show up and try to finagle your way in. That that it worked for Snoop until it did. <laughs> At Texas relays, or are you just saying no, in general? He was usually good about final credentials. I want to say it was like maybe I wasn't maybe UIL State basketball. Oh he yeah, forgot GG. To apply for, he forgot to apply for a credential and just kind of snuck his way down there, hoping things would work out, and things didn't work out. So. Yeah, but anyway, Jordan, you you have any interest in Major League Baseball whatsoever? Uh, no, not really. I'll be honest. Baseball is like the first sport I got into when I was a little kid, and actually, out of all the sports I played, baseball is probably the one that uh, my future was in. <laughs> but uh, once I got to like fourth, fifth grade, and it was like kid p- kids pitching instead of uh, coaches, mm-hmm. your boy wasn't as strong. Still pretty strong though. Um, but I want to play basketball. I was tired. Uh, I did baseball. I did fall ball, spring ball. And like, while I was like on like the top, like travel teams or whatever. Yeah. I just, I wasn't having fun and it it was just boring to me sitting and waiting in the outfield and yeah, it was too slow paced to me. So I kind of went all in on basketball, um, and got out of baseball, but but yeah, no, I knew, I knew tomorrow was good Friday, but I assumed we would still have shows. Uh, I don't know. I just assumed. who was your favorite ball player growing up? Your favorite baseball player? Shit, man. So I didn't necessarily, I think, have a, a player. Um, my dad lived in – so my dad's born and raised in Austin, but he lived in Chicago for a handful of years. And when he did, he uh, had season tickets to Cubs games. Okay. And so I was raised a, a Cubs fan by my pops. Uh, he also, uh, again, grew up in Austin, was born in Houston. Um and then moved to Austin after three years. So he pulls to the Astros too, but I never really had any affiliation there. But yeah, not necessarily a favorite player. If I had to pencil it down to one, probably Sterling Castro. Uh, I remember he wore 13 for the Cubs. Damn, okay. um, so, but yeah, I haven't watched baseball uh, legitimately in a long, long time. Um, in fact, the only baseball I really watch is whenever the Longhorns make the College World Series and someone in my house would have it on. But that, that was about it, man. Just the, the same reasons I don't really enjoy watching or the same reasons I stopped playing it. It's just so goddamn slow. <laughs> and I know the pitch clock has sped everything up, but still, like, man, unless I'm, like, at a ballpark with, like, a beer in my hand, I'm probably not going to enjoy, like, baseball. Like, it's just slow, boring. I don't know. Not me. I love, I love going to ball games. Uh, my daughter loves going to baseball games. Uh, you know, I, my favorite player growing up, well, without question, I, I grew up in a good era for baseball, you know, because my and I, I got some I got some some of the rookie cards floating around my office. But Frank Thomas, Jeff Bagwell, Ricky Henderson, Chipper Jones, Daryl Strawberry. I loved Jose Canseco, loved the A's early on. But man, the, my favorite player, it's like asking anybody, get a kid my age, who's your favorite basketball player? My favorite baseball player, without question, it's George Kenneth Griffey Jr., no question. 
the, the freaking goat. Um, yeah, yeah man. It's, but it's, you know what? Funny, someone brought up Josh Hamilton because whenever the Rangers went to the World Series like four years in a row, that also might have been my favorite player. Um, but yeah, I'd pull for the Rangers during that stretch just because that was kind of the stretch I was interested in baseball, and the Cubs sucked. Um, and it was, you know, a Texas team and, you know, versus, versus the Cardinals, Albert Pujols, like we're going to root for the Texas team, right? So I mean, that, that's um, one guy. So like card collecting, I said, has gotten me back into baseball, it's kind of rekindled my my love for baseball. But I get asked the question every now and then, like, hey, who's one guy that you couldn't have a card of or you just like can't? Pujols is that guy for me as an Astros fan. I just can't do it. And, like, I took my daughter. It was the second game I took her to. It was a 2019 season. The Astros were playing the Angels. I'm like, all right. I mean, this is cool. She can get to see, you know, all the, the great Angels players are going to the Astros say. She won't remember it, but she can say she was there. And, man, Pujols was just hitting, like, right around 200 just on the struggle bus toward the end. And I'll be damned if he didn't go yard and have, like, a another RBI double. I'm like, no matter – Old ass decrepit Albert Pujols is still gonna be raking against the Astros. Slapping dingers, like it, uh, yeah. he broke Brad Lidge, man. But uh, yeah. I man, think Jake Arrieta was strong too. I saw Coach Four Twenty talk about how he saw him the yeah. other week. Um, I remember him because man, it, it, the time I watched the Cubs most was probably like again when Sterling Castro was there and they sucked. Mm -hmm. um, but what would have been. Yeah, my eighth grade year, that was when the Cubs went to uh, the World Series and won. In yeah. 2016, I was in the eighth grade. So I hadn't watched baseball for a few years by then. But I remember during that playoff run, I watched almost all their games with my dad. So, yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm a Niners fan in the Cubs. The Cubs is through my dad. Niners is through uh, Madden. And I, I stuck with it. But, but yeah, man. So, yeah. So uh, Coach 420 will be happy to know because I, I saw some, some of his comments a little earlier. My brother is a Yankees fan. My brother's an unabashed you know, New York Yankees fan. He loves the Yankees. I hate the Yankees. But when my wife and I, we went on vacation in New York in 2012, I did do the Yankee Stadium Tour. Because I stayed in a new stadium. It was about three or four years old at that point. We did the stadium tour. And because if I'm a mark for anybody besides Ken Griffey Jr., it's Babe Ruth, man. I, I cannot get enough knowledge and stories and tidbits about Babe Ruth and like going through, you go through Yankee stadium and you just appreciate the history. Like, dude, like that's, that's a bat Babe Ruth use or like, that's, that's, you know, Mickey Mantle's, you know, the chair that Mickey Mantle used to sit in in his locker. Like it's, it's crazy. It just makes, it makes you appreciate history, but no, the Brian Cashman, uh, air, this whole, you know, the, the post Steinbrenner era, the Derek Jeter, core four era I'd, I'd piss on all that stuff as far as the yankees go um but at, yeah. at any rate man yeah I'm, I'm i don't i don't like the yankees i don't like the freaking yankees and they're like just getting juan soto and i know they're probably gonna end up with trout but it, it is what it is at this point that's just par for the course and the dodgers i did a co-host radio show with the biggest dodgers fan i know which is one craig way so mm -hmm. uh, i know craig's happy for for opening day um you want to hear a funny craig white dodger story jordan i love to hear it so remember the old saturday night live skits i'm sure you've seen the youtube videos where uh norm mcdonald is burt reynolds and then he changes his name on the jeopardy deal to turd ferguson so don't think i've seen it but okay i'm following man, along i'm following be called turd ferguson so the dodgers had a relief pitcher named caleb ferguson that whenever uh Craig came in and I think he had I think he had saved a game and Craig's like man Ferguson was really good last night I'm like give me Tur uh, Turd Ferguson Craig's like no Caleb Ferguson so I just kept calling him Turd Ferguson and at some point uh Craig ended up calling him Turd Ferguson so Caleb Ferguson for like the last two or three years he was a Dodger he was Turd Ferguson Craig referred to him as Turd Ferguson because I was doing a bit I wouldn't let it go and I finally got Craig to convert so there you go Caleb Ferguson no longer a Dodger yeah, no, man, I uh, I haven't been paying it. The, the like the most attention I've paid to the sport of baseball has been all the memes I've been seeing from Otani's press conference, where people, <laughs> bro, I was laughing my ass off at the one someone uh did a voiceover for him where it clearly wasn't him talking, but it was like 
The fuck you talking about? Alabama's a football school. We're hammering four and a half for UNC, baby. So is it like <laughs> uh, I forget the movie, but is it like the the Hitler clip where everybody's just gonna fill in like whatever, whatever they yeah, want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. gonna be the Otani deal from now on. Yeah, I yeah, like that. It, I dig it. I'm, you know me, man. I'm all about a good bit, so I'm, I I want to go. I want to see some of those whenever they pop up. Yeah, but no, I we're. Was, uh, can you imagine the pressure the new translators under from like oh everyone? My gosh, man, <laughs> like, <laughs> geez, uh, and also like just how awkward that has to be because like he. The fact that he needs a translator, right? You, you kind of are forced to become best friends with him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, just I can't even imagine being in this guy's shoes um, and taking that job. Like, how many people do you think turned it down before this guy was like, "Yeah, yeah, fuck it, I'll do it." <laughs> that's what makes that's what makes covering baseball. At least when I covered in the minors, that's what made it so unique because you got guys from all over the world, uh, especially from Latin America, and I remember. Uh, I just because I was I mean I'm running a local newspaper. I don't need to interview him, but Felix Hernandez was 18 years old in Double A, and you could see it already. Like, yeah, this dude's gonna be a freaking All Star Cy Young candidate unless something injury wise goes horribly wrong. And I wanted to interview him, and one of the guys that he was in San Antonio at the time with the missions, and one of the guys that was with the Mariners was like, "Yeah, you 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 can't interview him," and I'm like, "Why?" And is it because he won't understand it? He doesn't understand English and we don't, you know, we don't have an interpreter. I'm like, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go, go into the clubhouse and talk to him and see what's up. And I mean, it was, he was, you could tell he was still learning the language. It was broken English, but as long as, it, as long as you were asking baseball questions, it, it was fine. Like we had a normal conversation. If you like veered off and tried to ask something like big picture, like macro view, he had a little bit of trouble understanding it, and the translation was a little rough. But, man, if you just asked, if I was asking, like, hey, you know, how have you developed your curveball? He could tell you about working on the curveball. He could tell you about working on the fastball. He could tell you about his bullpens and the, what the plan the Mariners had for him. So that's what's cool. But I say that to say I remember when Ichiro came over, uh, people were wondering, like, how okay, how are we going to communicate with him because he doesn't speak English, but – what the Latin ball players in Seattle found out, Ichiro spoke fluent Spanish, so they were able to communicate with him no problem. Interesting. So it, the language deal with baseball has always fascinated me. But you know, I actually had an Ichiro Mariners like shirt jersey at one point. Did I you? remember that. Yeah, God, Ichiro was so badass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jake. Yeah, that's that's what it was. Um, to answer CB. I got a I got a bunch of Ken Griffey Jr. rookie cards. I got all of the the base rookie cards. Score Score Bowman, uh, the Donruss Fleer, and then the upper deck one is uh, on display at my office. Something light. Um, how do I feel about Smith or Rugbo? Haven't actually been able to see him in person. Um, he's kind of one of those rare kids that no one has seen. Actually, I don't think anyone in the industry has gone out to see him at a Leaf Hastings and. Uh, you know, he doesn't go to any camps, showcases. So um, I don't have anything planned on when I'll be in Houston next, but I've been looking at the calendar because I'm going to be home in Dallas for about a two and a half week stretch uh, next month. And I was thinking about getting down to Houston for a couple of days, catching some training sessions, maybe hitting some schools. And Man. and he was a guy I was going to try to see. Uh, he's, if, if I'm under the impression, I believe he has his OV for Texas already booked. Um can't remember the dates off the top of my head because I didn't – I just checked his profile. I didn't add it to his profile, but I'm pretty sure he has an OV dates already um, selected. But he he's one of those kids that, uh, you know, I'll be honest. We just – we got to find out more information about. Um, I do have a source close to him that is you know, been telling me he's pretty damn open. So <laughs> that's kind of why I've not necessarily been slow playing, going over to see him at a school, but, you know, I, I haven't felt – a sense of urgency too quite yet um but sometime in the next few weeks i'll get over there see him um and all that because he's obviously a top 247 prospect um and he's gonna be a big deal uh for texas and other schools recruiting him so um yeah out of anyone you could have asked me in 25 that's actually probably one of the guys that you know is the least known about so uh looking forward to finding out more um 
man, I was trying to look, and I don't think I'm that far off. It's either Roderick, it's either Rod Wright or Donnie Avery. Way, way, way back when was the last big time prospect to come out of A. Leaf Hastings. That's been 20, 20 years ago. So Hastings Hastings hadn't exactly been like a recruiting hotbed. We had, no, nobody in the industry's had a real reason to go over there of late. So that's kind of nice when you get guys from schools that you know nobody's been to in a while. And Hastings oh, yeah. is one of those. Let's see. I'm pulling up their notable alumni on on Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah I mean the the only two that really stand out are Rod Wright and Donnie Avery. The fuck, Maxo Cream went to <laughs> what? Interesting. Maxo Cream's a rapper. Um, they had two. They had two people who competed in the 2016 Olympics. <laughs> okay. This is interesting, and Rod Wright is on here, and it doesn't even mention Texas or that he coaches. It's just Canadian Canadian Football, football, football League player. player. Oh, yeah, that's not how I rem- I don't remember. Yeah, so Rod, if you get wind of this, I I don't remember your CFL career. Much more remember your Texas career. But yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Donnie Avery was 03. Thank you, uh, thank you, Antoine. I knew Rod Wright was 02. I didn't know what your Donnie Avery graduated. But Jordan, let's let's keep talking about it, man. Uh, if you've been to Horns twenty four seven this morning, you know it's Thursday, so the stampede drops. We drop part one this morning. Part two will be up at some point in the twelve o'clock hour. Uh, I've been editing that thing, getting it ready, so it'll be up. It'll basically be some recruiting stuff along with a position by position overview of the Texas offense. Posted part one this morning. That's how much information is in there. We had to break it into two parts. Uh, it was a position by position view of the defense and Jordan, I just want to mention this, that, that chip wrote it, it let off the insider just because it's something that we talked about yesterday and, and kind of how that, the defense the interior defensive line, that defensive tackle position last year was the unquestioned strength of this team. And now it might be the biggest question mark, not because of the talent, but just because of the unknown factor. I don't, to me, that's not that when you look at, and, and you, you know, you got a, a an eye test. You got to eyeball this roster. I don't think that's that outlandish of a take to say that interior D line is the biggest question mark. Considering when you look around at the other positions, I mean, you've got a lot of proven commodities at pretty much every other position. That's the one where, man, if something happens to one of your starters, what do you do? Just to reiterate, I would be absolutely shocked. And I don't use that word very often. Absolutely shocked if not very long after the portal opens, we don't hear something about Texas and a defensive lineman somewhere. Yes. Um, ag- agree with what you said. Um, I don't think it's questionable at all to say that that's the uh, the position group with the biggest question mark next to it. Yeah. Um, I mean, dude, like, Statistically, the two best players on the team last year were at that position. Right. Right. And they're gone. Um, and that is PFF is what I'm talking about statistically. The two highest graded uh, interior D linemen in the nation both played at Texas last year. And, you know, think about it. Who's replacing them? Alfred Collins, who has shown flashes, you know, through the roof, but has never been consistent once in his career. Right. The only thing he's been consistent at is being inconsistent. True. So, on the other hand, you have Vernon Broughton, who's been nails whenever he's gotten his limited action. He's been pretty damn good. Yeah. Um, Quiet, quietly, Vernon Broughton had a, a good year last year, I thought. And actually, you can correct me if I'm wrong, just off the top of my head, I think his best game was probably the game you were at. It was either U of H or the TCU game. One of those two games were his two best games last year. Yeah, I it's funny you bring that up. Like I I really so whenever I go to a game, I'm taking thousands of photos, right? And I'm looking at them as as I'm taking them and then I'm looking at them for an extended period of time once I'm editing them. Um and I really I don't, like realize his impact that game even though he was coming off, you know, the bench. I went yeah. back and watched the highlights and different things. I'm like he actually kind of felt like he played a more than he usually does and at a higher level than he usually does. So I just thought it was interesting you brought that up as well. But, man, Ed, Vernon's been really good in his small sample size, but it's, you know, about going from 
being the guy who's coming off the bench with fresh legs versus the lineman who just had to block Tavondre and Byron for 10 yeah. plays. Yeah. So being the guy who's going starter to starter, right? So those are going to be your two. You're also going to need some of that Dre Bledsoe, man. It's been two years. Um, obviously, you know, if you're a regular on the show, you probably know well about Dre Bledsoe's uh, background upbringing. Came from the two-way levels. Um was actually behind in, in school. There was some question marks on if he'd even be able to get into Texas originally. And then he got so ahead in school, he was able to early enroll. Yeah. So uh, a great story there. Um, That's the first, by the way, for me that I've heard of. I've never heard of a guy being – Going from borderline academically to he's an early enrollee. Yeah, man, it, it 2024, a lot's possible. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it, a two-way player, we always knew he was going to need a lot of time at Texas before he's playable, just, just like any other player that comes from the two-way level needs, especially one that's bigger, faster, stronger than everyone at that level as a you know an NFL body and alignment, right? So, um, have I been pleased with Bledsoe? Yes. Um, you know, I think physically he's developed. He's come a long way since he first got to Texas. Um, I think some people would have liked to see something from him by now, but at the same note, you weren't going to take Devondre Sweat or Murphy or the other guys off the field to play Bledsoe. Mm -hmm. And so those are the three main guys we know most about. And then you have the transfer, transfer Savea. Uh, you know, you, you've addressed Savea on the show. We're expecting him to make an impact, but we're not expecting him to, you know, be a, a the leader by any means in that in that room or the main uh, contributor in that room by any means. So that's four guys, and then you have four more: uh, Sadir Mitchell, Alex January, um, Aaron Bryant, Zach Swanson. I don't think I missed anyone. Um, so that that's eight scholarship defensive linemen. And again, you had to replace the two best in the country last year. So. That is 1,000%, uh, at least a position group I have the most question marks about. And, you know, uh, like you said, I would bet a lot of money they're going to go after someone in the portal. And I've been thinking – I noticed this the very first practice by the time practice was over, and I didn't text it to our group chat till a couple of nights ago. But, like, I think that is a very valuable data point, is that there isn't anyone wearing 99 right now. Yeah. So why do you all think that is, right? It's 2024. Like, how many major Power 5 teams are there that don't have one of their, like, most badass D linemen wearing 99? Last year was Sadir Mitchell. He made the move to 90. Uh, it's what he wore in high school. Obviously, Byron Murphy is wearing that number last year. Do I know if that was a move that was asked by Texas coaches or if that was a move made by Sadir? I don't. If I did, I still probably wouldn't report it. But, yeah. So, I think uh, that kind of – it ha I've, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, that the number 99 is available um, because, you know, numbers are decided in the spring. Yeah. Texas could have done that knowing that they're going to make a move for someone in April. So, um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it for D-line. And then uh, well, let Jake. Me say this, let, me, let me say this to wrap up the D-line question. Can I wrap up mm -hmm. the, the D-line topic? the reason why this position is so important, it's not, you know, yes, the down to down consistency you got from sweat and Murphy, you can't count on getting that again, but man, you look over the last two years, nobody's been able to just line up and run the football right at Texas. The only team you can say that really did it, Oklahoma did it, but they had to go to like unconventional run game. They had to go to some yeah, quarterback QB runs stuff. and things like that. Yeah. They didn't just line up and pound Texas. And, and Washington in the second half of the Alamo Bowl uh, at the end of the 22 season. Because Washington averaged a little over five and a half yards of carry. But you start looking at it, Jordan, like Texas in 2022. We know how good the run defense was last year. But even you go back to 22, and think about this. You, your top four on your interior D-line were Coburn, Ojemo, Sweat, and Murphy. It's good. all four of those guys are going to end up being NFL draft picks. That's that tells you you got a pretty salty interior, but you held three opponents. You held West Virginia, Iowa State, and Louisiana Monroe to under 100 yards, Baylor 101, Kansas 104, K State 139. The only teams that got over 150 on you, you know, Oklahoma did it, but you won that game 49 0. It didn't matter. Washington in the bowl game. They, they also like, attempted throwing the ball four times in a 49 to zero game yeah. so, uh tc important had, context Sorry. tc you went for 159 
75 of that was a Kendra Miller touchdown run, and Alabama went for 161. 81 of that was a Jace McClellan touchdown run. So for the last two years, you can make the argument There's an argument to be made that over the last two years, Texas has had the best run defense in the country. But you think about not only losing the interior lineman, losing Jalen Ford, who was a really big part of that. You can't, you just can't have it be to where anybody that wants to can just line up and run the football right at you. You got to have that presence about you. You got to be able to hold up more often than not against teams that you play, especially in the league you're going into teams that want to line up and run the football now we know the sec is changing but you're still going to line up and play you know can we know kentucky's going to want to play that way you know sam Pittman at arkansas is going to want to play that way i th- i'd like to think mike elko bringing in colin klein as his offensive coordinator a&m is going to want to play that way so you can't just go from having one of the best run defenses in the country over the last two years to just letting people just just run it down your throat like, you've got to be able to hold up a little bit. And that's why when you talk about Alfred Collins being consistent, I'm not even worried about him providing some pass rush or disrupting the quarterback. It's can you be, can you get down to down consistency stopping the run? Because if you can't, everything else we talk about with his defense that we're wondering, pass rush, coverage, whatever it is, for some more turnovers. Man, if you can't stop the run, none of that other stuff matters because teams will just run it down your throat. And, and also, like, an important reason why this this upcoming season is so big for this position group. What you talked about with the the two guys that were drafted last year and the two guys that will be drafted this year, yeah, it wasn't really reported, but it, it was in plain sight. But Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat, even though they weren't the starters, they had more snaps than Moro Jomo and Keandre Coburn in twenty twenty two. Yeah, they 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 and it was a significant. It was like oh, it was over a fifty snap difference. Um, and that being said, like you, you're basically replacing the two main guys from the last two years. Yeah, you are. So it, it's it's going to be important. Um, you know who's stepping up, and at you know everything we've talked about. I don't really got to repeat myself. Um, but but yeah, and Jake, to answer your question, if you fast forward to August 31st, who would you say is starting at safety for the Longhorns? Um. I'm not a betting man, but I think uh, the the pair that would give you the most athletically um, from an experience perspective and also just what I think the best pair would be is Derek Williams and Andrew McCuba. Um I think Michael Taff, I think obviously. I will be, by the way. Yeah, I, I think Michael Taff has shown a lot. But, um, you know, again, I just the, – the other two guys, it's hard to not start them. Um, I, I – I'll – I see Phil Simi rotating in a lot as a freshman, potentially even as a number two safety. Um, but regardless, I'm expecting Phil Simi to appear in more than four games. Um, uh, yeah, no, I don't think and, because he, he, he'll he'll play on special teams. I mean, he'll he'll burn his red shirt just being on special teams. Oh yeah. So, so yeah, that's that's kind of how I see the uh, the safety breakdown. And by the way, I've got the snap counts for you on the 2022 defensive line snaps. Oh, according was, to I PFF. was I wrong? No, uh, technically yes, but no. You're, I'll give, you, I'll give you partial credit. Uh, you're leading, you're leading guys in terms of snaps and into your D line. Sweat had four sixty four. They got Coburn at four fourteen, Murphy at three ninety two, and a Jomo at three seventy six. Oh, well, I can blame Hudson Standish. He's who told me that <laughs> a year ago. So. <laughs> Oh, uh, because I remember we were uh it was around this time last year when Hudson and I were just talking, like, how do you think Texas is gonna, you know, replace Coburn and Ojomo? And he was like, Oh, I'm not worried. Like they literally played more snaps than them last year. They just didn't start. And I was like, yeah. Oh, where'd you get that from? Well <laughs> Okay, dope. My turn to run with it. It was it was close it was close enough, one and two. I mean, Byron Murphy was one of those guys, kind of like, you know. I'll give my man Matt Butler on the Longhorn Blitz podcast credit. Like Matt started looking at some of those PFF numbers, really digging into it. And he's like, you know what? He's like the same thing I said about Byron Murphy earlier, where it's like, man, you look at Byron Murphy in terms of the PFF numbers. It's probably just, he just needs more snaps. If he just gets more snaps, he'll, he'll be maybe one of the most productive defensive tackles in the country. And he was, 
And Matt said the same thing about Jonathan Brooks. He's like, man, if you look at Jonathan Brooks, just the the per just the per snap numbers, like he's he's just as good. I as, yeah, as I, I remember season. being in some BS Airbnb thing me and my family did for Christmas last year in East Texas. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even remember where we were. And the place we were at, the house, the Airbnb had like five gigabits per second Wi-Fi, like super slow. And that's how we watched the Texas versus Washington Alamo Bowl game. Ooh. And I remember all seven of us screaming at the TV to give Jonathan Brooks the ball because they barely gave him any touches because Keelan Robinson was running back one that night. And as we found out, Brooks was definitely on a pitch count because dude needed hernia yeah. surgery. You know, still, still, week, but yeah. like a, I was just saying, like similar thing where I think a lot of people were wanting him to get more touches. You um, ever had hernia surgery, George? You ever had a hernia? I haven't. I've actually, or no, that's a lie. Um, I was going to say I've never broken a bone, but I remembered I, I have now. I had, a uh, hern- I had a hernia in 2011, and I was just like, man, I feel like I pulled something in my stomach. I went to a hernia specialist. And, he, you know, they lay down on the table. He goes, does it hurt if I push right here? Dude, it felt like somebody was, like, ripping something out of my gut. I'm like, yeah, it hurts. He's like, yeah, you got a hernia. So I had to go in and get that surgery done. You know, the worst part of that is, though, because of the painkillers they give you, you got to eat, like, a bunch of Activia and make sure you get up and walk around. Otherwise, you can get, like, constipated to the point where it's, like, detrimental to your health. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, you're you're giving me a motivation to not want a hernia. Not that I wanted one in the first place. L- lift with so. the le- lift with the legs, not the back, and you'll be good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, um, but no. So just to wrap that point up that I was making before I got off on an unnecessary tangent, like I, I you know, you start looking at the guys, just start looking at per, you know, the P. That's that's the good thing about pro football focus is. You can take the grades themselves for whatever they're worth, like however you want to interpret it. But basically what it tells you is on a play-by-play basis, these are who are your most consistent performers. And, you know, Derek Williams was one of those guys last year. And uh, that's the other thing I wanted to mention too. You look at the snap counts last year. I don't think people realize how much – like Derek Williams, his overall grade last year was a 68.7 for PFF. I mean, run defense is 77.7 and 70 is average for PFF, 75.6 for a tackling grade. Coverage grade, he was 65.4, which is okay. That might not sound all that great. Um, but that's actually one of the better grades on defense last year. Which th- those again, and those can kind of be deceiving because like Jaron Thompson's was a seventy-seven point one. You get more, the interceptions get weighted more and things like that. And Jaron Thompson had a couple of picks, but man, the, the, there's a couple guys like uh, that. I don't think people realize how much they played. Like Manny Muhammad played the eighth most snaps on defense last year with four seventy-nine. So the argument that could be made, and Ryan Watts didn't miss some time. But the argument can be made, okay, similar to the argument Hudson made about going from Cobra and Ojimo to Murphy and Sweat. You can say the same thing about going from Ryan Watts to Manny Muhammad. Like, it's no disrespect to Ryan Watts, but Manny Muhammad was just as good and actually yeah, I'd, more snaps last year. I, I feel more comfortable having Malik Muhammad guard someone than Ryan Watts. Uh, you know, Jaron Thompson led the safeties last year. Thompson had 568. Taft 439. And then you got Derek Williams almost right at 400 with 397 for the safeties. And that's the thing. Like, okay. Yeah, you're losing Jaron Thompson. All right. Well, Derek Williams showed you in the sample size he played. And his snaps kind of kept increasing as the year went on. There's going to be, you, you, you've got a chance to be better there. On a down, uh, no, they they will one thousand percent be better. Um, I was trying to be modest, but you know, I know, yeah, I <laughs> you you know how I felt in this, especially you saw our God in the group chat, yeah. But I could not stand when they would have Keaton Crawford and Jaron Thompson on the field at the same time. Like it, no, um, it's Keaton Crawford especially, man. 
Like, I get he looks the part eye test wise and is a great special teams piece. Mm -hmm. But, like, an, an actual god at figuring out a way to get out of position. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then Jaron, he had some great interceptions, but a lot of times it was just like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> So here's the I, I was really happy to see Derek Williams progression as the year went on. Yeah. Uh, same with Michael Taff. I think Michael Taff uh, really got a lot better, to be quite honest, as as it came through the season. And also with Michael Taff, like he's kind of or not kind of he's in a similar boat to. Um, I, I kind of talk about the Texas A&M linebacker, middle linebacker, Torian York in the same sense. Well, athletically, those guys might be the worst athlete on the field for the skill guys, yeah. but they know exactly where the ball is going because they study the game that much and they study everything and they're telling everyone else what's happening. But sometimes athletically, they just can't get to that spot. And I think yeah. Michael Taft showed that sometimes, but at the same time, like, dude, I think if you got, if you ask power five coaches, if you want a guy like Michael Taft as your second string safety, 99% of them would say yes. Like he he's everything you want for that role, hometown kid who's never gonna hop in the portal or anything like that. Helped you get Arch Manning too. So um uh, there's a lot to like about the safety room, and I bet a lot of money it's gonna be much better than last year's safety room. You know, you start looking at uh at the, where I think the upgrade is gonna come, it's not necessarily gonna be I mean, is Derek Williams a better athlete? Is, do we think he's gonna be a better coverage guy than Jaron Thompson? Probably the, the upside is there, but man, where Derek, where, where Derek Williams has a chance to really help you is, is the tackling department last year. Uh, Derek Williams had five missed tackles. Now you look at his numbers, PFF had him down for a missed tackle percentage of 12.5, which is, that might sound like a lot, but I mean, Jalen Ford was at 12.7, Anthony Hill, 11.1. Baron Sorrell, 11.1. So actually, Derek Williams was one of your better tacklers last year. And the more snaps he plays, if he keeps that up, you should you should give up fewer big plays if, if that missed tackle percentage holds. You want the numbers for Jaron Thompson, and this is where like it almost cancels out the interceptions. Jaron Thompson led the team with 15 missed tackles last year. Miss percentage, missed tackle percentage for him last year, 28.3. So basically, he's missing more than one out of every four tackle attempts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Like, you know, Jeff, I was losing my Dude. mind at times during the season. Just like there's no reason they should be in the game. There's no reason. Everybody, every writer, like at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're fans too. Like we watch the stuff and we see stuff that infuriates us and everybody's got guys on the team that, you know, no matter who you're covering or whatever, that it's like, man, like, you know, I'd rather have somebody else out there. And yeah, Jordan's guy last year was guys were Jaron Thompson and Keaton Crawford. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it just because I'm like, look, I know Derek Williams is young, but like, he's gonna be the highest safety off had drafted since I don't know who. Just fucking play him. Like, he needs the experience. Just do it. It's going to give you like, – like he's going to make mistakes and freshman mistakes, and there will be growing pains. But, like, if the freshman is making the same mistakes as a guy who's been there four years, you go with the play upside. the freshman. Play the go freshman. With the higher upside. Go with the higher so, ceiling. Between you, between you complaining about safety rotations and Chip complaining about Sark not running the ball – enough there wasn't a whole lot for me to complain about last year i didn't have any I, I didn't have any oxygen to to give to to breathe in man you you two sucked it all up complaining I, about safe rotations in the run game i remember you had to miss our show the the day immediately after texas lost to washington in the sugar bowl and like chip and i had never done a show and <laughs> chip and i also like I mean, we just don't talk much. Like yeah. uh, Hank and I are the ones who talk the most. Like anyone at our site, he's obviously a team guy. We're not overlapping a ton, so the chemistry and all was kind of off. But like most of the show was Chip, just like we got to run the ball more. And I was like, yeah, 
<laughs> and stop playing Darren Thompson and Keaton Crawford. And he's like, well, I don't think they're coming back. I'm like, shit, they better not. That was like the summary of the one hour show following right. Texas's loss to Washington in the I, uh, playoff. I was I sitting I sit next to Chip in the press box, and you know, mo- most of the time I'll try to give Chip a different perspective on the run game stuff. Like, well, you know, but <laughs> at halftime of the sugar bowl, I had I had nothing to go to. I'm like, you know what, dude, you're right. They just need to line up and run the damn football <laughs> a little bit more. Yeah, no, even at, I remember uh, halftime of the TCU game that I was at, I went up to the press box just to go, you know, shoot the shit with the guys, see if they needed yeah. some photos. And uh, Chip was like, have you noticed it? And I was like, notice what? That they've tried to use Xavier Worthy to block on three screens already? And he was like, my man. You're good. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Chip and I are common. We're usually on the same wavelength when it comes yeah. to hating. You got, yeah. You got, like I said, between between y'all, y'all took care of the dirty work. I said, I don't, I don't have, I don't have anything to complain about. I got to be devil's advocate and put the, put the, put the spin on it, put the positive spin on it, put a little shine on it. Which yeah. man, covering Baylor as long as I did when they were terrible, and covering the last before last season, the previous twelve seasons of Texas football, I've gotten. If I might say so myself, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at polishing turds and trying to find silver linings. Otherwise, yeah. man, my mental health would be even worse than it got. I'd be in the, it'd be in the, in the, forget the toilet. It would be in the sewer. It'd be in yeah. the doo doo water refining plant is where that would be if I just went negative all the time. Yeah, Antoine. Um, with the with the DB room, like it, I mean, we've talked about it at these practice availabilities. They're purposely not revealing their hand or their cards or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I, I think I and a lot of other people think Jelani's for sure going to appear in more than four games. I mean, he did last year, obviously on special teams. But I'm not even just talking special teams. I'm talking actual defense. Um, uh, whenever, I, so I missed the last two availabilities, but I was at the first one of the year um, mm-hmm. last Tuesday. Uh, or however many weeks ago, a week and a half ago, or whatever. Um, and he seemed to get more activity in that than he did in the uh, fall camp practices I went to. So I think he's coming along. Obviously, for him, everyone got really excited for him because his ranking. Uh, I think his ranking was 1,000% justified. But I also think that, you know, maybe we as a network could have done a better job explaining how raw he actually was once he got to Texas. Yeah. Um, and that that ranking is largely because of his basketball background, his track numbers, and also the fact that he played like 20 different positions on the football field. Those are all things that NFL teams value and that they love whenever they're scouting players coming out of college. So even though we knew he barely had any experience at safety slash linebacker or whatever Texas was looking at him to play, we still felt confident enough in that ranking because of athletically everything else he'd done. This isn't a normal kid or a normal prospect from an athletic perspective, so we didn't rank him like a normal kid or a normal prospect. Yeah. That said, he was always going to need time to get coached and to get developed at Texas, which is what is happening. On the same note, you were never going to play him as a freshman last year because of everything else that was going on. And two, this year, there's a chance he, he doesn't play it on because of the other guys they have in that room. So while I think, again, like I said, I, I do believe he's going to appear in at least more than four games, not counting special teams as actual defense. I do think that's going to happen. Um, but if it's only five or six games, I wouldn't be surprised. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if it's not till uh, a bowl game or, or next season that he's actually a major contributor playing yeah. major snaps. Because Makuba's only here for one year. Yeah. You know, and – Maybe you maybe he gets himself into that safety rotation. Look, I mean, talking about the athleticism, there's a reason why he's working at that star position too. I mean, he's in the freaking nickel. Yeah. So as big as he is, because he is that athletic and they feel like he can do it. Um, you know, some guys do just need a little bit more time to to develop. And and honestly, it's not his fault, you know, because you bring in Makuba because you needed a veteran presence at safety. You kind of know what Michael Taff is. You know, Derek Williams is is going to start and and should ascend. He should get on that trajectory. Uh, and, and it's not Jelani McDonald's fault that Xavier Filsomey coming in as a true freshman is probably going to be more ready to see the field at safety 
than Jelani McDonald will as a sophomore. That's not that's yeah. not Jelani's fault. That's just you you just happened to recruit one of the best safeties in the country in the 24 class. Yeah, and um I mean that that's kind of how it is. And like you said, Makuba, yeah. he's gone after this year. Um uh, Michael Taff redshirted his first year in Austin. So if he did want to come back for his fifth year, he could if he wanted to. I, um, I wonder if Taff, Taff is I wonder, I don't want to speak from for Michael Taff, but I wonder if he's a guy that if he's got his degree and doesn't need or want to go to grad school, does he just not take the extra year of eligibility? Or if he's already in grad school, does he figure, you know what, with one more season, I can go in, I can finish this out and get my master's degree. I have no idea where Michael Taff is academically, but that's the kind of stuff guys have to figure out. Sometimes when guys leave eligibility on the table, you hit on this a little bit yesterday, even if guys are done, like they just don't want to go to school anymore. That's not just for guys that, all right, I'm, I'm done with the college thing. That's for guys like there's literally nothing else for me to do in college. Like you've either got your master's degree or, you know, you've got your bachelor's and for whatever career fields you're going into, it's like, well, I don't really need a master's to do what I'm going to do. So there's no point in hanging around. I might as well just go try my hand at pro football and then go into the real world. Yeah, and I mean, for Mookie, he knows he's not going to the league. So, yeah. um, you know, if he gets to December next year and, uh, you know, he's seeing that his fifth year, he'd probably be behind Phil Smee and or Derek Williams. I, I, you know, I know him pretty well. I grew up with him. I could see him just being like, all right, I'll hang it up instead of coming back for a fifth year. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but Somebody asked it, yesterday. Uh, that brings me to something that's worth mentioning. Somebody asked me yesterday if I was happy that we're getting to the end, that starting next year we're not going to have to deal with any more guys with COVID eligibility. I'm happy. That shit you, fucked a lot got, of stuff up. You've got two. I think you've only got two. Jake Majors can come back for one more year if he wants. Vernon, Bro Vernon Broughton can come back for one more year if you want. Oh, oh, you're saying after this season? Yeah. Okay. I those are going to be the last two guys, Broughton and Jake Majors. Hmm. I I've got a feeling though they're both planning on this being their last year. Yeah. If I'm Majors, I'd leave because I have one thousand percent leave, and then Broughton too. Like, get get up out of there. Yeah. So, and Sam, I know the running backs fumbled, but like you, uh, it's not necessarily about <laughs> fumbling uh, in the Washington game at the second half. It was about not giving Michael Penix the ball back because he couldn't miss. And um, the fact that you were, you were, you were running it down their throat. Like we, yeah. we, you saw, everybody saw what Michigan did to Washington. Had Texas really stuck with the run? Texas was on its way to doing the same thing against Washington. I I'm glad, you know, the, again, the offensive part of the insider is going to be out at some point, whenever we get off here in a few minutes, I'll finish editing that thing and it'll be up. But, you know, chip reported some good things about DJ Campbell. I go back to the sugar bowl, Jordan, DJ Campbell probably came out of that game. Let me rephrase that coming out of that game. I probably felt better about DJ Campbell than I felt about anybody else on the roster in terms of, wow, that guy had a really good game and I'm excited for him coming back next year. Yeah, man. It's <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people forget that DJ Campbell was ranked ahead of Kelvin Banks. Yeah. At least by 24 seven. That is DJ was a top 10 prospect. Kelvin was like in the twenties. So, and uh, we did that knowing that DJ is a guard, and guards almost never go that high. That's yeah. that's because that's how special DJ was slash is. Um, and I've talked about it on the show, but <laughs> like three days before he moved into Texas, uh, I saw him at an O-line workout that had like eight other Power 5 offensive linemen, and he was the only kid in high school or coming out of high school. Yeah, And he was quicker than all those other guys at literally every single drill. And... <laughs> Like, still had, like, the difference between uh, a guy when they show up to camp or sh when they enroll in January as an offensive lineman compared to after three years is night and day. 
because to have an offensive lineman that's playable in the SEC, at least in Power Five, you have to completely strip their bodies down and rebuild them back up and just tear them down, rebuild them back up, right? And so I was seeing DJ do all this shit just from basically instincts, right? Yeah. Football and basketball at Arlington Bowie. It's not like he had anyone in a nutrition or weight program really helping him out. And he was better than all these other kids. So I knew there was something you know special about him from that point on, and I'm really excited to see what he's going to do this year. And – yeah, and Cooter, you made a great point. I've said that all year as well. Like it, it, it I feel like it's the same people who got mad at Bijan Robinson for fumbling in Lubbock. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, and and Antoine, yeah, you're you're right, man. I mean, this year only one starter's having to get replaced. Well, potentially two, with you know my thing about NATO. Um, but you know, after the season, it could be all five because Cam Williams is draft eligible after next season. So yeah. there is a world where Texas could have to replace all five starters. On Look, the- I, you've got probably a better idea than I do with what I'm about to ask. How do you think Cam Williams would test if he went to, when if he went if and whenever he goes to the combine? I don't know because uh, Cam Williams in high school didn't show off a ton of athleticism because most of the time kids See, were running away from him. That's um, that's why I think. I would, I would table the the I Cam Williams. Mystery. I would table the Cam Williams stuff leaving early until we figured that part out. Because like you look at a guy like look at the draft this year, right? Demarius Mills from Georgia came out. People are like, well, he only started eight games. Yeah, he only started eight games, but dude, the dude is a freak. Like he tested off the charts. So somebody's gonna draft him in the first round. Is Cam that kind of guy? I I would think the feedback would be. Is it unless he's just going to be a freaky tester? Go back to school, get another year under your belt. Yeah, yeah, no, great, great point, Sam. Valid point. Um, but yeah, and even so, I wasn't actually at this coach's clinic, but uh, a couple months ago was, um, I mean, y- y'all all know how they the Texas High School Coaches Association. We'll do clinics around the state around this time of the year. Yeah, uh, clinic, the one for clinic season. Yep. Yeah, the one for I twenty um, with all the South Dallas schools it was in Dallas a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Tashar Choice spoke at it. I wasn't there, uh, but Mike Roach is there, and I was like, "What did Choice say?" <laughs> and uh, he kind of just went through it all, and I don't remember all exactly he said that Choice said, but he apparently let off his presentation with like. It was my position group's fault Texas didn't play in the national championship because my backs fumbled. That's how he started it off. Um, And then went on and gave an amazing presentation for an hour or two. I mean, I have never heard a single bad thing about Tashar Choice, and I'm not Mm -hmm. saying that just to put wind in his sails or whatnot. Like, I can't say that for other coaches. A lot of other coaches at Texas have some dirt to them, some baggage potentially. Never a single peep about to shard choice this guy this got brought up again on our our longhorn blitz podcast this week but i think it's true i think the culture of that running back room because you the same thing jordan that you just said uh, trey i don't know if you want to jump in here if you got anything to add but the same thing that you said about to shard choice could be said about stan drayton like yeah a guy that coached with urban meyer as long as he did i've never heard anybody say anything bad about stan drayton like remotely so between the two coaches and going from and, and having two character guys like Bijan and Roshan passing that torch to Jonathan Brooks, who passed it to CJ Baxter and Jaden Blue, like you can talk about, we can talk about talent, we can talk about depth. I don't think there's a room on position group on campus that has a better culture than the running back room at Texas. Agreed. Like there's just a certain a certain level of expectation of not just how you play, not just how you work, but this is the, the kind of dude you need to be to survive in this room. This is the standard, and you got to reach that standard. I think that there are a lot of rooms that are starting to show that quality now, guys. Yeah. Running back room may be the best example, but how good do we feel about the quarterback room after listening to Quinn Ewers talk yesterday? I and mean, that guy is still focused yeah. and locked in. And uh, I'm strangely optimistic about this upcoming season versus my history with this program, especially in the recent past. A large part of that has to do with Quinn Ewers. 
and yesterday did nothing to dispel that optimism. Yeah, you've got the quarterback room. I think I think receiver has gotten to that point with Chris Jackson, just because you've got you've, it's because he's been able to steady that thing. Um, yeah, it's 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 a weird year though, obviously, because there's yeah. going to be so many new faces in there. This is this this will be a great year to determine just how healthy that room is. That's a great call, Jeff. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's you know there's some some new faces on defense and oh. uh, let's be honest, man. It's as we we also need to bring in. Hey, if anybody can vibe with Shohei Otani's interpreter and making bets, <laughs> maybe bets that you shouldn't. It's my man Jeff Barker. Yes, sir. Um, but you <laughs> no know, comment. You look at. <laughs> when, but no, when you look at uh, the secondary, like it's. I hate I hate using this term Trey because it gets overused, but it's a it's a referendum year on Blake Gideon and Terry Joseph. I thought you were going to say something to the effect of DBU. I like referendum year. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I could have. I, I don't know if this hurts people's fe- feelings or not, or if they get upset if you say something like this. I would have. I could have seen a justification in getting rid of one, if not both, guys this off season. It yeah. didn't happen though, and they. You know, this team did reach heights that they hadn't in a long time. And so, yeah, they get that one more year now with an added emphasis on going out and getting uh, some valuable pieces in the transfer portal, obviously still developing guys as well. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing what these cornerbacks are doing early next season because I think that's going to go a long ways in, in helping to dictate everything else. Had, had Sark not seen the turnover coming within the defensive staff, knowing pretty early, even before you really started, before you started bowl prep that Jeff Choate was leaving, right? that might have been something he thought more about. But, you know, I'll, I'll give Sart credit. He's at the point now where he's like, look, we, we've upgraded our pass rush. Um, we still feel good about our frontline D-line guys. Probably need to go get somebody in the portal. Uh, we've got you a, a dynamic guy in Anthony Hill. We've got you better personnel, brought in Makuba. Like, pretty much have no excuses if there's just those insane lapses that we saw in the secondary last year. Yeah, you know what? That's a great point about the turnover that already happened on that side of the ball. Choate, Bo Davis, obviously. So yeah. you want a certain amount of continuity, and I think you're exactly right about just all the different areas that they upgraded beyond the secondary position. Mm-hmm. I was talking with uh, Justin Wells about this a couple of days ago, and Trey Moore may end up being the underrated transfer guy in this cycle when it's all said and done. I realize that UTSA isn't exactly Texas, but he put up good numbers against some of the better competition, that power five competition over the last couple of years with the Roadrunners as well. Man, I, I, uh, we were talking about this yesterday, Jordan and I were, I, I've just got a funny feeling that like, with Ethan Burke, like we talk about guys that are multi-sport guys, and usually it's oh well, you know he hadn't been able to focus on football because he's playing, you know, high school basketball. Then he plays AAU, or he's a travel baseball guy. I mean, Ethan Burke was a really good lacrosse prospect. Now that he's just a football player, and his focus, his off-season development has been focused on just being a better football player. I'm, I've got this weird feeling like Ethan Burke could have like a double-digit sack type year and be be ready to go to the NFL after 2024. He was one of the few guys on the defensive side of the ball that looked ready to go in that semifinal matchup. Yeah, because we, I say that to, to point out, like to make a, a weird basketball comparison. You know, back in the, the NIT year, everybody went into that year thinking Jericho Sims will have a great year and he'll go, you know, he'll go pro. He'll be a first-round pick. And then after a couple of games of watching Jackson Hayes, it's like, I think we're talking about the wrong guy leaving early. I think that could be the deal with Trey Moore and and Ethan, Ethan Burke. Hmm. Uh, I think if anyone's going to go double digit at sacks, it's one thousand percent, one thousand percent Burke. Um, uh, I, I still hate, and I've talked about it enough. The the Colin Simmons hype as a freshman, like we still need to kill that a little bit more. Um, because Ethan Burke is gonna be who it is if there's double digits. Well, I think Trey Moore why, could do why, it as well. Why do you why do you but, say that about Simmons though? I'm curious because you've obviously watched him a lot more than I have. Um for what he's gonna be able to do as a freshman in the SEC, he's not I, I would bet significant money he's not reaching double digit sacks as a freshman. Yeah. Um and also like 
look, I get he had the ranking and all these other things, but people don't understand how our rankings actually work. And two for Colin, he's a 6'3", 220-pound edge that doesn't have amazing length by any means. So he needs to add a lot of strength. There's a lot of talk about it being 20 pounds. I saw Colin in high school play at least a dozen games from his sophomore year to senior year. And seeing my practice, he has not put on 20 pounds. That is like I, I know I'm arguing with the scale potentially, but I refuse to believe that he has gained 20 pounds. And on the the weight that they put out for height and weight, that wasn't a 20 pound gain either. So, mm. um, and also like the other guys on the roster are going to do more than him. You're, it was the same thing I was saying with uh, talking about Jelani McDonald. Like, yeah, I would have loved to see him play last year, but were you going to take Jaron Thompson or? Keaton Crawford or Mookie Taff or Derek Williams off the field to play him? Hell no. Same way I kind of feel about Colin Simmons as a freshman. Like, I think this guy is going to get drafted really high one day. I think he could be an All-American one day. I think he could be a lot of different things one day. But as a true freshman, I just – the the impact he's going to have, I think, will be around kind of what Anthony Hill did last year, maybe a little less, where most of his playing time are packages that are created for him to come in on third downs or passing situations where he is a very – specific idea of what he's actually supposed to be doing on that play. And that's what they did with Anthony Hill the first few weeks before they really kind of took the training wheels off and let him do his thing. I think it's going to be a really similar approach with Colin Simmons. Um, just because, again, as a freshman, I don't think he's ready yet to be relied upon to do all the things that you know you can count on Baron Sorrell or Ethan Burke or Trey Moore to do. So... You just brought up the name Jelani McDonald, which I think that at the start of the offseason, I would say was one of the more intriguing names out there, hearing that the linebacker room and the secondary room were uh, fighting for his services. I haven't really heard anything about him in spring ball. So where is he playing, and has there uh, been anything going on with him, good or bad? He's worked at safety and star, um, but I, I made the point earlier, Trey, I'm like, look, it's – Jordan talked about just how raw he is, and I'll let Jordan pick up pick up that point. But it's not Jelani McDonald's fault that they recruited Xavier Filsamy, and Xavier Filsamy is more ready to see the field as a true freshman than Jelani's going to be as a true sophomore. Damn, it's not his fault. It's just it just is what it is. Well, that's great news. Yeah. Well, I mean, Filsamy was like the number two safety prospect in the nation. Yeah. Whereas Jelani was a top 50 prospect ranked as an athlete, but it's because he had crazy times, averaged 20. So he's the best basketball player in Waco. Um, literally, the Waco Tribune named him that. And he played high school court. He played quarterback at Connolly. That's what Connolly yeah. does. They don't actually have quarterbacks. They just put their best athlete at quarterback. Yeah, so whenever that. Jelani would get hurt, sometimes Kobe Black was playing quarterback. But um, Jelani would primarily play QB, and then he didn't have an offseason because he was hooping. And when basketball ended, he'd go and do the triple jump, and he would place at state for the triple jump. Mm. So um, there was just so much to like. That's why we ranked him so high. Uh, but he was always going to be a long-term guy that has to be developed. And he barely played as a freshman outside of special teams. That's because he has to be developed. He's not going to play until next year, um, and it's because he has to be developed. Guys like that take time, but, you know, if you do it the right way, if they're patient, you cannot see them for two or three years and they start one year and they go first round. Trey, so, we're speaking of, speaking of small town football. Next time you talk to Quan Cosby, I don't know if you talk to Quan at all, but next time you see Quan, ask him if he's got any of his old tapes from Mart and ask him if you can borrow one if he's got it because I I've seen some of those old Quan Cosby films and it's just – it's not fair. Like it's fat kids like me trying to run down Quan Cosby in the open field. It's just it's stupid. Are there are, are they are they two A Jeff? What are they like two A? Because I know one. Yeah, is two, yeah. So they're they were one A. Yeah. Well, actually, they were two A, which would be three A now. But enrollment size, they're two A now, which used to be one A. It's confusing, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they just yeah, stayed a couple years ago. Moved everybody up. Is that what happened here? No, they basically they named six man. Uh, what used to be called six man is now class one A. Well, come on, we can't go six man. Is that uh, is that offending somebody? Do we need okay? To well, Trey, what happens when it's the girls' volleyball team and it's the six man girls' volleyball team instead of one A? Like, it just I don't know. The 
the class for other sports gets kind of messed up. You know what I mean? Six women. Like, oh, this is our six-man six basketball what team. Here? Six women. Six woman. Six woman team. <laughs> what about the basketball team? You're going to say the six-man basketball team? Can we go six human at least? Six person? I just like the idea of uh, being able to recognize that we're talking about the uh, the six-man football. Hey, if you know, sports, it doesn't you, matter as much. If you look at the big – and Barker can back me up on this, I think – if you look at the Big 12, the all-Big 12 women's basketball team this year, Deanna Gaston was the sixth person of the year in the Big 12. Uh, Not the sixth woman of the year. She was the sixth person of the year. Mm. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, if we're still talking about Mark, the best wings I've ever had in Waco are at this hole in the wall called the uh, Shorties. It's on campus at Baylor. Um, and they have a bunch of like local Waco area stuff. They have this badass hat. From I think it was the Quan Cosby era, era. It's a Mart hat, like up hanging in the rafters. And every time I go in there, me and Nick Harris just like belittle the all the workers to let us buy it, and they never do. But if you're ever in Waco and want some wings, stop there and you'll see this this badass Mart hat from like the '90s or something, man. Yeah, it's usually awesome. When I'm in Waco, I'm just driving through and trying to get just oh. head down business as usual. Yeah, I'm the only time Austin as quick as I can too, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, the, the only time I've stopped at Shorty's was for games that were at McLean or to go see Kobe Black play later on that day, and I was just in the area. So We know why Barker's got to get back home. He's got, like, whack basketball or something going on that has got, got some money lines to deal with. Houston mm. Open this week, baby. Come on, get your top 40s, your top 20s, your matchups in. Hey, I saw I was watching Bad Beats. It was the conference tournament edition of Bad Beats, and it's like America East semifinals. I'm like, I know Barker had some some action on this deal. Uh yeah, like yeah. the big West tournament, man. I mean, no one no one go no one walks into Cal State Northridge and just pushes the guys around, all right? <laughs> I'm just walking right. in the Adador Dome and do that, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> on that note you guys have a good show hey we're again we're off tomorrow for good friday so thanks to bk for giving us the day off and uh we'll be back to do it on monday everybody have a great weekend yes, happy See you. Great, great job going. Going. all right real quick uh off business off uh on air because that's how these things go i don't think your microphone is turned on it sounds like a computer mic so you may need to plug something in or shift a setting in Streamyard. So we can hear you a little bit more crystal clear. Maybe, uh, maybe if I get in, would that help? That's perfect. <laughs> well, when I when I rebooted a second ago, I I unplugged it and then didn't plug it back in. You know, hey, you know what? I'm I'm a little just a little off here. I'll, I'll get back on my game as we move into this. I'm usually I'm used to talking to you at three o'clock. Yeah, it's typically three to five Mondays and Fridays, which is a real treat. Today, it's Thursday for an hour. We don't have a show tomorrow. As Jeff just mentioned, we're all off for Easter. So I figured we would give people a taste of what we're normally doing Mondays and Fridays from three to five, a condensed version, of course. But you and I have a lot of fun. You're really smart for anybody who's never listened to Jeff in this format. If you only watch him on television, he has some epic old man rants, really solid opinion on things. He's not afraid to mix it up uh, if there's a disagreement. And uh, those are all qualities that I appreciate, as well as having a really sadistic sense of humor, too. And you're a degenerate gambler, which fortunately or unfortunately, I am not. So I love that perspective of things. After that breakdown, uh, first of all, thank you. But second of all, I think our listeners are probably going, how in the world did this man convince someone to marry him? Old man <laughs> rants, degenerate gambler. <laughs> <laughs> Not just that, but she's a, she is uh, just a, a beautiful catch, too, to uh, to really materialize things. So, yeah, you uh, the, the cliche is out kicking your coverage. You yep. out kicked your coverage, so kudos to you. Thank you. I, I, I definitely did. Not Not letting her go anytime soon. Or ever is what I'm supposed to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ever. It's till death, right? Until death do you part is yes, the sir. way the slogan goes. So we have uh, an exciting show planned today. Uh, Going to get into a couple of different things. The NCAA trying to ban prop bets at the college level. Yep, still operating five to ten years behind the times. Uh, Shohei Otani, the latest on that scandal with a guy who is a Dodgers fan, but a level-headed Dodgers fan. Not that all Dodgers fans aren't level-headed, but I, I'm curious to get your perspective on what's happening right now, what you think the truth is, and how that might affect this team this year. Caitlin Clark, 
gets a pretty big offer from the big three to come play basketball over there. Ice Cube, a savvy businessman as always. I'd love to see it. We'll talk more about that. We're going to start, though, Jeff, with the aforementioned Quinn Ewers, who did meet with the media yesterday and uh, really gave uh, a mature perspective on some interesting questions and showed some personality in doing so as well. So you were actually uh, covering this media session. What what were your initial impressions from things? It was the most honest that he's been, I think, ever with the media. And it's not that he wasn't honest before, but, you know, guy in his position with the hype that, you know, accompanied him to campus. I just think it didn't really benefit him much to be super honest with the media. Like if we're being honest, I mean, that's, that that's my honest assessment of him, you know, holding back is it kind of makes sense why, why he would have done that. But I just think I, we saw a guy that feels really comfortable in his role. We've seen his evolution and his growth. And, you know, I throw myself in here as much as any other Texas fan who I've seen similar, you know, criticisms of Quinn from, but it's like we forget sometimes that this dude was was basically a freshman, I mean, a, excuse me, a senior in high school when he well, was a senior in high school when he got to Ohio State because he skipped his senior year. So he was a redshirt freshman coming in. And I think everyone maybe unfairly threw the like, well, he had a semester at Ohio State, like watching, I think he watched, uh, I can't remember who the quarterback was. was that Stroud? I think he watched Stroud for a year there. I mean, they were in a, they were in a stacked quarterback room there. So I think he came in and it was like, because of his connection with Texas being a commit previously to Tom Herman, maybe the expectation was, was a bit too high. And then he had the mullet and when he doesn't connect on every deep ball right away, you know, we all freak out myself included. So I think now you're, you're seeing really the evolution and maturity, at least in this sense, in the off the field portion of it, of just his comfort in being the face of the, the you know, face of the franchise, if you will. Yeah, and let's not forget, he was out of shape that first year that he started at quarterback, and maybe some of that is getting hurt, not being able to do as much, but it was going into the bowl game that year that we saw a real change of psychology and him uh, really thinking about his level of commitment and what it needs to be for him to accomplish his ultimate goals in football and probably beyond. This is a guy that has a... A redshirt freshman for this team was eliciting Jeff George comparisons for good and for a little bit of bad, too, because you just wondered if he had the focus. That was always part of the problem for Jeff George, just immensely talented physically, but uh, between the ears, something was lacking. But Quinn Ewers has shown, uh, really starting with that bowl game and going forward, a, a different level of commitment, really looking in the mirror to see what he needs to work on and get better at and actually make those things happen too. And now we're seeing him take steps forward as more of a vocal leader, which is really cool. And uh, we're going to play a couple clips from yesterday's uh, presser, starting with uh, something that you shared on Twitter. Your handle is at Jeff Barker underscore. This is uh, Quinn Ewers providing some uh, really great insight, as you say, into his decision to return for another college season. Now, I had some people put together a pretty good chart on, you know, obviously the more you play and the more experience you have, the better you end up playing and in the and succeeding in the in the NFL. And I just wanted to put myself in a better spot to be able to succeed at a at a high level once I, you know, hopefully get there. So um, just more experience. And then, you know, I feel like I've been been rushing my entire life. So just take a year, slow it down. Um, and not not rush things, you know. Skip my senior year; that went by fast. Um, was at Ohio State for a semester or so; that all went by fast, also. So just take 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 my time throughout the whole process, and you know, enjoy being here and not <clears throat> just being present and not not looking too far forward. That's great. It's made more possible, by the way, by this NIL era that a guy like that who did have pro prospects could uh, comfortably make that decision for come to come back for another year. He, let's be honest, he's making money to do so, making good money as a the star quarterback for the Texas Longhorns and one of the most recognizable names and faces in all of college football. And he can just uh, take even more positive steps and getting ready for that NFL career. I, I feel like by the time it's all said and done, Jeff, when yours is going to be more ready to start as a rookie in the NFL than a lot of guys who are getting drafted very high here late, uh, in a little bit less than a month. And the line that stood out to me there was, 
I feel like I've been rushing my whole life. Like that to me, I know uh, people are probably like, I mean, it was just an interview, dude, relax. That's a, that's a next level of admission in front of six television cameras, 15 other reporters, knowing that that's going to go out, knowing that everything you say is going to get put out there. Like, I just thought that was a great bit of self-awareness almost of just realizing, Hey, you know, I have been rushing my whole life. And then he lists all the things that we just talked about too. But no, I mean, you, you make a great point about NIL helping to facilitate or, you know, give guys another option instead of just, Hey, I got to go get the money in case I come back and have a bad season. And look, if he comes back and he has an average season, he may not be the first quarterback taken off the board, but based on potential, he's still going to go pretty high in the draft, you know, and barring again, God forbid, some sort of injury or something like that, that would, that would alter how teams look at him given previous injury history. So I, I thought it was nice and that was refreshing from Quinn there, gave some insight into the decision. And you make a great point as well about all the, you know, all the guys that we see go into the league and look, maybe they're just not good enough. Maybe another year or two in college wouldn't have helped some of these guys, but look at the guys that we're all talking about right now, outside of Caleb Williams and Drake may like we have those two guys, but then we also have guys that are going to go right behind them. Bo Nix, five-year guy, two different schools, Michael Penix, five-year guy, two different schools. I mean, obviously McCarthy's polarizing for different reasons. He wasn't there for five years. Uh, but I think, yeah, coming back is only going to help him. And now having a third year in Sark's offense and the amount that goes into that, the amount that he puts on the quarterback is only going to help Quinn as he, you know, goes into the NFL presumably next year. Yeah, that healthy perspective is a great thing to point out too. I mean, that is such a mature response to be able to recognize that. You said self-awareness. I love that term as well. He clearly has all of those things going on right now, which is why I'm, I cannot wait to see what, he is going to be able to accomplish this next football season. It, uh, it's, uh, you know, he has new receivers to throw it to for the most part, although he did talk about DeAndre Moore yesterday. I'm happy to hear DeAndre is taking some major steps forward because he has always looked to me like a guy who is at least two to three years away from making a positive impact at wide receiver. That may change, though. And to have uh, just more depth at wide receiver, guys pushing other guys, uh, that that's what begets champions. That's what begets Greatness is being pushed by other really good competition, too. It's just, you know, back to the original point that we made during crosstalk about this team having such great depth across the board. Like, you think of a position right now that doesn't necessarily have very good depth. There's really only one spot that jumps out to me, and that's tight end. And tight end does have a ton of potential. It's just you lost Jatavian Sanders and Gunnar Helm and Nyblack seem more like uh, pass catching options than they do really good run blockers. But that will eventually take care of itself as well. Texas recruited that position well uh, this last cycle. Got a big-time talent out of California. They do have more blocking-specific tight ends on the roster, too. So these guys may be used situationally. But the, the depth is there pretty much 1-22 uh, to 22 right now. And I think the great part about turning over as many receivers as they are and replacing those guys that we've talked a bunch about Great thing is now you have a third year starting quarterback in the same system at the same school. So your production at any given position, any given year can evolve. I mean, that's what good teams do. That's what the Georgias, the Alabamas, the Ohio States, the LSUs, you know, when they really have it humming year to year, that's, that's what they're doing. They're, they're flipping it and saying, okay, well now let's lean more on our running backs. And even if we don't have two guys that are thousand yard or almost thousand yard guys who are the two clear cut options in Xavier Worthy and, and Adonai Mitchell. Now maybe there's five guys that all have 600 yards or it's, Hey, a Deandre Moore, you know, we realized, okay, this guy's actually better than we thought at the running back position. That's basically what happened with Jonathan Brooks this year. Yeah. They, they knew they had something in Jonathan Brooks. I would Sark, I think would be absolutely lying to our faces if he thought that John now Jonathan Brooks was going to do what he did in 10 games, stop, you know, you wouldn't have started CJ Baxter over him. If you thought that, no, you're right. That, no. that was, that was strange to me. Cause I feel like that that was visible, but they, they may have seen something else in practice. So there's may have been something else happening behind the scenes that led to a little bit of doubt, including yeah. CJ Baxter playing really well in fall practice. And to be clear, that's that's not a knock on Sark. I think the pivot quickly to saying, hey, 
we've got something here that maybe didn't maybe we weren't seeing as explosive in practice, but it's explosive in games. Like the dude practices well, but he's just a total gamer. And look what happened when he got his chance. And then to Sark's credit, he pivoted real quick. Not that he needed to admit like a mistake on that, but he kind of did by immediately then being like, no, Brooks is our guy. Yeah, yeah, so, no, it's, it's okay to say recognize a mistake. He they they kind of stumbled into that, but when he right. saw it, he was like, Oh crap, we, we need to flip flop how this thing is going here. And that didn't mean that CJ Baxter lost all of his carries. It's just they shifted into different roles with Jonathan Brooks being the guy to start games. And this team was better off for it too. And maybe you could argue that Baxter and then Jaden Blue by default were better off when it finally became their time later in the year after Brooks suffered his knee injury too. Oh, no doubt. And I, I say all that about the running back position just to say that that could happen at wide receiver this year. Yeah. He could trot out, he could trot out three guys and then it could be completely different a couple games later based on, like you said, hey, DeAndre Moore came in and got some reps, or hey, Ryan Wingo's more ready than we thought, or Ryan Niblett is awesome. Wow. Um, I think Jonte Cook's going to be great, just like a lot of people. And then, you know, Bond and Golden, we'll see how those guys produce. If they can just come in and do exactly what they did at their previous schools and do it here at Texas, would have no reason to think they couldn't in this offense and with Quinn Ewers at quarterback. So, yeah, I think going back to what, what we were talking with, you know, with the guys about earlier in Crosstalk, like just – and you just said this, like they're just in a really good position across the board. And you feel like that depth only helps you have an even better spring ball too, only a more competitive spring ball, a chance to say, Hey, you know, if a guy doesn't need to play in spring ball, like we don't need to push him too much. Like we've got competition down this position group, whatever it may be. So yeah, I think, I mean, you, you've, you've got to love a, you know, two weeks into spring ball, just, just where this, where this program's at. Yeah, indeed you do. And I uh, wanted to play one more video clip before we move on of Quinn really exhibiting that personality. Uh, this comes via Tyler Feldman with KVU. Shared the video. Says, nice to see when Ewers let his personality shine a little bit. Joe Cook of Inside Texas asks, what have you done to increase your durability? And here is Quinn's quick answer. Around 205, trying to get up to 210 right now. Um, I think that just... Just gaining good, and it's got to be good weight. It can't be, you know, that that mullet weight I had when I was back. When I was like <laughs> two twenty. <laughs> yeah, that that mullet weight, uh, the lifestyle that comes along with having a mullet, I guess. And that's some more great, not just personality, but awareness. Yeah. Realizing, hey, I needed to transform my body, and I give Quinn probably the most credit for that because you can have all the trainers in the world, the strength and conditioning staff a guy still has to commit to it and do the work. It's still his body. And then second, I give, you know, Tori Becton, all the training staff at Texas, a ton of credit too for, for not, you know, not necessarily like for, for playing the long game, if you will, with this and saying, Hey, okay, here's what you came in at. You know, you might need to play something similar to this your first year. And then the next year was shedding a lot of that weight, but not rushing it too. Because also, even if he's not growing taller, like we know, I mean, Trey, we were, we were both dudes that age, not that tall and that athletic, but still we were, we were dudes that age. You start to get a little bit of the grown man strength. So kind of melding that with a plan of attack and helping Quinn develop, you know, not just his game on the field and his, you know, slowing the game down that way for him, but helping his body mature into a real, like what you would see from an NFL starting quarterback. Cause that's really more what he looks like. Now we saw the, the mullet weight in year one, we saw him trim down a bunch in year two. And even he said, I was playing a little too light. And then now it's just kind of adding on that good weight, that that almost body armor. And who knows how much that actually helps because some you know freak injuries can happen. But the, I think there's there's no doubt the better shape you're in and the better your body is, is in, like the, the better chance you have to obviously avoid a significant injury, which if Texas wants to achieve its you know now national championship level goals that are finally realistic, they're going to need him healthy on the field. So I give Quinn a ton of credit for, for his part in the body transformation there. Cause obviously that's the most important. So those are the two clips we're playing. Was there anything else that he said yesterday that is worth a mention before we move on? I wouldn't say anything specific. We talked to linebacker David Benda as well, and he gave some good insight into his decision to come back too, which was a little bit different than Quinn's because he's, coming back for his sixth year and 
you know, doesn't have a first or second round projection on him. I'm sure he's a guy that could get an opportunity in the NFL somewhere, but um, he talked a lot about wanting to come back and be the guy that helps these younger guys buy into the culture and continue this culture forward because, you know, Jade Barron coming back, he'll play a similar role, but yeah. it is a lot of young guys. I mean, you could throw a, a Michael Taff in that same, that same role, a Baron Sorrell, Collins, Broughton, Burke even. So there are guys there that, you know, are guys coming back to lead, but you're losing a lot of, a lot of those real true, true leaders that had been there and had been the leading voice for a while, like a Jalen Ford immediately comes to mind. Um, so maybe he kind of goes into that, that Jalen Ford role where, yeah, he's, look, he's not as talented as Anthony Hill. Like Ant he's not making all the crazy highlight plays like Anthony Hill, but if you have a guy who uh, is, is buying in and guys can look to and lead and he's a, I mean, David Bend is a great, you know, gregarious personality, another guy who's great and shows a ton of honesty and personality with the media. So I'm sure that even when the cameras are off translates even more to the locker room. So he talked a bunch about that. And he also talked a lot about just kind of the obvious of wanting to come back because he kept going this close, this close for just how they were to playing for a national championship. And, you know, who knows if they would have beaten Michigan, but I mean, they would have played in Houston for a national championship. So he, you know, this talked about how that, that leadership side of it combined with knowing that this team really has a chance to take that even next step towards national championship, you know, contention was big reason why he came back. There was some talk right after that semifinal game that Benda may follow Cho to Nevada, which was concerning because he was this team's best linebacker down the stretch. You mentioned Anthony Hill, obviously a ton of potential. Anthony Hill's still trying to figure out the uh, pass defense part of that position. David Benda was this team's most well-rounded linebacker over the last three to four weeks. And that includes that semifinal game too, where he was one of a handful of defensive guys who uh, came ready to play when everybody else seemed a, a little bit shell shocked. Yeah. And again, you like, I, I didn't say, I didn't mean to say all that to discount his production and how good of a player he was on the field, but it really is just huge to have a guy like that, that, you know, you can count on the production, but then also, you know, can, can lead the way. Like if you're Sark, Pete Kwiatkowski, all the Texas coaches, you know that he's going to almost self-police the culture. He's going to be the guy leading that because I think you do worry about that a little bit when you lose, not just on the defensive end of Jalen Ford or Tavondre Sweat, Byron Murphy, all these guys, but you lose the guys on, on the other end of it too. Yeah, you bring Quinn back, but you know, you lose Jonathan Brooks, Savior Worthy, Adonai Mitchell. So, and, and even Sanders was a guy that'd been here the entire Sark era. Um, so yeah, I think guys like, you know, Benda, and then I don't want to leave Jade out of there too, because I think he's another super senior coming back where you just can't even begin to describe how huge that is for Texas on and off the field. I'm still in a little bit of disbelief that he's back. And I realized that it was a weird last handful of games for him, really starting with that Houston game that they wanted to keep him out of, but then they had to bring him in because there was a chance that they were going to lose to the Cougars. And just, I feel like there was maybe some sort of minor injury that was affecting him the rest of the way to get him back is enormous. I mean, this is a guy that Sark trusted as a leader to enough of a degree that he was one of several guys at media days last year in Arlington and through the first half of the season, you could argue that he was the defensive MVP of this team. I realize people are probably giving that to Devondre Sweat, but that's how important he was for that second slash third level playing the nickel position. His open field tackling ability is some of the best I've seen in a long time. He yeah. struggled at times in coverage, especially towards the end of the year. But like you said, don't based on what happened, the Houston game, even the Baylor game, I know that was earlier in the year, but there were times where you know, you were curious if he was truly a hundred percent, but man, some of those stops that he made on third down, um, like I, like I said, just that open field tackling, I, I think is huge to just have a, we talked about it with the receivers and complimentary skill sets, the running backs, complimentary skill sets. You want that in your defensive backfield as well. You want a guy who, of course, you'd like every guy to have every single specialty and, you know, be a five-star first round pick across the board. But yeah, to have a guy like Jade, the the leadership off the field, and then I think that that open field tackling is just something that you don't see in every defensive back. Going to take a quick commercial break or hear from some of our sponsors anyhow, including a TV spot before we get to the NCAA going an interesting angle with sports gambling. First, though, a word from our friends at Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. 
Welcome to Culver BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Now, Tom McKay and Audiovisual Consultations. Hi, this is Tom McKay with Audiovisual Consultations. Today's home electronics can be a bit daunting. My company has spent the last 36 years making sure they are not. For those of you who have not experienced our services yet, we'd like to invite you to give us a try for all your home electronics needs. We carry all the major brands of televisions and stereo equipment at prices you can't find in stores. And we come to you. There's no need to leave your home to find great pricing and incomparable service. No traffic, inexperienced sales geeks, or pushy showroom tactics. We believe in having some fun and dreaming big. Do you have a dream for your home entertainment? Let us know. We can make it come true. And we are always there to help after the job is done. We cultivate clients for a lifetime by treating everyone like their family. No, not those family members. I'm talking about the ones you actually like. So relax, hug your kids, make love to your wife, and smile. Then, when you have a moment, give us a call at 255-8678. That's 512-255-8678. Or online at avconsultations.com. All right. The NCAA was back in the headlines yesterday after President Charlie Baker decided that something needs to be said about sports betting and the integrity of college sports. Now, this is the NCAA, so you would assume that whatever the response is is completely off base or several years behind the times. And you would be right because Charlie Baker is renewing a push to ban prop betting on college sports games, Jeff. And also, the the other thing with this too is there's – I was kind of curious that they were making such a big deal about this specifically because there's already quite a few states that don't let you do prop bets on like legal gambling states where you can't do prop bets on certain, like, I guess, college, all college athletics. So it seems like a classic NCAA case where they're almost like focusing so hard on one thing that I'm not saying it's not an issue, but they're like, hey, we got to do something about this. And they just pick one thing to dial in on and focus and hone in on so much that it doesn't really solve whatever they perceive to be the bigger picture problem, which I'm not saying this is perfect. I just think a lot of what we're dealing with right now, we'll look back on later and probably just call it growing pains. Because if all these leagues and whoever want to be in bed with the sports books and we're going to make it, I mean, it's almost, it's almost, it's legal almost everywhere. We're not in a legal state technically, but if you're going to be in bed as a league with sports books, then even ESPN, um, our biggest media company, our biggest media outlet in sports still is they have their own sports book. So there's just so many blurred lines that trying to come out of nowhere and fix this is just kind of feels like a fool's errand or just focusing in the wrong spot, which the NCAA is known for. Yeah, misguided energy, misguided effort, I think, is a good way to think about it. It's like somebody who wants to fight pollution, environmental pollution, uh, advocating for the banning of plastic straws. Will it make a small dent? Maybe, but like, don't you want to try and go after a bigger fish here? For those wondering, you just mentioned uh, sport, prop sports betting at the college level is only fully legal in Kansas, Louisiana, Michigan, Wyoming, and Washington, D.C., and it accounted for just 1.4% of total DraftKings wagers last year, too. And also, guess what? We're not in a legal state here. You can still do underdog. You can still do all these other things where you're basically, that's basically prop betting. It's like a legal loophole in Texas. What what is underdog? Underdog fantasy. So it's, uh, and there's a couple other ones too, but basically you pick, so you could do it tonight for for the Sweet 16 games. Mm -hmm. And you could pick Terrence Shannon, more or less 17 and a half points. So they set a line. You just pick more or less. That's basically what, that's essentially exactly what prop betting is like Trey, you and I could play another commercial right now, download that and probably be signed up in five minutes and place a lineup or a card for tonight. So sure. You can't go on a site and say, I want to put 
eight hundred dollars on the over under of you know x players points or x players assists rebounds but you can go do it on all it's it's DraftKings like i've never done it i mean i've done DraftKings, and yeah that's not specific with the props but you're still putting a guy in a DraftKings lineup hoping that they surpass a certain amount of points and win you money like to me i don't know how that that's not gambling too but there's there's quite a few legal loopholes now so i mean the percentage you brought up too is what did you say it was one to two percent of of all money bet on sports one one point four percent yeah well and that's what i'm saying like because there's so many other ways to for people to bet like i do i'll say this for the ncaa i do understand to a point where they don't like that they don't like the what happens on the back end with certain bad actors getting pissed when they lose and finding a way to track down these athletes and, you know, stupid stuff as stupid as death threats or, you know, hate speech, harassment online. Like, like I get all that. I don't want anyone to have that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, banning that when it's actually already banned to what both of us said in quite a few States, like, I just feel like that's picking something like a really small part of the problem and trying to attack it that way. And it's basically a facade that they care, you know, and acting like acting like they care, essentially. I'd be curious to know the examples of student athletes being harassed by prop betters for failing to make them money. Well, I mean, I know not a college player, but Tyrese Halliburton had a rant about that with the media a couple weeks ago about, yeah, like, I don't care that, like, I had one bad night and it blew up your parlay. I'm totally paraphrasing that there, but that was essentially what he was what he was getting at. And he was saying that because of the, you know, I guess be it Instagram or Twitter, the stuff like directed his way on social media. And I don't want to downplay that because I don't receive that stuff at that level. I mean, obviously, I've gotten pissed off emails and tweets and things like that before. I'm not getting it to the level of a professional athlete or a highly you know, successful college athlete, but still it's kind of like you almost have to find a different way to not see that block people, like whatever you need to do. Like I'm trying to be empathetic, but also say, Hey, you kind of need to have your people help you take care of that too. This is a lesson and an adjustment that I don't care who you are. I don't care what age going forward. If you're using social media, you have to learn how to self filter a certain amount of bullshit. You just do. And that doesn't mean that his frustrations aren't warranted, but examine what's going on there and what you can do differently to not have to deal with that bullshit anymore. And yeah. the, the mute button is a beautiful thing. The block button is an even more beautiful thing. And just not engaging. Like, even if you look at it, just laugh it off. And again, sometimes easier said than done if you catch somebody in the right or wrong moment. But that's just a sad fact of social media life that uh, everybody needs to come to terms to and stop letting themselves become so triggered by it all. If it's that big of a problem, the best solution is just to quit that social media altogether. Find a social media that is more geared towards what you're looking for. Puppy dog videos and pictures of hot girls, you know, wh whatever, whatever that person's goal is with social media or just keeping up with your friends, obviously. And hopefully these college athletes right now are, growing up in an era where programs, their coaches, their athletic departments, their parents, the other people around them that they trust are teaching them kind of like you just did in a shorter way, how to operate in this world. I get it for some of the guys that are a little bit older now and maybe, maybe our age, you know, where social media wasn't huge when they were coming up as a recruit or a high school athlete, even a college athlete or beginning of their professional careers. But you need to have people around you that are teaching you how to, as you said, filter that stuff out of your life or really just not even use social media. And these athletes need to be, need to be taught. I think that, Hey, like you are fairly or unfairly going to be held to a higher standard because of the reach you have when you clap back. No one is going to see that tweet, that Instagram message, unless you put it out there for the most part, you know, you, you quote tweeting it and going on some rant is only calling more attention to the troll. Exactly. And, and now that all that's going to do, 
him coming out and saying that that's only going to enable more people to heckle him when he goes on the road or to heckle him online. And I'm just using Halliburton as the example, because he's the one that came out. So, you know, staunchly against it the most recently, but we've seen it with football players in fantasy, like the guy of a bad game quote, tweet somebody look, you know, with a egg picture, like no profile picture, even it's like, dude, what are you doing? Quote tweeting this guy. Exactly. Like, I get it. You're frustrated. You had a bad game. You're a human being too. I do my absolute best to be very empathetic to that, that these are humans at the end of the day, but still like you kind of have to fly above that. And it's easier said than done, but you know, the money and fame that you have, it comes with some, you know, other, other side of the sword type of deals too. Yeah, also keep in mind that there's a good chance that who or whatever it is that you think you're responding to isn't actually a human. It's just a bot that's been designed to uh, create interaction, positive or in most cases negative. So just have that perspective on things. It's either a real life loser who is trying to get at you or it's a complete non-human altogether that's coming from some sort of uh, spam bot farm here in the States or someplace else. You know, some of these bots have gotten really good with their responses. Oh, like yeah. I can I can sniff it out because I'm a millennial, but I could see how like even someone my parents' age would look at that and be like, oh, that's an interesting response and totally think it's real. Yeah, no, uh, AI has caught up with human intelligence and maybe then some. And so now we have to figure out how we integrate it into our way of life without having it take over altogether. Or maybe we want it to take over. Maybe we just want to be the slaves, right? I don't know if we could cover all that in 10 minutes. No, we can't. But I am curious what sort of response Shohei Otani gets at away games this year with what has transpired over the last week plus now. You're a SoCal guy, a Dodgers fan, who now has Shohei Otani to root for. Just as the place this year, not going to pitch, I believe, until 2025. But wow, what a news story that, uh, has come out of his camp in the recent past and has taken a couple of different turns along the way. Most recently, or at least most recently that I saw with him giving a statement suggesting that the initial story of him loaning money was BS. And actually this money was stolen from him. What do you think about all of this? I want to believe him. Like nope. I, I do. I mean, I, I just, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt initially that he wouldn't be this pardon the dog here, that he wouldn't be this ridiculous, like that he wouldn't be this silly and stupid. Yeah, but we also had that initial story too and a crisis communications expert who's helping him craft that initial response before things take a sudden turn. The problem is when you look at very basic elements of this story, for him not to have known anything would have been very difficult with the amount of money that you're talking about being wired. People who are responsible for those accounts have to give the okay when $500,000 is being wired from one place to another, much less that happening multiple times. Yeah, what was the number? 4.6 million? Yeah, I saw 4.5, but it could have been 4.6. I mean, okay, I'm wondering if what this really is, is he actually didn't do any of the gambling, but he was trying to help his buddy out, but he knows that that's not going to be believable at all. As many people he has that are already skeptical about this. Maybe it was just, Hey, that was the cover up, And that was the initial maybe miscommunication was, Hey, this is not going to be believable enough guys. And they finally got the right people and the right people to clean it up came, came in quickly and said, no, this is what it has to be. We have to call it a massive theft. Everyone has to go with this. You two cannot communicate anymore. Like to me, I think that's the most believable part where he did say, Hey, I'll try to, I'll try to help you cover some of this. And, you know, we can go from there because because it is it's difficult to believe when you see that clip of them being so buddy buddy in the dugout like an hour and a half before all this comes to light publicly. I don't see how a guy who makes what the interpreter made is betting four and a half million dollars worth of bad bets. Well, that that's what everybody's been saying, too, is maybe not on the bad bets part, but. How does somebody who makes 300 grand a year get a $5 million line of credit right. from a casino? Because uh, I've never 
thankfully I've never made enough money to lose that amount of money. <laughs> but if I did, I would think that there would have, there would be some sort of vetting process or, you know, building of a relationship going forward, you know, over a course of time that says, okay, this person is good for this amount of money. They will pay this amount back. I mean, almost like a credit card, right? You know, you get your first credit card and your initial credit line is $3,000. Then you show that you can pay that back and your income goes up and, you know, now it's 10,000 and so on. You would think that it would be a similar, similar process there, but I, I'm, I mean, this probably isn't the, you know, the most controversial answer here, but like as a Dodger fan, I'm just sitting back and waiting and, and I'm going to take him at his word that he did not gamble and he definitely did not gamble on baseball. I'm going to take him at his word on that. And I'm going to kind of sit back and let it play out. Yeah, the betting on baseball is going to end up being a huge detail here because reports right now suggest that it wasn't about baseball. If it's not about baseball, this story is significantly less bad. It's really, Oregon. to me, it's really not that much of a story if he's not betting on baseball. It's be, it's going to become a story if that's what comes out, is that he was betting and it wasn't on baseball, but really only because of what the story's become. Because then it's going to be, well, why'd you lie about all this? Yeah, and the timing is also a little bit weird too, right? Is it wasn't it August, September, September, October of last year? You mean when the money was transferred? Yeah, that the money was being wired. Yeah, I think so. So is that end of season baseball betting? Is that betting on the start of football? Is it there's something completely different going on there? I mean, look, if he was betting on baseball, like this is over. Like this isn't even this isn't even an argument. Like I think people are people almost confuse this too much with like, oh, the lines are being blurred right now. Sure, they're being a little bit more blurred. And as I said earlier, we might be going through some growing pains as we ease sports betting into the mainstream, although we're not really easing it anymore. It's been force fed into the mainstream. There's going to be some things that come up like this, the, the, the John Tay Porter prop bet thing. Now, you know, the NCAA, what well, we just talked about with them, but there's one thing that will always remain. You cannot bet on the sport you play or coach while you are active. Like, I don't care how much more mainstream this gets with gambling. That will always be one thing for the integrity of the game. I don't care if MLB players bet on football. Like, I really don't think that matters. What's the difference between that and them going to the casino to play poker? Like, if they don't play in that, if they don't play that sport, to me, it's just not that big of an issue. Well, that's partially bullshit, in my opinion. I think that guys should be allowed to bet on themselves, like for the uh. better. Like saying that they're going to eclipse a certain prop bet, let's say, or bet that their team is going to win, and that should be advertised on the broadcast too. But then, That's why would you watch? Why would you watch that game if you know that there the competitive integrity of it is basically BS? It's nothing. no, the integrity is not BS. If they're saying I'm going to do better than what Vegas thinks I'm going to do, they're they're trying to achieve greatness that day. Okay, so so what you're saying is you're so what you're saying is they have to they have to bet the overs then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. As long as well, betting the over or, or betting the win, then yeah, that I'm I'm much more okay with that, and it should be advertised on the games. That's interesting. I see. I the way I was disagreeing with that was then you could have guys betting their unders too, in theory. You like because there's the two side, there's two it sides to every prop. There's an over and an under. Oh, no, it's only about overachieving for what is predicted for you that game. That's the only way that you can bet on yourself. You can't bet on yourself to fall short of that because that's an easy one to cover. Okay, you know where okay, you know where we need to test this out because I don't want this just thrown into the NFL. Spring uh, football. Uh, call Spring it football, football league. Let's, call the rock. Call the rock. Let's do this in let's do this in this in the new spring football league before it starts. Everything should be on the table for the UFL right now. Larry David called the rock with an idea about eliminating kicking altogether. The UFL should absolutely do that and call it the Larry David rule. Just to try and drum up as much interest in that sport as possible. And it, it would honestly, I'd be surprised if they weren't trying some innovative things with gambling because they understand how many people tune into random fucking regular season, whatever game, even NBA, NHL, college basketball, whatever it is. Like what percentage of that national audience is there because of gambling. So the UFL would be stupid not to try and cater to that in some way, shape or form. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would think, like, I think you're, 
idea is probably a little bit ahead of its time, like ahead of where we are. What's that? So that's what they always say about me a little bit ahead of my time. (laughs) I just, I don't think we're there yet. Like, I don't think that, like, I don't want to write that idea off, but I just think seeing that in the NFL or the NBA anytime soon is, is just too far off right now. But again, like if, if you told me 10 to 15 years ago that like Charles Barkley would be making his picks on inside the NBA against the spread, or they would be making prop bets. They do that on inside the NBA and all these other shows. They literally, and the funny thing about that is I've seen them do it on ESPN and for college games. They do it for college games where they have the announcers be like, oh, who, is so-and-so going to score more, more than X amount of points today? So that that's bring, to bring it back to the NCAA thing, that's the comedy in all this too, is all these entities are supposed to be working together, yet everything is just exploding all over the place. Yeah, as long as it's a bit and not a major part of the programming, I'm okay with something like that. But it is starting to feel a little bit too oversaturated with sports broadcasts, including the pre and to a lesser degree, the post game shows. So I know that for me, I don't have an issue with it. I'm a very casual gambler. Like as much as we we joke about, you know, all betting on like a whack basketball game, like I'm putting three to five dollars on my golf guys to win like a big chunk of money and i'm hedging it with like i have a plan not saying that plan always works but (laughs) if i were to lose all of that money it would not be even remotely close to a significant sum of money and it would take me a long time to do that so i'm someone that they would be like targeting i guess and even i think it's a bit much to have guys and ladies on these broadcasts that you know most of them don't really care about that. Like Charles Barkley, like I, I just use him as the example because he's the most popular. Do you really think that if he retired from inside the NBA, he'd be sitting around placing $10 over under bets or whatever his equivalent of $10 is? Like probably not. Uh, but I, I know there's people like my dad who he gets into it with me. He's like, oh, who are we taking this week? And he'll send me five bucks to put on a golfer that he really likes. And if it wins, I'll send him money. Like that's the extent that we do it. He it drives him crazy. He's like, I don't need all this flashing on the screen all the time. And you know, again, he's he's not the one they're targeting because he's in his early 60s now. But I do know there's a lot of people that that can't stand it. It's information overload. It really is. And this like the win probability up at the top on all these games, like that's not why we watch sports for the win probability. I hate that stupid statistic. I hate that statistic. It's just like one more number to throw out there, but Maybe it gets back to the point that we were just talking about with social media harassment for not hitting a prop. Like you just kind of have to learn to block that out if you want to continue to watch sports or and sports channels aren't going to do this because it's also intertwined now is you have broadcast on multiple channels on like an ESPN, let's say maybe they have an offering that is lighter on some of the side info that is bracketing the television screen. Or I think pr- probably similar to that point, have a secondary broadcast, like have an alternate channel or have a stream. Yeah. So let's say the game is on a regional network, put, put the gambling broadcast on its own alternate, you know, telecast or stream. And I know maybe not to a gambling extent, ESPN's already done that with the Manning cast. They did it in college football with Pat McAfee and his crew down on the field on, you know, the Texas Alabama game was oh, the, that right? Yeah, the Texas Alabama game was the Fowler Herb Street broadcast on ESPN. And I believe ESPN2 or another one of their channels, they had Pat McAfee and his guys down on the field in like a, like our boxes, kind of like a small box with those guys up at the top and then a box down at the bottom. And they would be doing their thing and it would be more reactionary, not as like polished. But if you wanted that, you could get that. And then also, you know, now you could make that where that's more the gambling side of it. And I know there's there are radio programs that that do that to an extent too. Interesting. We bring Zay aboard now. We had one other thing that we wanted to talk about, Jeff, and maybe we'll get Zay's thoughts on this real quick. Uh, Caitlin Clark received an offer from Ice Cube and the Big Three yesterday to come play for them for a year for five million bucks. Seems like a pretty good deal for her. I'd be interested in watching the Big Three at that point, which I haven't really been up to this juncture. What about you guys? 
I'll, I'll start. I, I just think she's going to make so much money in these endorsement deals, even more than she's making now that the potential downside of what could happen on the court, I don't think is worth that extra money. Like, I don't think she needs to do that for her brand. I get the positives are, you know, what it could do. It could do even more for women's sports and for the, you know, the growth of that side of it. But also like if she just gets worked by these washed up, you know, former players, men's players that are like in their mid forties. Like, I don't know what that does for anybody. Like, I don't think you, that does. You think, you think there's, there's a good chance that that happens. Then these middle-aged former NBA players are still head and shoulders better than her at basketball. I I do. I just don't think it's, I mean, I think she would hold her own potentially and compete, but so she holds her own. Like, great. Like what, like what's, what's like the really good thing that comes out of that. I mean, yeah. I guess a little more attention, but we're really only going to go, but this is either going to go really bad or really good. That's the only way that it gets a lot of attention. I think if she just goes there and, and plays in the big three and averages a, a couple buckets a game, like, I, I don't know, or she just jacks up threes and like, they're not falling. Like I, I just, I'm trying to picture it playing out of my head. And I don't think the potential positives are worth the potential negatives for her when money is not going to be an issue. She's going to endorse everything under the sun which she was, she's already doing. Maybe she sets a four-point field goal record. What do you think, Zay? Um, I don't think the world is ready to see Caitlin Clark going down the middle and getting elbowed by Xavier McDaniel. That's not a good look. That, that, that's just not a good look. You know, Caitlin, she doesn't deserve that. Chip and I discussed this yesterday, which Chip and I, we're not the biggest Caitlin Clark fans. She's a little dirty. She's a little slimy. Mm. And that last game against West Virginia rubbed me the wrong way. Like the free throw differential is 25 attempts wise, 30 for Iowa, five for West Virginia. What are we doing? I get we want to see her in the final four and stuff. And that's what's going to sell tickets and get everybody's popcorn out and stuff. But come on, like, really? She, she, you know, uh, Ice Cube's wrong for it. Ice Cube, come on. There's a lot of women that you could have thrown in there. Why start with Caitlin Clark? Oh, because it's a brilliant business move. By the way, welcome to fucking basketball. I can't believe yeah. there's such a free throw disparity. <laughs> well, I see this the college is more like the NBA than ever before, I guess. College women, I should say. This, this is a, like you said, Trey, it is a pure attention getting like the big three must be really, really desperate for a new TV contract or something, because this is a desperate attempt by the big three to get a new TV deal. And I don't blame ice cube for doing it. I mean, Caitlin Clark is the hottest thing going right now. People will tune in. It's a novelty. Um, he's talking about, she can play the big three and the, WNBA, but if I'm Caitlin Clark and I'm already banking, I just want to be the best among my peers. I don't think I need to be the novelty act. Now, maybe she's got more charisma. Maybe she's got some Madonna, Bobby Riggs, like entertainment performer aspect to her that I don't know about. She looks pretty homely to me with a Great jump shot from West Des Moines. Doesn't seem like she's, you know, seen the world very much. I could be dead wrong. But, yeah, if I'm advising Caitlin Clark, I'm I'm thinking twice about this. Now, look, $5 million is $5 million. And she'll probably take a couple elbows in the, in the chops from Xavier McDaniel for $5 million. Um, yeah, but then but then she takes fat Khalid El Amin to the hole a couple of times. Yeah. Out, you know? She ain't taking any of those boys to the hole. She's gonna be shooting or trying to shoot over them. And they're six, seven, six, eight. It's a different world trying to get that shot off against yeah. you know the length of former NBA players. Oh, first of all, I, I don't want to watch that. That's a great point, shit, though, about the her if she's gonna do this, she needs to be an absolute like showboat about it. Like this needs to be the most entertaining thing I've ever seen. Like I need some globetrotter shit from her 
if, if we're if we're gonna do on this. the road with them, Barker. So they're on the road with the Harlem Globetrotters while we're at. It, but yes. I but say I don't I don't want to see her run around the three point. I don't want to watch the big three to begin with, and I oh, definitely no. don't want to watch it with Caitlin Clark running around jacking up threes. If I want to watch that, I'll just watch an Iowa women's basketball game or a WNBA game when she gets drafted. Like so, I don't see the benefit at all for her. But I mean, f- like you said, five million is five million. She's going to make a ton of money. She is not going to want or hurt for anything the rest of her life. She's already made a ton of money. And she's going, she's only going to make more. Golf has tried this with going all the way back to Michelle Wee. And then Lexi Thompson, about what, six, seven months ago, she played in a PGA tour event. That is that's a little more doable because it's like, hey, just tee it up and go play. There's not an element of direct, you know, bone on bone physicality in that. And she shot, I think she had a tough round early on and then almost made the cut. Like she shot under par the next day. And that then that sent people going, oh, that's really impressive. But even if she had played poorly, I think that the playing field's a little bit more level there. Like, yeah, Michelle Wee was never going to come in and win that event over Tiger and all those guys that were playing back then. But it's not it's not the same to just do that in a physical contact sport. What's the difference in distance for your best men's drivers versus women's drivers? <sighs> I mean, if just if I just guess off the top of my head, probably like the average PGA Tour driver versus LPGA at the top end for LPGA, like thirty or forty yards, maybe. Okay, yeah, that is less significant than I assumed it would be. I thought it would be closer to seventy or eighty. No, she are, like look, Lexi Thompson held her own when she you went. Are out having there to use play. longer clubs still, even with that thirty or forty yards, which does make a little bit of a difference. But yeah, that that is not as wide a gap as I assumed it would be. Yeah, like that's more just okay. You're hitting three wood into a couple more holes or six iron when the other guys are hitting nine or pitching wedge in. It's not as they, as they would say, going over the middle against uh, Xavier McDaniel. <laughs> Yo, do y'all remember X man? He was a nut. So he looked like an alien. He had those eyes, bald head. Yo, is that I dude really know. in the big three? I couldn't name one player in the big three. I don't know if X Men's in it, but that's the type of player that I think of that plays in the big three. Like I heard Kenyon Martin talking about it, who actually plays in it, and his Oak Cliff ass was like, "Yo, it's basically a level under prison ball." Like <laughs> Caitlin Clark don't want them problems. <laughs> yeah. Caitlin, you know, I'll just say this: Caitlin Clark is too good for that shit. <laughs> she she is too she's too good for that. Yeah, There's the benefit is not worth the money for her. The potential benefit in the versus the downfall. All right, here's here's some of the guys on big three rosters right now: Rashard Lewis, Reggie Evans, Robert <laughs> Dozier. Reggie Theus is the coach of that team. Next team is Three's Company: Mario Chalmers, Michael Beasley, Brandon Rush, Tony Allen, Julian. Twelve like team. Yeah, no kidding. The Aliens. Uh, are helmed by some dude named Dusan Bullet. Uh, Tom, Ovizef. I, boy, this is getting into an era of NBA that I have no fucking clue about. Rick Mahorn is the coach of that team. Ball Hall. Oh, hell. Caitlin Clark against a Rick Mahorn coach team. She's going to come out of there with a with broken bones. I found her coach. Rick Barry is the coach of the Ball Hogs. She could be teammates with Leandro Barbosa. Jody Meeks, Dewan Summers, Jalen Johnson. What are they going to be doing? Setting screens for her? Yeah. Like, exactly. Ice Cube's going to be like, you will set screens for her. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? You want your check? <laughs> you want your check this week? We got to make her look good. This he's, he's, he's got failure written all over it. This has got a 30 for 30 failure written all over it. But to the point that you guys made, it's a great business decision no matter what because we are talking about that this is the most media attention the big three's ever gotten. And she's probably – she'll probably come out later and say, I never even took that seriously. And then he just got all this free media attention from it. Zay, wasn't the big three born out of COVID? I don't remember. No, it was was pre-COVID. I interviewed Ice Cube a couple of times, interviewed Gary Payton once also. It was pre-COVID. But they did a reset. COVID allowed them to do a reset and bring the league back while rethinking a couple of things. 
Um, but uh, yeah, so they're they're trying hard. This may be their last run if they can't get C- Caitlin Clark, even with a guy like a Catino Mobley, a Daryl Green, a Jason Richardson, a Swag. Oh, hey. Swaggy P. Nick Young, the Longhorn Killer. <laughs> oh man, uh, San Fernando Valley hoops legend Nick Young. Let's go. Yo, legend, man. Cleveland High, stand up. Oh, baby. All right, guys. Have a good yeah, show. It's been a blast. Yeah, thank you so much for the time today. Great shit, man. See you guys. Hey, wait, we're, we off, right? Before y'all go, we off, right? Tomorrow? Uh, yeah, we're off, we're off tomorrow. Kevin and I will talk to you guys coming up at three, though. Okay, cool. Have a good show, boys. See you guys. All right. Hey, in the immortal words of Judy Brown, <laughs> happiness is a choice. We're happy to spend some time with us, Chip and Zay, holding it down midday right here. Texas Sports Unfiltered, where you come to have some laughs, get some infotainment. Here, my man, Perse Hilton's latest pettiness and gossip and his expertise on all things hoops. So, Zay, did you... uh, how you doing, first of all? I'm good. I know what you're getting to. I did my homework. Okay. I'm scared. Yeah. <laughs> I'm scared. Wait. Yo. This, is, this has got ambush written all over it's it. It's got ambush written all over it. I um, mean, they got, they got four fifth-year seniors. Yo. The Asian twins. Yo, again, for one, okay, we're talking know, about you don't know which is which. Saga women. We're talking about the Gonzaga women. Texas has to go out to Portland to play Gonzaga in uh, the Sweet 16, and we're that's what we're talking about. I told Zay, hey, will you watch this Gonzaga team and tell me what you think because I'm worried for the Texas women. It's a bad matchup. It's a bad matchup. We're the number one three-point shooting team in the nation. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bad matchup. You got five players over, double figures. Their whole starting five. Again, the Tron twins, those Asian twins, you don't know which is which. Right. It's pretty hard to match up with because right. they're very similar when they're game, but also different. So when you close out on one, your mind's going to be processing, oh, wait, okay, which one am I guarding? And I'm going to have to go by the jersey number. Like, you're really going to have to pay attention to the game plan and to the film and get them both down. They kind of just play them the same. You know, run them off the line. They create. They're really good passers. One is the second in all-time assist in Gonzaga history. You know, one of them broke their leg a year ago. So, they're, you know, slowly coming back. But, yeah, if you add, you know, homegirl, Ejim, she's she has so much – freedom in the post due to the outside shooting as you said number one in the nation now again this is the wcc women's like the wcc is already weak in the men's with say you saw saint mary's go down they won the league so the wcc is weak as hell let's just keep it real mark few anomaly he separates himself from everybody he's an excellent coach like you can't i don't right. even know why i doubt mark few so but but they beat stanford they beat stanford and they beat Alabama. Yeah. Who Texas just played in the NCAA tournament. They beat Alabama by 10. Yeah. Um, yeah. This this Gonzaga team, they are so tight, so connected. They're all seniors. Four of them are fifth-year seniors, including the Trong twins. And li- listen to this. I mean – I know people are like, are y'all really talking women's hoops? Yes, we are. It's the NCAA tournament. Yeah, they're 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 advancing. They have a chance to go to the daddy. Yeah, we're talking and, about it. Yeah, in Texas, the Texas women are the number one seed, right? They're they're the team, you know, according to the seeding, should go to the final four. Yeah. So Gonzaga is number 10 in scoring, number five in scoring margin. Texas is number four in scoring margin. Um, they're number Gonzaga. Number eight in field goal percentage at 48.6%. I mean, they shoot it. And they're number five in the nation in free throw percentage. Texas is 183rd in free throw percentage. And I'm telling you, this game's probably going to come down to free throws. Um, 
Gonzaga number one in three point field goal percentage at 40.1. Texas is 17 at 36.5. But they're Gonzaga's number four in assists per game. Like they share the ball. They yeah. and they they can all shoot it, like like Zay said. So they space the floor. Yvonne Jim is down low and she's really skilled and good at finishing. And this thing is, I mean, they are almost mirror images of each other. Uh, Texas is number six in rebound margin. Gonzaga is number eight. Yeah. So look, if Texas is locked in defensively and they're turning Gonzaga over, that's what they have to do. I mean, they're going to have to win this game by pressuring and getting Gonzaga out of their offensive flow. I mean, they're going to have to, and then yeah. hope that the refs aren't calling the game like the Iowa West Virginia game with Gonzaga ending up at the free throw line all day. Yeah, Chip, you might have to live with Iana Ejim going for 40. Yeah. I, 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 I'd right. go, I'd be the game plan if I was Vic Schaefer. You know, she's a post player down low. That what happens is you get so focused on her dominating you down low, you send those devil teams, and it allows those shooters to be open on the outside. Brianna Maxwell's a matchup nightmare. I don't know yeah. who Vic's going to put on her. Like, that's one of those, okay, she goes to the outside a lot, so Madison Booker, are you going to be able to chase her around and also have the same responsibilities on the offensive end? Because you got to put Shea Holly on one of the Tron twins. Like, that's yeah. just that's – like, I don't know which one. That's the scary thing. I guess the one that has the better statistics, you know what I'm saying, that's averaging 12 and 4, but the one that's – the other one's averaging 11 and 5. So, again, they're, they're – I don't know what Shaylee Gonzalez, it's going to be a tough matchup for her. It's going to yeah. be a tough one for her. Yeah, and like I said, they, they, don't really have a ton, they don't have a ton of height. Um, You know, I'd like to see Aaliyah Moore, you know, defend Yvonne E. Jim, but you, you might need Aaliyah Moore. You might want Deanna Gaston on, on E. Jim and Aaliyah Moore on – Brianna Maxwell, because Aaliyah's, I you don't think she can? I, I don't, nah, Brianna Maxwell got game. She be doing behind the back step backs and stuff. Like she, she let it up. I think Hollingsworth would be the better matchup for more. That, that's the thing. Like they're really versatile. And I mean, this team's a lot like Oklahoma, who beat Texas twice. Yeah. Yeah. They take they take your bigs away from the rim. Yeah. And this is a game where Vince, I mean uh Vic can't get you know, he's you would think, "Oh, Texas has size with Taylor Jones and Amina Muhammad and Amina's going to have to defend somebody cuz she's more athletic." This may not this may be a game where Taylor Jones barely plays, which is yeah. what happened against OU. As good as she is with her rim rim protection, and you know, this and then they play a zone. They're playing zone against Utah, and you know, Texas in the zone. We know Shaylee Gonzalez isn't knocking down that shot. Then that zone is offense isn't the best because Madison Booker. You know, it's hard for her to get to her spots. She still gets to them, but it's a little bit harder to get to her spots in the zone, knowing that they could collapse, especially on the 2-3 when she has the ball at the top of the key. So Shay Holly, Shaylee Gonzalez, they got to knock down those outside shots. Yeah, I'm nervous. You can't, you can't look forward to Stanford. The Gonzaga girls, yeah, all that experience that you said. And it's not – the Tron twins, they from Houston, man. They from Houston, so yo, a different type of toughness that they got, you know, like and they Jersey they Village, baby Jersey Village. Yeah, they they get it. I like them, man. I, I like their game. Like if just basketball wise, they're a fun team to watch. And yeah. you know, they also have the advantage of playing at the kennel the first two games, so we know how that crowd is. Like that 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 gives you an advantage. 
That's one of the best atmospheres in college basketball and that fan base. They roll for the women just like they roll for the men. So, yeah, they won't have that big of an advantage like the Kennel, but they'll still have a lot of home fans there due to it being in Portland. And the Horns, they got to overcome that too. Yeah, I mean, this is not a game where you need – I mean, I can see this game being close. I can see this game playing out just like the game in, in Norman against OU where it's right down to the wire. And in that game, Maddie Booker felt like she – needed to do everything and she ended up going one of nine in the fourth quarter and either other players weren't stepping up or they weren't looking for other players Vic you know let Maddie Booker continue to to shoot it and remember that game came down to that rebound that that Deanna Gaston could have grabbed and won the game instead she kind of she tipped it out and OU's Lexi Keys grabbed it and shot a three to win it by one. So, I mean, Texas, they know they have to rebound. They cannot give up second chance opportunities to this team. They have got to dominate the boards and be the more physical team, but they're going to have to be athletic. And I agree with you. Zay, I mean, I don't know. Did you watch the girl from Utah who had 35? Yeah, Peely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's how was she just they were just single team in her and she was getting whatever she wanted. Oh, she's cold. She's a top 10 pick in the WNBA draft. So, yeah, she's all they got over there in Utah. And yeah, it's just too much shooting. For Gonzaga and that crowd, man, that crowd was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> like, like well, that crowd, that the kennel, I'm telling you, the kennel is a crazy atmosphere. And that crowd was so intense. I think it overwhelmed the Utah girls. So, yeah, I mean, P Pilly, she's nice and all, but they don't have the talent that Texas does. So yeah. that game was a little bit harder to judge, knowing that Gonzaga had the home court advantage and also knowing that just Utah and Texas, two completely different teams, not only talent-wise, but just, you know, measurements and everything else that goes into it. But, yeah, I, I, I Vic's, would – Vic's not happy. What do you he's mean he's like, not happy? He's like, we're the one seed and we're getting sent west – and we're playing a virtual home game for Gonzaga. Yeah, they're lazy in women's. Like, I, I didn't know. It doesn't make sense that there's only just two sites. It's Portland and on the other side, what is it? Like, there's yeah. no Midwest or yeah. South. Or, right, there's nothing in the middle of the country. It's, there's nothing in the middle of the country. There's just those sites. It doesn't make sense. Like, why, let's not be lazy. Y'all don't have to <laughs> – y'all can spread it out. Like, really? I get it. It's women's basketball and, you know, whatever. But, yeah, you're screwing teams by doing it like that because Texas, they should have been in the South. They should have been playing in Oklahoma City or something. And it should have been good. But whatever. Uh, yeah, if I was Vic Schaefer, I wouldn't be happy either, especially with this Gonzaga playing in Portland, being in Spokane, Washington. I mean, come on now. That's an easy drive for them folks. Yeah. Well, Vic got sent when he was with Texas A&M. They were the number two seed in 2010, got sent to Sacramento, played seven-seeded Gonzaga and lost 72-71. So Vic has – you know, PTSD from the last time he he faced Gonzaga. Uh, he was and an Aggie. He, he had no, you know, it was going to yeah. happen. It was going to happen. Well, and Lisa Fortier uh, was not the coach then, and she's got it going right now for the Zag. So, yeah, yeah this is going to be a great test. Let Ejim get 30. Go for 40. Let, let her get it. Let her go for it. Play good D, obviously. We're not going to actually let her do it. But don't allow Brianna Maxwell, the Tron Twins, Hollingsworth, all those ladies are shooting over 37%. The Tron Twins are shooting over 40%.
Brianna so Maxwell, is this a game? Is this a game where you put Jaka Langham, Wen, and Tonda on Brianna Maxwell? Yeah. Yeah. At times, for sure. Yeah. Because like they're gonna go at Shaylee Gonzalez. They're whoever. There's no good matchup for her, and you know Vic plays her 35 minutes plus. They're gonna go at her like people go at Max A. Smiths. That's what they're gonna do. They're going to attack her and see what she's made of. And hopefully it's just going to bring out those basketball instincts in Texas where they overhelp and try to help for Shaylee Gonzalez. And you have such good passers and the Tron twins. They're going to make the right play and they're going to get those hockey assists and the ball's going to jump around the perimeter and it's going to end up wide open in the shooter's hands and they're going to let it fly. Yeah, like, they move the gotta ball. got to stay sound. Yeah. <laughs> they move the ball. It's – it's impressive. Like, I hope they're really studying film and just see what they're up against. Because if they don't lock in, this they could get. They could get. Well, I, they're tough enough that they'll make it a game. But yeah, you gotta you gotta run girls off the line that know they're gonna make the right play but make them scores. And what I mean by that is if you're the Tron twins that knows that when I pump fake and that person jumps and now I have a driving lane, somebody's going to step up. That's just, you have to, that's what you're taught. That's basketball. One on one. That's going to leave step up to help. That's going to leave somebody else to be open. Yeah. Play the pass. Yeah. Play the pass. Force those girls to look for their shot when they drive because they want to shoot the three first and then they want to drive the pass. I'm, tra I'm talking about specifically the Tron twins because they yeah. know Hollinsworth and Maxwell on the outside ready to shoot. Or they'll try to throw the little bounce pass to Egypt for the layups. Make the Tron twins try to take over the game shooting-wise and don't allow them to shoot threes. You've got to take away the three first. I think that should be the point of emphasis and then you go from there. But if EGM's killing in the first two quarters and you're still close and in the game, I wouldn't trip. I would stick to the game plan because that means that the other girls are probably not in the rhythm yet due to them not getting touches. When everybody's getting touches for a team like Gonzaga, which just like you see in the men's, like everybody's getting touches for teams like UConn and the North Carolina Tar Heels. That's when they're at their best. That's what you separates good teams from the lanes and teams that don't make it this far. So, yeah, I think Vic Schaefer and them got a good test in their hands. And, yeah, you damn sure can't look forward to Stanford. Yeah, they average – Gonzaga averages almost 10 made threes per game. Average. So, oh, yeah, fun, I'm bro. with you. That's a great call. That's a great call. And that's – that's what my man Zay comes up with, right? I mean, the right call, the great call. Play the pass. Play don't the pass. Be, don't be stepping up to help. Play the pass. Make them make them shoot. Yeah, this is gonna be it's gonna be a hell of a matchup. And it's late, right? This game's like at nine o'clock on Friday night. Yeah. Uh and, like, there's so many different ways to go about that, Chip, because some people are like, well, Zay, won't they just take open layups? No, that's not the case. That means if I am guarding one of the Tron twins and I bite on one of their pump fakes from three and they drive and a person comes to help, I'm not going back to the Tron twin. I'm going to that man who's open because my teammate is helping me out. So whoever they were guarding, I'm going there off jump like you don't even think about getting back to your man like oh i got beat i need to right. find the open person immediately which that's most likely gonna be pretty close to me because my person that's being helped they're gonna be the closest ones so i i like the rotations have to be good and you practice those things like you practice different rotations like you gotta throw different looks out there it's just like a difference in football you give them different looks. Sometimes you play tight. Sometimes you play loose. Sometimes you pretend like you're going to play tight and back up at the last minute when the ball snapped. Like, it's just different strategic ways to make life difficult for an offense. And I think Vic Schaefer, he's really good at that. And they might – I don't. I wouldn't play zone against this team, 
But just if they get hot, maybe just to slow the game down for a little bit to where they get a little confused because they aren't expecting it, throw that zone at them. But with the shooting that they have, I wouldn't recommend it for a long time. Yeah, this is a game where you really miss Rory Harmon because oh my gosh, man, her speed and quickness on defense would take away one of the Tarong twins. Yeah, um, and then you take your chances with Shea Holly against the other one, and yeah, because there's there's really no depth. Yeah, behind Shea and Shaley, other than Jacalenga Men Moen and Tonda who is a bit foul prone, but that's okay. It's okay. Yeah, that's all right. Just stay out there, you know, but yeah, you want to speed a team like Gonzaga up and they move the ball so quickly. They don't get sped up very much. Um, the women's final four is in Cleveland. And I'll say this, my hot take, if Texas beats Gonzaga, I think Texas goes to the final four. Okay. I think they I think they beat Stanford. If you know, if they beat Gonzaga, they will have absolutely earned it. Um, and I'm I'm super excited for this game. Friday night, nine o'clock. Um, they're playing in Portland, which is a five hour drive from Spokane, but that's also like one of the biggest population centers for Gonzaga graduates. Like, you know, Arizona graduates go to LA. Well, Gonzaga graduates go to Portland. They go to Seattle and Portland. So they're going to have a ton of people there. And this is going to be just like going to Kansas city for the big 12 tournament when you're playing K state and the whole house is against you. And Vic said, we're going to be the villain. We're going to be playing the villain. Everyone's going to be cheering against us. So yeah, that you can pretty much count on that. Um, all right. Good stuff, Zay. Anything else on your your homework that you – I mean, that was a great breakdown. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, I think if I'm Madison Booker, this might be one of those games that you have to take over. And Madison Booker's passing has came a long way since – Rory Harmon first got hurt and Vic Schaefer gave her the reins to be the point guard of this team. So I trust her decision-making and there it's kind of like just on the opposite side. Cause we haven't talked about the offense much for Texas going into this game. They have no one that could stop Madison Booker. So they're, they're probably going to play a zone for the whole game. Yeah. And you know, at times, when they play zone, she just stays out on top. Right. And that's I don't a think concern. that's good. It's not. That's but how, you got to make her move because when she moves, the defense knows she's such a star. Everybody's eyes are going to be watching her move because it's important to find where thirty five is. So if you just have her standing up top the whole time, just passing it around. And then every now and then when the shot clock's going down, she then has to make a move herself and shoot a pull up. Like that's good and all, but at this point of the season, when everybody's good, that can only get you so far. So having her just move around and move to the wing and go through, you know, the baseline and through the middle and sometimes flash in the middle and stop to where if she catches it and turns around and no one's there, or if they pick up on her, she can see Aaliyah Moore or see Taylor Jones or Deanna Gaston down low and make that quick pass, kind of like a high low action. But just, just having movement with Madison Booker in the zone offense is very important, especially against a team like Gonzaga who doesn't have any, Anybody that could check her. And that will allow Shaylee Gonzalez, because again, all eyes are on Mass and Booker when she goes through and like, you know, flashes and then moves to the corner or wing. All eyes will be on Shay Holly or, or eyes won't be, excuse me, on Shay Holly and Shaylee Gonzalez because they'll be open due to those eyes on Mass and Booker. So they'll have open shots and that ability to knock down the jumper and separate the game with a three ball. So yeah, I. I, I, that's one thing I don't think we've talked about much with Vic Shaver because teams don't play zone often, but when they do, his offense is a little odd 
it's a little odd. And he's trying to get the high low action. Like that's what he's trying to do. He's not necessarily looking for threes. He's not settling. Like that's what they want you to do when you play zone. They want you to settle for just right. And you have to get the ball inside. You have to get the ball inside. So that's what he's doing. He's making sure that with those girls just standing on the perimeter, which is really old school basketball. Like again, this is Hoosier Gene Hackman zone offense stuff. Jimmy Chipwood. Yeah, Jimmy Chipwood type stuff. But the posts are moving. They're flashing high. They're working around trying to find different gaps and stuff, trying to find different open spots. They're moving, and then those perimeter players are trying to find them. And then when they get the ball in the high post, they look down low, high-low action, and they post up and try to seal. So that that's what they're looking for. They're trying to exploit the down-low matchup. But you could do that with movement on the outside. You know, like you, you could still look down low and still get the ball down low and have those girls have that movement action, but also move on the perimeter. It just makes everything even more harder to guard. Well, so, to me, if you if if Shaylee, if they get some open looks for Shaylee and she's not hitting, they need her to have the ball so that Madison Booker can get to the middle of that zone and they can find her there. Yeah. And Aaliyah Moore and Deanna Gaston have to be the stars of this game. They have to dominate inside. They have to put fouls on Ejim and Maxwell and kind of just take over. And they did that. They've done that. They did it against Alabama. Um, if you get that, Aaliyah Moore and that, uh, Deanna Gaston, then I think Texas is going to be where they want to be, but you're right. If they get stagnant and they're not getting the ball inside that zone to, to uh, Amo and, and Deanna Gaston, that's uh, you know, those are your veterans. Those are the ones that need to help Maddie Booker because Booker tends to get off to a good start, um, which is great. She creates, she scores, but she gets a little tired and her legs tend to go in the fourth quarter. And that's when her teammates need to step up. Like Shea Holly did with that three pointer with 113 left against K State. And then that inbounds play and then the travel that Shea Holly induced. And remember, they, Shea Holly like coerced nine turnovers by Emily Ryan of Iowa State in that Big 12 tournament championship game. Emily Ryan's like a she's coming back for a fifth year. That was incredible. Like Shay's going to have to play that way uh, Friday night. They're going to yeah. have to be at their absolute best defensively and rebounding the ball. Um, it's an amazing story that Texas is in this position without Rory Harmon, but they're going to need to help Maddie Booker. They can't just leave it all on her uh, against these fifth year seniors, four of them for Gonzaga. So, um, cause they're not going to flinch. They will stay connected the whole time and Texas can't either. All right. We're going to talk to our man, uh, Lance Taylor, get his thoughts on the NCAA basketball tournament and, uh, sec spring football, LSU's pro day, all that stuff. Our sec insider. We'll talk to him at two o'clock. But uh, Zay, let's talk a little Texas spring football. Um, it's interesting. Put out the insider this morning at horns247.com. And we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, Quinn Ewers doing his thing uh, at the quarterback position and why he returned and all that good stuff. Um, make sure you check out all the, all the fine work my man Eric Henry wrote about uh, about Quinn, but had some interesting conversations with some team sources who say the interior of the defensive line needs help. That it's gone from a total strength, which is not a shock, considering you had the two highest rated interior defensive linemen in the country playing on your defensive line last year. But the offensive line is handling the middle of that defensive line. And 
you know, Albert Collins, solid, Vernon Broughton, solid, but they're not penetrators like Byron Murphy. Now, look, holding holding the point of attack and stopping the run, that's great. I'll take that. I'll take that all day. But I would not be shocked if Texas is in the portal um, looking for a difference maker, if possible, maybe from Michigan, um, who might uh, become available in the May portal window. Uh, yeah, um, that's unfortunate, but again, it's still just a spring and, you know, you knew they were going to take a drop. As you said, you knew they were going to take a hit and Byron Murphy, this guy is going to be a first round pick. Travandre Sweat won an Outland Award like this past season. So those guys, they're not coming back anytime soon. And I think the guys that have the opportunity, like Tia Savea, this is still a transition for him. Like he's getting acclimated to what Pete Kwiatkowski wants out of him and what Kenny Baker wants out of him. So, yes, even though he's an experienced player and has played a lot of college football, that's still a change. Like he's still got to get used to that. Like NFL guys, when they go to different rosters, like they've been playing football their whole lives and they go to a different team and they have to figure things out there. Like, it's like that for everybody. So college kids, you would think they would have it even harder. So I'm going to take that into account also. But, yeah, Alfred Collins, Vernon Broaden, you know those guys, Art B. Murphy, or T. Sweat. So they're going to have to do it in different ways. And Pete Kwiatkowski might have to get really creative this year. And if that means going into the portal when it opens again to try to get some more guys in there, then so be it. Like, do whatever it takes. But, you know, we've talked about the secondary getting better. And we talked about the linebacker room. Right. How underrated that can be. That's this. important. So that's even more important now hearing these things about the defensive line. And this is the interior. Like, we're not talking about how good Baron Sorrell could be. We're not talking about how good Ethan Burke could be on the edge or Colin Simmons or Colton Vossick, Jermon Tapp, like all those guys, et cetera. You know. Trey Moore. Trey Moore, baby. Like, there's a lot of dudes that could cover up maybe what that interior line is lacking at the moment. And again, it's up to Pete Kwiatkowski and Kenny Baker and all those guys to figure that out. Thank goodness that it's only the end of March. You know what I'm saying? Like if yeah. you were telling me this in August, I'd be a little nervous. Like I, I'm not, I'm not trying to trip or anything right now. Like I get that offensive line for the horns right now, seasoned experience been there. Done that. Got guys that are going to be top 10 picks possibly next year. We think of Kelvin Banks. So let's well, let's look at the you know devil's advocate here and say, okay, maybe the O-line is that good. And it's right. taking that next step to where Jaden Blue and C.J. Baxter and all those running backs are going to look amazing because those horses are moving folks this upcoming right. season. Well, and D.J. Campbell, I'm getting great feedback on DJ Campbell that he's in great shape contract year contract year he's draft eligible after this season wow so yeah like guys you haven't thought of as contract year like DJ Campbell Ethan Burke those dudes are looking at trying to take their game way up a notch and yeah the offensive line is now arguably outside of quarterback and maybe running back is the strength of the team. And so, yeah, you got Calvin Banks, you've got Hayden Connor who can play left guard or right tackle if Cam Williams is, is struggling. You got Jake Majors as your center. Your, you got Cole Hudson as your backup. I did hear that kind of Robertson is struggling a little bit, and that's why they're trying to get Hayden Connor um, as the third team center, you know, prepared. It would be Jake Majors, Cole Hudson, then Hayden Connor, because um, Hayden Connor needs another thing on his plate. Hey, man, we need you at right tackle. Hey, man, we need you at center. Um, I think Hayden Connor is a newly engaged man. 
I think I saw that via social media. Yeah, yeah. I think he popped the yeah. question. Let me I pull that he, up on bootleg Instagram. I hope he thought about coming to my marriage boot camp before making hey, that. Hold on, stop. What? Come on, man. Come on, man. Love is forever. But so is <laughs> some other things. Um, but, well, that's, gosh, hopefully it's a match made in heaven. Yeah. There's my Wow. Man. Okay. Way to go. Yeah. Way to go, Hayden hey, Connor. Look at the suit. The suit and the jeans. Looks like it's on campus, too. Yeah, and Hayden Connor was on Fire the Cannon not too long ago. That's right. So good to uh, Megan and Rocky for getting Hayden Connor on the show on Texas Sports right. Unfiltered. Look at our guy. Look at that. Look at that. Happiness. Happiness. Hey, yo, man. Hey, big year, Hayden. You Let's know what go. I'm Got a good woman on your side. A good woman can take you a long way. A long way. Boost your morale. Boost your confidence. She telling you you look good every day. Come on, man. Let's go. Yeah, life's good in Hayden Connor's world. Congratulations, my guy. You know, yeah, so. Probably has yeah. Quinn Ewers as one of the best men. Yeah, those Quinn's guys got, are tight. Is Quinn still dating the Sooner? I think so. Right. Think so. Me, 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 messy and look that up, too. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, remember, you've got four starters back on that offensive line. They had to go up against Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat every day in practice. They should be the strength of the team. And, look, if they're the strength of the team, then the running back room is even better than what we thought because those guys will clear space and – create holes and make sure that you're two dimensional at all times. Ah, okay. You see Quintavious and she's a boomer. She's a boomer. Boomer, boomer sooner. Okay. He's all right. out here. All right. A fellow, all. Man. Loves yeah. love, man. Hey, Loves he's, love. got, he's got payback. Quinn's got payback at the he's cotton. Got payback. Yeah. Yeah. I, that, hey, red river week. We don't talk to her. That's the rules. Yeah, three turnovers. Week. Three oh. turnovers. Three turnovers last year. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I, yeah. Too much access, probably. Too yeah, much man. access. Even though 26 for 28. Yeah. Nah, 20, 26 for 28 to finish the game. Yeah, yeah, man. And he got him the lead. He got him the lead. Yeah. Hell. Needed one stop with a minute 17 left. Come on, man. Yeah, Quinn, you got 51 weeks out of the year. You could talk to her that one week. We ain't. Sorry. Yeah. We ain't doing it. It's all right, though. You know, loves and love. They don't have Dylan Gabriel anymore. They, they're they throwing all their eggs in the Arnold or whatever. What's his name? Uh, Jackson Arnold. Jackson Arnold basket. And Jackson Arnold looked a little rough in the bowl game. Needs He's got all offseason to get fine-tuned. Sooner Nation was all about Jackson Arnold. So, you yeah. Know. Hey, they done. drove Dylan Gabriel out. Drove him straight to Oregon. Oh, straight to Oregon. And yo, them Nikes ain't that nice. You know, we saw Stretch yesterday with the jump man on the Sooner shirt. Like, you could get some gear at OU. I I, you know, I get it. Oh boy down there doing a good job. Their coach's name, Delanning. I get it. He's fun, yeah. exciting, which Brent Venables. That guy looks like a tough dude to work with. I'm just, I'm he just looks, speculating. He looks like a villain in a Terminator movie. That's what I'm saying. He looks like a villain. He just has an aura of, God, do I got to look at your face every with those day? those cheekbones and that jawline? I wish I had a jawline like that, man. <laughs> I don't have no jawline. I got a turkey gobbler. I mean, Brent Venables, that dude, that dude. <laughs> That dude looks like Jerry's surgeon got to him, and that's just natural. Yo, man, you're going in on bread. I love it. He is the Terminator. I love it. Yeah, man. yeah. So, yeah, he's got payback. Hell Quinn's yeah. got payback. But that offensive line, strong. DJ Campbell, strong. Yeah, and DJ Campbell's so nasty, man. He is in his arm length. Like people don't realize. His arm length. He's 
he's like got 34 inch arms, got a 68 inch wingspan. I mean, and he's strong. So it's kind of hard to believe he didn't play his freshman year. He just wasn't ready. And then it took off. Well, you remember when they were asking Byron Murphy and T. Sweat and those guys, like, who's the toughest guy on the other side that you go up against? They all would say DJ Campbell. Yeah. Like, just, and again, this is Byron Murphy talking about, like, you know how big of a dog he is. He was like, and he said it with a smile, like, yo, DJ Campbell, dog. We be getting into it. We be getting scrappy. And you just see different clips of him this past season, like, right when the whistle's being blown taking guys heads off to where guys are not really expecting they're out to play and dj campbell's out here looking for blood and yo you gotta have that mindset man you can't be no nice guy you could be super intelligent you need to be as an offensive lineman a lot of them are but you gotta have a nasty streak and dj campbell you ain't gotta worry about that nasty streak with him it's just about you know, understanding your assignments and understanding your technique and trusting that day in and day out and, you know, just what you have to do, snap in and snap out. And I think, like you said, that's a part of the reason why he didn't play his freshman year. But now that he's getting it and you don't have to think about it as much, you're just reacting, and you're probably going to see it all come together for DJ Campbell. And, yeah, this all offensive line as a whole. That's why I'm not tripping about this news about the – Ontario lineman. Like I expect that. I expect well, that. if they were dominant, right. I'd be more concerned that the offensive line, like, okay, offensive line. Well, should be okay, good. hold that thought. Because the flip side, the good news or bad news, depending on how you're gonna look at it, is Cam Williams good when he can get his hands on you. He's struggling against the twitchier speed rushers, the the Trey Moores, the the Colin Simmons, the Anthony Hills, um, those are elite players. Period. Um, at varying degrees of experience, but uh, that's that's the thing you're watching with Cam Williams. And there's, you know, there's some who think he's still not down to where he needs to be at 360. That he needs to be closer to 345, 350 tops. Just just to you know, get his kick step and his footwork down. And, and so we'll see time there's time, but Sarkeesian gave him some sugar. Who's the other day. I mean, it's Hayden Connor really. Okay. Yeah. They'll move him to right tackle because Neto Yumazulu is the next up. He's he's he and Cole Hudson are the, the guys, but I think they like, I think they like Neto a little bit more than Cole because Neto is the bigger guy. Neto is 334. Cole Hudson is 315. So, and Neto's Neto's a dog. I mean, I I think he's going to play. I think he's going to play some this year. And and so that's a good thing. I mean, look, you, you got to get your five best on the field if it's if it's Hayden Connor, if it's Neto, both those guys can play and, and we need to see Neto, you know, I mean, look, he's three thirty four. That's what DJ Campbell is. If he's got the dog in him, and he's, we know he's got arm length. I mean, the Yuma Zulus have arm length. They're like one of the fantastic four. Their arms are so long. I mean, Zeke, Yuma Zulu. I'm just telling you, Zay, wait till you see Zeke number 41 in the spring game you're gonna be like whoa that is stretch man yeah and and xena like the length that texas has at the edge with burke vasic um xena yumazulu it's impressive i mean they've got they got headaches and now you got trey moore and his spin move you got colin simmons and his just flat ability to bend and kind of dip under the shoulders of offensive tackles without losing speed or leverage. And, and they got a lot to learn still. There's no doubt, but those guys are relentless too. I mean, that's, that's what you have to be as a pass rusher. You've got to be relentless. You cannot, you 
can't take a playoff because that could have been the play that you you got to the pocket and the secondary held up and the quarterback's holding the ball and you there was your sack you know so and they've got depth i mean they can rotate guys in and out um but let me give you a couple other highlights before uh before our man lance taylor and i'll i'll stay with the the defense and we'll go to offense after we talk to lance but um the sense is anthony hill uh will be the middle linebacker and that's if he can handle all that if he's processing and playing still playing fast that's great if not put that on david benda or Leonga Lafau, if he's ready and let Anthony Hill just, you know, play fast. But he's David Bendis said that Anthony Hill's making all the checks for the, you know, for the defense. That's big time. And if he's ready for that, because I remember his his progression at uh, Denton Ryan was the exact same as it's been at Texas. He moves to varsity as a sophomore. He's so unbelievable at rushing the passer. He's got the arm length. He's got a knack for knocking the ball out of the quarterback's hands. They say see ball, hit ball, and he's a menace on a state championship team as a sophomore. Then they move him to middle, and it took a minute. It took a minute. And and then by the time he was a senior, he was a wrecking machine. Um, and so – I'm sure for him, it feels like, okay, I've been, I've been through this. Um, but let's uh, see our man, Lance Taylor, uh, checking into the green room. Let's see if uh, we may just be doing audio today. Uh, LT. LT, can you hear us? Uh-oh. LT. Well, Lance, can you hear us? Uh -oh. Alabama somewhere. Oh no! Yeah, we got you now. Yeah, got me. How you doing, my man? Uh oh. All right. Well, he said Backwoods, Alabama, somewhere. So yeah. I'm thinking that tough. the reception's not the best. All right. Well, we gave it a shot. We gave it a shot. All right. We'll see. L LT, we'll catch up with you. Um, no worries. Yeah. All right. So, and I'll just uh, shoot him a little message saying, don't you worry. Um, yeah. Uh, March Madness games back tonight. Um, obviously still disappointed that Texas – as bad as they play, only lost by four. Not advancing, but it's all righty. Terry has a birthday today or yesterday, maybe. Yesterday. Yeah, happy birthday, RT. Hope he enjoys that. Well, let's go get some players. <laughs> that transfer portal is open. Let's go get some guys. You know, you need to be on the one-way trip to Africa very soon. I don't know when, but very soon. But, yeah, man. Um, well, Okay, let's yeah, let's get a little uh, let's get a little uh, basketball in here, Texas basketball, because um, in the insider at horns twenty four seven dot com, um, we talked about the priority list for Texas in the portal. Okay, and according to um, my sources, here is the priority list. For Texas basketball in the portal. I want you to tell me what you think. Point guard, numero uno. Big wing. Four. Four man. And another five. To pair with Caden Shedrick. Yeah. Um, that's about right. That's about right. But again, like point guards mean different things. Like point guard doesn't have to mean John Stockton type. Like that thing, I don't think that point guard exists anymore. Like you need a point guard that has size, that has the ability to knock down shots, 
with the ball in his hands. Like Max Aisman is as good as he was. The fact that his size was just an issue. It was. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. I love Max Aismas. He played hard. Like, he was a hell of a player. The fact that he is top 10 in point scored in D1 history is amazing. Yes, he had the COVID extra year, but still, it's amazing for his size. But he had his limitations. Like, you need to put guys out there that don't have many. You know, you can't. The Texas. The Texas, exactly. Like, the athletic wing that might be right up there with the point guard. I say that's 1A, 1B, because athletic wing changes everything. Hell, Grand Canyon had that, and they made it to the round of 32. They didn't have much else, but they had an athletic wing. I was averaging like 20-something a game. It was a former Kansas player before he transferred, and a whole bunch of you know stuff happened to his life. But still, like Texas didn't have that at all. They had no athletic wing. Like Kendall Weaver, he was your athletic wing at 6'2". That's not a wing. That's more of a combo guard, really. You yeah. need Arterio Morris. Oh. Yeah. Even that, though, that, that's more of an athletic guard, too. He's just so talented that, you know, he was an NBA caliber player if he just got his head on straight. But athletic wing is like – and I'm reaching here, Terrence Shannon Jr. That's an athletic wing. That's a dude that, yo, the speed, the athleticism, like the craftiness, twitchiness in the lane to twerk his body in different ways to make miraculous finishes and stuff. Like there's not too many guys like that, but there's guys that do a little bit of those things. You know, Emmanuel Michael Miller, Peavy? Michael Peavy. He's solid, but I don't think he has that offensive game. Like, he's a really, really good role player. Really good role player, which is fine. I, I take him on the roster because he has that toughness, and you pair him with somebody like Kendall Weaver, that's going to win you games. But he also has his limitations. Like, if you told me, talking about TCU, Emmanuel Miller, that is it. I don't know if he has any eligibility left. I do has like five, six years, but a player like him, like, damn, that's it right there. That's a dude that pushes the needle a little bit. So you're going to have to hunt. You're, you're going to have to hunt. And I still think as good as Trey Johnson is, you cannot bank revolving the team around him. You got to look at him as a piece that helps your team. But him as a freshman, he don't deserve that responsibility. That would be unfair to him. You know, yeah. he still could be a NBA lottery pick caliber player, but he doesn't have to be Kevin Durant. Hell, Castle for UConn, he's their fifth best player on that starting lineup. He's their only really lottery pick. Donovan Klingon is starting to get his stock rose, but – other than, like, Cam Spencer, he's not projected to be a lottery pick or even an NBA player. Tristan Newton, kind of the same thing. Those guys are way more valuable than Castle is, but Castle being the freshman, that potential, you know, the NBA, that's what they love. So I'm not saying that Trey Johnson's going to be that, but Castle was a five-star McDonald's All-American player coming into a really good team like UConn. That is just a piece to the puzzle. Uses his athleticism to change the game, uses his size, can shoot the ball a little bit, can go one on one, but they don't rely on him to have 20 point games for them to be successful. They rely on Spencer, they rely on Newton, they rely on Cleegan. So, as good as Trey Johnson is, you still need those guys to go around him. And yeah, it's up to RT to really get out there and find those dudes. Yeah. Yeah, Manuel Miller just played his fifth year. He was so good this year. Yeah. God, he was good. I yeah. love his game. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, Texas missed on the nun kid from VCU who went to Baylor. That was a that was a big miss. They missed on the Mom Chilovich kid. From Iowa State, the freshman. 
I mean, Bridges would fit what you're looking for. Jalen Bridges, right? Yeah. Yeah. He had a really good year, you know, but that's one of those one guy dudes. Like there's a dude, South Dakota State, as a point guard, Zeke Mayo, averaged 18 points a game, around 19 points a game, five rebounds, three assists, six four point guard. That's perfect. That'd be perfect. Tamper. Be perfect. Start tampering. That'd be perfect. And Texas has already contacted him. So And he's in the work. he's in the portal. Yeah. Yeah. He's in the What's portal. the kid's name again? Zeke Mayo. Zeke Mayo. I yeah. love that name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Zeke Mayo. Yeah. South Come Dakota on State. down. Yeah, but the rest of his list on um, people who have contacted him, Kansas, Ole Miss, Alabama, Oklahoma, Kansas State, Arkansas, Indiana, Clemson, Houston, Utah, Texas, Florida, Missouri, Auburn, Arizona, Louisville, Colorado, Villanova, Cincinnati. So, so yeah. 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 <laughs> but that, that's what I mean. Like, that's how good he is, though. That That's positive. Like, you want him to be caught right. out there. Like, that means he can hoop a little bit. Right. So... Yeah, he's a 40% three-point shooter. He makes his free throws. This guy's an 87% free throw shooter. Gets you a few boards. Gets you three assists. Yeah. And look, man, if I'm Tyrese Hunter, because we from still Lawrence, know it, Kansas, for God's sake. Not good. That's not good. That look that seems too easy for Billy. Way too easy. Um come on. But- RT? Yeah, that's tough. If yeah, if I'm Bill Self, I'm because Dwan Harris is done, right? Oh yeah, he should be gone. That dude ain't no way he should have another year. Ain't no way. But he Brock had six, so my, why not? But Dwan Harris, he's been playing forever. Dwan he might be- Harris. Yeah, he's done. Okay. He's yeah. done. Yeah, it might be unless, too unless they count. Do they count the 2021 season as a COVID year? Probably. Uh, I don't know. Because he was a freshman in 2021. If they count that as COVID, then it seems like maybe that's, uh, I think that's not considered COVID, but. Um, yeah, Zeke Mayo, come on down, baby. Come on down. Let's come go. Down. That's my new favorite guy. Yeah. So. Yeah. Watching the games yeah. tonight. Yeah, man. We got games. Yeah. You, you got a little breakdown? Yeah, I got a little bit. You got a little yeah. something? A little something, something. I mean. Something, something. Clemson's fun, man. Like, I know. I, I love the way they play. I did not expect Scott Drew and them to go down the way they did. They got those bigs and Hall and Shefflin that could really pass. And, you know, Gidyard, who was at Syracuse, he could shoot it a little bit. And Hunter's a good shooter, their best player. So this is a tough matchup for Arizona. He's playing good basketball, too. I mean, obviously, everyone's playing good basketball at this point. But, yeah, this isn't going to be just an easy game for Arizona. Like, Caleb Love's playing well. You know, Balo, when he plays well down low, they're definitely a problem. They got Johnston from San Diego State, who's super athletic and threw out some crazy dunks, and their bench is solid too. So Arizona, Tommy Lloyd, he does a great job there, and I expect them to win that game. But I would not be surprised if Clemson pulled that off at all. Yeah, Clemson, Arizona at 6, 609 on CBS. Um, Lance is going to try us again. Uh, Apparently, he's coming out of the deliverance. Um, And then you've got San Diego State, UConn at 640 on TBS True. Yeah. What do you see there? 
Yeah, rematch from the national championship last yeah. year. Um, ah, guys, so hard to see UConn going down, man. You know, the LaD for San Diego State, he's dominant, but he's not the biggest guy, especially if you compare him to Donovan Klingon. Like Donovan Klingon, 6'3", and LaD is 6'9". So you would think that the height for Donovan Klingon and how good he is defensively, that's going to be a problem for LaD. So those guards for San Diego State, Butler, Parrish, Trammell, a lot of those guys that have been there before, they got to come along with it. And they were good you know, these last two games in the tournament. And again, just that experience, like that means something. They're not going to back down. The big lights don't face them. Like that's not even going to be close to an issue because again, they were in the national championship last year. So they have that on their side, but at the end of the day, Camp Spencer, just his shooting, the decision-making, Tristan Newton, his two-man game with Donovan Klingon. And if Klingon's going to score on the inside, then they're absolutely unstoppable. They're unstoppable. And then when Cleon goes out the game, they bring in that African looking skinny brother Johnson and his, you know, roll to the rim abilities is exceptional. So they're loaded, man. Like there's a reason why everybody and their mama took them in the bracket to win the whole thing. And everybody has them going back to back. Like Dan Hurley has a legitimate powerhouse there. Now, do I think that what those guys in the four letter network are saying about them being the team that could go out and beat the worst team in the NBA? Absolutely not. They are not a team that can make the NBA playoffs. Let's not disrespect the pros here. Like, Donovan Klingon would get absolutely worked by whoever's big man that he would have to guard, even though he will eventually be an NBA player. That's just preposterous. But in college basketball, they deserve to get all the love that they're getting, all the flowers. And, yeah, I, I don't see San Diego State winning this game one bit. All right, here's, here's the million dollar because my bracket depends on it. Iowa State – and Illinois in the nightcap tonight at nine o'clock on TBS. Who do you like in that one? Iowa State is favored by one and a half on uh, Bet US. Yeah, um, this is the best game of the night. Like, this is my favorite one for sure because you've got the great defense with TJ Otzelberger's Cyclones and the great offense in Brad Underwood's Illini. And, I mean, the matchups for Illinois, when it comes to just guard-on-guard guard matchups, like with the, how they play and all the iso ball that they do in the half-court game, if they could get Marcus Domask on Taman Lipsy, like Taman Lipsy's as tough as it gets, but Domask – still has them about four inches or so. And Domas loves that turnaround fadeaway. If he could get to that consistently and hopefully force the Cyclones to rotate and they'll get outside shots with guys like Dawkins who can really light it up. What do you mean hopefully? Time. You cheering for Illinois? I don't care. I don't have a dog in the fight. What do you mean? It's not, it's not like I'm – Supporting the Big 12. The Horns aren't in the Big 12 no more, so I can care less. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I don't care who wins this game, but I'm trying, I'm trying to I, I'm speaking as a – if I'm an Illinois fan, this is what I would want to do. Hopefully, I would make the Cyclones have to collapse because Domas is just killing Lipsy down low, which is – it's a reach because Lipsy's such a good defender. Like, Domas, he better be in shape because trying to take him, that's going to be tough. But Terrence Shannon Jr., you got Gilbert for the Cyclones, could really go. And I've been talking about with Iowa State, if Monchilovich could give you 15, if he could give you 15, man, that completely changes what they do offensively because they could go in those droughts. Their defense, it always travels, but sometimes they'll go in those droughts where it'll be hard to score. And Taman Lipsy, he'll be forced to take over the game, which he could do. And I think him trying to take those guys like Domas and Shannon, that's going to be huge to the Cyclone success. But Monchilovich, that dude, the freshman at 6'9, 6'10. His versatility, like that is a tough matchup for anyone. 
And if he can knock down shots and stretch the floor and allow guys like Lipsy and Gilbert to get in the lane and make plays happen. And Jones coming off the bench too, like he's for uh, Iowa State. Like Curtis Jones, that dude, he can really shoot that thing and gives them a spark off the bench. So he has to be good too. But I, I don't know who's going to win this one. I really don't. It's a coin flip. It's Mom Jelovich had 19 in the first round. He had 10 against Washington State in the second round. He was timely against Washington State. Like that 10, yeah. I want to say, came in the second half. Like he was really timely, and they need that from him. You know, they need that from him. When he gets his swagger going and he's letting it fly, like when he's not – and he doesn't have to be necessarily open. Like you could be in his grill and he'll just shoot over the top of you because of that height. You know, like he's a different type of guy. And when he's at the top of his game – like, he'll be a good player for them for a lot of years. Like, he's one of those dudes I could see being the Big 12 player of the year in the foreseeable future. Like, he is that type of guy. So, he's still just a freshman, and that's what the issues that you have with him. But if he could – he's the X factor in tonight's game for Iowa State. And just their whole season, he's, he's going to be their X factor. But if he can light it up – that gives Iowa State a little bit of the advantage because all right, who are you picking in that game? Um, I I got I Illinois. Got Iowa State. I got Illinois. <laughs> That's I good though. Illinois. You and I, you and I are you you like to go against me. That's good. I don't um, like to go against you. That's it just happens. Who you got who you got? Clemson, Arizona. Zona. Clemson. Arizona. Arizona. Yeah. You think Follow. they're legit? Balo Johnson, those, you know, white boy, big men for Clemson. They're good, but Baylor's bigs, as tough as they are, they don't have the experience like these guys for Arizona. They're bigs. And Johnson and Balo, they're going to give Hall and Shirefin everything they can handle and plus those guards for Zona, you know, Lewis coming off the bench, Caleb Love, he's so good. I love his jump shot. You know, that dude, he has a point to be made leaving from UNC and everybody talking about them and getting Pac-12 player of the year. Like he – it looks like he has a chip on his shoulder. Clemson, they play good enough defense. Can they match up? Because I'm going with Clemson. All right. Um, there you go. UConn, I got UConn losing to uh, Iowa State. Let's see if we can get Lance in from the backwoods of Alabama. Lance Taylor, LT, what's going on? Hey, fellas. Yeah, I'm on my way back. Spring break. And uh, I am outside of Montgomery. And for people that don't know what Montgomery is, it is actually the capital. Of Alabama, believe it or not, not it's my favorite. Still, city. Right? Not my favorite city, but what's that? Is it in Southern Alabama? Uh, kind of. Yeah, I mean, more so. Yeah, kind of South Central. Mo Mobile's further south, right? Yes, Mobile is, is about as south as you can get in Alabama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mobile. You're almost in the, you're almost in the Gulf. Yeah, uh, yeah, it touches it. Yeah, that's the uh, the good news getting away on spring break is I kind of outside of the games this past weekend just kind of decompressed and, you know, I've been out of it. So I don't know if anybody has, um, you know, uh, I don't know, gambled $7 million through an interpreter. I don't know if anybody <laughs> I don't know if anybody's been fired. I, I don't. I don't. I don't know uh, if there's been any big news. So you guys can fill me in. Well, we were going to ask you, uh, you know, your thoughts on since you're the SEC insider, uh, mostly football, but you also you are Lance'sLock.com with all the picks. Um, your thoughts on that Tennessee Texas game? And Rick Barnes advancing to the Sweet 16. Yeah, um, you know, watching Texas in their first round game against Colorado State, 
that Texas team looked legitimate. And then obviously Texas, the way they battled down the stretch. I mean, I don't know how you guys felt. That was some of the best basketball I've seen them play under Rodney Terry this year. But that Tennessee team is tough. And, you know, Dalton Connect was obviously off against Texas, and they still find a way to win that game. When he is on, that is a tough, tough team. Um, and you just wonder, I mean, you know, the thing is, there was two coaches that, to me, had all the pressure in the world coming into this tournament, Purdue's Matt Painter and Rick Barnes for Tennessee. And, you know, you get those guys matching up in the regional final, then, you know, somebody's somebody's got to get to a final four. Yeah. Yeah, who do you like in that situation? Uh, I like Tennessee. You know, I had them before the tournament. I didn't – I ended up playing Texas plus the – seven and a half against Tennessee. Didn't like how Tennessee looked, but again, connect was off. And I, I think, you know, I think it'll be a completely reset team this weekend. So I think Tennessee wins the region. I really do. And I, okay, I so actually, well, go ahead, Chip. Sorry. Your final four, you had, you have who? I had UConn like everyone. I have Arizona. I've got Tennessee. And then my fourth was Houston. Okay. Go Right. right. So they're still intact. Yeah. Yeah. You're still you're still dancing. At this yeah. Point. And I feel I feel pretty good about it. Um, I think UConn could get uh, look, they're so much better than everyone. Um, I, I just I had this feeling that they're not going to get to the final four now because um, my Iowa State psych cyclones are going to beat them. Well, that's going to be a great game tonight. And uh, I'm going to give your listeners a free play. I've got Iowa State in that game. Um, and I think it is a difficult matchup. But, you know, if they can slow down Terrence Shannon. And Terrence Shannon, when he was back in his Texas Tech day, 6-0 and all-time against Iowa State. But Otzelberger is a hell of a coach. Their defense is lights out. Fourth nationally, giving up a little over 61 points a game. And, you know, I think it's going to come down to that. I think they can shut down Terrence Shannon, Jr., and, uh, you know, it's such a balanced offense. You don't have to rely on anybody. There is not one dominant score that's going to take over. It's just a collective effort. And then, again, the way they defend is just it's next level. So I like Iowa State surviving and advancing. And I think, I think they can oh. give UConn some problems. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. That's what I'm going with. Go ahead, Zay. Lance, Crimson Tide, they got the Tar Heels tonight. Nate Oates, man, he does a hell of a job with those guys, especially with Brandon Miller off to the NBA this past season. Marcus Sears, that lefty, man, I can't he really hear likes Zay. it up. I don't know why. like their chances tonight or? I don't know. Oh. He was, he was asking you about Alabama and uh, North Carolina. Uh, look, I mean, Alabama's defense has been garbage. They played well in the first round, or excuse me, second round against Grand Canyon. But you look at it from Charleston, Grand Canyon, and now, you know, you got a different animal in North Carolina. I think R.J. Davis is a guy that can have a huge night. Uh, Armando Baycott, obviously a guy that's got a ton of experience. And, you know, he's going to give Alabama problems down low because Bama just doesn't have size outside of Nick Pringle. Um I think Alabama will keep it close, though. That was the number one seed that, you know, I know it was the last number one seed. I thought Alabama got a really beneficial draw. Um, pretty well documented now. They've never been to a Final Four. Um, and, boy, it'd be a tough road because you, you knock off North Carolina, you probably get Arizona after that. Arizona's got a lot of scores, and, and that's going to be the problem. We'll see if, if Alabama, you know, coming off giving up 61 to Grand Canyon, their best defensive performance since January. We'll see if it can uh, it can hold another weekend. I don't think it can, but I think Alabama can definitely make this game interesting tonight. Well, Clemson, kind of the what are they doing here, team in the NCAA Sweet Sixteen against Arizona? What are you thinking that one? Well, look, I think PJ Hall and and believe it or not, I had Clemson in the Sweet Sixteen. That was one of the few things Woo! I got right. Um, but P.J. Hall's a load at 6'10". I mean, he can do a lot of things. And and it's going to be, you know, contrasting styles. Arizona likes to get up, get after it. That's Tommy Lloyd's uh, tempo. But on the other side, Clemson wants to really slow it down. So we'll see who controls tempo here. Um, you know, I think Clemson, this is kind of their ceiling getting to the Sweet 16. So I don't think they've got enough for Arizona. But, again, they defend well. And, you know, a 6'10 guy and P.J. Hall. Um, you know, he can, he can change a game, but I do like uh, Arizona to advance here. Yeah. 
All right, Chip, if you can't hear me, ask him about Duke versus Houston because he got Houston in the Final Four, but Duke looks good right now. And the way Houston looked against a and scares you a little bit. Yeah, Chip, Lance. You have, to, you, you have to translate for me. I can't hear. Yeah, Lance, um, Duke and Houston, your thoughts? I, I think Houston is really, really good. And I think, you know, Duke – probably has played their best basketball these first two rounds. But I think Houston and Kelvin Sampson, it just uh, – I've got them winning it all. So I'm not going to jump off of them yet. I will say that Duke has looked better than advertised. I mean, they just uh, – the game they played uh, this past week against uh, – oh, help me out. The uh, – oh, my gosh. a Because I had Duke minus seven Against and Texas a and No, the game after. No, that was that was Houston, Texas A&M. Oh, oh dude, um, James Madison. Yeah, James Madison. Trip. James uh, Madison. I forgot who it was. James Madison. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Purdue and Gonzaga. What do you think? I think we lost them. We lost them. Yeah. It's tough. Montgomery, right. man. Good old Montgomery. It's backwoods. <laughs> backwoods. <laughs> yeah, why, why is um, he there? Yeah, man. I'll tell you what, Gonzaga, the men and the women are still dancing around in this thing. I'm just telling you, I have a weird feeling about Gonzaga beating Purdue. Oh, yeah. I got a yeah. weird team. I mean, it makes sense. You know, it's Matt Painter. Like, he always underachieves. It's just a matter of when. And when you have Zach Eady, you should be going to Final Fours. I'm not saying you have to win the whole thing, but you should be going to Final Fours with this roster. And, again, Mark Few, he's one of the best in the game. I mean, Iki, their big man, African brother, see, Mark Few, he gets it, but that dude, he's solid down low. Again, you just sometimes you have to let Zach Eady do what he does and just dominate and then try to take away the shooting from everyone else. Like, you can't afford Lawyer to knock down shots or Jones to get started and knock down shots, and you can't allow the point guard to – run around and drop dimes and get in the Smith to drop dimes and stuff and him get going. He hasn't been the best in the tournament these last two games. Like they need him. And ever since he got injured in that Wisconsin big 10 final four game in the tournament, he has not looked the same Braden Smith. And he's huge for them. He does so many things. He's a triple double threat every single night when healthy. So again, Zach Eady. Yes, he's dominant, but the reason why they haven't looked like Matt Painter teams in the past is due to them being a top three, three-point shooting team in the nation. I want to say they're number two. So that, kind of like with Texas women's basketball and the Gonzaga team, like sometimes you have to let the bigs that score a lot go to work, but take away that outside shooting. That's how you have to play Purdue. And Gonzaga – they got guys, too, like Nimhard, Watson, Hickman, all of those guys, experienced players. And, hey, again, Mark Few, I take him over Matt Painter any day. So <laughs> coaching goes a long way this time of year. And, yeah, I'm right there with you, Gonzaga. They could be one of those teams, man. Which, you know, Lance has Tennessee – moving on and going to the final four. Don't sleep on Creighton, man. That old McDermott, you know, he might've said that racist shit about them being in the plantation and stuff. You remember that? He said, Hey guys, we got to stay in the plantation. He said, <laughs> I don't know. really happened to him. Nothing happened to him, but plantation, you probably shouldn't use that in your motivational speech, Doug. But whatever, he's learned, and hopefully he's a better man because of it. But, Jeez. yeah, you can't sleep on them at all. I got at them all. in the championship game. Hey, against so Iowa. do I. So do I. 
You have Creighton in the championship game? Yes. Against Houston? No, 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 no. I got them in the final four. Sorry. I got Creighton in the final four. Yeah. Yeah, you got Houston beating them? Yes. Yeah, which Houston scares me now. That I did not like the way they looked. They still won, but I did not like the way they looked against. Dude, they had some – They had some – Walk on shooting free throws at the end of that game. Yo, that kid is an Austin native. Selvin or whatever. Yeah, I don't know his name either. Shame on me, but I think he went to Cedar Ridge. Okay, good for him. He hit one free throw. That's all they needed. But all he needed, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, good for him. He wasn't scared. He missed no. the first one, but after you miss when you miss the first and you don't get many shots, usually that second one's a lot harder because now you're really thinking about it. And he knocked it down. So yeah, they're on advancing. And hopefully for Kelvin Sampson's sake, they don't need him moving forward. Okay, now hold on a minute here. We're not we're not going after McDermott Rex. We're going after TJ Otzelberger if if our T is you know. But um, it was RT's birthday yesterday, so I'll take this. No, y'all call him. We, I don't think McDermott can come around here talking about plantation and stuff. No, I, no. In Nebraska, not good, but <laughs> we, we, we can look past it. We can put him in, you know, therapy and stuff like that. He can't do that here at all. I, at all. And I don't think he doesn't fit Texas either. Like, no. he, you know, he's a good coach. I'll give him that, but I don't no. think he, he's he's not the guy. Who would you – okay, let's say RT wins the lottery and retires tomorrow. Come on, man. <laughs> Who would you – I mean, I'd have Otzelberger up on my list. Yeah. Royal Ivy. Royal Ivy. Because he's going to get you all those African brothers that you want. Yep. Um, he's the head coach of the Sudanese national team. Yeah. Um, Nate right, Oates. I, thought, I didn't know if you had a name that was just no, like. No, Nate, Nate Oates. Okay. Alabama. Uh, Alabama. Um, and. Why, why you like you like the way he, you like his style? Oh, I love his style. He gives those guys so much confidence, and they love him. They love his ass. So, yeah, yeah, Nate Oates, I think he's terrific. Because Nate Oates was, you know, he was on the short list. Right. When they hired Beard. Yo, RT's philosophy isn't bad at all. It's his decision-making. It's playing IT hoarding, starting IT hoard. That's what's bad. If he could get away from that, if he put the right guys on the court, the right personnel, which this Texas team had their limitations, even if he put the right personnel on the court, but he didn't do that enough. So that's why he's still at question. That's a big reason why I give this season a five out of 10, because some of the decision making made no sense. And, and five is an F. Uh, I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. A five out of ten is a fifty. That's a fail. Okay. All right. Yeah. A I just, sixty. A six is a D. A seven is a C. An eight is a B. A nine is an A. Yeah, I'm looking more at it as like half was good, half was bad. <laughs> but sure, if you're graded. Little tactic, I, I whatever. Either way, it's, should, it's not good. I a mean, five out of ten is an F. I mean, if we want to do it from a grade standpoint, then it would be like a D. Okay, I would give him. I wouldn't give him an F. I five out of ten from my outlook is more of just fifty percent was good, fifty percent wasn't. You know, like getting guys like It Horton, mm-mm. Zerik Oyema, mm-mm. You know, I'm, the development of Chris Johnson should have been better too. Like I, Chris Johnson's too talented to look the way he did this year. I get it. He's a freshman and all, but he looked like a deer in the headlights. Like 
I don't even know why. What are your expectations there, for him next year? Um, because he's got some length, right? I mean, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like TJ Ford's really high on him. He's known him since he was a kid. He played for TJ Ford select team. So yeah, I, I take TJ Ford's word, you know, for a lot. And I, I don't think Tommy Lloyd, I, I would have mentioned Tommy Lloyd Rex, but Arizona is a way bigger powerhouse basketball wise when it comes to texas he ain't leaving that now they're going to the big 12 best conference for basketball tommy lloyd's gonna get a raise but um i been six five got some length yeah i i was very underwhelmed with his performance this year because see roddy terry tried to put him out there and every time he did it's like dude it was a turnover like, machine turnover machine a brick machine. And there were mo he had a couple of moments where you're like, okay, you got a little something. But yeah, just it wasn't what we saw with Arterio Morris his freshman year. That's for right. damn sure. Like right. that, that's you saw Arterio Morris getting better and better as the season went on, to where once March came, you could rely on him in the Big 12 tournament and Big 12 championship and stuff. Like that's I was kind of banking on that for Chris Johnson to where he started out slow, but maybe you could throw him in because they damn sure could have used him. Oh, my gosh. They needed another guard out there. But Roddy Terry couldn't trust it. So, well, And they must not trust his defense because uh, they sure could have used, you know, and I know everyone's like, well, who's going to score? Stop. If you play good D and it creates offense, people score. Defense yeah. can feed your offense. Like that's that was Rick Barnes' whole philosophy. Like if you ever asked Rick Barnes about his offense, he'd be like, "What are you asking me that for? Mm -hmm. If we get lost in our defense, the offense will come." Okay. And look, Rick Barnes won eight hundred games. He knows what he's doing. He just needs to learn to turn his players loose in the month of March. They look tight against Texas. They sure did. Texas played. They looked tight. I mean, I had Tennessee fans texting me going, here comes Rick Barnes. <laughs> here comes Rick Barnes. Rick Barnes is involved. I'm like, oh, God, no. He cannot lose this game. After like, post up Dalton Connect more. If I have Kendall Weaver on him, I'm sorry, Kendall Weaver, as good as you are defensively, you cannot – Don Connect has him about 20 pounds heavier. He's taller. Like, he had him on the perimeter way too much. And, again, that's due to it, Barnes personnel. Like, where are you going to put Adu if you have Don Connect posting up? You know, right. he doesn't have that ability to shoot on the outside. So, you're going to have to make some decisions. Or a Waka. Or, yeah, or a Waka. Like, you, you kind of have to put him on that baseline and just have him – like if Dog Connect looks over his shoulder and the person who's guarding the Walker or Adu steps up, then you can hit him on that pass for an easy dunk. But oh my gosh, that was me. I would have had Kendall Weaver and IT Horton in the post almost the whole game, especially if he's not shooting well from the outside. Like if I'm Kendall Weaver, that's what I want. I want you to be on the outside, Dalton Connect, because now I could guard you a little bit. I could show my attributes and abilities. But in the post, Kendall Weaver doesn't want that. He might say he does because he's that type of competitor, but he really doesn't want those problems, especially with a player like Dalton Connect. So, yeah, again, Barnes, as good as he is, he ain't perfect. You know, there's just certain things that you'll notice with coaches because it's not their forte. That would be getting out of their comfort zone because they haven't worked on it enough to where Dalton Connect has those ISO, you know, plays for them in the well, let me tell you something that's going to get you into your comfort zone that is audio visual consultations <laughs> getting you into the i mean when you're ready and you want the big screen of your dreams some surround sound some surveillance some new lighting electronic shades audio visual consultations our man tom mckay makes it so easy all you got to do is call 255-8678 and tom and his crew will bring everything to you just write that number down 255 Eight six seven eight, um, and Brain Vault, the mouth guard that is changing the game. I mean, listen, my man Zay was down there, down low for the.
Bowie Bulldogs just working his elbows and he could have caught one in the jaw. And if he did, he would have needed that brain vault mouth guard because developed right here in Austin by Austin's dentist, Dr. Greg Eckert, Dr. U-E-C-K-E-R-T. Proven patented to reduce the effects of concussion. Listen, you got a competitor in your household, whether it's cheerleader, flag football, lacrosse, basketball, the brain vault mouth guard. Just go to brainvault.com to set up a fitting. And of course, Apple Leasing, baby, getting you into the car you really want to be driving. Leasing any make or model of car. They don't care what car you pick. They're going to go get it for you. And you're not paying for the future trade-in value of that car. When you're leasing from Apple Leasing, you're only paying for the car while you're driving it. And you're getting the part that's under warranty. Brand new. New car smell. It's so simple. Apple Leasing. You want to be in a new car every three to four years and you deserve that because you're going to be in traffic in Austin, Texas, then Apple Leasing is the place for you. Give them a call, 346-9977 or visit AppleLeasing.com. Tell them Chip Brown sent you. And of course, get to cover three tonight for NCAA tournament basketball. I mean, you got nothing but cover three uh, events coming up the next four days with the NCAA tournament, men's, women's. Get your buddies together. Head over to Cover 3. Get the Sean Adams Prime Rib Sandwich. Get a good seat in front of all of those big screen TVs installed by Audiovisual Consultations. Um, and enjoy yourself. All right, Zay. It's the moment of truth. We've got some commentary here. I'm just telling you. I'm a little indecisive about which way I'm going on this. Texas football or Iowa State, Illinois basketball. All right, I'll go Texas football. All right, we didn't talk a ton about the offense, so let me get you up to speed on the offense. I think we talked about the offensive line, definitely a strength of the team. Quarterback room, strength of the team. Running back room, definitely a strength of the team. Talk about guys heading into a contract here, Jaden Blue. Jaden Blue, contract year. Um, I think this guy's rise from where he was in high school, opting not to play. It was COVID and all that. And then he, you know, COVID kind of lifted. He's like, hey, I want to play. The coach left it up to a vote of the team. They said no. And so everyone's wondering, what, what's going on with Jaden Blue? His own team doesn't want him. And Jaden Blue has Grown up, and I give Tashard Choice a lot of credit. Tashard Choice is he's real. And look, when Jonathan Brooks' dad died, uh, Tashard Choice had a similar situation in his household. He lost his dad at an early age. This guy relates to people. He relates to people. He coaches them. He gets them to see his vision for them, which is what coaches do. They, the coaches lay out the vision. The players trust the coach. They rise above where maybe they thought they could go. Um, or maybe they weren't sure how they were going to get there, and that coach helps them get there. And I think this is a cool relationship to watch with Jaden Blue and Tashard Choice. Look, C.J. Baxter is a talent. He's going to keep getting better. Um, but he's young. I wasn't quite sure what was going on with that. Him starting the season, I was way high on Jonathan Brooks. I said he would run for 1,300 yards, and he would have if he didn't tear up his knee. Um, I love Jonathan Brooks. Like, I was screaming it from the mountaintop. So, but Jaden Blue, you could see it. Like, he's he's getting it. He's getting it with the blitz pickup. He's getting it with what he's got to do. And I just, I think that's going to be a really good story for this year. And then, you know, when it comes to the to the receiver position, this is going to be the most fun for me, I think, because Sarkeesian is watching these guys to see who's picking up the offense the best, running every detail, because you have to do everything to the detail in this offense. If they tell you to run the route at 12 yards, you've got to run it at 12 yards or you're not going to be on the field. 
because the spacing is that important. What you're doing and going to that depth is causing the defender to be on his heels at exactly that point, and then you're taking him somewhere either for your own, uh, you know, either you're the, the priority in the progression or you're taking that defender away from the priority of the progression, but you have to do it. You have to do the detail work. You're not going to be on the field. So if you think you're better, smarter, faster than Steve Sarkeesian and these coaches about where you're running your route depth, good luck. Good luck watching this season. So um, they're coaching them. They're coaching them, Zay. I'm just telling you. So receiver, this is going to play out, folks, over time. Um, I think Sarkeesian is evaluating everything about how much two tight end personnel, about how many receivers are going to be in a rotation, how much four receiver set am I using, all of that. So I know he's never had this much speed. Even when he had Ruggs and Judy and all those dudes, he's got crazy speed on this team. So let's see if they can catch. Let's see if they can do the details. It's, it's going to be fun. This actually, I know it's going to be vanilla with the spring game on April 20th. I'm actually very interested to see how they look in a somewhat competitive situation. All right, let's get to the right call. All right, let's get it for the right call, though. Shout out to Covert BK, the Covert Automotive Dealership. Been doing it for over a hundred years, man. I know people cars even made back then 100 years ago that's ridiculous but that's how long they've been doing it and that means they've been doing it well seven terrific brands to choose from and cadillac gmc ram buick chrysler dodge and jeep they provide you with a high quality selection of new and pre-owned vehicles go to covertvcave.com for all the latest specials and inventory nobody beats a covert deal not now not ever all right, Chip, this story's been floating around for a few days. Very interesting. Michael Porter Jr.'s brother, John Tay Porter, is a current two-way NBA player, two-way contract guy, which means he has a certain amount of days to be that 15 for 16-man uh, roster spot on the Raptors, and he'll also go back and forth to the G League. So that's basically what that means. But John Tay Porter is under investigation for for finessing the sports books and maybe betting on himself. That's right, baby. That's where we are. We are betting on ourselves. And John Tay Porter, who isn't a very good player, that's why it's very suspicious because the under the night that he's getting investigated for, March 20th against the Phoenix Suns, his over-unders were 7.5 points a game, or this game, and 5.5 rebounds. This dude left the game chip with a mysterious eye injury. And that under the next day, hit was one of the biggest hits for that day from DraftKings. So we got Bet US here. If Jonte used Bet US, hope he did it. But yeah, Jonte, he's in a lot of shit right now. And again, under investigation, innocent until proven guilty. But this ain't good. And you see what's going on with Shohei Otani and the interpreter and all that stuff. And we saw what happened to Hunter Deckers. He was supposed to be taking snaps for the Cyclones this 2023 season, but he's out here bad on himself. Is it becoming a problem? Yes. Like, it seems like it's, yeah, it seems like it's becoming a problem. Like, I think, I think this is going to get interesting because I think these single person prop bets that the president of the NCAA, I'm actually in agreement with him. Charlie Baker is saying, get rid of those individual player prop bets because it's too easy for a player to get seduced like that. And the leagues are going to put pressure on DraftKings. And, you know, to, I, I'm fascinated to watch how this plays out because I, I think there's plenty to bet on without having these individual player prop bets of over under seven and a half points. <laughs> um, Old boy Porter sitting there going, oh, man. 
Yo, like, two way contract. That's not. That's money, but that's not the money that you think of when it comes to the NBA. Like he ain't bankrolling, right? You know, like you would think. Right, so he, he'll take the money. <laughs> like if he's got Moose, if he's got Moose and Rocco telling him, "Hey, we're putting five hundred G's down on you and the under. Yeah, we're gonna man. give you two hundred fifty G's." Yeah, some Italian mobster up in East New York. Going to Toronto, crossing that border. Well, yeah, and especially yeah, the, man. that's that's pro. Imagine the college kids. We don't need the individual prop bets on the on the college or pro players, in my opinion. But pro is a different deal. But look at this. Look at this very situation that you're talking about. That's an individual prop bet, and those are too easy. To be manipulated by one person. Yeah. I mean, all this money coming in on the gambling, it's like you're going to have to draw some lines here. And, and I think the leagues are going to go to DraftKings and say, hey, hey, oh, hey. Man. Talk about getting manipulated. Them college kids like my man Tony and Blue Chips, Nick Nolte. Crash that party where Tony was staying. That he was like, You fixed the game, Tony. No, coach, no, coach. It was one time. It was one time, coach. We won the game. It was just one time, coach. Like, you can't be like Tony. Hunter Deckers was like Tony. Got Hunter Deckers. Iowa State could have been good too. Really good. They won a lot of games. That one when the horns went to Ames, that wasn't no easy. Easy contest right. with their backup, who they're very high in, but still. Rocco Brecht. Rocco. Rocco was slinging that thing. I want to say Rocco was Big 12 freshman of the year. Yeah. Rocco, yeah, Rocco was slinging that thing. Rocco, yeah, Anthony Beck's kid, the former Jets tight end. Yeah, so. Yeah, man. His, his mom is a smoke show, too, apparently. <laughs> Just saying. Good for Rocco. Yeah, man. Well, that I think they're gonna have to have a little come to you know who about these individual player prop bets. Because the integrity of the game, the question is, does the underworld, the gambling world, listen? Do they listen? Those are products for them. That's a revenue stream. Are they willing to take down some of their revenue streams to work with the leagues, to work with college athletics, to protect the integrity of the very games that people are betting on? Yeah. Like the league commissioners and Charlie Baker are going to say, dude, we know you're rolling in it, but if you don't have the integrity of the game, it could hurt you in the long run. Yeah. I mean, if you're betting the under, you're an absolute piece of shit. If you're betting the over, you could say it's kind of a motivation thing to play better. <laughs> it might not be for the team, you going out there and trying to get 40, but it might give well, you some motivation to play better. It's like betting on the length of the – national anthem at the super bowl like it's always mystified me that this continues to be a bet it's usually right around two minutes like the singer can totally manipulate that and bet on themselves like bobby riggs is a famous tennis player he's the one who lost to billy jean king in 1973 in the houston astrodome he used to bet on himself all the time in tennis matches <laughs> like you know, I don't know. I get oh, rid of the individual man. prop bets because that that just has trouble written all over it. And you're going to prison. I hope old Porter knows he's going yeah. to prison. If he's going to prison, say what up to P. Diddy for me. P. Diddy's Wait. in prison? Oh, he's about to be. They raided his house. He get in charge of multiple counts of sex trafficking, which they're they have they're they're trying to charge him. But yeah, 
Which that come on, man. Come on. Don't you ruin a lot, Diddy, because Biggie Smalls, I can't look at Biggie Smalls the same. Ain't that a shame? I can't look at the notorious B.I.G. the same if all this Diddy stuff's true, which a lot of it, he had to give Cassie that settlement, his ex, when she was putting out rape charges and stuff, and that's never good. Not good at all. Like, settlement? You just gave her money to be quiet? Like, come on now. So, yeah, Diddy is not looking good at all. Some tremendous music that he's put out, but yeah. Can't look at Biggie Smalls the same. Mace, 112, Bad Boy Records, making the band, all them legendary things. A little different now, a little, a little tainted, you know, which I'm a Tupac guy anyway. With, yeah, know, I'm a two by like like uh Steve Sarkeesian. Steve Sarkeesian playing that Tupac. You know what I'm saying? California boy, California love. What's Saeed? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Diddy, gosh. Disturbing. Very disturbing. Wow. I'm just reading all this. This is nuts. So yeah. So, I mean, you knew Diddy was wild, but not that wild. Well, like the women accusing him of all these things. I'm not seeing a ton of details yet on that. Do we know who these women are, apparently? I haven't looked too much into it. The Cassie thing I knew. That was a little while ago. The stuff that just came out while they're raiding his homes and stuff. I don't know too much into it, but that's not looking good. Oh my God. I mean, they showed up with the military at his house. Yeah. Like <laughs> oh yeah, that that that's the thing. Yeah, CB's making a good point. So there's like a Syracuse walk-on that Diddy had as his drug mule that got all his drugs for him. It was that like middle bed. So I guess he was going to the hood and stuff and picking up the cocaina and different types of things that Diddy liked to party with. But yeah, I think Diddy just threw him under the bus. And just they got him. He was a Syracuse basketball player, like a walk on. Yeah. So not wow. good. <laughs> not good. Not good at all. Yeah. Oh boy. So, yeah, Biggie don't deserve this. Biggie rolling over in this grave right now. Right now. You know. Wow. All those songs, Juicy, Hypnotize, Biggie, 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 Can't You See? Sometimes you want to hypnotize me. Like, that That don't sound hypnotized. That don't sound good with this Diddy stuff. You know. Mm. Cassandra Elizabeth Ventura. Scored a minor club hit in Germany with her debut single, Me and You. That was when she was 20. Yo, Cassie, that was a hit. I'll never forget that video. She was dancing with like a bra on, like, and these black pants. That's all it was. There wasn't much to her. She's just dancing in like a dance room. And Teenage Day was very interested. <laughs> <laughs> that, that video changed a lot of people's lives. She's been living off that one single for 20 some years almost. Impressive run. Very impressive. Oh, yeah. Remember when he went to UCLA and like picked up a kettlebell? Who? And Did he? Was, yeah. Wasn't he like arrested and charged with assault over that? I. Uh, I don't remember all that. I want to say, wasn't his son like a football player at UCLA? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, here it is. Officers at UCLA had to deal with an altercation at the college training complex between P. Diddy <clears throat> and, um, let's see, was it a, uh, Oh, it's reported a team assistant was shouting at Justin Combs repeatedly during a game which P. Diddy was attending. He's then said to have confronted the coach in his office after 
the game and picked up a kettlebell and threatened to beat the guy with it. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah. Yeah. It's Come on. Good. Come on, Diddy. Yeah. God, he J-Lo dumped him and he lost his mind. Oh, yeah. She dumped him when he was shooting folks in the club. That old incident where the rapper Shine got booked for. And a lot of people say that Shine just took the fault because Diddy, obviously, they needed Diddy to stay out. Of out of the, the pokey. Head. Yeah, out of the pokey. But people say that Diddy was the one that allegedly pulled the trigger. Shine just took the fault. And J-Lo was like, nah, 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 nah. J-Lo hasn't dated a brother since. <laughs> yeah, that caused her to run to Mark Anthony. for. Yeah, that, she went completely left. She went completely left after that. She was like, you know what? This hip-hop world, I'll keep one foot in and deal with some of the safer folks in hip-hop, like a Ja Rule and a LL Cool J. Diddy, you know, Diddy was still coming off the Biggie stuff. Like, that was... 99, you know, it took a while for Diddy to get really commercial. And J-Lo, she wasn't trying to wait around for that. Yeah. Trey, you have thoughts on P. Diddy's house getting raided by what looked like a military militia? To Zay's point, Ja Rule is just going to rip a bunch of your friends off by having them travel to <laughs> the Caribbean for a supposed festival. Fire <laughs> festival, baby. He did. He's going to sex traffic you. Yeah, that's I mean, it's just crazy uh -oh. to, to read some of the details of this and how far back it goes too. literally to the start of his music career. If he's guilty of this stuff, he needs to go away for a long time, and never be seen or heard from again, probably. Man. Gosh. And again, heart goes out to everyone that's been affected. But if we're talking about from a music standpoint, like, Trey, I, I told Chip, I don't look at Biggie Smalls the same no more. I know. That's, that's a damn shame. That sucks. That is true. In terms of uh, blowback or fallout, any negativity towards Biggie, which we have to ask those questions now, it's unfortunate because he was obviously much more talented than, than Diddy was back in the day. And, and he, he owns Biggie's death, his career, in a lot of ways, too. I mean, that really got catapulted by the sting cover that he did in the wake of Biggie's death. Yep. Man. KD. Yo, yo, guys. Yeah. I don't know what you guys are talking about. How crazy is that story? Wow. Wow. I know. That's... Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's crazy. The super famous, super rich, some of the stories that come out about them, like, you know. Well, I'm this glad is like I mean, just, yeah, I mean, I. how do you get to that point in life, you know, especially when like you have Epstein. Right? Yeah, right. I mean, that's kind of what, if he does have video, he's holding over people's heads. But, like, that's one of those parties of, you know, I'd never be invited to. But if I was there, I'd be like, I mean, you're getting out right away, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's the unfortunate detail for a lot of people who got had pictures taken with Jeffrey Epstein. They weren't necessarily going to his island to try and diddle little kids, but they're connected now because they took that one picture at a larger get together in LA, New York, or elsewhere. Yep. And then you have the Stephen Hawking's of the world who apparently were geniuses, but real life creeps. And then others who uh, may be even more pedophilic than that. How did he fondle people? With his mind and his eye movement. I've done I've done that. I'm guilty of that. That joystick. <laughs> it's okay to mock him his disability considering he was a creep, right? I I think that it's much more open now than it was whenever that was revealed in the last few months. Yeah. Too much, man. Oh man. Yeah. Love you, fellas. Y'all be you cool. Guys. Be Peace. Y'all too. Happy Easter, guys. Yep. Happy, Happy Easter. Easter. What's up, bud?
Not a lot. Is, is that okay for uh for a godless heathen like myself to wish people a happy Easter? Like, even if you don't necessarily celebrate the holiday, if you're not that religion, like it is still a nice time. Uh, this may be worldwide, but certainly in this country where you get an extra day off to really try and appreciate family, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I wish BK and my Jewish friends happy Hanukkah, and I don't, you know, I'm not Jewish, so I think it's okay. It's a yeah, nice there you thing. Go. It's a nice thing. Yes, it is. Do y'all have any plans? Y'all doing any Easter egg hunting or anything like that? Yeah, so this has evolved over the years. I mean, my kids don't believe any of the imaginary nonsense elements to it and haven't for at least a year or two. But we still do. Uh, it's an Easter egg-ish hunt. It's actually a scavenger hunt. And okay. there may be an Easter egg the next clue is written in. But my kids are are to the point now where they're so grown up and they want to do things themselves or like, can we each get our own scavenger hunt? And we're like, yeah, yeah. That's just going to be a little bit more work for mom and me the night before to come up with the clues. But Hey, it's, it's all for the, it's all for the, the good of that moment. That's something that'll hopefully stick with them years from now. I'm just thinking about like doing this still in like five to 10 years and trying to gear it more to towards teenagers and young adults which uh, which can take a, an interesting but still fun shape and a, a, another one of those bonding moments for family, assuming we're around one another at Easter time when they're out of high school, which part of me hopes that's not the case. Yeah, you'll, you'll be lucky once they hit teenage years if they even hang around the house. Yeah, no, I it's, it's crazy. The percentage breakdown of the amount of time you spend around your kids, it's like 90 to 95% up to the age of 18. It's 95% up to the age of 18. And once they graduate high school and move out of the house after that, it's that's that other 5% for the rest of your lives. Yep. And that does slow up to your point when they become teenagers and don't really want to be around you because you embarrass them at every turn. Much less if you have me as your dad, and then it's really embarrassing. Yeah. I found that out yesterday, or I found that out two days ago when I went to go grab Vivi from her Math Olympics deal. And she was like, because all the kids gather in front of the school after the the, uh, the practice is over with and parents pull up and they see mom or dad and run to the car and go home. Well, Vivi didn't see me, so I did our family call. Like if we're ever in a crowded situation and we need to find one another, we have a specific thing that we do to help with that. And I did that out the window. Calvin, who was sitting in the car and couldn't even be seen, was like, Dad, stop it. That's embarrassing. So then I asked Vivi if that was embarrassing when she got to the car, and she said it was. What's the, what's the call? Caca, caca. That is embarrassing. Well, I look I look like a bird, like the side profile. I've got the bird beak, so is like, that I, like call? I have to make sure to get into it too whenever I'm get, giving it out because you want to do it a little bit into the air to help get over whatever obstacles may be in the way. So it's like. Caca, caca. You're being serious? That's the call? Yeah. Okay. I feel it. Anybody it, listening right now, that's the Elling call. That's, that's, they have every right to be embarrassed. I thought you were kidding. Well, I, well, what's, what's embarrassing about that? It's, it's just good old fashioned uh, preparedness. <clears throat> that is too much, dude. Too much, man. Hey, we got baseball today. Congratulations on the start of another MLB season to you and the other big baseball fans out there. Yep. Um, Dodgers and the Cardinals here. Hmm. Oh, kudos to Wags Orioles through uh, the first third of the first game, beating the Angels right now, five to one. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, the Angels are going to suck this year. How oh, they've sucked every year. Well, yeah, now that they don't have Otani, it's going to get real bad for them. Yeah, and Mike Trout will, you know, miss 40 or 50 games like he does every year. When did that start? There was a point where he was a bit of an Iron Man, but I feel like in the last, I don't know, three plus years, he can't stay out there. Yeah, I feel like it's even longer than that. But, man, he is, it's almost like he's wound too tight. I was talking with someone the other day, I think it was my dad actually, um, about, you know, with all the medicine, and this is something you can touch on, just with all the science and these guys taking care of themselves, um, there was a good Whitey Ford line. He said, 
man, he said that I would have won 20 games every year if I just could have, uh, if I wouldn't have been drinking and smoking so much and chasing women. And I was like, wow, that's a, goes to show you kind of, you know, the life those guys were, were uh, living. But you would think now you'd have less injuries. And I feel like we have as many as there were when we were kids, you know. Yeah, Mickey Mantle is another good example of that. And Mike Trout strikes me as that Reggie Sanders type where it's almost like he's too in shape. Yeah. To where it's just that that uh, if you drive a Ferrari rough, it'll break down really quickly and become very expensive to uh, to fix or to keep in good standing. All right, looking at Mike Trout's... I'm at it right now, yeah. Career. 2023, eight, half the games. 22, he got to 119. 21, 36. 20, 53. 2934. Awesome. So yeah, this really it started, I guess, in 2017, although he yep. did play, play 140 in 2018. And since 2019, it's been a rough go. Uh, excuse me, since 2020, it's been a rough go for him. So that's the last four plus seasons now. Yeah. Um, yeah, 82 games last year. Damn. And 119 the year before. Jeez. Um yeah, he, I, he and his numbers were also down a little bit too. If you look at the overall splits, I mean, his OPS being anything below 900 is obviously a bad year for him, even if it was still 857, which is probably around or maybe even a little bit above the major league average. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're comparing it to to him being, you know, for a long time, they're the best player in the game. And, but his swing and miss has gone up. Mm. Uh, talked about retooling his swing a little bit. And yeah, I, I would like to see him, you know, I just want to see him out there, man. He's so much fun yeah. to watch. Well, your Cubbies and my Rangers start the season against one another this year. I'm just now seeing. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah. Banner raising in Arlington tonight before that game. That's crazy, dude. That was a fun run. Um, I enjoyed the Rangers as much as I did, if not more, the Cubs last year. And I'm obviously yeah. a Cubs fan, but the Rangers were a fun team. So um, I'll be all in watching them this year. Yeah, I, I can't help but to wonder if there's not at least going to be a little bit of a step back because starting pitching is such an uncertainty right now. But that lineup is going to be a lot of fun. And Wyatt Langford, watch out, folks. He is already going to be an integral part of that lineup as a DH, and he will fill in at uh, positions from time to time to give guys days off. But uh, that lineup is, is going to be mashing the baseball, so there may be a lot of uh, high-scoring games in the Rangers' immediate future. Yeah, that lineup's going to be crazy. Um Low is out, right? Yes, I believe he's starting the season on the DL, yeah. But they've got plenty of people. Uh, Scherzer's going to be, I think, out, but he's been throwing. They feel pretty good about that. So, but yeah, they're going to be, they're going to be damn good. And as they proved last year, they can also, you know, I think they'll make some moves if they're in that spot around the deadline to uh, solidify the back end or whatever they need. Yeah, assuming that they are competitive, it would be shocking not to see them do so. So you guys are starting a guy named Justin Steele, who I'd never heard of before right now. Yeah, I saw him last year. Um, I don't know, the Central's so wide open, but you don't play your division as much as you used to. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd, you, know, you can see the Cubs winning 95 games. I don't know. I mean, they, you know, they were better than I thought last year. They just fell apart, you know, in the end. So um, I'm kind of optimistic, you know, but – as a Cubs fan, I mean, even though we won it that one year and had a good little run there, you just you're always waiting for something to go go haywire. Is y'all's manager Craig Council now? Yeah. What do you think about that? Because he was with the Brewers for a long time. I mean, they made it to the postseason regularly, but didn't have any deep runs. I think he's a really good manager. Um, you know, the best thing about it was they spent a ton of money. Like he's got the you know, uh, richest contract for any major league manager ever. I think Tory's second, but oh. he, he's making like eight, eight mil a year. Okay. Um, yeah. So now, now let's go spend some money el elsewhere, you know, uh, like on the field. Yeah. Cause you gotta do that as well as developing guys too, by the way, it's not one or the other. It's both of those things lead to a uh, short term and sustained success. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I was wrong on the Rangers. I thought that maybe this year or next year would have been their year. It felt like it was a year too early. But when they signed Seager and Simeon, I was like, well, at least they're in. But 
they've got to figure out pitching and they've got to figure out other stuff. And they, they did, man, that, that was, um, that was an impressive run, but definitely shocked me. Yeah. Bo- getting Bochy last off season, Chris Young talking him out of retirement. It accelerated that obviously too. That was huge. Yeah, no, um, Young's done a good job. It's kind of built a, on a lot of what Daniels did. Um, did you like John Daniels? Um, I did. I also felt like he didn't necessarily do a great job whenever he was making changes of ensuring complete buy-in from the guys who were affected. And there were some leadership shifts that happened. And um, there was also, they, they took some chances to try and keep that window open and traded away a lot of prospects in doing so that when they didn't hit, when the formula wasn't right and things fell apart, it just set the franchise back by a handful of years. But uh, ultimately they were able to to dig out of it with Daniels certainly in part, and then Chris Young continuing things and then just adding that fresh blood. And I lo- like I've watched Simeon go up against the Rangers or I had back when I was watching baseball regularly when he was killing Texas as a member of the Oakland A's. Obviously Seager was a huge get. But even some of the the pitching that they went out and got, I was a big fan of just how they were going about constructing this roster while smartly bringing guys up from the minors. And correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't um, wasn't uh, Adolis was he a Rule Five guy from St. Louis, or did they yeah. give him a cheap deal? Like going out and getting a deal like that is obviously huge as well. Yeah, St. Louis had a Rosarena and Garcia, and you know. Game away for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Breaks my heart as a Cubs fan. <laughs> yeah, I bet it does. That's, that's <laughs> weird. Being a Cubs fan, can, you know, with Cardinals being their biggest rival, but the Cardinals are, I, I would argue, the second best major league franchise ever, um, obviously behind the Yankees. And it's it's like the equivalent of like if I was an Aggie baseball fan, you know. My big rival is the Longhorns, you know. It's like, oh, yeah, you guys are right there. What do you think the third franchise is? The Dodgers? Yeah. I mean, that it would have to be, right? I mean, I know for kids now, they'd be like, what about the Red Sox? And the Red Sox were the Cubs for 100 years or 86 yeah. years. No. Um, yeah, especially when you count the, the Dodgers-Brooklyn era. Yeah. No, it'd be the Dodgers. I mean, you're right. And I, then, I mean, I don't know where you go with four or five. Um I hadn't even thought about that, but hmm. shit, who would it be? Um, Cycling through each division right now. There are so many newer divisions that it's tough. G- uh, Giants, maybe? Yeah. Yep. Good call. You're the, you're the baseball guy. What am I doing here? Blind squirrels and nuts. Blind squirrels and nuts. Squirrels. And nuts. Hey, I, yeah, we got a th- uh, three-round mock. We're starting to see bigger mocks. Yeah, just Matt Miller's seven round mock. He's a uh, a an admitted Longhorn homer, but there was a lot of Longhorn flair in that one. I haven't seen that. Um, I'll I'll pull this one up. You pull that one up. Let's do it. This what is, is this three round mock from? CBS and Josh Edwards. Okay. So, and once again, save the text. We we know mocks are mocks. It creates conversation. Um, I think mocks get a lot as long as you're looking at the right person get a lot closer as we obviously get to this spot, you know? Yeah. Um, but this has Byron Murphy going to pick 12 to, All right. to the Rams. Um, oh, interesting. Wait, pick 12 to the Rams. So there's a trade there then? Yeah, from Denver. Um, but – that would be crazy, you know. I mean, they um, they got Kobe Turner, and they mentioned that here. And he, you know, did a great job. Um, but if they had Turner and Byron Murphy, I mean, it just makes sense, you know. The the comp we've been given forever is Murphy, you know, being a when I started as a poor man's Aaron Donald. Now, you know, it's a middle class Aaron Donald, which <laughs> definitely take. Um, but that'd be cool, man, if he went that high. Um, it's definitely. This has Michael Penix then going to 19, so they flip those to uh, to Denver. 
Michael Penix to Denver. Wow. Well, he's got some decent weapons there, and Sean Payton's his OC, even if there's another guy who technically holds that title. That's the guy calling plays. I, I mean, that would be an interesting pairing for sure. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it would work because I question Sean Payton at this point in his career, but I'm just like you. I'm a big believer in Michael Penix. If he can stay healthy, big if I get it, but if he can stay healthy, he's going to be a good quarterback at the next level. Now this one, I've seen a bunch. The Cowboys at 24 taking Jackson Powers Johnson, the interior offensive lineman from, uh, from Oregon. And I forgot the Oddish left in free agency. I did not realize that. I'd known that uh, Tyron Smith had, obviously. That's uh, that's a big deal. Yeah, so they need they need to go after guys in the interior on both sides of the ball, offensive and defensive line, and they need to try and address that interior linebacker position too. Yeah, yeah, they, you're right. They have to. Um, just to run defense up, up the middle in general. Um, yeah, this guy can play both guard or center, so that would be, that'd be a smart pick, I think. Um, this has... Adnai Mitchell going pick 28. Seeing this one a lot now to the Buffalo Bills. And I like this as a fit a lot for him too. With Josh Allen, obviously. I, I question Stefan Diggs, not only just how good he'll be going forward, but just simply how much longer he's going to be on Buffalo. That wide receiver diva matrix is starting to skew a little bit too heavily on the diva side for him, at least in Buffalo. And he just wasn't great. He wasn't a number one wideout in the second half of last season either. So there could be a sort of passing the torch that happens there. And there will be uh, receptions available because Gabe Davis is no longer a part of that offense. They do have some other younger guys in that receiving room, but A.D. Mitchell uh, would be a nice additional option for Josh Allen. No doubt. Um, so those are all the first rounders on this mock. Second round. Any guests who goes next for Texas? Got to be Xavier Worthy, right? That's what I would think. They got the uh, Panthers 39 taken to Vondre Sweat. I, okay. Yeah. I mean, well, for Tavondre, if that's what ends up happening, I think that we're going to ultimately see Tavondre slide a little bit more than that. So this has Xavier really sliding 49. This would be a great home, though. This would, I mean, I would love this. And, you know, I know he'll be disappointed on draft night and be like, shit, I should have been a first round pick or earlier in the second, but 49 going to the Bengals. Oh, wow. And they have the Bengals. Who do they have the bank? Because I've seen the Bengals taking um, Brock Bowers and a lot of these. That would be crazy, too. I just wondered if the Bengals have more needs than the go Xavier Worthy right there because they do still have T. Higgins. Now, he may very well be gone at some point later this off season or after next year, but he's franchise tagged right now. Jamar chase is obviously going to be there for a while, but yeah, to give Joe Burrow another electric weapon, right? That I, I just, I don't think that he ends up sliding to 49. Like you and I talked about this a couple of years ago, that there were whispers among scouting circles that were these attitude was questionable and it might cause him to slide a little bit. I feel like he did. a He went a long way in dispelling a lot of that this last season. And obviously what he was able to do with the combine, I assumed that that uh, would have cemented him as a first rounder, but clearly there are uh, those who follow this for a living who don't think that's the case. And so maybe they're talking to people behind the scenes who believe that to be the case too. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it and a lot that, that we don't know. Um, you know, I've talked about the PIs they have on these guys pretty much. And I mean, they're, they're doing a lot of homework. So I mean, I, I don't know what Xavier would have done. I mean, that could cause that. But I think durability is one thing that people are going to question just with his frame. And he played through a lot of stuff. So I think that'll help him. The hands thing was definitely a question coming into this year. You feel like he answered that for the most part? Yeah, I do, actually. And one of my big critiques of him this last season as a punt returner was how well he caught the ball in traffic and how he was reluctant to even try and do so at a certain point in the year. We saw that improve throughout the course of the season, not to say that he is going to be a punt returner at the next level, but it's more of an option for him. If a t team wants to try him out anyhow, but if nothing else is a wide receiver, he's, he's got special abilities, not just the speed. The, the hands did get better this year too. He's not the most polished route runner necessarily, but he, he runs good enough routes.
Yeah, and it's not just screening nine routes. I mean, th- there are other routes he ran for guys like that a lot of time. You know, I mean, that was the knock on all the Baylor guys. You know, yeah. they would run fucking one route and and kind of a, a schemed up college offense. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, JT Sanders. This, at this point, I just want him to go in the third. You know, yeah. and going to the Commanders at seventy eight overall. If he goes in the third, that's great. And and I thought you made a good point last week. Not that you remember it, um, so I should just take take credit for it. Did we, uh, we talk last week? Uh, no. I haven't talked to you in months, dude. Uh, I know. That's why it's. I'm so happy to see your face as we catch up for the first time. Good to see you. I miss you. Um, just been busy at Lone Star. Sorry. Um, but no, but it, you said. Uh, Wait, are you not at the horn anymore? No, I'm, I'm at the zone. Oh, shit. Well, life comes full circle. Yeah, that's a great, great corporation. Um, they're still iHeart, aren't they? Yeah, they rebranded to iHeart to make sure everybody knows that they do have a heart. <laughs> yeah, that's the funniest thing with iHeart. It's like, yeah, not really. Um, command. Yeah, it rolls off the tongue a little bit better than I coronary. <laughs> <laughs> then I an asshole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We an asshole. Yeah. We assholes. Uh, <laughs> I'd be more on the nose. Uh, uh, I'm not I'm not crazy. Oh, you you were saying about JT Sanders about the the game or the game tape and what he's able to do on game day, maybe being more indicative of, of his capabilities than the testing. Yeah, you mentioned that last week that about it, that he may slide because of all that, but which which he probably will, but I at the end of the day, the guy can fucking play football, you know. Exactly. Um, so, and, and the guy wants to play football and, and he's, you know, he's someone I'd be like, well, they all want to play football. Well, I mean, that guy was, you know, there, he's a dog out there. So, in in the best way. So I, that actually be a really good pick at 78, but, um, I love this pick and a lot of our listeners are really going to love it for two reasons. Can I guess? Yep. Jonathan Brooks of the Dallas Cowboys. I haven't seen a three round mock draft that doesn't have him going I, to the Cowboys. I haven't either. Um, and that's where you look at enough mocks and put it together. It's like, there's some that just make complete sense. And that makes a ton of fucking sense. And that would be, that'd be a fucking steal for the boys. Yeah. I agreed. If nothing else, the fact that their team surgeon did his knee surgery. Yeah. You brought that up. I didn't know that. Um, but, and people may be like, well, you know, how does that play in? I know a lot of our listeners are really smart and they're like, well, you know, they're going to have even better intel than they usually would. Not that they couldn't go talk, not that other teams aren't going to talk to this surgeon and say, hey, you know, how clean was it? You know, rehab, all that. But he seems to be on track to where he's going to play next year. Yeah, the team surgeon could also be telling those other teams, oh my God, I haven't seen a knee this ugly since Napoleon McCallum. Yeah, no, this thing looked like Bill Walton's feet. There's an old school uh, reference for you. Or any basketball player's feet. Right, no shit. But Walton's feet, I mean, just were so, you know, just broken. And, I mean, he had all types of fucking issues. Yeah. There's uh, Jalen Wright, who I love, the running back from Tennessee, going to the Rams, the second to last pick in the um, in the third round. That'd They're be gonna, a really good one-two uh, combo for them with Kyron Williams and yeah. sharing that backfield. I like that a lot. Take some pressure off of Stafford and that passing offense next year. I love Jalen Wright. I love Trey Benson, and I love Jonathan Brooks. And you know, where, this, where does this ha- where does this have Benson going? Um, I don't think I've saw him here. This has Max Melton from Rutgers being the first running back taken. I don't even know who that is. Actually, no, I'm sorry. It's got Trey Benson going 70 to the Giants. Um, so he would be the first running back taken. That's that's a nice cons- consolation prize for Saquon Barkley. Yeah. No, but Benson's a fucking player, dude. I yeah. mean, you know, running backs have just been so devalued, but you're going to get some really good value for these guys, um, especially if if no one goes until the third round, which – I mean that I've I, I haven't seen many mocks where running backs gone in the second round. No, there's not that Bijan Robinson this year. No, I mean and that was God, that was great. Um, 
All right, so the seven round mock, how does how does Matt Miller does a good job? And yeah, he is a big Texas fan. Um, but he's definitely connected. Um, anything that stands out with that one? Uh, we'll just start at the top, like you did. After the run on quarterbacks, which starts Caleb Williams, then Jaden Daniels, then the Vikings move up, trading with New England to take Drake May. I can see Broncos that. Move up to take JJ McCarthy at four in a trade with the Cardinals. And then the Chargers take Marvin Harrison Jr. Jesus, what a steal that would be for the Chargers. Uh, getting to uh, the first Texas guy before the. Hold on, Texas hold on quick, because I want to see if this matches with this one. This has. This has the Patriots sitting pat, but Caleb, Drake, um, Jaden, JJ, and Marvin. JJ going to who? Do they have a card? The Cardinals and somebody trading the Broncos. You said right? No, they've got. Oh, the Broncos were trading to get Penix. So who trades up to get uh, McCarthy? They've got uh, the Vikings trading up with the Cardinals. Okay. Good luck with that, guys. Uh, the first Longhorn taken shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Byron Murphy, Matt Miller has them going fifteen to the Colts. Yep, seen that one a bunch. Pretty indifferent on that. I don't dislike the Colts, but I have no idea what's happening with them right now. Uh, Anthony Richardson will be back for them. They uh, also have the Texans. Where did that go? Oh, wait, the Texans traded out of that 23 pick. So they have the Cowboys going with an offensive tackle. Amarius Mims, offensive tackle out of Georgia. Yeah, I, just, I got questions about him, man. What are your questions? Just um, consistency and how good he'll be at the next level. Okay. I mean, he's, he looks like a fucking pro offensive tackle. He looks like an all pro. Um, so the size is there, but. Um, there are other guys in this draft, including, um, the Oregon state kid who's going to gonna go probably very high who I like, I like JC Latham. Um, but yeah, I mean, if Mims can keep his body in shape, um, I mean, he, he's six, seven, three forty, and looks the part, dude. Much like with your mock, A.D. Mitchell to the Bills at 28. And then I love this fit. Speaking of good fits for Xavier Worthy. Into the first round, Xavier Worthy going to the Chiefs. Oh, God. That would be. Now, they. You know, the only thing that I wonder about that, didn't they add that pretty much in Hollywood Brown? Yeah, but they only got him on a one-year deal. Okay, I didn't know I that. I feel like Worthy's upside is greater than what Hollywood Browns is. But you do also have to think that you've got – that's a couple of diminutive wide receivers right there, even if they do have speed for days. So there's perhaps more of an injury risk that surfaces. But I could see the Chiefs doing that, looking for a long-term solution for a, a, a number one option for Pat Mahomes other than Travis Kelsey. Mm -hmm. uh, scrolling through the second round now – one Texas Longhorn. Once again, it is Devondre Sweat going 54 to the Cleveland Browns. Holy cow. That would be a fantastic fucking addition for Cleveland. That would be. That'd be great. For a guy that you don't necessarily need to be that three down option, joining a defense that was the most disruptive in the league last year. Yep. Totally agree. Yeah. You're going to have Garrett. I mean, they've got most of those guys back, don't they? Yeah, they do. And how about the Cowboys in the second round taking Jonathan Brooks, according to Matt Miller? So, yeah, the secret's out on the Cowboys and how much they like Jonathan Brooks. Well, they're going to have to take a running back, right? It seems like that. I think they got Dowdle back. And I, I would be curious to see Deuce Vaughn get an opportunity at this level. He was on the roster for Dallas all last year, and I believe he stayed on the practice squad. There may have been a game or two that he – No, no, he, I think he played a little bit. Did he? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'd be curious to see him get some actual NFL carries and what he might be able to do with that. Next Longhorn up is 69 to the Chargers, Jatavian Sanders. Okay. They've got to reload at pretty much every pass catching position, running back, wide receiver, tight end because Gerald Everett is – oh, wait, Gerald Everett. Yeah, he was their tight end last year. So, yeah, they've, they've got a lot of work to do at the skill position. So, JT could be a really nice option for them there. And then Jalen Ford going in the third round, according to Matt Miller. Th this is probably a little Whoa, bit. Oh, Matt. In. 81 to Seattle. He actually admits as much. 
He says this is a little early for Ford based on feedback from NFL teams, but the Seahawks need a young linebacker for new coach Mike McDonald to train him into his Roquan Smith. Ford is special in pass coverage with six interceptions over the past two years. Let's pump the brakes on the Roquan Smith comparison. I like Jalen. I think he could be a nice player at the next level, but uh, taking him in the third round it is it does feel like a stretch right now. I hope that happens for uh, right. Jalen Ford's sake, but it ain't happening. I hope it happens, but yeah, it's not happening. And then how about this? Another third rounder for the Longhorns, Christian Jones going 84 to the Pittsburgh Steelers, a franchise with a storied history for offensive linemen. That would be fantastic. I mean, just for him to go anywhere in the third round. Um, you know, I still think he's probably a day three guy. Me too. But, but yeah, that would be I, – I can see Jones getting drafted in the third round before I can see Jalen Ford getting drafted. Yes, yeah, I agree with that too. Uh, your guy, Trey Benson, goes 85 to the Cleveland Browns. And okay. they're, they're saying Nick Chubb's going to be back this next season. That would be incredible if so, considering that gruesome injury that he suffered on national television last season. But bad. that would be a year removed, too. All right, scrolling down now. All let, right. me, let me throw in the Texans here because I didn't do that. Yeah, go ahead. So 42nd overall. Taking uh, Ennis Rakestraw, the corner from Missouri. I like that. That would be a good pick for them. Yeah, he can cover the shit out of it. I think he has one pick in his career. It's a little bit concerning. Yeah, but um, but there's no doubt he can cover. They have the Cowboys taking Zach Frazier, a center from West Virginia. Okay. <coughs> Don't know anything about him. I'm going to be completely honest. It's the first time I've heard that name. I mean, I... I've seen him because he played at West Virginia, but I, you know, I'd be lying if I have any idea how good he is. Um, Texans taking Mike um, Sane. What is it, Saner uh, still? Who's the cornerback from Michigan? I don't know much. I watched a ton of Michigan, and I do not know much about him. So, yeah, I'm not gonna sit here and bullshit you. It's not what we do on this. Um, what else? Round three. Texans taking Jermaine Burton from Alabama. I do know a lot about him. Um, what do you think about him as a pro? I mean, in that that offense and being, you know, the third or fourth wide receiver. Yeah, I, I think it's a good fit. Um, yeah. I like that. Um, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't want him as you know my first or second option, but he wouldn't be there. So I think. I think that makes makes sense, you know, and they there are there are different. I think that is it for the Cowboys and the uh, Texans on this three round. Um, there are there are different options that the Texans have. I like the fact that they traded and and got some capital. Yeah, they had the luxury to either take a risk with a skill guy, go skill guy, or just get more draft capital and stock up on depth. So I'm I'm in. I'm in agreement with you that they chose wisely. And so there's there's going to be guys, some of whom whose names you'll know, and other guys who may play those uh, those dirty work positions that are hopefully going to allow them, for Texans fans' sake, to uh, to really build depth and make sure that injuries don't derail what may be a, a fun season for them in year two for C.J. Stroud and uh, D'Amico. Hey, where does where does Miller have um, Penix going? Uh, real quick, finishing off the Longhorns, Jordan Winnington goes seventh round to the Carolina Panthers. Let's keep Longhorns away from the Panthers this yeah. year. And at that point, you'd rather go UDFA, man. I, I, I said that. BK and I went through this a day or two ago, and I said that exact thing to him. I, I want Jordan Winnington to be able to pick his team at that point. Now, Carolina could be a good team because they have a lot of needs, so his ability to make the roster goes up, I guess. But, yeah, let's let Jordan make that decision for himself. As far as Michael Penix... And by the way, most agents want that. You know, the last couple of years, I've been watching this draft with a much different eye. Yeah. Uh, and talking with, you know, agents throughout the process. And you get to the seventh round, go go pick your own place that's going to work for you, you know? Yep. I am looking for Michael Penix right now. I'm through 25 picks and I don't see his name. Wow, Matt Miller. Maybe the Texas bias is showing up in uh, what he thinks of Michael Penix as a pro prospect. 
Well, game. with the Texas bias be, you think he's going to be fucking Joe Montana? Or maybe you're just you're still bitter at how good of a game he had, which Matt Miller apparently is, because he has Michael Penix going 47 to the New York Giants. Yeah, that would be a fucking steal for the Giants, dude. There's no way. Yeah. Falls, there's no way he falls to 47, does he? No, there's no way. Let's see. The teams ahead of him, the Colts, the fucking Saints would take Michael Penix before he makes it there at 45. The Raiders, perhaps. If he's available in the early to mid second round, someone's trading up to get him. Yeah, that's a great point. Actually, you're right. Not even looking at these teams is probably a fool's errand. Cardinals don't take him. The Commanders, the Chargers, the Titans. The Titans may take a, a roll of the dice on him at 38. Yep. Because it ain't going to be Will Levis or I forget who else they signed this off season. Yeah, they have Levis. <clears throat> who else did they bring in? Hold on, now I'm gonna look. Cause it's not um not Tannehill anymore. Is Tannehill even on a roster right now? Um I don't think so. Astros are up three, nothing over the Yanks. All right. The quarterbacks. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mason Rudolph is the backup, and Malik Willis is the third stringer. Okay. Let's see, Ryan Tannehill. God, why don't we not get the Astros? God, it pisses me off. So fucking stupid. It's obnoxious. You, I mean, do you know the amount of fans that are young that they lost? Like in the Austin market that, you know, you can see the Rangers. And when the Rangers were sucking, you know, the Astros had the best run they've ever had. And yep. you couldn't fucking watch them. Like, she's bad business, you know. Pretty embarrassing. Welcome, welcome to baseball. Bad fucking business. Ryan Tannehill is not on a roster right now. He was linked to the Chicago Bears two days ago. Okay. I don't know how much. I mean, I don't think he's a starter anymore. Do you? No, maybe you have a power run game that you can hand the ball off to two guys 30 plus times and allow him to operate off of play action like his most successful seasons in Tennessee. When he's having to be the guy to make plays consistently, it's it started to not work in Tennessee as soon as they had to lean on him a little bit more with Derrick Henry going down to injuries and just being overall less effective. No, he he is a, a quality backup for you. You have a good starting quarterback, and when he's pressed into action, he can do some nice things and catch teams off guard before they have a chance to game plan for him. Did you have anything else on the uh, mock? No, not really. We, we could go over the Cowboys and Texans players, but it's, it's a bunch of random names, yeah. so I'm going to spare the people on that one. Jay, did you see you, were, you guys were talking about the uh, Puff Daddy story? Um, which is just fucking wild. Um, yeah. But did you see the drug guy, like his drug mule, who was arrested? Oh, yeah. It was a former professional athlete, wasn't it? Former Syracuse basketball player. Oh, that's right. Former Syracuse. And it's he's literally called his drug mule in these stories, too. Yeah. Like, he was arrested. It had coke on him at the Miami airport. Well, if there's a place to have, if there's an airport to have Coke on yourself, then I guess it is that Miami International Airport. I was just going to say, how many people have had Coke at the Miami, you know, fucking airport? They must, they must be breeding German shepherds like a fucking dog farm over there. I just assumed that would be like trying to take cannabis through the Denver International Airport. They're just cool with it at this point because everybody has it. Yeah, no, it's like storming the border. You know, let's just do this with numbers. <laughs> <laughs> numbers. Um, a flimsy gate at Lollapalooza and there's 50 teenagers on the other side. Yeah. Right. Uh, God, that is, that's a sad story, but, um, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff that, you know, the, the stories that have come out too, that, you know, yeah, I know you probably heard this before, but like to get in this, you know, hundred million, 200 million, you know, billionaire club, like they'll ask you to like bark like a dog. Like just, I mean, these are some fucking weird ass people, dude. I can't and even begin to imagine just how convoluted your thinking becomes when you get that rich and you gain that much 
power partially as a result of celebrity. Yep. It's obviously a weird fucking concept in and of itself. But I feel like there are people that don't handle that like complete creeps. And there yeah. are those that take it well above and beyond and uh, cause a great deal of suffering to other humans. Oftentimes a lot of other humans too. There are a lot of rich people out there that you have no idea. That how fucked up they are? No, that you have no idea that they're rich and they're normal people. And they're oh, normal. yeah, yeah. So, so it's a combination. Living in a small money. house or an apartment. <laughs> It's, it's the combination of money and celebrity, though. I feel like that's what yeah. does it because there's yeah. like an entitlement that sets in. Yeah, I'm talking more about maybe a neighbor. It's like, you know, you know, what do you think he's worth? You know, and it's mm -hmm. like, I don't know. I mean, he, you know, drives a nice, you know, humble car. He's got a nice little humble place. He doesn't dress real flashy. It's like the guy's worth 80 million. It's like, what? Yeah, you know I mean, there are people that actually do handle the money part. Now, the fame part's different, you know. Tell me if this is the case at Westlake, because after I graduated high school, I got jumped. And so my mom didn't feel safe in Carrollton for my brothers anymore. So they moved to Highland Park and they were, they were essentially the poor kids in Highland Park. But the observation that they made is that the richest people were just, they were chill. They were cool. They didn't flaunt it. It was that next level that made sure you knew how much money they actually had. Was that something similar happening like that at Westlake? Yeah, I'd say that's the case. Um, yeah, that, that you know, they, they felt the need to show how much money they had, you know, with nice cars and everything. And, um, oh, I mean, I also know people that have made a lot of money and they're really into cars. So, yeah, but they're a good person. And, but, you know, but not everything is flashy all, all around them, you know? Right. Um, yeah, if your money, spend it the way you want, whatever. But yeah, I mean, I, I do think that's probably, probably true. Hmm. Hey, do you have an interview to play today? I don't have anything off the top. I can grab something if you'd like. Well, I'm just really enjoying those. It's, I think it's a nice little 10 minute break, you know? Let's see. And I don't mean a break for us. We don't need it. I mean a break for you guys at home. Yeah. From our constant. Um, I've got. Did I play the CDC interview on this show? Um, you did. Um, never mind. Did, did um, Skeet Ulrich, uh, Stephen Root. Bobcat Goldthwait. Bobcat would be good. You could replay CDC. I thought it was a good interview. And I think for our listeners, I mean, there's a lot of them that probably didn't didn't hear it. And, you know, it's not like it's super long. So, um, but I, I don't know with you too. It's funny because you told me you thought he got a little short with stuff. I thought, I thought he was fine. And but, I mean, you asked some really good questions. Right? Like you always do. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Where is that? We got basketball tonight. How's your bracket looking? Uh, great question. I should check that. I know. I haven't checked mine either. I need to check, see if I'm, um, I know I'm not in first place at Lone Star because we had meetings this morning and uh, one of the guys is like, you know, sports guy, I thought you were going to be dominating this. I'm like, one, you know, like even if it was a sport, I watch a ton. That's not how it works. Um, yeah. But, but I was like, dude, I, you, you have, you know, the guy who's in first place, his 15 year old son did the bracket and he's probably like, I, I wasn't 15 or you are at 15. Yeah. I mean, five nights a week, I'm watching a ton of college hoops. Yep. All right. So I am, let's see. Will you just take me to the group for Pete's sake, ESPN? This is fucking ridiculous. All right, I'm tied for 67th right now. Okay, how many people are in your bracket? This is the TSU League. There are 133 so far, so shame on more than half of you for being worse than me with these picks right now. How, how do you find the fucking... 
Dude, ESPN made this whole thing so convoluted this year. If I were setting up a league going forward, I would not be using them because they're trying to reinvent the fucking bracket challenge wheel. Very dumb idea, ESPN. Yeah, I always thought that they were they were good too, you know? They used to be. It was a very simple formula that it, I think they had mastered, but they decided to fuck it up. All right, I do actually have an interview to play. It's not going to be CDC. It is actor Skeet Ulrich. Oh, okay. And people probably know the most from his role with the original Scream movie back in the day. Well, he's a very accomplished actor and has some crazy back, uh, crazy roots in NASCAR. He was actually the honorary pace car driver at last weekend's NASCAR race at Coda. And we talk about all sorts of stuff. He went through uh, something medical, not similar to you because they were different medical situations, but something that gave him a, uh, a similar perspective to you in terms of what matters and what doesn't. And uh, Yeah, we, we went deep last week. And so we're going to play that now. So uh, you and I catch a little bit of a break and the people are still entertained in the meantime. Mookie Betts. Summer of the year, baby. There we go. All right. And with that, here is my conversation with Skeet Ulrich. Ulrich is a longtime actor who was here in Austin. Skeet Ulrich is a longtime actor who is here in Austin this weekend, taking part in the festivities for NASCAR out at the Circuit of the Americas, the Echo Park Automotive Grand Prix. He's serving as the honorary pace car driver prior to the race on Sunday. He also has what looks like an outstanding new series coming out on AMC. It is called Parish, and it stars Giancarlo Esposito from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul fame. Skeet is a part of the cast, plenty of others as well. We're going to learn about that and his Crazy NASCAR past, believe it or not. And now my conversation with Skeet Ulrich. So you are in Austin. How are things going for you so far, man? Very good. We got in yesterday. We had the premiere of the new show uh, Wednesday night in L.A. And uh, and then we're out here to to uh, enjoy some NASCAR. I've got a lot of family, obviously. I'm sure you heard in the sport and uh, over the years. And um and uh, so it's good to have family come in, my kids, uh, and also get to represent a show that I love and a sport that I love. So, oh, you get to make it a family affair this weekend. That's yeah, 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 yeah. There's so much to get into with Parish, uh, which does premiere very soon for the general public on yeah. FX, and then, or I'm excuse me, AMC, and AMC. can be seen on Hulu immediately as well. And then also what you're doing in NASCAR this weekend. So you see that somebody is driving the honorary pace car for a NASCAR event. And you're like, oh, that's cool that this person is getting to do this. But that's that's not where it begins and ends for you, as you just alluded to. Now, I can take Wikipedia at face value and see that you've got some serious NASCAR connections in the past. But for anybody who's un unfamiliar, just how ingrained were you in the NASCAR lifestyle as a kid based on uh, family members and strong male role models in your life? Um, well, uh, uh, just to summarize it maybe in a unique way, um, I got on a Ferris wheel in at the Cabarrus County Fair near Charlotte Motor Speedway at, I believe I was 11 or 12 years old, felt dizzy. And the man beside me who took me on this ride was Tim Richmond. And, <laughs> and he began screaming at the guy, let us off, let us off. He was like a protector to my brother and I. Um, um, DK Ulrich, who is my stepdad, um, you know, ran, ran many, many years in the sport and owned uh, teams for many years after that and brought Ernie Irvin in, brought Tim Richmond in. Um, uh, Ricky Rudd is obviously my uncle. Uh, so I spent a lot of time around, you know, Earnhardt and, and Richard Petty and Ricky and sort of the legendary NASCAR drivers. Um, and I, it was it was amazing. It's such a family, you know, and it, it, I'm not as enmeshed as I once was. But from looking in, knowing Chad Canals, you know, from our relationships through the years, from Jimmy and ever it's always been a family sport and continues to be a family sport and it's it's beautiful in that way it's a traveling circus 
Um, when you're a kid like that, you don't realize that you're amidst these legends. So obviously the Ferris wheel story is a great one. Like, do you have a fondest memory from just hanging around the sport though, when you were a kid? So considering that you were around it a, a lot of weekends when these races are going on. Yeah. I mean, we were sort of, you know, at, at that time you qualified on Wednesday. So you got a lot of tracks, you know, or that weren't near to Concord, you know, Rockingham, obviously, North Wilkesboro, stuff around that, uh, you know, that was a day trip. But everything else was, you know, family leaving on Tuesday, getting back on Monday. So you either went or you were alone. And uh, my brother and I were often alone, but we often went. And I had a, I had an issue. I had a heart problem when I was 10. I had to have open heart surgery. And the week before I went to go in for the surgery was the Talladega race. And we went down for the Talladega race. And I guess word got around to everybody through DK and, and Ricky that, you know, what was going on. And it was going to be a tough surgery, this or that. And so, you know, Earnhardt, like, especially pampered me, stuck me up, he picked me up at one point, put me on top of the roof of the garage in, in, uh, in Talladega. And, you know, they just treated me like a king. I was in the driver's meeting and, and the king himself. It was a bank of pay phones I was sitting along and somehow he got the number to the one I was at and they rang and DK was like, pick it up. And I picked it up and it was the king and he was like, you're going to be just fine. You're going to you're going to make it. Don't worry about it. You know, he's just so sweet. Wow. And uh, I, I had a lot of a lot of times with with uh, some extraordinary people. And but those two legends, yeah, were of particular interest that weekend. Gosh, I, you know, I don't want to talk too much about this, but open heart surgery at such a young age. I've got a good friend of mine who went through testicular cancer when he was a teenager and it was so important for him as a character builder and something that built a resilience and a perspective that not a lot of kids or adults even have having to go through something so serious obviously it's very scary for you as a kid not knowing one way or the other but how important was that moment and who you are today oh man i think it kind of defined so much you know I, um everything down to career you know it uh i you know i was like many many kids wanted to be a pro baseball player and that was my jam and you know and and then you know the fear of getting hit by a baseball you know from a you know pitch in the chest they created we called it <laughs> my dolly parton in little league but i had a you know a catcher's <laughs> A chest protector cut up and they would ace bandage it in front of my sternum, you know, in case I did get hit, but yeah. it ingrained the spirit. So I was, I couldn't hit, you know, scared to stay in there and hit. Yeah. Um, so in a way I know, you know, there's so few of us that go on to be major league baseball players, but in a way that sort of changed a traje trajectory right there. Um, and, you know, I started finding other things that interested me, uh, like acting. So uh, um, um, yeah, it kind of defines everything. And you're right in terms of being a human being. I, I mean, I felt invincible, you know, uh, most of my life and still in, in a little bit of ways I do at 54 still feel, you know, invincible that I've, I've, you know, I've beaten death. Um, so I know what you mean. I know what your friend means. Yeah. It does give you a resiliency and a strength and a, and a, a scale of what's, major and what's not yeah, and i don't mean just medically uh you know but yeah very important perspective so did that keep you from ever getting behind the wheel yourself to race just because of the concern with the steering wheel maybe hitting you there no that wasn't it at all i mean I, you know it was um you know everybody was really busy uh you know there wasn't a lot of money to be made in nascar at that point in the yeah you know, early eighties. So it wasn't like, you know, we had a ton of money to even, or, or time for me to even start a go-kart, you know, uh, career, if you will, or somewhere to start, you know, your driving career. I mean, we had dirt bikes, we'd ride them all around. We lived off to ride a road, which is now like Hendrick lane, you know, where it's every industrial thing to do with NASCAR, but it was, you know, a couple of miles from the speedway, you rode dirt bikes all over out there. But no money no time to really you know invest in bringing along me as a driver or anything i would have loved it um i according to ricky i have some skills so oh really yeah yeah 
I'll take that. But I got to hand it down to my son. My son was doing bandoleros at eight. He was doing 110 and bandos at, you know, eight years old, nine years old. And damn. Um, yeah. And he had a, uh, you know, he ran seven seasons and then, you know, you hit a price point that just becomes a bit unmanageable. You know, uh, I do okay, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be able to support a race team. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a good way to put it. So you have served as a grand marshal previously at a NASCAR race. Is this going to be your first time to get behind the wheel of the honorary pace car? Absolutely. I'm not even sure what to expect. I mean, my my brother, you know, he uh he works for the company that runs nine of these tracks and um Speedway Motorsports and um and and uh you know, he when he talked about it it sounded like I was driving the pace car the entire race and I was like and that's a bit nerve wracking. I don't know about that. It can't be it. Yeah. He's like, I think so. And I was like, bro, I don't think so. So I think we're like, you know, doing a couple laps ahead of the base car, but yeah. and then we'll peel off and let him have at it. But um, it's exciting. You know, it's really, uh, I, I can't tell you, like, I mean, my mom started one of the first PR firms in this business and she worked at Charlotte Motor Speedway for years doing everything from bringing in, you know, sponsorships to the pre-race stuff to all the different things they did to try and generate fandom etc you know she was responsible for and and so i've had moments where i sat in between the grid as they rolled off pit road you know and ricky waves out the window at me and like you know i've had some really cool moments like that and but this one i you know it's so cool to get to come back in this way to a sport that i've spent generations around and in a role and in in a show that i i can't speak highly enough about and my experience with Giancarlo esposito and amc in general and this material and this show uh, i mean i'm blessed i am a blessed man uh, to have family around me while i'm doing it it's a highlight yeah, everybody knows Giancarlo from Breaking Bad, of course, and Better Call Saul. He actually looks a lot like the Longhorn men's basketball coach, believe it or not, a guy named Rodney Terry. Look that up after the fact. <laughs> I will check it out. You'll get a chuckle out of that. And let Giancarlo yeah. know that too, please, because that's been a running joke ever since Rodney Terry started coaching here a few years ago or came back to I will let him know, yeah. absolutely. But this, this show, this show Parish, looks incredible. Everybody knows about Giancarlo and his acting chops. I hope people aren't sleeping yeah. on what you're going to be able to bring to the show, too. Uh, you said in a previous interview, or probably a couple of previous interviews, if we're being honest, that your character uh, is towing that line and sometimes not so well between uh, problem-causing, let's say, and then also fun, too. Is it difficult yeah. cool to get to, to play those two sides on screen like that? Uh, it's incredible. You know, I like, I always have liked, um, I remember really being such a big fan of Gary Oldman and Vigo Mortensen in my twenties, you know, and, and the virility and the, and the tension that they brought to scenes and to characters. And it's, you know, that edge staying on that edge, but this guy's like got the, got a heart of gold, but he's just keeps messing up and keeps messing up. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I had, you know, put that on the front of my script. His name's Colin, the character. Does Colin bring trouble or does he bring fun? And it's and it's obviously both. You gotta do both. So uh uh it was an extraordinary experience. He's a you know a, a Cajun, which is a lot of fun to to work with that accent. I had done it one other time and um and this one I got to elaborate a little more on it and and that just is a whole sing song amount of fun that uh uh, I can't even explain. Um, but yeah, it's an, an incredible show about really about a guy who's suffering from so much grief at the loss of his son a year prior to the story, starting a 19 year old that was murdered in New Orleans and story all takes place in New Orleans. And, you know, subsequent to that, his grief sort of overwhelms his ability to run his business. His family's falling apart. They are going to have to sell the house. His daughter's at odds with him everything's falling apart and then an old friend shows up who they had done a lot of crimes together and this guy went away for 17 years for him and never ratted him out and that's me and now his life's on the line and he needs his help and uh and they they get into some stuff so they oh, get in deep that, that sounds <laughs> exciting that sounds really exciting yeah. i can't wait to hear you do the cajun accent again too i know you've said that when you got into acting, 
that you had to kick a southern accent because you grew up yeah. Virginia or North Carolina technically that you were both mainly North Carolina but I was born in Virginia okay yeah. so yeah you grew up in the south and you had to kick that southern accent to make it as an actor yeah what did you go back to to make sure to get the Cajun accent right are we going back and watching season one of True Detective or is there something else going on there <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's funny because I couldn't really find anybody that was doing what I wanted to do, uh, or that the, I couldn't find the accent anywhere. The one thing that was closest is that, um, that Cajun, uh, catfish cook dude, I can't remember his name. He's a YouTube sensation. Um, I know you're talking about, I'm going to have to look <laughs> yeah, and I wish I could remember talking. his name, but, um, but I saw that a little bit, and it's close to that. I mean, the character had done 17 years in Angola, which is the toughest prison in the U.S. Oh, yeah. And um, and it's a 90% um, Black population. So I wanted to sort of figure out how did this guy survive that, you know, and how. And so it was sort of a mix of Cajun and what it may have sounded like in Angola um, that I was after. And so that was kind of unique. And um but the basics of it are there. And, and I had lots of people coming to me on set who are obviously from there shooting in New Orleans saying, oh, my God, you sound just like my family or just like, you know, my uncle or this or that. And but yeah, it, yeah, it paid a lot of money to go to NYU and lose accents like that, only to like be asked <laughs> to <laughs> do them again. <laughs> That's very but, high praise coming from uh, people in the uh, Dubuque, the Bayou State. I was there yeah. at the start of this year for the Longhorns football game against Washington. Man, that city is so unique in so many ways, and it yeah. is very easy. You understand why people may be walking around with five to ten extra pounds because there is so much delicious food. Yeah. But it's also extremely decadent as well. I gained ten pounds over the five months we were shooting there. It was easy to do. I could have easily put on 20. Yeah, ex exactly. So yeah. much good food. Yeah. You got to catch yeah, yourself at a certain city. point. It's like that freshman 15 that first year in college. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the freshman 15 first, uh, first six months of living in New Orleans. Um, so one other interesting aspect about your story, Skeet, and something that led to you acting as well as a sort of passion for building. You were building tree houses yeah. with a friend, and you were actually mm -hmm. – a set builder which led to you realizing yeah. this passion for acting i'm curious in modern times is there something that you just built or something that you're currently in the process of building that you're especially yeah. proud of or has your attention oh my god yeah i've been building uh i i built a lot of well i shouldn't say a lot i'm not prolific because i have a lot of other things going on but when i do get time and the the strike allowed quite a bit of time for building recently um and I'm building a credenza, like an eight foot long mid-century low credenza for my daughter's apartment now, um, which is all walnut. And uh, I'm probably a week from finishing it. I don't know how much you'll be able to see of that. Like, Oh my God, that looks awesome. Yeah, they're cool. This is all like box joints. Um, let's see if you can see that. Oh, look at that. Yeah, that's beautiful detail there. Yeah. So I got to build the doors for it and uh, and uh, put the finish on it and stuff like that. I've built some stuff recently for my son, some side tables for his apartment, for his sofa. That was a lot of fun. I used Live Edge uh, walnut, which I'd never used Live Edge before. And I had a bunch of Santos mahogany left over from a current other projects I had built that I used to make the bases and stuff like that. So it was it's been fun. I, it's just something I love so much, you know, in film, uh, you know, we, it's a very collaborative effort at its best. And it's, um, and, you know, but we show up, we hand over our ideas and our presentation of, of the story, our part of the story. And then it's not ours anymore. And um, it becomes how the story gets shaped by the director and by the producers. And that's okay. I mean, and you want it that way you want, you know, but it's, you know, in furniture building, I get there from design to completion. It's my, mine, mine. And I, if I mess it up, I mess it up. If I make a great piece, I, I completed my vision, but um, it, it's just been a nice, uh, you know, something so interesting to me. And, and I build what's called heirloom quality furniture. There's no metal in them other than the hinges or something, but there's no, you know, it's all joinery uh, based. So it's all woodwork then? It's all woodwork. Yeah. Yeah. 
Sounds like you and Nick Offerman need to uh, do I know people together say if nothing that else so you guys time. can talk shop. I know. And I think we live near each other too, from what I hear. So okay. yeah, I, maybe one day we'll meet. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, we have just uh, another couple minutes left, Skeet. I'd really do appreciate the time today. Uh, we're going to finish with this question now because I really enjoy having these sorts of conversations to discover a deeper side to people. And you strike me as a very thoughtful dude from the interviews that I've listened to you do long form and otherwise. Uh, smart people, accomplished people tend to ask themselves questions. And at a given time, there's generally one overriding question that is top of mind for you right now as somebody who's bright and accomplished. Is there that one question? If so, what is it? The one question that I ask myself lots that you're uh, that you're asking yourself right now more than than any other question, let's say. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think it's a uh, for me at the moment, it's career based. Like, you know, it's I mean, it's a it's a tough career. It's a tough business to to uh, maintain. I've been in it 30 some years now. Um, and I wonder if there's a future. You know, I always, you know, wonder, do I still have a future in this? you know business and and i say that as i have a show coming out but like you know you just don't know things are changing so rapidly and uh and it's a performer thing you know i mean it, you know it's it's a uh you want to be doing your best stuff you know i don't want to just get by it's not doesn't interest me you know so i i ask myself lots you know what how you know what can i be doing how can i be bettering myself how can i you know uh stay on point so that i don't lose something i've worked 33 years for longer for there he is skeet olrich was in town for the nascar race at coda last weekend serving as the honorary pace car driver he's got a new show that he co-stars with giancarlo esposito aka gus fring from breaking bad and better call saul aka rodney terry's doppelganger parish premieres on amc this sunday so check it out live through amc or afterwards through amc's streaming service another one in the books for you man <clears throat> that was definitely worth it um you know you nailed it too thoughtful guy but like as somebody who didn't you know really seek out new shows like stuff like that you know i mean i, I hope he understands and yeah, i get the sense he does just how how valuable maybe giving you 20 minutes is because, you know, there are people like, I'm going to go check out the show now. I was, I'm interested in the show in, in New Orleans, but he seems like a thoughtful guy and just the storyline seems cool. But yeah, he was, uh, he, he, he's one of those people that, you know, clearly I've never met, but if someone said, Hey, he's going out to dinner, you want to come join us? I'd be like, hell yeah. I'd love to pick his brain. He just seems like someone who would be a pleasure to be around. Yeah, we didn't get into this either, but he took a pretty sizable break from acting in his early to mid-20s, I want to say. He and his, I forget if it was a wife or a girlfriend at the time, they had twins, and something happened to where he needed to be the primary caretaker of the twins, so he put his career on the back burner to ensure that his kids had at least a little bit of parental consistency in their childhoods, and um, he has zero regrets about that all these years later, even if it may have cost him a, a role here and there, because his role as a dad is much more important than any uh, character that he's played on TV or in movies. So uh, he and I talked once I stopped, uh, once I uh, stopped or I hit, uh, what am I looking for? Once I stopped recording and I said, yeah, I'd love to get into the parenting side of things. The next time we have a chance to chat, if, and when you got another project out. So that might not be the last time that we, that we talk, but yeah, he's, Seems like a really cool dude. The show seems fascinating. I mean, Giancarlo Esposito alone is probably worth checking it out. He did such a good job on Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. And yeah, the, the another reason is Skeet Ulrich pulling off a Cajun accent that even had the the uh, the Coonasses in Louisiana impressed on the set. All right. That's pretty damn impressive. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that would be just with the accents alone. And it's funny how he said, you know, he had to drop his Southern accent. I didn't know his whole backstory with racing. I thought that was pretty cool. And the heart, you know, open heart surgery and the fact that Petty calls him, you know, it's like, you know, that's that's crazy, dude.
Yeah, Rodney chimed in as the interview was going on. Obviously, Rodney uh, knows more about racing than maybe the rest of us combined here at TSU. Oh, no, hold uh, on, hold on, hold on. Not, not maybe. Rodney's forgotten more about racing in the last five minutes than all of us combined will ever know. He is to racing what you are to college baseball on this channel. I know. That's all I know. Nope, I needed to, whatever the opposite of an intensifier is, a a, uh, a dowser, uh, <laughs> I needed to drop the maybe and just uh, say it, be confident in that. He said, DK kept Richard Petty's starting streak alive by putting him in his number six car when Petty failed to qualify. Interesting. I wish I'd known that in the moment. Thank you for sharing, Rodney. The next time we chat, I may have to bring that up. Yeah, I mean, yeah. how'd you not call Rodney on this one? That would have been like my first call. It was a last minute setup and I decided to keep it fairly general, but the next time we may get more into the minutia of it. Rodney also says DK and JD McDuffie were the best of the independents. What racing was all about worked on their shit with volunteers. Usually damn. So truly a, a love for the sport scenario there. So I've heard you ask this question multiple times. <clears throat> I'm going to turn it around on you. What's the biggest question you're asking yourself right now? Because I think it's a great question. How in the fuck can I get this interview thing to take off? It's a really good product. I, you know, I know this doesn't sound humble at all, but I do a good job. It's compelling guests, episode in, episode out. Like, what in the world do I need to do to get a lot, of, a larger audience to notice? Because yes, it's a passion project and I do it because I love it. It's this thing may, may be coming to an end sooner rather than later in terms of uh, just high caliber. This whole thing is if I cannot figure out how to get the word out better than I currently am. I hate to hear that. You don't do a good job. You do a great job. You know, you, the, the best, you know, the best compliment I can give you are there are people I either don't know or would never care, care about, but I'll watch 15 minutes and I'm like, that was that was great. You know, um, like that, you know, and you learn a lot about people and, you know, you start asking yourself questions and, and, um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I wouldn't necessarily have, if that interview was on TV, um, stayed on it, but I would have missed out, you know? So I think, um, dude, keep up the good fight. Keep, Keep staying. Um, you know, I mean, I've got ideas. I'm all ears. What about you? What's a question you're asking yourself right now? Um, really just rebuilding my, you know, this side, I've, I lost the weight I, that I needed to. And now it's about adding good weight and, mm -hmm. um, just more health. It's like just wanting to continuously get healthier. You know, I'm in my forties now and uh -huh, definitely in my forties. Um, so, just, just how to be healthier and be a better person every day. I think I'm a good person, but the health part is probably what I ask myself the most. Like what the next major step is for you because yep. you started to reintroduce the right sorts of foods and working yep. out and some other things. Yep. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm getting there, but it's something that I think about daily. So that would be it. But also, you know, with my uncle dying, um, in what was that August? Yeah. Uh, kind of the just making sure that I spend great time with my mom and dad, you know, that there that there are no regrets. Um, there was a guy I was talking to this morning who was having some problems with his wife and was venting to me and asking questions. And he said, you know, I hate ending in arguments where it's like, fuck you, fuck you. And I was like, I don't do that. Like, I won't like, you know, yeah. you and I have gotten in arguments and I'm like, I love you. You know I mean? Yep. Like, you know, because if we die in a car wreck, I don't want the last thing I said to be, you know, fuck you. So this, he was talking about a guy who, I don't want to get too specific about this. A guy who I knew, um, he knows a lot better, but. I guess was in an argument with his mom, which of all things and yeah. said, you know, well, fuck you and hung up. And then a couple of days later called her and she didn't pick up and he went to the house and she was dead. Oof. And not by suicide. I mean, you know, but the last thing he said to her was fuck you. You got to live with that for the rest of your life too. 
that's rough, you know, and he has, he's lived with it for a little while and it just eats him up. And, but that story just reminded me that life's so short and um, no matter what, you know, arguments you're in with people, especially people you love, you've got to, you got to end on a, Hey, we can figure this out or we don't, we won't figure it out. But, um, you know, I do love you. Yeah. Fuck you. All right. I'm out of here. How yeah, are you? Always been my style. Also, even if it's, uh, been a screaming match and ugly things are said, like maybe you need to some, a cool down period before, before the before anybody goes to bed or before you part ways, at least be able to say that to one another. Even yeah. if you both feel upset, maybe it's going to take a little bit more time to process before you come to a solution or or make amends. But don't let that person out of your general vicinity without them understanding how you feel about them deep down, regardless of the ugliness of a moment. I think I think some of that's just growing up, but you heard it in that interview with him. I do think there's certain things in life that will completely change your perspective. And honestly, the younger they come, the better. I mean, it does suck that he's 11 and 12 and getting open heart surgery. I was 18 with my my deal, but I mean, but hell, even my parents getting divorced at 12, like I go back on that, like that was hard at the time. But yeah. you know, you know, built a lot of um, resiliency and made sure I'm never going to get married. So. <laughs> daddy's keeping all the coin yeah well uh, epiphanies are enormous for I'm kidding about the marriage thing like that that is not why i'm not married like it you know no, it's, it's in your genes that you are gonna stay single for your entire life we've discussed this off the air i forget if we've discussed it on the air no surprise to you but and honestly i i do too i don't know if i'm, I'm sure I've, I've been on the air so much i'm sure i mentioned it at some point but yeah i mean a majority of my family is single and lives by themselves and wants it that way. It, yeah. And is happy as such. So that's not, yeah. that's not a sad story. That's not a tragic story. That's just the way that a, a somebody or a situation is. It's okay. Yeah. And not all the same. Right. I mean, my uncle John who died um, was, you know, he, he was with a girlfriend for, he was 10 years when I was like a little kid, but, he dated, but single. My dad never remarried. My mom did remarry, but she's been single forever now. Um, my aunt Wilma was single when she died. Was married and had kids. Um, my uncle Keith and aunt Laura, single. Um, Sue had her husband die, but hasn't dated and lives alone. So, you know, the biggest thing with that, though, is I, I don't think I could do that. And, and that's why I do think I'll end up... There's going to be some poor woman who's got to deal with my shit. Um, but I think the older you get, you know, my, my life's so busy right now and I've got a great crew of friends and I've got um, uncle Kevin too, you know, some really good kids. So I don't feel like I'm missing out right now. Um, but I can definitely see myself getting to an age, especially retired. And I'm like, I'm just fucking bored. And guess what? Like I don't talk to my friends as much as I do in our forties. And that makes sense. You know, I mean, although they should, I mean, I've talked to my dad about that. I'm like, dad, you should spend every day and pick five of your friends and call them and see what's going on. Cause they're retired. You're retired. And I'm not buying your bullshit that the Notre Dame message board you're on, that they're going to be, you know, about to go on a three year run and winning natties. All right. <laughs> I like that idea. Actually, maybe it's not five, but pick a couple different people out every day. Yeah, I, I've kind of done that um, to where, you know, because it's weird off friends that we just don't talk a lot. Yeah. Um, Malik and I are a great example, but like he's one of my best friends and we're super close and we will be for the rest of our life. But we may go, you know, four or five months without talking. We, we may text a little bit, but the second we talk, we just pick up where we left off. But you got to have friends you got to kind of be in the same spot there. Cause I've had some friends that are like, bro, it's like, I'm like, dude, I, I mean, I'm busy and I'm not gonna, I, I'm just not gonna. And I don't want to talk to you three times a week. You know, our friendship went through that, by the way, when you were in New York and I was in Chicago drink up, yeah. like, we yeah. would touch base. Sometimes it was like every three to four, there may have been a, a six month or in there, but we catch up. We're not giving one another shit because life is fucking busy. 
And we try to live very much in the moment, including the people around us. It's just the, the nature of the beast at times. And I think a defining characteristic of a lot of good friendships is that that time off, it doesn't harm the friendship necessarily. In a lot of ways, it is beneficial. It helps you grow closer because you can appreciate one another that much more when you do have an hour or two to carve out to, to catch up on a weeknight. I mean, with all the crazy stories I had last night, I gave you a story that I can't believe I've never told you. That is top three for me. And oh my God, I I don't know if you can ever tell that story on these airwaves. That was that was on par for people who have heard Kevin's uh, one of Kevin's best stories. It's on par with the Larry David story. It is that insane of a fucking story. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, it's one of those where. I woke up the next day and I told you I called Colin, one of my buddies who was involved in the story and was like, did that really fucking happen, bro? Like, <laughs> no way that happened. It's like um, out of a fucking movie is what it was. Yeah. And it was a time when there were a lot of, you know, there were drugs involved. There was, there was a lot of, of a Quentin Tarantino movie. Yeah. A lot of being in your twenties, but <laughs> FBI agent involved partying with us. Um, it was, <laughs> you know, hold on. Why didn't you just tell the story? All right. Um, I want no, to no, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't. Well, tell no. I tell you what. Let's you and I talk and find a creative way because I also yeah. don't want to vote. Agreed. Lot. Agreed. You know, yeah. And it's certainly not who I am, or yeah. you know, have not been for a long time. But even then, like that was so. I mean, you know, it it fucked me up to where I was like, I, I just had never, you know had a night like that but it, it's a great fucking night and it's a it's a great story you do actually have another story that you can tell that's more recent ah uh, let's get I, I i thought about that we're, we're gonna we're gonna hold off on that one you know um oh really yeah i don't want to tell it i don't i mean you know one one of them listens to this so oh, okay yeah well that's that's a good deterrent yep yeah. um so you know you know, not that I care that it puts me in a bad light. And it's not, you know, like I yelled at a, you know, a woman because of her dog at a coffee shop. I mean, I'm, it's not, I'm not that big of an asshole in this story. Uh, Kind of. You kind of are. In some ways, it's worse because there's bodily fluids involved. It was an accident. <laughs> and I'm sorry, it wasn't I fluids. Got, it was a single I, fluid. In, 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 see them. Say that again. <laughs> That I have big time allergies. Okay. Yeah. You like how, I mean, anytime you go Larry David right away, it's like <laughs> kind of where it's like I had allergies and it was an accident. And all right, I was an asshole. Yeah. This sounds like you're qualifying your assholeness. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I pretty much am. Well, I mean, intent to me is, is a large part of life, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if you're someone at work and they intend well and they're trying hard man, you're going to give them a lot more rope than someone who just doesn't give a fuck, right? Or if someone does do something to you and you know that was not their intention, that's way different than someone who's trying to to hurt you with intention, you know? Yeah, somebody who doesn't give a fuck but does their job well and, like, they, it doesn't impact me at all, them not giving a fuck, I'm, I'm probably okay with that. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'd actually rather have that person because they're not going to bother me at work. Um, yeah, that's but I'm a characteristic of yours and my friendships. Although we do care about things in a large way, we don't give a fuck and we don't give a fuck together. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, yeah, we got to find a way to give, give the, the really good story, um, on, uh, it was in New York and I was bartending at the time. So, um, you can probably piece some stuff together, but that was, Dude, that was uh, I mean, that was such a short part of my life in between CBS and The Onion. But it was like, I'm so glad I did that. I always wanted to really bartend and I needed to for money. But then I got to a point where I didn't need to. But I just kept on. I kept like, you know, a shift, I think, every Sunday. Um, where was the bar of the financial district, too? It was in Tribeca. It's OK, called, Tri Tribeca. That's right. Yeah. Reed, uh, Reed Street Bar and Grill. And the Borowski sold it. Um buddy of mine from New York who worked there called me lifetime bartender in, in New York. Great, great fucking guy. Big Cowboys fan of all things, which is hilarious mm. from, from the East coast, man, there are Cowboy fans everywhere. Um, and called me was like, well, they sold it. So 
it's it's actually right across the street from Mark Forgione's place restaurant. I don't know who that is? You don't know Mark Forgione? No. Chef, nope. Iron Chef, Larry, his dad was one of the pioneers of of modern American cooking. Mm -mm. Man, what are you doing in life, man? I mean, you you should be asking yourself that question. Why coaching, am I coaching I'm, second and third grade girls volleyball? Oh God, I'll, I'd rather watch Mark Forgione on Iron Chef America. Hey, Texas baseball tonight. Who are they playing this weekend? They are at Kansas State, and because it's uh, Easter weekend, they always do the Thursday through Saturday. I totally miss this, and have just been um, busy in a good way at work. Um, and then I've just tried to crash early, but they lost – Tuesday to uh a &M Corpus Christi. So Kansas State's ranked 23rd in the country. Um where's Texas ranked right now? Texas is 15 and 10 overall. Oh shit. Okay. So I saw that they bounced back from that tough extra inning loss last weekend to Baylor to win the series, including yeah. run ruling on Sunday. That was a good, nicely done by Pearson Company. Yeah, I mean, I, I like how they're trying to figure stuff out, you know. I mean, and they, you know, they lost an 11 4 3. I was um, at that game. <clears throat> and then 10 2, they won. Um, and then 11 1 and 8, they run ruled them. So, I mean, it was a nice little bounce back. I don't think Baylor's good, but where Texas is right now, just like trying to figure out the pitching. And I, I think that, you know, I'll give the coaching staff credit. I think they've done a good job of, you know, People, when we did the uh, preview show before a and when we were out there, BK asked me, he said, well, like, what do you do with the pitching staff? Well, you try and figure out as many options as you can. And you and they've done that. And Ace Whitehead was one of the people we, we asked about. And Ace has gotten into the rotation now and has done a really good job. Really like that young man. He was a dude. He was a great, uh, probably more than two sport, but two sport athlete at Lampasas. He was like all Syntex quarterback. Um, obviously if you're playing baseball at Texas, big time baseball player, but yeah, it's been, he played a lot of outfield early on kind of pinch runner defensive replacement in his career, but it's been good to see him come in there. So look, I mean, they're, they're never going to have, this team will never have probably enough pitching, but I think the staff's done everything they can in season to try and figure out any options they have and whether it's moving guys around for different roles or guys getting more innings and really getting in there. Um, you know, I told you one of my biggest frustrations during the Pierce regime is that it, they just walk too many guys. Yeah. Um, and it's something that me as a baseball person can't stomach just watching a game right now. I'm watching Cardinals Dodgers. I just, I, you can't fucking walk people. Watching that first guy get on via walk, especially with the percentage of him making it around the bases and scoring a run. Yeah. It's maddening doing man. Give up 450. Seriously. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, you know, it kills me. And a lot of that, too, is growing up with Gus and especially Augie and Skip. Right. Like, you just did not. Um, you just did not do that. You know, I mean, it, you, you know, you just you weren't going to pitch. You know, you just didn't. Frank Anderson was like that with Augie. Um, Clint Thomas and Gus. Um, is it just as simple as making sure you're throwing first pitch strikes? Is that what it comes down to? That's a lot of it, but you need guys in there who are going to be competitive in the zone. Yeah. So I've given Mix this pitches up a little bit, get closer <laughs> to corners on that first pitch to make sure you're not just putting something down the pipe. Yeah. Um, yes. I, um, I've given this story, but I, I think it's telling on where Texas was. Um, and look, some of their really good teams under Pierce, they've done a better job at throwing strikes. There's usually one fundamental thing that that always kind of trips me up. But I was I've also, you know, most of us right now who watch Texas baseball our whole life, we had two fucking legends, you know, that 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 it's hard to replace. But <clears throat> when I was doing play by play for uh, for baseball, I went to a practice midweek. During um during the season, and I'm in right field in the uh, bullpen with Skip, and there's this guy who had not thrown all year, big ass son of a bitch. I forgot his name, and I won't give his name even if I knew it, but I forgot his name. And but like six four, six five, big dude, 
and they've got the gun on him. And I'm standing, you know, with Skip as we're watching him. And this guy's pumping 95, 96, wipeout slider. Like, Skip, where the hell has this guy been, dude? It's like, I think he's pitched a third of an inning this year. Looks at me and is like, he doesn't throw strikes. Mm. It doesn't matter your stuff, your potential, whatever. You got to throw strikes. And um, like that. guys in there now, hopefully they're doing that. But this will be a good test this weekend. I don't know what the weather's like in Manhattan, too. That's a kind of a funky park. I called a, a, a regional there for ESPN. And it's, you know, depending on the weather, that that place can kind of turn a little bit. Oh, the winds get going any which direction, which can serve or hurt pitchers slash hitters. Yeah, and there's something about the wind in the Midwest. I mean, it just, you know, I guess the there's no things to block them. They just, you know, they can be running for miles. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, You know, I think one of the reasons, real quick, why I always did like baseball, and I'm just now realizing this, is because baseball is able to experiment more in season than pretty much any other sport. Oh, yeah. In terms of where guys are in lineups, how you're throwing pitchers out there, pitch sequences, uh, just what you're doing on the base paths as well. Basketball is probably second just in terms of lineups and combinations of guys who are out on the floor, but baseball is leaps and, ba- leaps and bounds beyond any other sport in terms of just testing things out to see what works and finding that right combination. Yeah. Dude, I'm with you. Um Astros leading the Yanks 4-3. Dodgers are up 5-1. I told you Betts went yard. Freeman hit a two-run shot. Goldschmidt. Tyler Glass now, the ace for the Dodgers. I love that move. Hmm. Where did he come from? Well, Tampa. He's obviously got to stay healthy, but he's got big-time fucking stuff. And I I like his competitiveness, too. I mean, he's the real deal. Yankees got on the board against the Astros because of a Juan Soto single to right field. For those wondering, Juan Soto is going to have a monster year. Yeah, with that lineup with Stanton, Judge, who else is in that lineup now? Well, I think he's I think he's hitting by hitting ahead of Judge, so he'll be protected there. But yeah. short right field porch. I know when he's really going, he's going everywhere. But that short right field porch, you know, he had a monster spring. It's his walk year. Um, I mean, this is his money year, you know, and the guy's just too good of a hitter, man. He just is. Um, he, he's got too good of an approach and great eye. Um, yeah, I think so. If you took Soto one in your uh, fantasy, then I, I can see that in the first round. Wow. Anthony Rizzo is still going. His age 34 season. He is with the Yankees still. Yeah, Rizzo. Rizzo was, you know, I think having a relatively good year last year, but he got the concussion. Do you remember that? I don't remember that, no. He, and it was a weird concussion. It's like, it's a funny thing about concussions. It's not necessarily always has to be like the type of dramatic blow you'd think. Um, but they're trying to pick a guy off and he's like, you know, the throw was in and the guy just coming back just kind of hit him. But... I guess hit him hard enough and he was just in a funk and then pretty much sat out the rest of the year. I mean, he, he was, you know, he was, I, I always liked Rizzo. I, I didn't, you know, the Cubs, did the Cubs ended up being right by the way. And, and at the time I said, I agree with it for the money. getting rid of him. Rizzo, Bryant, Baez. None of those guys have been the same since then. They, it was, it was the right decision. Wilson Contreras. It, it was like, I mean, the, well, the one guy you could maybe argue, and I don't like this style of baseball. This is me watching the NBA and, and seeing uh, 71 threes hoisted. Um, but Kyle Schwarber, you could argue just for what he yeah. does. Now he hits fucking, you know, at the Mendoza line, and he doesn't really get going until May, it feels like. But, I mean, for what you're looking for in baseball with the analytics, like that may be the guy who's worth it. Chris Bryant's the biggest one because Chris Bryant – was so damn good. I mean, they were talking about him being a $350 million guy. Well, Four- didn't he end up going to the Rockies too? He's been fucking awful, man. That That is shocking just because of the Coors field effect, if nothing else. You would assume he would have good home splits. 
Totally agree. Um, yeah, let me look at his stats. It, it'll it'll surprise you. I mean, I would think. And by the way, the over under, if y'all can still get in on this for his home run total, I was watching MLB. Good to have some of these shows back. Um, and the over, they were go, giving some good over unders for the year. His over under. Guess what his home run over over under is for this year. Yeah. Oh gosh, he played 80 games last year and he had 10 homers. It's probably like 15. It's 18, but Chris Bryant's got to hit more. I'm assuming he plays more. But yeah, look at his Rockies numbers. Now he hit 306, but dude, his yeah, his <laughs> he had 306 and 22. Last year was 233, but I probably value OPS a little bit too much at this point with all of the advanced statistics that exist in baseball, but his last season of going 900 plus OPS was 2019. He gets traded from Chicago in 2020 in the midst of a 644 OPS season. It gets a little bit better. Uh, excuse me, 2021, his OPS with the Cubs was 861. He gets traded to the Giants temporarily and is not very good after that. He was 851 in 2022 and last year a 680. That is. That's unacceptable. It's got to be better than that, Chris Bryant. Again, if nothing else, the home splits have to prop everything else up to, to get you closer to that 900. Yeah. Um, in the 306 year, he only had 160 at-bats, so he was injured. Right. Um, he's another guy just has not had – or I guess he has. I take that back. But, yeah, in Colorado, it's just – I mean, he's not been, not been worth it. And I'm with you. That makes no sense. I mean, I, I really – I overestimated Bryant. Now he was also a rookie of the year and MVP, you know? So, I mean, when he was, you're that young, you just think that your 30 and 31 year, you know, you're going to be fucking crushing it. And, and he's not. Um, So yeah, I mean, the Cubs actually ended up making the right moves. I think on all those guys. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there was anybody else from that group that ended up getting shipped out. I mean, Ian Happ, funny enough, they've stuck with him. He's still there. Mm-hmm. Um, Albert Almora didn't end up sticking with that team long, did he? A little bit, but no, he's. I think he's gone now. Um, I don't even know their roster that well this year. Is, uh, oh gosh, who's the dude who was getting called the next Greg Maddox early in his career? He wasn't quite that. He's a solid pitcher, though. Kyle? Kyle Hendricks. Kyle Hendricks, yeah. Is he still on the team? He, I think he is, but he's been there, you know, the whole time. Yeah, he's yeah. poor Greg Maddox. Um, they got actually funny enough, the guy, the other guy who they probably should have kept, and I thought, why not? Why not just give it a shot? Was Jorge Soler. Yeah. Who's put up some power numbers, you know. Yes, he has. Yeah, he's got some Nelson Cruz potential in the latter half of his career. Soler does. Without a doubt. Um, are the Rangers playing tonight? They are, yeah. Rangers and Cubs. I think it's a seven thirty start, maybe. Okay, yeah, R- Rangers should be. Fu- I mean, the Rangers and Astros, I think, are going to be once again the class. You know, we'll see where Seattle is. Um, Seattle's got some really good young arms, um, and they've got. I, I've got some guys, you know, who can who can really rake too. Um, Rodriguez, especially, but I like the way they built that team. I don't know if they have enough offense, but it should be Houston and Texas and. Just great for us, man. Um, I just wish the Astros were on. I'm gonna bite the bullet, and it's definitely worth it for me to to get the package. But even if I get the package, I'm not sure that I think they're still called an in market team, and I can't watch them. Yeah, you're right about that. Right, you just need to pirate it on your computer. Rangers Cubs is at 6:35 on ESPN. For those wondering. Okay. Yeah, and Texas Kansas State. I looked at it, and there's a watch. Maybe it's watch ESPN. Um, but that uh. I'll have both those on, man. Yeah, dude, it's nice to have. And then we obviously have basketball tonight. Oh, yeah, we do have that. God damn it, I hate how little I care about college basketball. We do have basketball, though. Sweet 16 gets going tonight, also tomorrow. And the first game is Clemson, Arizona, San Diego State, UConn, All right. Alabama, North Carolina, and Illinois, Iowa State all playing tonight. I'll be into San Diego State, UConn, and Illinois, Iowa State. Um, I actually like the Clemson team. The little bit that I watched of them last weekend, closing out Baylor. Yeah, that's a fun team. 
I'll watch a little bit of San Diego State, UConn too, and then I'm intrigued by this Iowa State team going up against Illinois. Terrence Shannon is obviously a fun player to watch, but this Iowa State team is clicking at the perfect time, it seems like. No, they are. That guy's done a good job, dude. He's he's exceeded expectations all three years. And you know, I really love Illinois' coach. I was one of the guys that I wanted Texas to really look at when they when they I guess hired Beard. It was uh, so fucking amusing to me. And look, I understand why they went with Beard. It was so amusing to me to hear people say that Underwood is too old. Too old for what? Yeah. Yeah, it was in like his mid fifties at the time. I realize you want somebody who can be here for three decades. You can't take for granted. A guy who has the ability to turn things around pretty quickly, play a fun style, and yeah, he could still be there for a decade. That's that's a great run. Texas yeah. hasn't had many of those. Uh, yeah, that I, program. Current current day or even back in the day, but current day, I would never hire someone as a coach saying, well, we got to make sure they can be here three decades. Easy, Cowboy. Let, let's get through the first recruiting class, all right? It's that Sean McVay romanticism. It's guys like that who have that early success and are young. And it's like, oh, we got to find the next version of that. No, just find a coach who's a good coach, who has a fun style, who has a, an adaptable style that can win in a variety of ways and isn't a complete embarrassment off the court. Yeah. That. Age, is, age is very secondary. Yeah. No, it's, that's not very high on my list. I mean, I, I don't want to go higher, you know, you know, some, 68 year old but um but yeah i mean that's, that's yeah, i'm not hiring dick vital as the next coach at texas no for a variety of reasons yeah for for a lot of reasons um what was i going to tell you about that oh i was going to ask you with sark and this is obviously talking about putting the cart for the horse I mean, he's had one good year here but it looks like it's on the right path assume that he does have some great years ahead of him right and we should be in the playoff a lot, the, the number of teams in it now. Um, but it's in the playoff consistently, makes a run, maybe wins one, maybe wins two. I mean, that would be, you know, what do you think it would take for him to leave? Like the type, the type of pro job that he'd want? Because I don't think he's going to another college. Yeah, no, I think it would it would be an NFL jump and maybe things are starting to teeter a little bit and he's getting a little bit tired of the, the politics element of things and they don't figure out NIL in the transfer portal to make it less of a 24-7, 365 part of the job that he grows tired and says, you know what, I can make as good or better money at the NFL level. Yeah, it's a grind during the season, and there's stuff to take care of in the offseason. Do you actually catch a little bit of a break, though? So I could see him maybe getting to that point in his career where he just wants to shift gears. And also, you know, Nick Saban did this. There are plenty of guys who have done this, proved that he can do it at the highest level as a head coach. Yeah, Nick Saban proved he couldn't. Um, right, but I, I think you hit the nail on the head. The thing that worries me about him or any of these college coaches, because we've seen in our lifetime an amazing turn of pro guys going to college, you know, and a lot of that's because there's more money or there's more money in college. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think we're going to see a shift here. And I totally get it as much as I love college sports more than, than pro sports. And I love pro sports, but college football to me is, is king. Um, man, I, that would really wear on you. They're going to have to figure out the portal, NIL, all that, or else like that job, it's just, it's just, that's too, too fucking much for too long, man. People may think that I'm obsessing on this and maybe I am in a sense, but the reason why I bring it up so much is because nothing will get done until the NCAA is completely out of the way, at least as it pertains to college football. The NCAA, once again, still operating five years behind the times. I don't know if you saw this. It came out either yesterday or today. Charlie Baker, who's the head of the NCAA now, says that gambling on college sports is a problem, and he's calling for these betting sites to no longer allow college sports prop bets, which is only a handful of states that actually fully allow prop bets at the college level. But it's like, man, you're... You're trying to fight the environmentalism fight right now by banning plastic straws. This is such a misguided, almost nonsensical effort in terms of what the actual impact is 
on your sports and the supposed threat to individuals who aren't necessarily matching the props that people are betting on them for. Yeah. I, maybe it's a bigger problem than, than we know, but I, I think you, you kind of hit it there. It's it's 1.4% of what DraftKings brings in annually, according to their 2023 or 2022 numbers, no 2023 numbers, 1.4% of their bets had to do with college props. And it's literally only five or six states that even allow it to its fullest. So it's like five or six out of the 36 that do allow the full thing. Like, what, what are we doing here, Charlie Baker? You already kind of have this. Are you just trying to find a W? Is that what's going on right now? And this is going to help you feel better about yourself because you keep striking out so miserably with regards to getting federal legislation passed, which is never going to get passed as long as you are insisting that that package includes these universities and athletics departments from having to consider football players and maybe basketball players as employees of the university, like ultimately you're going to run out of time and you're also probably going to run out of money too, considering all of the different lawsuits that you're having to deal with right now as well. No, you're right. That's, that's what's ultimately going to torpedo the NCAA and make knock it out of college sports altogether. And then there's probably going to be even more of a scramble because there isn't, a contingency plan in place. And that's probably what's going to force the SEC and Big Ten to break off and do their own thing, at least in football, but maybe in every other sport before it's all said and done. And Charlie Baker was a politician back in the day. He He was the governor of Massachusetts. That's one of the big reasons why they brought him aboard to the NCAA is because they realized that they needed something done legislatively and they wanted someone who was familiar with that process to lead the NCAA and, and help do their bidding for them in D.C. And it's just been a, a whole lot of strikeouts up to this point. Yeah, man. Um, I don't know. It, it's a it's a interesting question, interesting discussion and debate about where all this is going to go. Because um, I do think there there are some things that have gone the right way. I mean, I think these guys do need to be paid, and I think it also will help. You know, I think college basketball could actually get better because there may be more guys playing. You know, I mean, one, the NBA is like finally waking up years after it's probably too late. But if if you can pay them and make some coin, then, you know, at least have them in at least have them for a year. I know it's not ideal, but it, NIL is definitely helping college basketball. It's weird because there's so much player movement, so it's hard to keep track of rosters year to year. But in terms of keeping talent around. It is having that effect so far. And the best guys at the college level are upperclassmen. I, I know I'm getting repetitive here because you and I talked about this on Tuesday, but look at the All-America teams. Yeah. Second and third team, there's only a couple of guys who are freshmen or sophomores. Everybody else is juniors and seniors. Yeah. Um, I think I told you, speaking of repetitive, that Jay Wright had said that he thinks it's really moving that direction, that he was talking about Calipari in Kentucky. He said, I just don't think yeah. you're going to do that anymore and and win, you know, win the way you went to, which is getting the final four and winning the natty. Calipari said, I'm, I'm glad we passed on that. Calipari's had, I wonder how much pressure he's facing at Kentucky, which to me is, you know, numero uno for the, the best program of all time. He got the endorsement, or I guess Kentucky announced that he will be back next year, but he's going to be dealing with a pretty warm seat next season. If he doesn't get them out of the first weekend, that's probably going to be it for him. And I do remember Texas fans, and BK Holy admits this too. He he was arguing for Calipari several years ago. I was like, no, this guy's done. His his strategy is it's even bad for what college basketball is right now. He's trying too hard to build everything off of like a handful of really talented one and done guys. And yeah. To the point that you made on Tuesday, you you need more time to gel as a team to win at any sport, but certainly college basketball, even though it's a diminished product, it's not diminished to that degree just yet. No. By the way, Calipari's 65. He looks good for 65. Yes, he does. Good jeans. Good Italian jeans there. Good Italian jeans. He's got a good-looking daughter. I did not realize that. What's her name? Uh, yeah, I've seen her, seen her uh, on on Twitter before going through kind of what, um, Aaron Calipari. That's it. What do you think? Yay. Let's see. 
Would you? You'll have to tell me if this is her. I mean, I'm I'm not stalking her. I haven't seen her that much, but she would have this picture. Someone reposted something not too long ago, and I was like, she's she's quite the looker. Quite the looker. Quite the looker. I'm sure she'd love to hear that. Is this her? Yeah. It's a better pick. Right. I think he's got a couple of daughters. I mean, she she's a pretty woman there. I'm, that one that one's a better pick. I think that's her. Yeah. For some reason it's not letting me go down. Yeah, yeah. I, I see what you're saying there. May have been the other daughter. I don't know. Hey, what do you think of Caitlin Clark possibly playing next season in the Big Three for five million bucks? What's the big three? It's Ice Cube's three-on-three basketball league that has four-point shots and whatnot. Oh. Um, four-point circles, excuse me. Yeah, I've not checked that out. Uh, what is she getting paid for it? Five million. Does she not play in the WNBA? I believe that she would be allowed to do both. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Good for her. Yeah. I, I mean, want to see it. Because the reality is, I mean, it depends on how many ashes she brings to WNBA events or games. And she did a pretty damn good job, you know, good job in college that she, you know, may end up needing to be the most highest paid person. But it's still the WNBA. It's still a subsidized league. And it's just not that popular. Maybe she changes that. But you can only argue for her to get so much. If you're running a real business. You're absolutely right about that. It's a smart business move by Ice Cube, by the way, to float this idea publicly. Because even if and when she says no, and she's going to say no, it would not be very smart of her to say yes and then get dominated by middle-aged former NBA players. Yeah. Um, but I, I would want to see it just to see like where that skill level is because like as a basketball player, she moves in ways, as we talked about on Tuesday, that isn't typical of women's basketball players. Yeah. I don't know how old the players are in that. Uh, well, we'll, we'll go to big three.com right now and I'll give you a taste of who some of the players are. Do you watch this? Fuck no. Is it on TV? Is it? I believe so. Yeah, it streams of nothing else, but I think it is on TV. All right, so here here are some of your big three stars: a Gerald Green, okay, a Jason Richardson. Oh my God! That, go back to Jason Richardson. That is not your uh, Michigan State Jason Richardson. <laughs> a Swaggy P. Nick Young. Somebody named Franklin Session. I don't even know if that's a real person, a real name. Rashard Lewis, Houston name. Houston, yeah. Oh, it says Pineville, Louisiana. But he played at uh, Houston Elsick, didn't he? Yeah, I think he did. Good call. Leandro Barbosa from Brazil. Wow, Leand Leandro wasn't ready for picture day. <laughs> <laughs> and bringing it up, Mario Chalmers. Mario, Kansas, baby. And then bringing it up the rear, Catino Mobley, the cat himself. God, the lefty from Rhode Island. That's uh, right. Him and Lamar Odom. That was a nasty team. That was a nasty team. Um, I yeah. think I picked them to go further than they did. I had them going Elite Eight or Final Four, and they fucking bowed out in the Sweet 16 or something. You know, she'd had some problems with Richard Lewis, but some of those guys, I mean, God knows what type of shape they're in. Yeah. Like if Khalid Alamine is in this league, I mean, she, there's, she's going to be able to dribble right around his fat ass and shoot over him too. Yeah, I would think so. So, well, I yeah. hope Khalid Alamine isn't dead. Now I'm starting to wonder if he's dead. Uh uh. Let's hope not. Yeah. Uh, still alive. All right. And I'm on the hook for Khalid Alamine for the next two weeks. Still alive, baby. Still alive. Keep on cooking and eating. Um, yeah, this article didn't get into what Kentucky's done, but lost to 15 seed St. Peter's in the opening round of the 22 tournament. Then obviously lost to Oakland. Um, yeah, they're bringing him back. Yeah. It's going to be, 
just the fact that you've got to, for a guy who's won a national title, you have to come out, Barnhart does the AD, and be like, hey, he's coming back for another year. Yeah. Well, great. You know, you know, it's like your boss calling you and being like, hey, dude, come on in today. You know, it's like, okay, um, you know, what's going on here? Everything okay? Right, yeah. Come on in. We're going to have a talk. Uh, Freddie's up. I could watch Freddie Freeman take at bats all day, man. Freddie Freeman is a Hall of Famer. Okay. Damn, this two hours flew by. Yeah, it did. Clock and thought it would be four thirty. It's five oh two. How about that? We're already here. What are you? Uh, what are you making tonight? We are going to soccer practice and then hitting up Style Switch. So got some sausages in the fridge was going to do some sausages and peppers but that'll have to wait till tomorrow night yeah and you have a style switch right near you right we do yeah off of 1431 delicious let's see it is a thursday i don't remember what the thursday special is it may be a burger night up there and they've got really good burgers too but yeah style switch this location serves the cheesy tater tot casserole which last time i checked the North Lamar location only served that on Wednesday. So that's definitely something worth getting. If you do so, get a side of the Alabama white sauce too. But there really aren't any misses at this style switch, including whatever that special is on a given night. That's funny. I was watching a, a food show the other day and they, um, you know, it, it was Andrew Zimmern and I had never really thought about it, but you know, a place that I want to go visit and actually go spend three or four days and just go eat a ton is Birmingham. Okay. There, there are some, and then I, of course, looked it up, and there are some really good restaurants. Birmingham seems a lot cooler than maybe I suspected or, or you would think, you know, not really knowing much about Alabama. But there were a couple of restaurants that really looked, you know, looked new, and, and I use this, you know, hip, but the type of restaurants we would like that kind of new cooking but with some old stuff. And, yeah, there was a, but there was an old barbecue place that he went to. They had the Alabama white sauce on the side. And I was like, man, that, that looks fucking good, dude. It is delicious. Yeah, I felt that way about Charleston, South Carolina, too. And then I went there and was underwhelmed. Yeah, Charleston's gotten almost went off, like the way Austin did years ago. It's getting so much national pub. Yeah. And I remember people coming here and being like, yeah, it's good. You know, I just, I, I thought I was going to San Sebastian. I'm like, well, you you know, you're not, you know, so. It's that low country coastal fare. It's a lot like Southern cooking. Like when that's your, the primary thing that you're all about, it's only going to get so far for me. Yeah. I think a lot of that's you too. I mean, cause I doubt that like the grits and some of that stuff was, was right up your alley. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, a crepe place. Like if you tell me it's a, the world's greatest crepe place. I, yeah. Okay. It's a crepe though. I don't know how insane i'm gonna go for how delicious these crepes are savory or sweet yeah i feel like i need to you know i've always kind of felt that way about um i hope ray the owner from show creek's not listening ray you know i love your food and i eat a lot of stuff there but i'm kind of felt that way with uh what a little bug's called the uh, oh crawfish crawfish yeah mm -hmm. like i just i thought I, you were gonna go cajun but you just went crawfish. Okay. Oh, no. I mean, there's a lot of Cajun stuff that I love. So, um, a Franklin's lot. new Cajun place, or it's not as new now, but Uptown Sports Club is really good. We went there on Sunday. Uptown Sports Club? Okay. Yeah. Well, no, I, I can have garlic soup, boudin, etouffee, gumbo. Um, there's a lot of Cajun food that I, that I fucking love. But, yeah, I've never got on crawfish as much as, you know, some of my friends. It's like it's a mix between, you know, lobster and a shrimp and just seems like a lot of work. And, you know, they're always so damn spicy and hot um, the way they cook them. But I, I've, I've had them there and enjoyed them, but I just don't, I, I don't get the craze with it. Yeah. All right, All right buddy. I got to head to a kid's soccer practice now. So good conversation as always, my friends. Go enjoy it. Go enjoy it. We'll talk this weekend. Y'all have a good weekend. Happy yeah, Easter. Brother. Thank you to everybody for tuning in today. If you are still on YouTube right now, click that thumbs up button and subscribe to the Texas Sports Unfiltered YouTube channel. Please download our free app through your app store. Just search Texas Sports Unfiltered there. 
for Kevin Dunn and everybody else at Texas Sports Unfiltered. I am Trey Elling. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back on Monday, Easter Friday, off for the channel tomorrow, and you will, will get the Wagner Wire on Sunday as well, of course. Until then, have yourselves a great holiday weekend and hook them. Oh. Uh...